Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. From somewhere beyond the threshold of neon, the happy holidays beckon to Broadway. And the wilderness of plastic and chrome dons its ribbons of tinsel. Garlands of evergreen are hung against the shriek of subways. And behind plate glass, puppets with shrewd mechanisms perform their frenetic dance. The metallic music flows out of the horns of loudspeakers. The women walk slow, sway gently to its holiday rhythms. And everywhere, the image of gaiety is reflected in spangles that whirl on winter's wind. So paint the grin across your mouth, kid. It's the merry time. And somewhere within it, a phone call, a drunken voice that pleads you into a desolate, wind-littered street, into a tenement scarred with shadows, into a room also desolate. A man sprawled on the floor in drunkenness, his arm flung toward the woman who lies away from him, his fingers reaching, trying to touch her dead face. And the other man who clings to your lapel has waited there only so he could tell you about it. That proves I had nothing to do with it, doesn't it? I called it in. I waited here for you. Me, along with those two, just so as I could tell you about it. Who that are you? proves... Bob... Robert Coker. I got a wife and a good name. I don't want to get mixed up in this, mister. The woman? That's Mrs. Baker, Charlie's wife. Boy, has that boy got a hangover waiting for him when he comes to. Imagine, you and Charlie, you're enjoying yourself. You get invited in for a little nightcap. You walk in, and there's Mrs. Baker lying on the floor, her head all twisted like that. She was strangled. Yeah, yeah. That's how I figured it, too. When we walked in, saw her, I said, look, Charlie, boy, look at your missus. And Charlie kind of yelped like a dog or something. Tried to make it to her. But he passed out on the way. I never touched him, mister. Honest, I didn't... You and Mr. I... Baker were out together, then you came home? Yeah, but not like you think. We were to the office party. Charlie and me, we got adjoining desks. Big deal, office party. Booze and paper cups dance a little with the stunnel you've been wanting to touch all year. Then you take Charlie Boy home and... And look, mister, okay if I go home now. I done everything could be expected. Okay, Call your wife, I... Mr. Culker. Tell her you won't be home for a while. And wait, then. Watch the barrier of faces form at the doorway, the same faces that gather always when sudden death is done. Faces tempered only by the quality of shirts, neckties, and hairdos. Quality this time, tenement, frayed. And in a while, the medical examiner, the nod toward the dead, the black satchel opened, and the stethoscope that hears no heartbeat. The official pronouncement that a woman named Lucille Baker, age about 32, married, no children, had been strangled to death. And the other nod to the two men who had been found with her. Take them along. Get out. Go. And back to the office. Give orders to interview everyone at the party. Turn Mr. Baker over to the officer whose extracurricular duty includes the sobering of suspects. Question Mr. Coker again. His story sticks. Then a door opens and a very sober man walks in. But they just told me I don't believe. What are you doing here, Bob? I just told them what happened. I told them we came back to your place. You wait outside, Mr. Colker. Sure. Sure, whatever you say. Just take it easy, Charlie boy. Sit down, Mr. Baker. Your wife is dead. Lucille. I want you to try to tell me just what happened tonight. Uh, the office party, I... I went there. I was having a fine time. Yes, I was. I was having a wonderful time. Look, it was the end of the day, and at first I wanted to go home, but they wouldn't let me. They said, look at all this free booze. Lap it up and forget it. And now... Uh, go on. Well, I tried to call Lucille three or four times. I don't know how many times to tell her I was having a good time not to wait up for me, but the line was always busy. What else do you remember? Bob said, come on, let's go home. When we got there, that last thing I remember, Lucy lying there, and saying to myself just like this, I am drunk. You, you think you see all sorts of things when you're drunk, and this is one of them. That's, that's not Lucille. I'm not even home now. I wake up and it... <laughs> Oh, 
And the room shorn suddenly of everything but a man sobbing. And this is only one in the long array of grieving that has been displayed you over the last years. The grief for the loved dead, sometimes with laughter of strange texture, with silence sometimes, anguish, bitter. And sometimes this, like this man's, and always the walking away from it. And release him and his friend, Bob Kolker. Go home. Sleep. The next morning, back to the tenement where a woman had been strangled. Ask questions through inch-open doors, and the children of the tenement shrivel away from you as if you were a cold wind. The doors that are never opened to you, the furtive whispers and scurrying behind them, the giggles. And finally, at the mention of the dead Mrs. Baker's name, a woman who begins a weeping suitable for police callers invites you in. Oh, that poor, poor creature... Taken from us like that, choked like that, cast away. Please, won't you come in? I'm Ruthie Alexander. Let's just shut the door, shall we? My neighbor's curious, nosy, so pathetically nosy. May I get you something? Hot chocolate tea? Something with a bite to it? Uh, No, thank you. You knew Mrs. Baker? I knew Lucille. Better than... How awful to be a man and have to suffer weeping women. You were saying you knew Mrs. Baker well. Better than she knew herself. And the promises life offered that girl. Although Lucille wasn't pretty, mind you. Not in the real sense of the word. But she had her qualities hidden, kind of. Sly. It intrigued you men. You're saying that she... Nothing of the sort. Why, Lucille, the poor unimaginative creature, and I say this of her, and I was her best friend, mind you, and have the right. Lucille backed away from me, and I honestly think they frightened her. She was married to a husband who loved her. Of course he did. Of course he did. Why shouldn't he? She could have even had a man like Teddy Fletcher. Teddy was dying for her. Lucille told me all about it. Fletcher? A fellow who works at the Dorsey Company where Lucille's husband worked. I told her so many times, a man like that, Lucy, they don't grow on bushes. They... You know something? What? That Lucille. She was a deep one. Sly, like I said. I wonder. I just wonder if she and Teddy... <laughs> Oh, how, how awful of me. <laughs> but will you have a cigarette at least? I'll light it for you. Draw the first puff. And refuse the kind offer. King-sized, cork-tipped, gratis and all. Give her back her solitude. Leave her to her tearless weeping. Now she'd have something really to cry about. She'd wasted a cigarette. To the offices of the Dorsey Novelty Company, Incorporated Limited. Be greeted, be given a catalog concerning current novelties. Be frowned at because I didn't want it. Be listened to, be ushered past the office force and slogans about geniuses at work and courtesy and cleanliness and accuracy. And be shown to a cubicle. Yeah? Mr. Fletcher? Yeah, what is it? I'm Danny Clover from the police. I'm expecting somebody from down there. Sit down, please. Thanks, sir. I'm trying to get some information. I know, I know. All right, you know. Tell me what you know. Just one thing. You think I killed Lucille? Did you? I was in love with her. Did you kill her? I just told you I was in love with her for two years now. I built my plans around her, day-to-day plans. That adds up to being my life, doesn't it? You think I killed her? It'd be like killing myself, wouldn't it? All right, we'll go on the premise you didn't kill her, Mr. Fletcher. Tell me about last night. I was at the party. Everybody got loaded. Not me. You don't drink, huh? Now, when it's better to say sober. Last night was such a time. Oh, why? Last night, Charlie Baker was here getting tanked. Last night, Lucille Baker was home being lonely. Then you left the party because her husband was here and went over to see her, huh? Is that it? It's the way I planned it. It didn't work. You want to tell me why? Yeah. I called Lucille from here during the party a lot of times. She said, I'm a wife with a husband. Stay where you are. Admirable, huh? A wife, if it killed her, then it killed her. Then you gave up and went home? I needed solace. I found Isabel by the water cooler. Isabel? Isabel Mitchell, pal and buddy, sweater and skirt. We smiled at each other over paper cups, linked arms, and went to her place. Drank and did childish things like pin the tail of the donkey. 
Drank. 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 Your alibi, huh? I want to talk to her. I guess she's still at home getting rid of last night's head. She didn't show up today. Nice kid. Where does she live? Two rooms on West 37th, 905, apartment 2. Look, Mr. Clover, that Hamilton wall clock says noon, and it's never wrong. You're not going to join me for lunch, are you? Thanks a lot. And the ride now to West 37th, to the block of the brownstones and the low rent and the corner grocery store. And next to the tailor shop that advertised proudly how it had held the line since 1950, find the number, 905. Walk past the door to apartment one, and a few steps more to apartment two, apartment of Isabel Mitchell. Knock and get no answer. And open a door, walk in. The living room decorated in row house decor. Dregs of last night's drinks, Coolidge modern and empty. And the kitchen, the light still burning, the perpetual distant sound in the exposed water pipes. And strung from them, the girl, the girl twisting this way and back. Only slightly, the lifeless girl, the murdered girl. <laughs> You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Confidentially, Edgar Bergen has a split personality, and it's hard to say whether he's funnier as the harassed Bergen or as that saucy figment of his own imagination who does the harassing, Charlie McCarthy. We leave it to you to figure out, between the laughs, every Sunday night on most of these same CBS radio stations when you hear Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy. In the days before Christmas, Broadway puts on its flashy clothes and the flashy smile. Everybody's on his way to con Santa Claus. The blonde who walks with you stops to adjust her nylons in front of the jewelry store. The brunette who tells you to pick her up for lunch in the lingerie department. The redhead who behaved all year long. And while the reindeer dash across the tundra of the spectaculars, the recruits from the Bowery shake their little bells and nod lovingly at tiny tots. Get out the Christmas list, kid. That's where your friends have been all year long. And at headquarters, consider other things. Official musings. The dying of Lucille Baker, a woman strangled. Consider what chain of circumstance led from her to the murder of another, Isabel Mitchell. Consider... And be interrupted by a police sergeant named Gino Tartaglia, who sometimes had things in his mind. I got a headache, Danny. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Why don't you take an Such astro- condolences are touching, Danny, and I thank you for them. However, my symptoms are psychosomatic. Psychosomatic. A word Mrs. Tartaglia read to me last night, from a book. It's the type headache which is prone to deep thinkers, so science explained to Mrs. T, and she to me. You've been thinking deeply, Gina? Indeedy, as concerns the current situation in the murder of Lucille Baker and the subsequent same of Miss Isabel Mitchell. Oh? A theory to wit. Mr. Ted Fletcher is a killer. Murdered the woman whom he loved, Mrs. Baker. Then murdered the girl he flirted with, Isabel Mitchell. But Isabel was his alibi, Gina. Why should he murder her? I got my headache making it sound reasonable to me, Danny. But I think I know why he killed Miss Mitchell. Yeah, I can think of a reason, too. You mean like that, so soon? Well, it'd figure, Gino. You tell me yours, I'll tell you mine. The way it stands now, Gino, Fletcher can't account for his actions of last night. Nobody remembers when he left the party. Let's just assume he left with Miss Mitchell. He took her home and left her... You've been peeking into my brain, Danny. He left her, went to see Mrs. Baker, killed her. Came back to Miss Mitchell and asked her to be his alibi. She refused. Indeed, Danny, indeed. So she was the only one who knew he was a killer. She refused to help him. He killed her. Our theories make a lot of sense, don't they? Maybe. Have Fletcher picked up, Gino. I'm going out. Okay, Danny. Where can I reach you if I need you? At that novelty office. Maybe I can find out why that happy party had so much murder in it. You're the guy who told the girl you're a detective? That's right. Show me, show me. 
Girls get impressed with guys who show them shiny badges. Don't bother to read the small print. All they care is that a muscle man with a favor to ask. You through with it? Yeah. Take back your badge. I produce novelties like that by the carload. Just had to be sure you weren't giving the girl a fast shuffle. Some questions I want to ask you, Mr. Dorsey. About time you got around to me, huh? It just so happens I'm the head man in this little enterprise. Maybe the personnel didn't get around to telling you. They didn't need to. I saw your publicity on the wrapping paper. Yeah. You had a little confab with Ted Fletcher, the girls tell me. Sorry, it didn't occur to me I need your permission. Oh, it's not that, kid. It's just that I got a happy enterprise here. You walk in, talk murder talk, it spreads gloom. Everybody gets unhappy until I think of something. The office party the other night, that was one of your thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, it was. Happened to be my birthday. I let it be known in a loud voice. And before long, the personnel is pitching dimes into a kitty. A good time was had by all. What did you think of? Who? Ted Fletcher. Personally, I can't stand the guy. Good worker, but I can't stand him. What do you think of him? Just keep talking. Fletcher. Not much to look at, but oh, you kid, what he does to the emotions of the ever-loving opposite sex. You know what I mean? You gotta agree, because you got him tabbed for killing Mrs. Baker, I understand. I tell you, it couldn't have happened to a nicer guy. Charles Baker works for you, too. Give me your thoughts on him. Baker's a good boy, nose to the grindstone type. I got a lot of plans for him. Been to his home, ate his impressed the boss type of food. Met his wife, the former Mrs. Baker. Yeah, and do you have an opinion? Mm Mm-hmm. Dull woman, plain, boring. You know, Baker's better off without her, in my opinion. I tell you, because you asked. And Isabel Mitchell, who also worked for you, who was also at your birthday party, who was strangled, murdered. Hmm. Kind girl. Had a kind word for everybody, but everybody. Prove it to you. Fletcher meets her at the water cooler at my party. Isabel gives him the kind word. Fletcher takes her home. That was a busy, busy night for Fletcher, wasn't it, guy? Anything else, Mr. Dawson? That cuts it as far as I'm concerned. You too, huh? I bet you got loads of things to do, just like me. So goodbye, huh, guy? Mr. Clover? Yes? Is it all right if I just walk in here into your office? Of course. Won't you sit down? Thank you. I'm Lois Nolan. Yes? I work at the Dorsey Novelty Company in the office. I run an IBM machine, time study cards. I don't guess you noticed me, did you? Well, seems that I do. I guess you're wearing another dress. No, I was wearing this dress. You just didn't notice, that's all. Well, why have you come here, Miss Nolan? I wasn't at the party last night, so your men haven't questioned me. I see, and you want to be questioned, is that it? Well, I was a friend of Isabel's. You were? Though we had differences of opinion, as they say, about friends, boyfriends... Personally, I like fellows from whom I can better myself. And Isabel. Yeah. She was not the discriminate type. Life, she once said, was a laugh and a song. Look what it got her, some laugh. Yes. Well, now if you'll pardon me, Miss Some Nolan. laugh. If you knew where I just came from, you wouldn't say some laugh. Where did you just come from, Miss Nolan? From her uncle's house. In buckets, that's the way he was crying. He didn't say a word. But if you could have seen his eyes, those tears... Then he said, Lois, I cannot cry anymore. Isabel was a good girl, and now she is gone. I didn't know she had a family. No one's claimed Because that man is a nervous wreck. After all, Isabel did for him. Where does her uncle live? In Brooklyn. 2020 Stockton Street. I hope I have been of some help, since Isabel was a dear friend of mine. I was was always broad-minded enough to forgive the things. You've been a great help, Miss Nolan. Thank you very much. And the house in Brooklyn, like all the other houses in the long file, the peeling paint, the sagging porch, the parlor curtains drawn aside to reveal the Christmas wreath, then drawn further to permit a clearer view of the man who walks their quiet street. And having noted your passing, open their windows, crane to see at whose door you'll knock. Then in faraway voices, announce it to friends, relatives, and neighbors. The voices drain away. Then, for a moment, the stillness is almost complete except for the wailing of vessels in the harbor, the cry of wind trapped against street lamps. Then break it, and the man in the woolen sweater wonders at you with pale eyes, washed-away eyes. Oh, you must be from the mission. I phoned. I have the magazines all tied and ready there. I'm uh, from the police. About Isabel. Yes. Come in, come in. You'll take your death of cold. 
I haven't been to claim her body because I didn't know if it was right. I'm just her uncle, and Isabel moved away from me over a year ago. I thought maybe she'd got someone closer to her. That's than... not why I came. No? Then why? Well, I thought maybe you could help us. Maybe you could tell us things about her that'll help us find her murderer. Isabel came here to live with us when her mother died. Then my wife died and Isabel stayed on. It was nice when she was here. And then she went away. Well, tell me about it, Mr. Clayton. It was nice, gay, exciting. Young men called on her, brought her things, brought me cigars, sat and talked with me while they waited for her to dress. She was pretty, real pretty, worth waiting for. You remember the men who called on her? No, no, just boys, nice-looking fellows. And you haven't seen Isabel since she left? Oh, yes, I didn't say that. I saw her many times, but only quickly. I'd call her and tell her to come pick up little things I had for her. Oh? Things, presents. They weren't really from me. They were from this nice fella. He must have liked Isabel a whole lot. You know how I know? Tell me. Well, he'd bring her these things and make me promise not to tell Isabel they were from him. He said he'd tell her when the time came when he was ready to. And, and I'd say, Charlie... Charlie... Charlie Baker. Nice fella. You know, he made me tell Isabel I was giving her those things. Look at me. What would I have to give a girl like Isabel? This is the first time I've been in a place like this, Mr. Clover. I've passed the jail many times, but I've never been in. These are just the detention cells, Mr. Baker. Detention cells? You mean they're not permanent? You're not sure about Fletcher? Fletcher was picked up as a suspect, and that's still all he is. He's a killer. We'll find out. I still don't know why I'm here. I want to put your story together with his. Oh, then you'll know, huh? Then we'll know. Fletcher sleeping. With a conscience like his. Look at him. All right, come on, Fletcher. Wake up. Wake up, killer. On your feet. I brought you a visitor, Fletcher. Hi, Charlie. Hi, Charlie. Hi, Charlie. That what you got to say to me? You my friend. Killer. Break it up. I said, break it up. Yeah. What am I, crazy, dirty my hands on him? You know what they got for you, killer? A chair. And you're going to sit in it. Fletcher, I told Baker how it was between you and his wife, Lucille. I'm glad you did. We were going to tell him we didn't get a chance. Lover boy. Killer boy. I didn't kill her. Is that what he keeps telling you, Mr. Clover? Uh-huh. That's why you just keep him in the detention cell, huh? That's right. Look, Charlie. All right, I'm looking. you got to understand, Charlie, about Lucille and me. I loved her. She loved me. If we could have worked it out, I would have married her. Loved her? Loved Lucille? You? She wasn't a beautiful woman, Charlie. You know that. She was a gentlewoman. Talking with her, you, you weren't afraid of the world anymore. Well, Fletcher, if that's what she did to you, that's what she did to you. Didn't she do that to you, Baker? You were pretty broken up when she died. Did you ever have a wife who was murdered, Mr. Clover? No? Then don't tell me how it should feel. You and my wife, huh, Fletch? I didn't kill her. I swear I didn't kill her, Charlie. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. What happened last night, Fletch? Lucille waved you goodbye and you let your emotions run away with you? It was all over and you couldn't remember a thing, so you say you didn't kill her? Is that what happened, Mr. Fletcher? I told you what happened. Get him out of here. Just a few more things. About a girl who worked at your office, also murdered Isabel Mitchell. You had your hands full last night, didn't you, killer? I ask you, get him out of here. No, I want him to hear something. There's another way this thing adds up. You could have killed your wife, Baker. What are you talking about? I was at the party. Everybody knows that. Everybody will vouch for me. I don't know. A party like that, people coming in and out, nobody remembers much about anything. You building something, Mr. Clover? Maybe. You could have left the party long enough to kill your wife, then go back to it. No one would have known the difference. Then play drunk, have a friend take you home, find your wife dead. Have a seat, Charlie. 
You might as well. His cots take a little while to get used to. Now, listen, Clover. Then early the next morning, cry on my shoulder, be released, go around to Isabel's place and whisper to her the happy news about your wife's being dead. You're crazy. Why would I go to her? Because you were crazy about her. Crazy about her? Isabel? <laughs> Isabel! <laughs> what are you laughing at? He's right, Fletcher. You shouldn't laugh. Mr. Baker was crazy about Isabel. Gave her presents. What are you talking about? But on the sly. Isabel didn't even know where they came from. After you've gotten rid of your wife, you could tell her, huh, Baker? But she wouldn't have any part of you. You killed her. <laughs> In love with Isabel. Her? A girl like that? Oh, Charlie, you stupid man. A girl like that when you had your own wife. Shut up! Shut up, shut up! Isabel was sweet and she was wonderful. You know how I know? She wouldn't look at me because I was married. That's the kind of a girl she was. She was good. I killed my wife for her, and she took pity on me. She was good. But she still wouldn't look at you, so you killed her. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I had no more to live for. Why should she go on living? Why should somebody else have her? Who else would have done for her what I did for her? Nobody. Just me. But she didn't want me. And she had to die. <laughs> It's an enchanted island, this Broadway, or a desert of dust. Look at it, and it's a magician's pitch with golden mirrors and fountains that plume with jewels. Then you blink, it all dissolves. It's a crumbling wall, corroded with pain. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover, with Charles Calford as Tortaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. Featured in tonight's cast were William Conrad, Harry Bartell, Peggy Weber, Lou Merrill, and Herb Butterfield. All the best fun-making from Arthur Godfrey's daytime shows on CBS Radio. That's what you hear every Sunday afternoon on most of these stations when King Arthur Godfrey and his roundtable hold court. Hear it tomorrow afternoon. And remember to enjoy King Arthur Godfrey and his roundtable every Sunday afternoon on CBS Radio. Bill Anders speaking. And remember, those lovable rascals Amos and Andy are here every Sunday on the CBS Radio Network.
That's what the sign out in front of my office says. Pat Novak for hire. It's about the only way to say it. Oh, you can dress it up and tell how many shopping days there are till Christmas. But if you got yourself in the market, you can't waste time talking. You gotta be as brief as a pauper's will. Because down on the waterfront in San Francisco, everybody wants a piece of the cake. And the only easy buck is the one you just spent. Oh, it's a good life. If you work real hard and study a little on the side, you gotta trade by the time you get to prison. I rent boats and do a few other odd jobs you can't afford to pick it on. It works out all right if you put your tongue in hock. Because down here you shouldn't talk. It's like installing a set of drums in a belfry. You make some noise, but it's never the right kind. I found that out a few days ago. Must have been Tuesday or Wednesday night anyway. I was sitting in the office reading Time magazine when the door opened. I looked up and had to keep right on going because the guy was so tall he'd have to bend over to see through a transom. And he had a voice deep enough to red out as a bassoon. Good evening, Mr. Novak. I'll take your word for it. You have a small office. I'm small time. What's on your mind? My name is Leahy. I want to hire you. Yeah. Sit down. Are you cold? Yeah. That overcoat around your neck. You're either cold or a priest. Oh. I'm a priest, Mr. Novak. I'm sorry, Father. You got a slow brogue. What do you need? A few hours of your time. I want you to help a man escape from prison. Uh Uh-huh. Father, you'll never get along with a bishop. Mr. Novak, in a curious way, this is an errand of mercy. Well, this isn't my year for mercy. I'm sorry, Father. Maybe you don't like to hear it that way, but if I got the right fee, it wouldn't be mercy anymore. When I say it's an errand of mercy, that's what it is. Sometime tonight, a man is going to break out of Alcatraz. If he's allowed to get into town, he may kill somebody. You want me to stop him? That's right. And if he doesn't kill anybody, he can still be shot down by the police. Well, that's the percentage, Father. If he comes off that rock, he knows that. Stop worrying about him. If you could bring him to me, I know I can talk him into going back. Tell headquarters they'll do the same thing. If I did that, I'd break a promise. This is the only thing I can do. Will you help me? Yeah, I suppose. How do I pick him up? Treadwater in the bay till he comes by? He's due in at Pier 19 sometime tonight. When he comes ashore, bring him to me. I'll be waiting at the ferry building. Well, suppose he doesn't want to come. Suppose he wants to party. How am I going to get him there? I don't ask you how to say the beads. If you're any good, you'll get him there. But you don't want him in sections. I want him all at once, Mr. Novak. I wouldn't ask you this if it weren't important. But i got to help him. He's one of my boys. Yeah, sure. What's his name? Joe Feldman. Feldman? Yeah. If I don't worry about the spelling, you don't have to either. He's one of my boys. Slow down. Nobody's pushing your father. I don't know when he's due, but I'll be at the ferry building from 8 o'clock on. Yeah. I only got one worry. Huh? Is there really a guy named Father Leahy? I suppose you'll have to take a chance on that. Yeah, well, it's a big chance. You come in here with a story anybody can see through like a screen door, and I'm supposed to buy it. You could dig up a collar. What happens if you're a fake? Just try to guess right. Suppose I don't. Then you're in the same spot Pontius Pilate was. Good night, Mr. Novak. Whoever Joe Feldman was, he had a good friend. Because when Father Leahy walked out of there, I knew he was all right. You could tell without even testing him. The way when you pick up a pool cue, you know right away whether it's any good or not. He stood at the door for a minute, and then he walked out. And you got a funny feeling that he didn't walk into the night that he was big enough to wrap it around his shoulders and take it with him. I got a last look at him as he turned the corner under a street lamp. He looked even taller now, and you knew if somebody stood him in an oil field, you couldn't tell him from the rest of the derricks. Well, I made a couple of phone calls, and then I closed shop and went down to the end of Pier 19 to wait. The bay looked as dark as a bruised crow. The fog was beginning to drift in over near the piers. By 9 o'clock, you couldn't see a thing. You felt like a guy trying to shave in a bathroom full of steam. I was about... 30 feet from the end of the pier when a small boat pulled in and let somebody out. I was sure it was my boy, so I moved behind a shed and waited. The boat pulled away and the guy started down the dock. I waited until he moved past me. Oh, Oh, I'm sorry. You ought to be glad. How's the rock? Huh? You lonely, mister? What do you care? If you are, buy a beer and talk to the bartender. I'm busy. All right, you're tough, Feldman. Let's go now. You got dates for us? You're going to see Father Leahy. Come on. Why, are you doubling for Gabriel? Leave me alone, mister. I don't want to go. Now, look, Junior, if we draw straws, you're going to get the short one. Oh. 
that's supposed to be a gun in your pocket? Well, you get a chance to find out. That's what I'm going to do, because I have one, too. If it starts to hurt your stomach, back down. <laughs> now where's yours, Mr. Timmet? It's a bad night for bluffing, so goodbye. Yeah, come here. <laughs> go easy, fella. It's a big one. Well, you can let go easy, then. Come on, drop it. Drop it in the water. Let go. Now, you want to start again? No. All right, I'll see you, man, lady. But I got to make a stop first. Make it after. It'll take five minutes. Look, mister, if you want to do it the easy way, let me make the stop. You go with me. All right, five minutes, and then you see Father Leahy. Suit yourself. I doubt if I'll make heaven, but if you want to run interference, it's all right with me. If you need the credits, you need the credits. <laughs> Joe Feldman wasn't very friendly. He sat over in the corner of the cab and he didn't say a thing. He just kept looking at me and waiting, like a guy feeding arsenic to a rich aunt. A few minutes later, the cab pulled up in front of a hotel on Geary Street and we walked in. One look at that lobby and you got the idea. The place was about as cozy as an abandoned mine shaft. Over by the wall, there was an old mohair couch and the legs on it were so warped pretty soon it was going to look like period furniture. There were a few chairs, and over by the stairs, a faded calendar of a girl in tights holding a jar of mayonnaise and winking, whatever that meant. And there was a broken clock over the desk. But you knew it was all right, because nobody there cared about keeping track of time. It was something you got rid of in a hurry, like a bent quarter. Well, we went up to the second floor. We walked down a long hall that smelled like an ante room to a sewer. When Feldman knocked on the door, she opened it right away. The room was full of taboo. She stood leaning there for a minute, a sort of a girl who moves when she stands still. She had blonde hair. She was kind of pretty, except you could see somebody had used her badly, like a dictionary in a stupid family. Feldman seemed to know her. Hello, Ann. Well, the harvest hands arrive all at once. Yeah. It's good for the crops, but tough on a woman. Come in. Who's your friend? A missionary, I guess. He grabbed me down by the docks. Does he talk or just stand there looking healthy? He growls a little. Do you really growl? Come on, hurry up, lady. Your friend's got a date. I'll bet you bite instead. <laughs> Don't worry about him. He can go over in a corner and play fifth wheel. Now, look, he's got five minutes. Use him quick. Yes? I uh, came up with a message, Ann. The time's been changed. Stay around till 10 o'clock. All right. Is that all? Yeah, that's all. You want the other four minutes? Let's go. All right. Open the door. Yeah. Oh. Oh. You didn't open it fast enough. When Feldman hit me, I wobbled for a minute and went down like the price of winter wheat. If Father Leahy had any loose prayers lying around, now was the time to crate them up and ship them over, because I wasn't going to stay awake long enough to test the varnish. I rolled on the floor a couple of times, and then I took a rain check on the next couple of hours. When I woke up, it was like buying a new Nash and then finding out you can't drive. Joe Feldman was lying next to me with his throat cut like a pound of rib roast. His head was over to one side, and his body was twisted over the other way as if he couldn't make up his mind which direction to die in. I got up and rolled him on his back. He was grinning like a Pullman porter at the end of the line, and his mouth was half open as if he expected you to drop in a suggestion on your way by. I noticed right then how thin and small he was, about as fat as a shadow and tall enough to scrape his head on a lampshade. Well, there wasn't anything I could do but wish him luck. So I called the check stand at the ferry building and had them page Father Leahy. About two minutes later, he answered. Hello, Father Leahy? This is Novak, Father. Yes? Call in the outfield. Your boy's dead. I see. What happened? Somebody didn't like him lots. I wasn't around for the main event. Where are you, on the pier? No, I'm in some cave up on Geary Street. He wanted to come by here first. Father, who's Ann? I don't know. Has Feldman got a girlfriend? He's got two sisters, I think. One of them's named Ann. A tall blonde with lots of speed? That's your definition, but it'll probably do. Now, she was around for a while, in case you ever want to check. Get on the back stairs and pretend I never heard of Joe Feldman. I'm sorry, Mr. Novak. I'm sorry it worked out that way. So am I, Father. 
If you liked him, I'm sorry. He may have been a nice little guy. Huh? Oh, I could do without him, but if you like it, I'll say he was a good little guy. How little? I don't know. We could start a picket fence with him. Why? Because you've got the wrong man, Mr. Novak. Huh? If he's under six feet, you've got the wrong man. Whoever you've got up there isn't Joe Feldman. Well, he's happy about it now, Father. Whoever he is, I'm sorry. It's the percentage. Why the percentage? If it isn't Joe Feldman, why? That's the waterfront, Father. If your name's Joe Nobody, you still can't do better than eight to five. At least Joe Feldman was smart. If you're going to get your throat cut, it's a good time to send in a substitute. As soon as Father Leahy hung up, I knew hanging around that hotel was going to be a waste of time, like sending mash notes to a bearded lady. If I couldn't prove the guy was alive, they were going to charge extra down at the desk. And if Hellman down at Homicide ever found out I brought the guy up here, I'd have about as much chance as a bottle of scotch at a cocktail party. So I picked up my hat and started for the door. I looked at him once more, but he wasn't going to say goodbye, so I started out. Boo. Oh. Hello, Hellman. Expecting me, Novak? No, I'd have rolled him first. Yeah. Invite me in. Crash the party, Hellman. You'll be more at home. All right. He sure looks lazy. Who is he? He's supposed to be Joe Feldman. But Feldman let him do the hard work. They must be good friends. You better check. I don't know the guy. Yeah, help me roll him over. Okay. There. Here, here's his wallet. You let me have it. You're going to break your fingernails. Give it here. All right. Yeah. No money in here. You're going to drop the case? Here's his card, Mike Greeley. Oh. Didn't he like you either? You're wearing out the rug, Hellman. I don't know the guy. You brought him up. I checked at the desk. Well, check on who left then. I brought him up here on a phony leave. Why? Because I was hired to tow him around. He liked the room, so we dropped by. And he cut himself shaving? I wasn't around. There was a girl here for the handshakes. Oh. What kind of girl? I don't know, Hellman. How many kinds are there? Her name was Ann. She had a fast pulse. That's all I know. You must know more than that. If you don't, you'll never get a lawyer. I won't need one. You'll save money at least, because you got a real hole this time, Novak. We get a phone tip and find you in the murder room. You got half a story, Hellman. I know, but I'll get the other half. Until then, you're under technical arrest. It's practically the real thing. Now, you got a technical head, Hellman. I wouldn't tip myself off. Somebody else would. Walk around, Novak, and tire yourself out. Because you'll wind up sitting down. In the meantime, I'll have you tailed. Your men couldn't follow a moose through a revolving door. Now, look, Hellman, I'm going to double back. This guy's a phony lead. I was supposed to meet a guy named Joe Feldman, but he never showed up. He didn't? No. I got a dead copper to prove he did. Your boy, Joe Feldman, killed a sergeant named Grubb at the Gold Rush Club Club a half hour ago. You better start that walk, Novak. two kind of raps you can't ever beat. Cheating a woman with kids and killing a copper. So I knew Joe Feldman could put in for reservations right away. And I knew Hellman would stay with him like a February cold. He'd stay with the whole thing and I'd have a real tough time explaining. <laughs> I couldn't explain it to myself. What about the message up in that room? Why did the little guy tell Ann to stay until 10 o'clock? Why did he get off at Pier 19 instead of Joe Feldman? Once he got there, what was Feldman doing at the Gold Rush Club, and why did they spot him so fast? Well, it pointed to one thing, a police tip-off, but that's as far as I could go. On the way down, I stopped at the desk, and I asked the clerk to see the register. He pushed it over toward me. It was a dirty brown thing that looked like an old tortilla somebody had left behind. It didn't do any good. The registration was a phony. Well, I had to do something in a hurry, so... I looked up the only honest guy I know, an ex-doctor and a boozer by the name of Jocko Madigan. He's a good man, and he used to be a smart one, too. And still he started chasing a jigger of beer with a glass of whiskey. I finally found him in the Pied Piper room arguing with somebody about the words to Annie Laurie. Ah, Patsy, a drink for Mr. Novak. Something cheap but impressive. Oh, stop it, will you, Jocko? Are you going to be drunk all your life? Yes, it's only a matter of willpower, Patsy. I'm probably the only man in the world who intends to carry a hangover into eternity. Well, stop long enough to give me a hand, will you? I'm in trouble. Of course you're in trouble. You'll always be in trouble because you can't recognize it, Patsy. You're fuzzy, Jocko. You have the social outlook of a bull with a hot foot, and there's no hope for you because if from time to time a moral feeling does sweep over you, you mistake it for influenza and go to bed. All right, all right. Oh, you try hard enough. You go through the motions, Patsy, but you never get anywhere. 
You go stumbling through life doing a tight wire act on a rubber band. You're always in the middle. Will you listen to me? It's because there's no variety in your life. You won't allow it. You're a broken-down banjo, not a very good instrument to begin with. And to make matters worse, you allow everybody to come along and pluck the same string. All right. Are you all through now, Jocko? Yes, you sound angry. I think you have a bad disposition, too. What kind of trouble? Well, I tried to help some guy out of prison tonight. You got drunk and thought you were the parole board? No, I did it for a good guy, a priest named Leahy. Yes? The guy was already out, and Father Leahy was trying to hurt him back without getting shot. But this guy, Feldman, didn't want to play. Another drink will clear this up for me? I picked up the wrong guy. I took him to a Geary Street hotel. I napped a while, and they cut him up like a piece of parsley. Sounds like a gruesome hotel. The dead guy's name is Mike Greeley. I don't even know who he is. Well, this is no time to start building a friendship anyway. Uh, who is in the room? Some girl. She may be Feldman's sister. Would she kill a man? Well, if she did, he'd be crushed to death. No, I'm sure somebody else came in that room. You better talk to Feldman. Well, he's a hard man to reach. A sergeant almost made it tonight. Feldman shot his way out of the Gold Rush Club. Hmm, that's one way to get out of a nightclub. Well, Hellman steamed up, so you got to help me, Jocko. You'd better look up Father Leahy. You'll probably be electrocuted, and if you are, he may have some drag. I want you to go down to the Chronicle Morgue and pull the clips on Joe Feldman, will you? Get everything you can, and then hit the horse parlors. Find out what they know about him, huh? Maybe he's a heavy drinker. I'll check the bar. Jocko, wake up and get down there. If I don't pace Hellman on this thing, I'll be a dead pigeon. What am I supposed to do? I don't know. You might start cooing. Good night, lover. Well, as soon as I left Jocko, I went down to the Gold Rush Club on O'Farrell Street. It was a little nightclub where they charge 80 cents for a drink of whiskey that'd kill a redwood. The floor show was just as bad, and the headliner was an oriental dancer whose only talent was a zipper. I sat at the bar, and I tried to pry some talk loose, but they liked the boss. I finally got a hold of a fat waitress who should have been wearing a harness instead of slacks. She told me a little. The owner was a guy named Charlie Giffen, and he used to make book with Joe Feldman. She told me that Joe's sister worked at the Gold Rush Club for a while, but she got sick a few months ago and quit. I asked the girl if tonight's shooting was a police plant. She didn't know, but she said that Feldman had been in to see Giffen tonight, and on his way out, he ran into trouble. I gave her five bucks, and she looked hurt as if somebody had given her a plow for Christmas. She showed me where Giffen's office was, and I walked back there. Giffen wasn't there, but the taboo was. Do you have the right door, Mr. Novak? You seem to be in all of them. Do you mind if I lean in the doorway? No, but I'll bet you need shoulder pads by this time. Where's Charlie Giffen? Why? I want to ask him about Joe Feldman. Ask me. I'm his sister. I'll ask you about Mike Greeley. Who killed him? I don't know. Is he dead? Yeah, he couldn't stand the bleeding. He was all right when I left. What were you doing up there? Waiting for Joe. My sister and I were going to meet him up there. Relax, Mr. Novak. Relax for me. No, when people relax for you, they do it on the floor. I was out long enough for homicide to catch up. They want me for Mike Greeley, but I'm going to send him you or Joe. You're forgetting my sister Norma. Should I? For most things, yes. But she was up in that room tonight after me. I'll ask her. Ask her about the money, too. Well, you're out in front of me on that. You can see me better that way. Joe had a lot of money on him tonight. With the police out, he wouldn't carry it with him. By now, the money's gone, so's Norma. Oh. Do you know where it is? No. Well... You growl, and you bite, and you lie. You must have a full day. Sit down, relax. I want to see Giffen. He won't be back tonight. Now lean back. That's it, Patsy. Well, you really want that money. I can split a motive. Can you split it 90-10? If you can't, you better get your breath back. I won't need it. I don't want to talk anymore. Come here and make me stop. Over close. If I get any closer, I'll be on the other side of you. Yes. Hmm. Patsy. You ought to get time and a half, darling. Hello, Anne. Thought you were coming in to curl up with a good book. Uh, uh, Mr. Novak came by full of questions. This is Charlie Giffen, Patsy. I got some questions for you, too, Giffen. Well, ask him down the bore of this gun. Over by the desk, Novak. Did you lose that knife, Giffen? By the desk. That's it. Where's the money, Novak? I gave her the last report. Where's the money? Joe gave it to somebody. Try the Red Cross, mister. You got a tender face, Novak. Now get out of this club before I slap on a cover charge. Oh, 
I was getting sick of tonight. In three hours, I'd seen more service than a mix master in a cooking school. When I left the Gold Rush Club, I dropped by headquarters. Hellman had nothing to show but his badge. They had a dragnet around the city for Joe Feldman, and they'd lined up the record on the dead guy in the hotel. He'd been a friend of Joe's before his trip to Alcatraz. There wasn't much I could do. If homicide couldn't find Joe, I couldn't find him. So I looked up Norma Feldman in the phone book. She had an apartment out on the avenues, but when I called, there was no answer, so I tagged by my apartment to see if Jocko had left a message. When I opened the door, Norma was there, and she had a gun to keep her company. Come in, Mr. Nowak. Yeah. I came up here to kill you. Well, if you're Norma, the rest of the family's ahead of you. What's happened to my brother? I don't know. Please, what's happened to him, Mr. Novak? Well, if he killed a cop, he's hiding out. I know he didn't mean to do that, Mr. Novak. Joe's not that way. Somebody told the police he was going to be there. That's why I came up here to see you. Oh, put down the gun, huh? You can't shoot through the tears. Mr. Novak, if you know where he is, tell me. Make him give himself up. Make him stop hiding like a small, frightened animal. He looked big to that copper. Please. Please find him. You got uh, Yeah. Hello, this is Jocko. Yeah. You sound ruffled. Joe Feldman's sister just walked in to kill me. Don't argue. It's the best offer you've had. What'd you find out? Feldman has two sisters. I know. They both go to pieces. The Gold Rush Club is owned by Charlie Giffen. He owed Joe Feldman $2,000, and the horse people say Joe collected it tonight. Well, that fits in, Jocko. Everybody in town's after that dough. They'll have to look some more. Hmm? I'm out on Arguello Boulevard. Homicide just fished Joe Feldman out of the gutter. If Homicide finished second, he was a lucky guy. He didn't have the dough on him? No. Well, he stashed it somewhere. Then he left it with a woman. Yeah? Because he's got a woman's compact in his pocket. You uh, better hit the sister's place. How do we know he got it there? A woman's compact? If he didn't get it there, Alcatraz is getting too social. Well, the minute Jocko hung up, things began to fall into place. But I knew the last piece was going to pinch somebody hard. If the Feldman blood was going to turn bad, Father Leahy was a good man to send in, so I called him. He was out, but I left word for him to get out to Norma Feldman's apartment. Norma and I left, and on the way, we picked up Hellman. When we got out to her place and started up the stairs, we could hear people moving above. There was no point in trying to keep quiet, because Hellman was creeping up the stairs like a stallion with a broken leg. Yeah, if you got a bomb, touch it off, too, huh? Well, open it, Hellman. Hello, Novak. Did you find the dough, Giffen? You mean my stolen dough? Yeah. Come on, Ann. No, you and Ann better wait. This is Hellman from Homicide. We're leaving. You better move, Novak. Not until you settle a murder rap. Can you pay it off that fast? I can do it on the way to the door. Oh, wait a minute. Point the gun at Hellman. He's official. I can tag you both, so move away. You too, Norma. Ann and I are leaving. Look, Giffen. Homicide gobbles up nightclub big shots like you. You're nothing to me, copper. Move away. You got the hammer. Use it and come on through. All right, I will, copper. Hey, hey, yeah, you need a refill, Giffen. That's right, darling. Hand him your gun. And, and you couldn't have done that. You couldn't have taken him out. All right, so they fell out. You better take him for murder, Hellman. You little bum. That leaves you all the money. I can spend it, darling. Well, you better do it fast, then. Grab him, Hellman. Yeah, yeah I got him. Oh, you can fucking for both murders. My Greeley and my brother. I'll testify and I'll ride there in a cab on your dough, Giffen. Yeah. Are you going to pose or take me, Hellman? If you're anxious. Sorry about you, Norma. You get nothing out of this, but that's better than I got. Goodbye, Ann. Lots of luck. Thank you, darling. You know what kind. I hope you are rot. Come on, Hellman. I'm ashamed of you, Ann. Leave me alone, Norma. I'm ashamed of you, Ann. What you did to Joe, I'm ashamed of you. Leave me alone, Norma. I'm sick, you know that. I didn't know how it was going to work out. Poor Joe was trying to help you when you got greedy. He was trying to help you. That's the only reason he came out. You let this happen. I told you I didn't know how it was going to end. I thought they'd get him and take him back again. There's no good in you, Anne. They couldn't find good in you anywhere. You let that happen to Joe. You stood by and watched him walk into something like that. All right, I stood by. What can we do about it now except weep, and that won't help him. But hating you will... That'll help Joe a little. I'm here at least to hate you for the short time left. Please, Norma. Giffen told you to spend it fast. Well, you better. You better spend it fast. 
Ask him at the hospital if that isn't so. What do you mean? Ask him out there what you've got. They don't. You ask him what you've got. Ask him what's staring you to pieces. Ask them, they'll tell you. They'll tell you you've got cancer. Norma, please. They'll tell you cancer. Ask them, they'll tell you you're full of it. Now spend your money. Spend your money and see that it lasts as long as you do. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Novak. Well, did you miss much, Father? No. Feldman luck is running kind of bad tonight. It does for some people, I guess. All they get is unhappiness. They wear it the same way you'd wear a sports coat, only they never seem to get a new one. I'm sorry about tonight, Mr. Novak. I'm sorry it's not a smoother world. Yeah. But if it were, you'd be out of a job, Father. See you later. If you get a bad first break, you never run the table. That's what happened to Joe Feldman. Charlie Giffen owed him dough and wouldn't pay up. But Joe didn't care until Norma showed up and told him how sick Ann was, so he decided to collect from Giffen and divide the dough between the girls. Father Leahy couldn't stop him. All he could do was try and make it work out. Joe was going to get the dough and meet the girls in that hotel room, but he changed his timetable and sent Mike Greeley up to tell the girls. Giffen showed up there and figured that Mike had tumbled to a double cross, so he killed him. Anne engineered the double cross, but she didn't mean to go that far. She wanted all the dough and tipped off Giffen. He was supposed to turn the dough over to her and then have the police pick up Joe, but Joe got there early. He took the dough away from Giffen and shot the copper on the way out. Giffen followed Joe and killed him out in Arguello, but the dough was gone. He finally tumbled to Norma's place, and that's how her apartment filled up so fast. Well, Hellman asked only one question. What did I get out of all this? Nothing. Father Leahy offered me 50 bucks, but I didn't want it. Jocko was with me, and he offered to give it to charity. I guess he did, because where Jocko spent it, the drinks aren't worth money. Pat Novak for Hire was previously released by ABC, the American Broadcasting Company, for listeners in the United States, and rebroadcast for our men and women overseas. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell means mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. You're a... And you've lost your... Oh. Archie, the answer is no. Hold on a second. The answer to what is no, Mr. Wolf? I should not attempt to find a blonde for anyone. You've got the man on the phone a little wrong, Mr. Wolf. He's not looking for a blonde, he's looking for a prize fighter. (laughs) Indeed, have him come here. Okay. Mr. Wolf will see you at 8. So long. 
I was all set to argue with you about taking the case. You you gave in too fast. Nonsense. I am fascinated by the thought of anyone misplacing a prize fighter. They're usually quite large, aren't they? They are. But what this guy is worried about is not only finding his boy, but finding him alive. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's the bulkiest, balkiest, smartest, and most unpredictable detective in the world. That chair-born genius, Nero Wolfe, created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. Case of the Deadly Sellout. That's what my boss, Nero Wolf, called it. And it almost meant curtains for the firm of Wolf and Goodwin. But let me give it to you straight right from the beginning. Although you ought to know that it wasn't until it was all over that I knew the very beginning of it myself. It all started in the New York flat of one Brock Rainey. Yes? My name is Jerry Fay. I'm supposed to know you? Being a very good friend of Pepe Gatto's, it's time you got to know me. May I come in? Oh, sure. You've got a problem, Miss Fay? Pepe took a fall at the garden last night against a coffee and bum named Eubanks, right? As far as I know, Sister Gatto met his match. Please, Mr. Rainey, do me a favor. Skip the sausage meat. It happens I saw the 1200 bucks you counted out to him to take a quick dive in the first. Mm, you did. How else would I know? Okay, then here's my wrist. Slap it, Miss Fay. I'm a bad boy. Now, look, who's kidding who? I don't care if Pepe makes himself a few deals on the side. I should worry whether he gives those meat eaters on the benches a run for the ducats. What's it to me? If you're not worried, Sugar Plum, then neither am I. Also, I'm a very busy man. Not too busy to pay off, I hope. Pay off? To who? To me. For what? For keeping it to myself that you collected five grand from the Eubanks crowd for getting Pepe to take that dive. Certain people might not like to hear it. Miss Fay. Yeah? Drop dead. I don't think we understand each other. Which is just as well. Now get out of here. Something Blow, else. bimbo. Okay, Mr. Rainey. Have it your way. I'll go find someone with a more sympathetic ear. Someone like Lawson. Arnold F. Lawson. So long. Wait. Where does Lawson come into this? You asking a Stalin. Lawson dropped a sizable piece of change on last night's two-step. No. Close the door, Jerry. Oh, yeah. $25,000 to be exact. That's a lot of corn to lose because a cheap fight manager arranges a frame. At least Arnold Lawson might think so. Sit down. Who's tired? Look, Mr. Rainey, it goes very simply in only one way. Lawson at yet knows from nothing except that your boy Gatto lost the fight. He may suspect, but he don't know. And he really don't have to know. Glad to hear you say that. And I'll be glad to see the shade of 3,000 long green banknotes. How much? You heard me. Three grand. Get out. Okay. I'm going. To the next phone and call Lawson. Look, Jerry. Give me time, huh? I haven't got that kind of dough right now. I Tell got... it to Lawson. When he gets through with you, you won't need any kind of dough. You know, I've got Gatto set for a go with Mellish, the title contender. Gatto can take him. Please believe me. He's going to take him. So? So after what happened in the Eubanks fight, the odds on Gatto will be like a war debt. We can clean up. Listen, we can make Heel, a... I wouldn't trust you from 11.59 to midnight. Get it up. Now. I'll give you six hours. After that, Lawson. So long. Come on, come on. Hello, Rainey, this is Gatto. Hiya, Pepe. Look, the boys dropped in on me at the office at Mindy's. Lawson wants to see me. Lawson? Look, bum, I'm the one with the cauliflower ears. You heard me, and what do I do? Nothing. But... Don't uh, go near him. Stay home. Let me take care of it. How? How? What do you do? I don't know yet, Pepe, but I'll find a way. How did he find out? Your girlfriend. What? She wouldn't do that. She hates the guy. Hate him or love him, she told him. 
I, I can't believe it. I... I suggest you call our little doll Jerry and give her your regards for the double cross. Meanwhile, stay put in your apartment. Don't move. But, Rainy... Hello. Hello. Seventy-five, three, three nineteen, three. Archie, mm-hmm. what on earth are you mumbling about? The high cost of blunt. Indeed. Oh, you can say that again. I have no intention of doing so. Okay, be smug. But there must have been a time even in your life when knickknacks from Tiffany figured on the budget. Phooey. Uh, not to mention steak dinners and champagne. Or what did you feed your girls? Peppermint lozenges? Nonsense. Nonsense. They preferred lime. Oh, <laughs> I'm dying, and he laughs. <laughs> Mr. Wolf? Yes? I have decided that you are giving me a raise. Archie, this is not a period in which uh, unilateral decisions are wise. So I'll be a dope and get a raise, huh? As for your future mental attainments, you may be right. As for raise... You want to drive me to gambling? Like betting on fights or going... Okay, it's the doorbell, and I'm answering it. The name's Rainey. You're Goodwin? I'm Goodwin. Come in. Is Wolf in? Mr. Wolf is always in. Unlike prize fighters, I guess. Come on. Thank you. Mr. Wolf, this is Mr. Rainey, the man who lost his prize fighter. How do you do, sir? I'm not doing so good. Mr. Wolf, you gotta help me. That would depend. On what? The fee. <laughs> I digress. Your problem is what, Mr. Rainey? Mr. Wolf, I manage a fighter named Gatto. Maybe you've heard of him. I have not. However, that is of little significance. You are having difficulty with this Mr. Gatto? I'm not having difficulty with him. I can't find him. Uh, maybe you better let me give you the whole picture, huh? Very well. Well, Gatto is an up-and-coming boy, Mr. Wolf. He had a little upset last week with a guy named Eubanks. But everybody knows, in spite of that, Gatto's heading for the big time. I think he'll prove that when he goes against Mellish. Mr. Mellish being another pugilist, huh? Oh, that's right, Mr. Wolf. Now, Peppy, that's Gatto. Peppy was due at the turf club this afternoon to meet the opposition management and go over the setup. He was due, but he didn't show. I waited all afternoon, and then I started the phone calls and taxis. The results? No results. I combed every joint I ever knew him to buy a beer in, and the score was zero. Matter of fact, nobody's even seen him for four days. You would have tried the gymnasium, naturally? I did. Does this pugilist have a home? Yeah, 206A Rathburn Street, a penthouse on the roof. He was not at home during all this time? It's where I tried first. It was empty as a bank on Saturday afternoon. I see. And you want me to find him for you? If Pepe blows this fight, Mr. Wolf, it'll ruin his career. And the preservation of his career is worth a good deal to you? I got a check for two grand right here. Archie? I'll get it. Two thousand dollars. Very well, Mr. Rainey, I should take immediate steps. I got a cab waiting outside. We can get started right away. We? Oui. <laughs> I should remain here. But how do you expect to... Archie? Yes, Mr. Wolf? You will leave with Mr. Rainey. I need information. You might try the Rathburn Street penthouse to start with. But I've already been there. With all your apologies, Mr. Rainey, suppose you restrict your activities to pugilists. Archie is a trained observer. You are not. Archie, you will pick up whatever you can in Gato's apartment. I especially suggest a careful check on his wardrobe. Wardrobe? If his clothes are missing, Mr. Rainey, it would indicate that he left voluntarily and deliberately. For whatever reasons he may have had. If they are not, Archie, you will phone me from the apartment after your investigation is over. Okay. I should, in the meantime, devote some thought to the subject. Huh? For two grand, all you're going to do is devote some thought? Mr. Rainey, if I were not a modest man, I would point out to you that you're getting quite a... <laughs> a bargain. <laughs> Gatto? Gatto? He's not here. I told you that. I was up here before. He left the door unlocked? I had a key. Guess I forgot to lock up after I left. Now, let's look around. Bathroom? Yeah. Mm. Empty. Mm. 
It's a nice penthouse. Is that a closet? Yeah. What do you think? He's playing hide and seek? Try it. Okay. Anything in there? Nothing I'm looking for. What's that you found? A hat. Well, let's see. A lady's hat. Yeah, a smart and expensive. Label reads a Madame Yetta original. <laughs> that bunch of lace and feathers cost somebody a fast half a hundred. Yeah, probably one of his girls left it behind. And maybe she'll call for it. Come on, we'll take a gander out on the roof. I took a gander out there. It's bare as a bone. Uh-uh. What have we got over there by the chimney? Where? Over there. Uh, just an old awning. Got blown down in the storm last month. Yeah. Be right with you. What are you doing? Looking under it. Oh, brother. You, you found him? Yeah, we found him, chum. A little late. Two holes in his dorsal development and dead as a clay pigeon. Yeah. Well, what have you got to say? Well, now at least the bookies will cancel all bets. We both save our dough. Yeah. I got a phone, Mr. Wolf. <laughs> And there he was, Mr. Wolf, under the old canvas awning. Hmm. Where's the hat? Oh, this is it. Mm-hmm. That's it, boss. <laughs> Snazzy number, no? Where'd you find it? On the floor of the closet. You're right, Archie. Frothy little bit of millinery, caprice. Mm-hmm. Have you any idea whose it may be, Mr. Rainey? I wish I did. But you have to find out. Well, how, boss? The hat is an original. See? The label under the band reads, a Madam Yedda original. Tomorrow morning, Archie, you will interview Madame Yetter. Yes, boss. And discover in your inimitable fashion for whom she made this chapeau. Hello? Archie again, Mr. Wolf. Per your instructions, I have just talked to Madame Yetter. What did you learn? Madame Yetter tells me she made that hat for a Mrs. Lawson. Who is Mrs. Lawson? Wife of an ex beer hustler is in the chips and puts on airs. Lives in a penthouse of the Bradford Arms. I was just about to hop a cab and go up there, boss. Good. Keep this up, Archie. And through sheer practice, you may yet develop to a full blown intelligence. Well, I'm trying, Mr. Wolf. And after the Lawsons, I do what? Return here immediately and hurry. <laughs> Oh, Mr. Goodwin. My secretary tells me you're a detective. My boss might argue with you on that, Mr. Larson. Your boss? It happens I work for Nero Wolf. I see. And you wish to see me about... About this hat. Hat? Oh, I see, yeah. Well, Mr. Goodwin, please believe me. I never wear hats like that. Would your wife be likely to say the same? My wife? Just what are you getting at? Would I seem too nosy if I asked how well you and your wife know Pepe Gatto? How well do we know who? Pepe Gatto. The pug? No, no, not such a pug. No, huh? <laughs> I lost 25000 on him in the Eubanks fight. You ask me, he laid down like a dog. And did you talk it over with him? Talk it over with him? Never seen the man in my life. Not even at the fight? No, I placed a bet over the telephone. I'd scarcely have anything to do with a character like Gatto, Mr. Goodwin. You surely won't from here on out, Mr. Larson. What do you mean? Gatto is dead. You don't say... He was murdered last night. Murdered? And what would you say, Mr. Lorson, if I told you that this hat is your wife's and that it was found in a closet in Gatto's apartment? Now, wait a minute. Let me get this straight. Are you implying... Not implying. That... Facts are sticking out. What time was this dumb brute done away with? Oh, I'd set it at somewhere between 5 and 7 p.m. last night. Well, you said it very conveniently. Thanks. Why? My wife and I drove out of the city at 4.30 yesterday afternoon. Didn't get back until two this morning. And this hat? It took wings and flew into Gatto's closet? Is that the answer? No, that's not the answer. Then what is? This is. A month and a half ago, I was with Celia on a bus top. She was wearing that hat, and the wind blew it off her head. I see. And from there, we figured that somebody picked it up, and it finally wound up at Gatto. You can figure anything you please. Personally, I don't feel in any way obligated to figure anything. Darling, I was just on my way out and... Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize you were busy. Yes, I am busy, Celia. Wait a minute. He's not all right. Run along busy. now, dear. You'll be late. But I want to talk Run to you. Run along, Celia. Yes, darling. Sorry. I'll see you later. 
Beautiful. Really beautiful. I've always thought so, Goodwin. You uh, didn't give me much of a chance to talk to her, did you, Larson? If I didn't, it's for your own good. My good? I don't get it. Celia's a sensitive person, and I won't have her bothered. And do you mean to tell me you let him scare you? Let him scare me? Say, will you stop being so fearless with my life? The guy said don't bother my wife, so I didn't bother his wife. It was that simple. Apparently his wife is not blonde. Answer the phone, Archie. No, you answer it. Now you've hurt my feelings. Oh, well. Hello? I want to speak to Mr. Nero Wolf. Mr. Wolf speaking. Oh? Is it true that you're interested in the Gatto murder? Who are you, and how do you know he's been murdered? The second question is none of your business. And as for the first, call me Jerry. J-E-R-I. How do you do, Jerry? J-E-R-I. Where do you call? Would you like to come to an auction? An auction? You know, going, going, gone to the highest bidder. And what are you placing on the auction block, Miss Jerry? A few facts. All in good condition and guaranteed to make it a cinch to snag the Gatto killer. Sounds promising. Only you'll have to bid against real money. May I have the address of the auction room? You'll have no trouble finding it. Your assistant was there last night. Where? The penthouse on top of 206A Rathburn Street. The big item goes on at four bells. Yeah? Who is it? Man in Wolf sent me. Just a sec. Hmm. You're Jerry, huh? I was expecting the man named Wolf. Unfortunately for me, honey, when he's expected, I usually show up. Come on in. You? See, I'm the legs of the combination. He's the brains. It makes uh, makes a nice division of labor. I see. You came in plenty of time. On the nose is our custom. Where are the rest of the bidders? Any second now. Mm-hmm. How many besides me are coming? One. Small auction. But big action. How'd you happen to decide on this? I knew Gatto pretty good. And you were fond of him pretty good, huh? How did you guess? Well, you've got a key to this place of his, or you couldn't let yourself in. It adds, no? Gee, you should have been a detective. Just what I keep telling Mr. Wolf. Look, tell me, Jerry, darling, this other person who's coming to the auction, who? The killer. You don't say. You sure the killer isn't here already? Look, I didn't kill him. Ah. Uh. The story you would like me to believe is that you witnessed the killing, huh? Called the killer and Mr. Wolf and said, come on, kids, you can get me either to talk or shut up, depending on who pays the most, then it? Something like that. Mm-hmm. Okay, prove you know what you're talking about. Who is the killer? Is it Block Rainey? should also have your head examined, pretty boy. I talk for dough and only for dough. Not that I'm mercenary or anything, okay. but... Okay. Okay, tell me this. How come you saw the killer in the act? Simple. I was here with Gatto. Call me to come see him. While I was here, the shot came through the window there from the roof. You know something, sweetheart? What? I can't understand how a girl like you, a pretty nice girl under all that uh, paint and powder and Broadway shellac, how you could do a thing like this. You were in love with Gatto, I know that, everybody does. And still you're willing to keep your mouth shut if the killer pays enough. How come? Hmm? What's the matter, honey? Did I hit a tender spot? I... I don't think you understand. Sure, I was in love with the goof. Then along comes this other dame. She's rich and beautiful, and she has everything to give him. Oh, do I know her? Of course you do. She... Jerry! Uh... Oh. Jerry. She was just about to tell me, and then the shot came through the window from the roof, boss. It's a flat roof outside. You didn't, I suppose, see the murderer? No. I caught Jerry in my arms by the time I laid her down on the couch and got out on the roof, the killer was gone. Get right over here and bring our client with you, if you can find him. Rainey? That's right. He has a right to be in on the kill. Okay, boss. But keep away from that beer till I get there. Don't be impertinent. I should be busy phoning Mr. and Mrs. Lawson. Meanwhile, I want them here, too. Besides, one bottle won't do any harm. <laughs> Uh, 
Ah, there they are. Let them in, Archie. You remain seated, Mr. Rainey. Okay, Mr. Wolf. Well, come in, Mr. Lawson. Come in. Mr. Wolf here? He's here. Nice of you to come. Anything to help the law. Ah, Mr. Lawson. Your wife didn't come. Uh, no, Mr. Wolf. She was out when you called. Sorry, I forgot to tell you. I left word with the butler, however. Mr. Lawson, about 20 minutes ago, a girl named Jerry Faye was killed. So? She was killed in your neighborhood, in a flat formerly occupied by one Pepe Gato. Well, where would that be? Maybe your wife knows where the flat would be. How dare you, sir? No histrionics, please. Where was your wife when the girl was killed? I'm advising you that if that is an alibi, now's the time to state it. I wouldn't humiliate Celia by alibying for her. And the police will pick her up. But she didn't kill this girl, Mr. Wolf. You have reasons for that opinion? The best of reasons. I'd be grateful if you'd state them and let me be the judge of their excellence. Well, one should do. This one. Celia's out in the country visiting her mother. No. Oh. Does that settle it? Possibly. What's her mother's telephone number? Why, uh... Merely a routine check. Well, can't you take my word? I'll take her mother's number. Well, Mr. Lawson? I'm sorry, I... I hoped you'd buy the story. What do you mean? The mother's been dead for ten years. I see. Well, I don't. What's the idea? It's known as marital devotion, Archie. <laughs> I suppose you realize, Mr. Lawson, that in shielding your wife, you're aiding and abetting a murderer? I, I haven't stopped to realize anything. When Goodwin brought me that hat, I didn't know what to say. Oh, you pitched me a curve then, too. Well, I suppose you might call it that, but... And she didn't lose the chapeau off a bus top. No, but you've got to understand. Celia's the dearest thing in life to me. Yeah, so is a lady rattlesnake to its husband. I suggest it is time for you to be objective in this matter, Mr. Lawson. What do you want to know? Tell us where she can be found. I, I have no idea. When is she expected to return home? Never. Oh? You see, we, we had an argument. I doubt that I'll ever see her again. Then we are quite on our own, Archie. To do what? To make a journey to Gatto's apartment. Gatto's apartment? She probably has a key to that popular abode. But she wouldn't go there, boss. On the contrary, I am of the opinion that that's just where she would go. Give me my hat. Don't tell me you're going to stir yourself. Ah, it's a most unpleasant necessity, Archie. But the lady in question is dangerous and not at all hesitant about indiscriminate gunplay. Get out the car, Archie. We'll make the journey to Rathburn Street penthouse with the hope that Celia Lawson will show up in time to mourn her lost love. Uh, uh, you want me to go along with you too, Mr. Wolf? Yes, indeed, Mr. Rainey, I do. Uh, I trust this chair will hold me. Should. Biggest chair in the house. Mr. Wolf. Yes, Mr. Reening? Mr. Wolf, am I to understand that the way you have it figured is that Mrs. Lawson killed Gatto, and then to keep the girl from pinning the crime on her, she killed her too? What's the matter, Mr. Reening? Don't you think the theory holds water? Well, yes. I, I mean, of course it does. Mm, thank you. On the other hand, there is room for doubt. I'm glad to hear you say that, Mr. Wolf. Would you mind explaining? I'll explain, Mr. Lawson. Mr. Goodwin was in this room when Jerry Faye was killed. Right, Archie? Right, boss. He ran as quickly as he could out onto the roof, but your wife was nowhere in evidence. What difference does that make? A good deal, I'd say. Wouldn't you, Archie? Yes, a detail like that would give a jury room for doubt. Oh, don't be a fool. How so, Rainey? Well, I was about to agree with Rainey. I, I mean, on sheer logic. I'm afraid I miss your point, Mr. Lawson. Well, what if Goodwin didn't see her? That proves nothing. She fired the shots, and then she ran down the fire escape. What fire escape? The one a few feet beyond the chimney. Mr. Lawson. Yes? Who told you there was a fire escape there? Why, uh, Yeah, I... Yeah, who did? You can't see it from here, Lawson. Well, I, I just imagine there might be. Sensationally accurate imagination, Mr. Lawson. Allow me to congratulate you. I don't know what you have in mind. You have in mind to see your wife convicted of the murder of Pepe Gatto. And so punish them both for having dared to fall in love. I love Celia. I worship her. Yes, that's what you expected me to believe. Hoping, meanwhile, that a hat would convict her. You worshipped her until she became fascinated by a young savage animal known as Pepe Gatto. No. At that point, the worship shifted into reverse. And you went green with hate. Hate that drove you to climb that fire escape that you know so much about. And shoot him in the back. You're dreaming. Jerry Faye saw you in the act. 
And when she was about to divulge your identity to Archie, you killed her too. Meaning to hang her murder on your wife along with the other killing. That's a lie. Mr. Lawson, I didn't bring you here to apprehend your wife. There's really no reason why she should come here. I suggested this visit in the belief that you'd betray some guilty knowledge of the place and circumstances. As you have so obligingly just done. You're clever, aren't you? Monumentally. But a little hasty. So, why? There's a gun in my hand. I haven't you noticed. <laughs> of course, sir, but yours is not the only gun in the world. What? Sit still, Arnold. And don't turn around. Your wife, Mr. Lawson. Come in, my dear. Celia. What are you doing here? I came to get a hat that I'd left in Pepe's closet. It suddenly was clear to me what was in the wind. And I thought I'd better remove all evidence that you could possibly use against me. Celia, listen, you must understand. I it understand for you... one thing only. Pepe's gone. And you took him away. Listen, please, if you let me explain, you'll understand. Yeah. Please, honey, help me. Sure, I'll help you. Oh, uh... Celia. Well, that's all, Mr. Wolf. What now? Archie, why is it when you drive it always gets so crowded outside? Will it go tough on her, boss? Why not? She killed a man in cold blood. Though she actually saved our lives while doing so. I hope that helps her at the trial. I hope so, Archie. After all, if she hadn't done what she did, what would have happened to the lobster beast? What lobster beast? The lobster beast that Fritz is making for dinner. Hurry, <laughs> uh, Archie. It really can't be appreciated unless it's eaten hot. You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program, produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Larry Dobkin as Archie Goodwin, and Ann Diamond, Charlotte Lawrence, Gerald Moore, Don Diamond, and Eddie Fields. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Killer Card. Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Saturday night is date night, and NBC has a lively lineup of music and fun to help your courting along. Tomorrow, Dennis Day brings you a melodic and mirthful 30 minutes, and then Judy Canova gets together with her gang for a sparkling session of mountain-style song and laughter, followed by singing MC Red Foley and his friends on that exciting parcel of Western tunes and mayhem Grand Ole Opry. Here's Sam Spade. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Randy Stone. I cover the night beat for the Chicago Star. Stories start in many different ways. This one began in the darkness of the human mind and ended in raging flame. Night Beat, starring Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. Ever look at people as you pass them on the street and wonder what their lives are like? Where they've been, where they're going, and what they'll do when they get there? Me, I'm a sucker for the guy who wears his heart on his sleeve with just the scars showing. Or a pair of eyes that look out of a soul eaten away by loneliness. The old lady eating her dinner alone in a booth for four. The lone drinker in a plushy bar who toasts his reflections in the mirror and wishes that he was too drunk to see it. 
Sometimes the busiest street in the city can be the lonesomest spot in the world. And tonight it had seemed like that as I drove through the dark city. I was well into the warehouse district when I saw a flash. It was like an explosion, only there was no noise, no sound, just this flash and then flames. It was a three-story warehouse, the old wooden type, and the flames worked fast. I started fast to find a box to turn in the alarm when I saw a man, and he was running into the fire. I stopped the car and took off after him. The only light in the building was from the fire, and the man was nowhere in sight. Hey, you! Here I was making like a regular stout-hearted Frank Merriwell. First one to a fire and no one to save. And then I heard him. Chloe! Chloe! I followed the sound of his voice. He was standing at the foot of some wooden steps, yelling his head off. Chloe! Hey, Chloe! Hey, you! Hey, what are you doing? Come on, Pop. Huh? Let's watch it from outside. Let go of me. Now, come on, now, come on. Leave me alone. Let go of me. Hey, come back here, you fool. Go away. Leave me. Papa, you hurt? My leg. I hit him when I fell. Well, let's see if you can walk. I can walk if you'll help me. I'll go with you, mister. Yes, I figured you would. I half carried, half dragged the old man. The smoke was so strong that my lungs ached and I felt lightheaded. Outside, a crowd had gathered. A line of policemen were keeping them back out of the fireman's way. One cop came over to us. Hey, you guys, you work here? He came in after me. Who are you? I'm strong heart the second only. Don't let it get around. Oh, are you, Randy? Oh, right. The old man's leg hurt? is isn't broken. It's just banged up a get bit. You guys stay put. I'll get the ambulance boys over here. Okay, we'll be here. I, I'm not saying. You stay where you are. I gotta get going. What's the rush, Bob? Any good reason why you shouldn't wait around? You mean, did I have anything to do with the fire? Well, did you? Uh, no, I, I didn't. I didn't have anything to do with it. Okay, okay. Nobody's accusing you. What's it all about? Why did you run in there after the fire started? That's my business. Well, you're going to have to answer questions. You might as well start with me. Oh, get me out of here, mister. Get me home, and maybe I will. I led him through the crowd into my car. I followed his directions through the dark streets. He seemed to be looking for something. He leaned forward, watching in the lights of the car, turned his head to peer at everyone we passed. And all the time, he was silent. Finally, I broke the ice. Uh, maybe I'd better know who you are, hmm? Hey, uh, I'm Ben Graham. Huh? You said you were going to talk. Yeah, it's, it's, it's my son, Tony. Were you looking for him in the fire? Tony went there earlier. When, when I saw the fire start, I thought he might still be in there. And you ran in to find him? Uh, Tony used to work there. He used to? Yeah, he was a night watchman there and several other warehouses. You see, he's not like other people. I, I was afraid they'd see him there. Oh, uh, like... Oh, oh, it's not what you think. He's not crazy. He's... Well, he stays inside himself, if you know what I mean. He... He don't like people. He sleeps in the daytime. He lives at night. What happens with the jobs? Does he quit? He was fired. Every time. Fired. Why? He thinks it's because of the cane. Well, he uses a cane? Yeah, ever since he was a boy, he's touchy about it. One, one reason he doesn't like people. Ben, why do you think he started the fire? Oh, I didn't say that. I didn't say anything like that. No, you didn't have to. It shows. I don't know what to think. There have been several warehouse fires around here recently. Five. Less than a month. Yeah, yeah. Are they the ones where Tony worked? Some of them, but it's not only that. But well, what else, Ben? Why are you afraid Tony started those fires? Three out of five of them are man with a cane was seen coming out around the time of the fire, and it, i I, I got to find him. Have you asked him about the fires? Oh, I've tried it. We don't talk much. Oh, well, this is my place. Uh, it seems like we're strangers. When, when I mention fires, he slams out of the house. Well, I'll talk to him then when we find him. I mean, I talk to you, mister. He's, he's funny about that. Well, we'll see. Hmm? I'll go in, will you? No, no, don't. You, you wait here. Don't come up there. I'll, I'll bring him out to you. Ben Graham staggered up the short walk to his little shed. What was he hiding? What was he afraid for me to see? I heard him open the door without a key. The light switched on. After a few seconds, switched off, but Graham didn't come out. I waited a few minutes and then made my way to the darkened house. There was no sound from the inside. I called as I felt for the door. Ben! There was no answer. 
I found the knob. Before I could turn it, the door was yanked open. You, you, I told you to wait. I told you to wait in the car. Well, I saw the light go out. When you didn't come back, I thought something was wrong. Come on, there's, there's nothing wrong. Get back into the car. Tony's not here. We gotta find him, Ben. I know, before the police do. But where? Oh, we'll try some of the warehouses. That's that's where he hangs out. Which ones? Are they near here? Yeah, yeah, around. Well, then why don't we leave the car here and walk? No. Get in. What are you hiding, Ben? What do you want to get me away from? You wanted to find out or not? All right. All right. Where to? Block down and block over. Young and Wilson's warehouse. You seem to know a lot about these warehouses yourself. I've been working in the most of my life. That is, I, I used to. Uh-huh. This uh, Young and Wilson, is that where the next fire is supposed to take place? I hope not, mister. I hope not. <laughs> down. That's it ahead. The building's dark. Yeah, the watchman's inside. Over here. You do know your way around. Here? Yeah. What do you want? Tony here? Who wants him? Oh, you. Get away from that door. Don't come around here, Graham. Have you seen Tony? No, he's not here. Now get moving. What is all this? You're a stranger around here, you'd know. I'd know what? About Ben. He's a bad luck woman. Anywhere he goes, trouble starts. Somebody gets hurt or a fire breaks out. Once a watchman was killed. There's always accidents. It's him. What kind of superstition is that? Maybe a superstition to you, but not to us. All the watchmen know. Ask any of them. Now move on. Well, what's that all about? It's true what he says. Oh, coincidence. You know, call it any M you like. It happens. It... I can't help it. It just happens. That's why you're not working now? Oh, nobody will hire me. They, they all know. Sometimes they think of excuses, but mostly they like him. They, they run me off. Well, you could get some other kind of work. Oh, I've tried, but they ask me where I worked, and when they check, they find out they don't need me. I... Listen. Stand back. Yes, Ken. Tony? Soon see me. There's that corner. What are you doing with a gun? Keep out of the room. You're not going to... Don't talk. That's not a cane. That's a nightstick. Policeman. Hey, you! Over there! He won't find me here. Hey, wait a minute. Hey, hey, wait a minute. Now, what's the matter with old Screwball? With who? Ben Graham. Oh, you know him? Sure. Everyone around here knows him. I'd have a black cat cross my path and Ben. Why? Wherever there's trouble, you'll find him. See the fire tonight? Oh, yes. Why? I'll bet he was there. Every time there's a fire, someone swears Ben was there. Hey. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What was it the watchman had said? Somebody gets hurt or a fire breaks out? What about the fires where a man with a cane was always seen and another man who nobody wanted around? But why did Ben run when he saw the police? Why was he carrying a gun? I decided I wanted to see the Graham Shack again. What was he hiding in that house? What was it he didn't want me to see? The little building was dark when I went up the walk. If either Tony or his father was there, he didn't want anyone to know about it. I knocked once before I turned the knob. I thought I heard a movement in the corner. Ben. Tony? Anybody here? I felt along the wall for a switch. It was a sound like the cry of a cat. What do you want? Please answer. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I frightened you. I, I'm looking for Mr. Graham. My husband or my son? Uh, both of them. What is it? What's happened? Oh, nothing's happened. I just wanted to see them. There is something. I know there is. No, it's nothing, really. Now, why don't you lock the door when I leave so no more bad dreams can come in, huh? I can't lock the door. I can't move out of this bed. Oh, you're paralyzed. I didn't know. I, I'm sorry. I, I wouldn't have laughed. I... It's all right. I like to hear it. No one laughs here. Won't you sit down? No, I, I can't stay. I've got to find Ben or Tony. What have they done, Miss? Oh, they haven't done anything. You're just like them. They won't tell me anything either. I lie here alone in the dark. Can't move. No one will tell me anything. Well, I just wanted to 
Give them a message. No, you didn't. Don't try to fool me. Nobody wants them. Either of them. I'm sorry I disturbed you, Mrs. Graham. Is there anything that I can do for you? You can talk to me. Just talk to me. They don't talk, Ben and Tony. They're dark men, both of them. Why do you say no one wants them? Has there been uh, trouble? There's always been trouble. What are they into now? I don't know. I better go find them. Is it the fires? You know? I've guessed. It is. It is the fires. Now don't upset yourself. Ben and Tony are all right. They won't tell me. They won't talk about the fire. I ask them and they won't answer I know. I tell you, they're all right. I just talked to your husband, to Ben. I I thought he came here. They don't come here. All these years I've laid here alone. They don't come here but to sleep and to eat. Well, Ben was here a little while ago. He turned off the light and waited in the dark. What did he want? What was he waiting for? We, uh, we were looking for Tony. What has he done? I've got a right to know. I'm his mother. Well, Ben thinks that... Tony started the fires. Tony? <laughs> Tony started the fires. <laughs> he did. He did. Tony started the fire. Back to Night Beat and Randy Stone. Yes, it was adding up, but it wasn't making sense. First, I drag a man out of a fire, a man who's carrying a gun. And now a frightened, paralyzed woman who wanted someone to listen. I could feel that tingling on the back of my neck as Martha Graham talked. She was terrified at the mention of fire. I sat in one of the chairs beside her bed and tried to calm her fear. She wanted to talk, and I couldn't stop her. Tony started the fire. It burned our house. That's that's how I got like this. That's why Tony uses a cane. He was a little boy then. Tony loved matches. He liked to watch them burn. Well, don't think about it now. I think about it all the time. Sometimes I dream about it. Everything burning all around me. My clothes on fire. And, and Tony in, in the corner screaming. I can see it over and over. And... Isn't it better if you don't talk about it, Mrs. Graham? Don't talk about it. Don't talk about it. That's all I hear. I want to talk. It's better than lying here alone, not able to move. Now, don't excite yourself. Why don't you get some sleep? All right. If you'll stay, I'll talk about something else. You have any idea where Tony is? In one of the warehouses. That's where he always is. Well, I'd like to see him. Do you know which one? What time is it? Well, let me see. It's, uh, it's a little after two. Why? Then he's at the Holland Warehouse, about three blocks from here. It's where he goes at two. I don't understand. You mean he goes to different warehouses at certain times? Yeah, Tony makes a few dollars. The watchmen help him out. But he never talks to me. Well, it's hard for all of us to talk sometimes. You say Tony will be at the Holland Warehouse at two? Yeah. Tony tells me where he'll be. I don't worry if I know. And Ben, will he be there too? If he's looking for Tony, he will. Oh, thank you, thank you. I must be going. Will you do something for me, mister, before you go? Well, sure. What is it? Laugh for me. I just want to hear you laugh. Laugh, she says. She hits me between the eyes and tells me to laugh. I stayed with Martha Graham a little longer, promised her I'd come back, and I set out to find the Holland Warehouse. It was larger than the other buildings around it and stronger. It was made of cement and steel and it towered above its wooden neighbors by several stories. I tried the front door, no luck. I rang the bell, I waited. No one came. I tried beating on the door. That didn't do any good either. I started to turn away and then... Hey, what do you want? Who are you? I'm the watchman here. I thought the watchman stayed inside. I just stepped around the corner for two o'clock coffee. Oh? Uh, don't worry. The place is guarded. There's a fellow inside. Who? Oh, Tony Graham? Yeah. You know him? Well, in a way. Is his father with him? Uh, that jinx. I wouldn't let him near the place. Oh, you too. Huh? Well, let's go in. I want to talk to Tony. About what? I'll tell him. Uh, come on. We 
as you like. Got a flash here. Tony. Tony? Tony! That's funny. Well, it's a big building. He's probably on one of the other floors. It shouldn't be. We punch a time clock here. This is the time we're supposed to check in on this floor. Now, where is the clock? Over by the stairs. Lights are there, too. It's not like Tony not to be here. You mean you've left him here before? Sure. He he helps a lot of the guards. Kind of relieves them like. We all pay him a little. And that way he can have a job and his old man don't know it. Better with these lights. Well, there's your light and there's your clock, but no Tony. Can't understand it. Let's try upstairs. We'll take this freight elevator. Are you in all the aisles here at least once during the night? Uh, it'd be pretty hard to do with all those rows of boxes and crates. Hey, uh, you, uh, you don't think uh, something's happened to them, do you? I hope not. I don't think he's up here. I don't know where he is. Listen. Tony and Ben behind those boxes. They're coming. Oh, I, I tell you, I didn't have anything to do with these fires. Oh, you'd say that. I knew you'd say that. But I didn't. Why would I start these fires? Because you're a firebug, that's why. I'm not. You told me that all my life, but I'm not. Ben. Who's that? What are you doing with that gun? Stone, are you following me? What are you doing up here, Tony? I came up here to punch the clock. He, he followed me up. Huh? He's going to kill me. This is the only way. Uh, there's always trouble where he is. I told you. Shut up. It's not my fault. Everything that happens. It's not my fault about my family either. Look at us. Me. Nobody give me a job. And Martha. I know, Ben. I saw her. You know all about us, don't you? Oh, but Tony. Well, there he is. A fire bug. What's that? Hey, hey, fire! Hey, the building's on fire! You brought it, Ben Graham. I told you not to come here. I'm getting out! Another fire, Tony. I didn't start it. I've been up here with you. I know you started it just like the others. I didn't start them. Oh, listen to me, Pa. I didn't do it. You have no proof he started them. How many times did I stop you when you were a kid? You always like to play with the fire and watch things burn. All kids do. That doesn't prove I... In our house, you sat there on fire, too. Everything we had went up. We've never had anything since. Haven't I been punished for that fire? Look at me, haven't I? Yeah, but not for the others. You'll never do it again, never. Put that gun down, Ben. You can't do that. That's murder. He's got to be stopped. It's got to be. But not that way. What if he didn't do it? What if you're wrong? I can't be wrong. I know him. You don't know him at all. You don't even know what he's been doing at night. Oh, yes, I do. He goes from one warehouse to another. I've been following him. He's been in every one of those buildings just before they burned. Every one of them? You see, even you were beginning to believe. The fire bell has stopped. That means the watchman's turned in the alarm. It's automatic. The fire truck should be here soon. The sooner the better. Look at the smoke has started to seep in. Let's get out of here. Yeah. yeah you're not getting out of here, Tony. I can't let you. Listen, you can't do it, Ben. It's like a lynching. You can't be the judge and executioner, too. I can't take it anymore. A monster, the way she is, a Tony like this. You know what they'll do to him. An asylum. I couldn't stand that. It's better this way. <laughs> smoke, will you put that gun away, Ben? Tony, I don't want to do it, but it's the only way. There's one other way. Stay away from me, I don't want to hurt you. Stay away. I'm not much of a target with the smoke. <laughs> Stay away. Give me the gun. Give me the gun. Give it to me. Uh, Grab the gun, Tony. I got it. All right, now, come on. Let it not be. Let it in now. Come on. Let go, Mario. I said come on. Tony, show us the way out. <laughs> if I can, Mr. Stone. If I can. <laughs> The room was full of smoke and the concrete floor was warm from the fire below. We worked our way to the elevator, but from the smoke and sparks drawing up the shaft like a giant smokestack, we knew it was useless. The stairway! Over here! Ben had stopped struggling. He wanted to live, too. We followed Tony by the sound of his cane. He stopped before he reached the steps. Flames outlined the square of the stairwell. Tony! Take us to the fire escape! Where is it? The other side! Down this way! Ben was coughing and gasping for breath. Once he stumbled, nearly fell. For a second time in one night, I was helping him out of a fire. Through the smoke, we saw the light of the red exit sign. We leaned against the door and we found it open. A policeman was on the landing. I was coming after you. Watchman said you were here. He helped us down to the street and away from the building. He just took another one out. Over here, the fire bug. The fire bug? Oh, no. Mom. Ma, you're walking. Oh, no. Martha, it can't be. Who is she? The old man's wife. But she can't walk. She's paralyzed. What's it all about, Martha? My men and those warehouses, they acted like I was already dead. 
She was hurt in the fire a long time ago. Oh. You can walk better than me. Nobody will care. Oh, sure we do, Ma, sure. Did you start those fires? Yes, I started them. That's what they did to me. And after I was hurt, they left me alone. They let me lie there alone. First I got so I could talk. But you wouldn't talk to me. I couldn't, Ma. Seeing you there like that and knowing it was my fault. Nobody came in. All those years, nobody. You can walk. Then I got so I could walk. When was that, Martha? About a year ago. First I thought I'd go out and see people. But I don't know anybody now. Why didn't you tell us? I was going to surprise you, Ben. But you didn't want me. You wouldn't stay around. Don't you see it was because it hurt us to see you like that? Well, when you look at me, you'd look away. So at night, I'd follow you. You didn't even look around. Then I got to understand. You didn't want me. It was the warehouses you wanted. I was jealous of those warehouses. Just like they were people, and I hated them. Martha, no. Oh, no. So one night, I watched you both go into one of the buildings... And I was left outside alone, just like I'd been so many years. I wanted to kill it, to destroy it. <laughs> oh, Ma. And when Ma. you came out, I went inside. <laughs> there were some papers and things in the corner. I started a fire, and then I ran out. Tony, I, I thought then that Then I you... hid, and I watched. And fire trucks came, and people. <laughs> I had to laugh. I brought all those people... They came because of me. Yeah, yeah. You come with us, Mrs. Graham. You? Where? They'll take you to a hospital. There'll be people there. People? People? Will they talk to me? Will they talk to me? Why, sure, sure they'll talk to you, Martha. They'll talk to you. Brother, sometimes the night is even deeper than we think. A moral, too? Well, it seems to me it sticks out all over the place. The Graham's loneliness proved about as deadly as poison. Even more deadly. At least poison kills quickly. But there's an answer to loneliness. And it's so simple it chokes you. Loneliness is a prison that separates you from the world. And you can escape from that prison in only one way. By freeing another. Hmm. Oh, yes, indeed. None but the lonely heart stone. <laughs> Copy, boy. The Adventures of the Saint, starring Tom Conway. The Saint, based on characters created by Leslie Charteris and known to millions from books, magazines, and motion pictures. The Robin Hood of modern crime now comes transcribed to radio, starring Hollywood's brilliant and talented actor, Tom Conway, as... The Saint. Hey, Mr. Templer. Yes, Louis? It's 8 o'clock in the morning. Oh, that's right. So for what are we driving out to the racetrack at this hour? You know, the first race don't go off till 1.30 in the afternoon. A letter from a lady in distress, Louis. Ah. And you, the Robin Hood of modern crime, are jittening to the rescue. I might have known. Uh, Louis, yeah. keep your mind on the road, please. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Hey, is she blonde and beautiful, or is she brunette and beautiful? She's 15. She's 15? Uh, going on 16. Sounds like a dull case. 
Well, here's the track, Mr. Temple. Where should I park? Uh, drive over to the training track, Louis, over by the stable area. Oh, sure. And say, if you happen to pick up any inside information, Mr. Temple, you can know what I mean. Uh, save your money, Louis. You cannot beat the horses. Who wants to beat them? I'm fighting the whole even. Uh, let me out here, will you? I think I see my lady in distress. Okay. I'll wait here, Mr. Templer. Thanks, Louis. Good morning, Annie. Oh, good morning. Are you Simon Templer? And you're Miss McIntyre. How do you do? Oh, I knew you'd come. It wasn't logical that you should, and I know I shouldn't have asked you, but I knew you'd come. That's the nicest thing anyone said to me all day, and it's uh, almost eight o'clock. That's Dad over there with the watch. Pete's getting ready to work. Pete? That's our horse. Pete is a great. Oh. Vic's up on him. And uh, Vic is the boy you're worried about? Yes. Please don't think I'm a silly, hysterical little girl, Mr. Templer, but Dad practically raised Vic. We grew up together. And now? Now I don't know him at all. I see. I called you because something terrible is going to happen. Hey, Annie, and... bring your friend over here. He's getting ready to break. I'll tell you later, Mr. Templer. Come on. Uh, Dad, this is Mr. Templer. My father, Mr. Templer. I'm glad to know you, Mr. McIntyre. How are you, son? Looks good, doesn't he, Annie? Full of run over there. Told Vic not to let him out, though. An easy three-eighths, that's all. Getting the horse ready for a race? Well, I might let him go any day now. Almost any day. Mm. If he's up to it. Oh, watch him. Getting close to the pole. Watch him. There he goes. Annie. Annie, Vic's letting him out too much. I told him. I said to him. Got a tight hold, Dad. He's just breathing. Well, maybe. Hold him, Vic boy. Hold him. Looks like a beautiful animal, Mr. McIntyre. Never guess he was eight years old, would you? Should have been one of the top ones, Pete should. Maybe will be yet. Hold him, boy. He's just breathing, Dad. Well, maybe. Cut him. How much did you run it in, Mr. McIntyre? Uh, Thirty-nine and a fifth. Don't think he's quite up to a race yet. But you told Vic not to let him run, Dad. Pete was fighting for his head all the way down the stretch. Well, uh, maybe. Horseman, Mr. Templer? Uh, just um, a two-dollar better, Mr. McIntyre. Greatest animal on the face of the earth, the thoroughbred horse. That includes humans, too. More heart, more brains, and much kinder to each other. Yes, you may have a point. Has, uh... Peter the Great always been your horse. Bred him, fold him, raced him, and had him all his life. Outside of a couple of months a while back. If it hadn't been for a little leg trouble, Pete would be up there with the best. Oh, here he comes back. Thirty-nine and a fifth, Vic. You could have held him a little harder, though. Oh, Pete, steady, boy. <sighs> held him a little harder. I almost pulled both arms off holding him. All right, Vic, all right. Easy, boy. You think Pete's ready for a race, Vic? What's the matter with you, Annie? Are you getting it, too? You know he's ready for a race. He's been ready for a month. And Dad knows it, too. Well, maybe. We'll see. Steady, Pete. See? What is there to see? The horse is eight years old. What are you waiting for? A match race with citation? Vic, uh, this is Mr. Templer. He's a friend of mine. Uh, and I thought... How are you, Vic? Dad, what is it? Every time I work the horse, it's hold him, hold him. Every time I tell you he's ready as he'll ever be, it's, it's maybe. Let's wait and see. Is it me? Are you afraid you won't get an honest ride? Is that it? Vic. Well, is it? Uh, you know better than that, son. All right. When are you going to run him, then? Well, we'll see how he cools out today. Maybe maybe in a week or ten days. A week or ten days? Well, we'll see. We'll see. Come on, Pete. Come on, boy. Vic, you shouldn't have said that to Dad about an honest ride. That's what he's thinking, isn't it? That's what you're all saying behind my back, isn't it? And what's Mr. Templer here for, to spy on me? Vic... Well, I'll save you the trouble, Mr. Templer. Right now, I'm going to get some sleep. After which, I get up, eat some crumbs that pass for a meal, get in the sweat box for as long as I can stand without it killing me, ride five races this afternoon, and after that, I've got a date. Thanks for your assistance, Vic. Don't mention it. See you later. Vic, are you, are you seeing her again? Annie, you're a nice kid, but that's all you are. Just a kid. And who I see has got nothing to do with you. Understand? Yes, Vic, I understand. Goodbye. Annie. Don't worry, Mr. Templer, I won't cry. I haven't cried since I was six years old. But, Mr. Templer, don't let him make Vic... Throw a race? He wouldn't do anything dishonest. I know he wouldn't. You love him very much, don't you? I believe in him with all my heart. Oh, 
Let's go, Louis. What? Well, we're, we're not staying for the races, Mr. Temple? No, we have to do. Oh, too bad. I would have had five hours to figure out the first race. You, know, you can spend five hours looking at a form sheet. Oh, well, sure, sure. <laughs> Only trouble is, by then I can't see the horses. Uh, Louis, where would I go to pick up whatever rumors might be flying around about horses and jockeys? Oh, almost any barber shop. But if you want authentic rumors, I would drop in downtown on Honest Isle, your friendly neighborhood bookie. I thought Al was out of business due to uh, a slight difficulty with the court of law. Well, the technicalities of such things I don't follow all the ways, Mr. Temple, you understand. But the general principle I understand, it's like the song, there'll always be a bookie. You know, you may be right. <laughs> Well, Simon Templer, a pleasure. Welcome to my humble cigar store. How's business? Haven't sold a cigar in months, but business is booming. How's things with you? No decline in crime, I hope. No, no. Good. None whatever. Just so we all keep busy. That's the big thing. Al, what do you know about a horse owner and trainer named McIntyre? Dad McIntyre? Mm -hmm. Anything you want to know. Owns Peter the Great, dog patch horse. Chestnut Gelding, eight years old. He's had a one-horse stable for years, has a daughter, 15, and raised Vic Borkowski, the jockey. Vic uh, always rides for him? Nobody else has ridden Peter the Great for years. Has um, anybody else ever owned the horse? No. Oh, yeah, yeah. Some months ago, Big Ed Kleinman claimed him. Claimed him? Sure. Most cheap races are claiming races. You enter your horse for, say, $5,000, and if somebody puts in a claim for him... He owns the horse. I see. And nobody would ever claim Peter the Great because they knew how Dad felt about him. But Big Ed did. And it almost broke Dad's heart. Uh, how did Big Ed do with the horse? Mm, he won a couple of races with him, but then his legs went bad, and finally Dad claimed him back again. Uh, what about the jockey, Vic? Mm, Saint. All sorts of rumors float around about jockeys. All the time, all sorts of rumors. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. That's um, all you can tell me, Al? Well, if a real big bet came in against the horse that Vic was riding, and Vic was on the favorite, I might be tempted to lay off the bet somewhere else. Nothing personal, just business. I see. Uh, you don't know any particular girl who Vic has been seeing, do you? Sure I do. Jacks live in a goldfish bowl. If one of them scratches his head with his left hand, 50 horse players spend the whole night trying to figure out what it means. Uh, the girl? A big blonde named Crystal Winters. Mm -hmm. Showgirl. Used to go with Ed Kleinman. She hangs out at the band box. Thanks, Al. I'll uh, be a character witness for you someday. That's a deal. I hope you get him straightened out. Get uh, who straightened out? The kid, Vic. He used to be a nice guy. Maybe he still is. Dad's a nice guy, too. And I always liked Annie. <laughs> I even liked the horse. Hell, awful, isn't it? But don't let this get out, Saint. It would ruin me in the profession. Good evening, Vic. Huh? Oh. Hi. Introduce your friend, Vic. This is Mr. Templer, Crystal. Friend of Annie's. Miss Winters, Mr. Templer. A pleasure, Miss Winters. And uh, have you got a first name, Mr. Templer, so that we can be old friends and then you can sit down and join us? Uh, the first name is Simon Crystal. And uh, I'd love to join you if uh, Vic doesn't object. Object? <laughs> this is what he's been waiting for all evening, isn't it, Vic? Crystal, will you You see, off? Simon? Sit here next to me and have some champagne. And Vic, you've let us run out of champagne again. Go get some more. What do you think I am, a waiter? Oh, no, you're a jockey. You're too short to be a waiter and too tall to be a midget, so you're a jockey. You're getting tight, Crystal. And you're getting the champagne. Goodbye, Vic. Well. Goodbye, Vic. Okay. You're a little rough on the boy, aren't you, Crystal? Sure. Why? Well, I could say I was to drive him away because I'm bad for him, but I'd be lying. If I wanted to drive him away, I'd have to be a lot rougher than that. I can see why. Thank you, Simon, but you can't. Little jockeys just happen to like big, expansive, expensive blondes. I found that out at an early age, which was quite some time ago. And do you like uh, little jockeys? You're becoming very personal, Simon. I don't 
quite know what I like. I'll have to think about it. And I'm a slow thinker. Uh, do you like uh, Big Ed Kleinman? Why don't you ask him? He's standing right behind you. Oh. Who's your friend, Crystal? Mr. Templer, Mr. Kleinman. Mr. Kleinman, Mr. Templer, Mr. Templer. Shut up, Crystal. You a friend of Vic's Templer? Well, you might say that Vic I'm... Vic so... hates him. Uh-huh. Just uh, put me down as a patron of racing, Mr. Kleinman. I'm uh, interested in improving the breed. Yeah. What's you move in on Vic, Templer? He's not big enough to object, but I am. He didn't move in on Vic. He... Shut up, Crystal. Leaving, Mr. Templer? That seems to be the majority opinion. Good night, Crystal. Every moment has been golden. You hear that, Ed? Can't you say something nice like that sometime instead of... Shut up, Crystal. Hmm. A one-track mind. <laughs> Hello, what is it? Mr. Templer? Who's this? Ed McIntyre, Mr. Templer. I'm terribly sorry to bother you, but... What's wrong, Annie? It's Dad. I can't find him. He never stays out this late, Mr. Templer. He's always out at the track early in the morning. And he... What time is it? 4 a.m. I didn't want to wake you, but I've been sitting here all by myself wondering... Just stay what... right there, Annie. Most likely your dad will show up before I get there. But I'll be right out. Thank you, Mr. Templer. Thank you. You... You don't think anything has happened to him? No, Annie. I'll be right there. Mr. Templer, he never did anything like this before. He... Easy, Anne. When did he leave here, do you know? I was here. It was around nine. Dad left to walk over to Pete's stall. He always does that just before he goes to bed. And, and then he... He just didn't come back. Uh, did you look for him? Yes, I... I went over to the stables. I didn't see him in Pete's stall and... I asked a few people, but none of them had seen him. And I, I came back here. He, he was always in bed by ten, Mr. Templer, every night of his life. All right, Annie, we'll find him. Did you call Vic? He's living at a hotel. He just moved from living with us a month ago. I, I called him. Is he in? No. All right. Don't worry, Annie. We'll find your dad. Just go over to the stables. All right, but I looked there. Well, we'd better cover them again. What is it? Somebody coming. Dad? Hmm? Oh. oh, Annie. What are you doing out this late? And Templar. Hello, Al. Seen anything of Annie's dad? No, no. Just came from a poker game with some of the boys, but we didn't see him. Well, you know he never stayed out this late, Al. Never. Sure, Annie. Sure. You've been down to Pete's stall? Annie looked there earlier. But uh, we might check again. It's right over here. <laughs> Easy, boy, easy. Dad! He's not here, Mr. Templer. I'll go in just to make sure. Wait here, Annie. I'll come with you. Uh, easy does it, Pete. Well, the old boy he looks excited about something saying. Yes, I, I noticed. Well, it doesn't look as if... Al. Yeah. Over in the corner. Dad? I'm afraid so. Got a lighter? Here. Here. Mm. Mark of a horseshoe. Must have killed him instantly. Keep Annie out, will you? Sure. Mr. Templer. Oh, wait a minute, dear. Dad! I'm sorry, Annie. Oh, please. He's... I'm afraid that he is. Kid. Oh, Dad. Oh, How ever? How? Oh, Pete, must No. Have... Not Pete. He didn't do it. He didn't do it. He couldn't. I'll never believe Pete did it. Maybe I won't either. <laughs> Annie, I want to help you make some plans. Plans, Mr. Templer? What's there for me to do? Just keep on going to school. I've got another year. and Keep on living here. I... I guess you'll keep on living at your hotel, Vic. I, uh... I think that's best, Annie. Of course. You're right. Uh, what about Peter the Great? Pete? Yes. I know Vic thinks Dad wouldn't race him because he didn't trust Vic to ride him. 
But I don't believe that. So I've entered Peter the Great in the sixth race tomorrow. Will you ride him, Dick? You trust me to give you an honest ride, Annie? I trust you, yes. Oh. Thanks, kid. Thanks. I'll ride him. I'll ride him for you. So long. Did I do wrong, Mr. Templer? If you like someone very much, then you have to trust them, Annie. You just have to. And that's never wrong. Hello, Al. Well, hello, Mr. Templer. Get to place a little wager on Peter the Great for tomorrow? Word gets around fast. It's a scientific pastime, Mr. Templer. The players have to study out things well in advance. Helps them to lose their money. Mm. Had any action yet on the race? Definitely. Mr. Big Ed Kleinman placed a very substantial sum on two other horses in the race, mm. which I promptly laid off with the connection I got out of town. He's uh, pretty sure Peter won't win. He must know something. If he doesn't, he stands to go broke. Pete's picked in the consensus. He'll go off maybe even money. Well, what could uh, Big Ed know, Al? Well, what's there to know? You can't very well dope a horse these days. So what does that leave? The man on the horse's back. The monkey on the stick. You know the saying, Saint, never bet on anything with two legs. That's a bitter comment on the human race, Al. All I know is it's very hard to find a dishonest horse. Well, Big Ed isn't... Uh... Throwing money around just on speculation, I suppose. Well, uh, it's the size. The what? The size of the jocks. Mm. They're five-foot men in the six-foot world. They never get to eat a decent meal. They can't take a drink. Everybody else is trying to get big and strong, and the worst thing that can happen to them is they grow up to be normal. So if their ethics are not all they might be, well, it's... Now that's understandable. A very good word. You don't think Vic uh, Bokowski will give Annie an honest ride tomorrow? I'll tell you better this time tomorrow. How are you betting? I'm not a better, Al. I'm only interested in improving the breed. Hey, uh, who do you like in the sixth, Mr. Templer? Uh, Peter the Great, Louis. Well, you like him at even money? I'll tell you after yeah, the race. After the race. Uh -huh. Thanks very much, yeah. Oh, sorry, Louis. It's just that I almost wish the race wasn't going to be run. I I have a feeling something tragic is about to happen, and I, I don't know what I can do to stop it. You know, I get that feeling every time I go to the window, the better horse. A girl's life can be shattered at 15 and never quite be the same. Well, you know, that's what they call a vulnerable age. Oh, here we are. You, uh, you got any plan in mind, Mr. Templer? I'm afraid it's too late to do much, Louis. Even if there was anything to be done. Just on a chance, I'm going to check the clubhouse bar. Hey, you don't think you'll find your friend Annie in the bar? Maybe another friend, Louis. Enjoying the races, Crystal? Oh, Mrs. Simon Templer. Sit down, Mrs. Simon Templer. Winning or losing? It's his sister. You divide the number of highballs you've had by five. Add three and that's your horse. Never fail. Except when you've had enough highballs to make it work, you forget how many highballs you've had. Mm. How many highballs does it take to forget this next race? I'm trying to find out. You know something about it, don't you, Crystal? Sure, I do. Why don't you ask me why? I'll ask you. Then I won't tell you. Were you ever 15, Crystal? Yeah, I was. At 15, I started to dance in a chorus line. At 16, I was married. Two months later, I was back in the line. <laughs> was I ever 15? Did you ever believe in someone so hard it hurt? And have to him take your belief and throw it away? You're talking about the kid. Annie and her jockey. Yes. What's going to happen, Crystal? You know. Tell me. That's the funny part. I don't. Nobody does. And what suppose, what's that supposed to mean? Either Vic throws the race or he doesn't. What else is there? Either Annie gets her heart broken or she doesn't. If it's an honest race, Pete should win easily. All right, Boy Scout, I'll tell you. Why? Don't ask me why. Maybe a girl can be pushed around only so long. 
Maybe she can be pushed around all her life like a mop. Maybe she can have... Crystal. There isn't much time. Tell me. You've got to tell me. Ah, There's nothing you can do anymore. You know my boyfriend at Kleinman? Yeah. You know how many kinds of a louse he is? He wouldn't bet on this race only because I was supposed to persuade poor little Vic to lose. He couldn't trust either of us that far. He's got another gimmick. What? You know, he owned Peter the Great a few months back. Yes, I know. Claimed him from Dad McIntyre. Well, poor old Pete broke down. So Ed nerved him. He what? He nerved him. Took out the nerve in his sore leg so he couldn't feel anything when he ran. Nice. Oh, what happens to the horse? Nothing. For a while. Ed won another race with him, then he let Dad claim him back. But after a while, the leg begins to die. And sooner or later, if you run the horse... One leg will cross in front of the other in a race. Well, what happens to the jockey? I don't know. If he's not trying to win, the horse might not even fall. If he's out front with the whole pack behind him. Oh, great dandy. Does Vic know about the horse's leg? Nobody knows. Except me and Big Ed and now you. But Dad knew, didn't he? That's why he wouldn't run the horse. Kept telling Vic to hold him back, even in a workout. Must have been nice for him knowing Pete had to die. Money, 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 money. The horses are nearing the starting gate. And you can't do anything about it. Too late. Much too late. Crystal, what happened the night Dad was killed? I told you enough. I told you too much. Did he come to the club that night looking for Kleinman? Did he? He came there. That's all I know. I don't know anything more. That's all I know. That's enough. What's enough? Race ready to go, Crystal. Are you... So you've been talking. Ed, I didn't say anything about that. Honest, I didn't. Shut up. Too late, Kleinman. Way too late. Hey, Mr. Temple, don't you want to see the race? They're in the gate. Just a minute, Louis. I want you to hear this. Kleinman. Why? Anyone that would kill a horse would have to figure on killing the horse's owner, too. Or get killed himself. McIntyre got kicked by his own horse. Everybody knows that. You expected Dad to show up when he found out you nerved his horse, and you were ready for him. I never saw him. He already knows you. Shut up, Chris. An old trick, Kleinman. Tie a horseshoe on a baseball bat makes it look like a man's been kicked by a horse, doesn't it? Must have been quite a job getting Dad back to the stables. But then, uh, you're a big man. Such a big man. Listen, Templar, this doesn't add up to anything. But... You're just trying to make trouble for me. You know, if it's just a question of money. Money, you know... money, money. Don't you know, honey? You haven't got that much uh, money. You shut up! You know, Kleinman, I'm getting a little tired listening to you say shut up. Go for the track police, Louis, will you? Oh, a pleasure, Mr. Temple. Wait a minute. Uh, that gun must be very heavy. I'd like to use it on all of you. But there isn't time, is there? Well, just stay where you are. I'm getting out of here. Hey, you want us to try and catch him, Mr. Temple? No, he won't go far. Get the track police after him, Louis. I've got to find Annie. And they're off. At the start, it's Speed Merchant breaking on top, followed by Count Flavacci, Harbor Light, Quizmead, Fleet Arlene, and Peter the Great. Annie! Annie! Oh, Mr. Templer, I've been looking for you. How, how does it look? Oh, he wants to run, Mr. Templer. He wants to run. Well, let him out, Vic. Let him out. Oh, oh, come on, Pete. Oh, come on, Pete. Speed merchant by one, moving up on the outside. Oh, now, Vic, now. Oh, give him his head, Vic. He can do it if you let him, Vic. He can do it if you let him. Into the far turn, it's still Count Lovacci showing in front by one leg. Speed Merchant with me. And now moving up very fast. And the outside is Come Peter on, the Pete. Great. He's second. He's going to get the leader. Now it's Peter the Great in front oh, by one Pete. leg. Count Lovacci, Speed on. Merchant third with me. He's riding him, Mr. Kemper. Vic is riding him. He's letting him run. And yeah, turning for home, me. it's Peter the Great by four legs. Oh. Speed Merchant is second by two. Oh, with me, Count Lovacci, Speed Ali by a neck and half a leg. Into the stretch, it's Peter the Great stretching out oh, by six lengths. They'll never catch him. They'll never catch him. Speed Merchant is second by half a length. With me, Fleet Arlene, and Peter the Great wins it going away. Oh, Mr. Kemper, he's gone. He's gone. Yes, Danny, he... trouble. Peter the Great is going down. Oh, Vic! 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 <laughs> Templer? 
He's going to be all right, Annie. Oh. He was thrown clear. Well, I guess I'd better be going. Wait a minute, Annie. He wants to see you. He does? As a matter of fact, he was uh, very emphatic about it. Go on in and smile for him. But, but what will I say? I mean, how will I act? Well, how I mean, do you feel? Well, I... I don't feel like a kid anymore. You don't think he'll call me a kid again, do you, Mr. Templer? I don't believe he will. But how will I act? Oh, don't worry, Annie. When the time comes, a girl always knows how to act. He thinks that this is the time? This is the time, Annie. Good luck to both of you. You have been listening to another transcribed adventure of the saint, the Robin Hood of modern crime. Now here is our star, Tom Conway. Ladies and gentlemen, in our cast you heard Janet Waldo's Annie and Jean Tatum as Crystal. Jack Moyles played Dad, Sam Edwards Vic, and Paul Richards Al. Paul Freeze was Big Ed. Louis is played by Larry Dobkin. This is Tom Conway inviting you to join us again next week at our new time for another exciting adventure of The Saint. Good night. This script of The Saint was written by Dick Powell. The Saint, based on characters created by Leslie Charteris, is a James L. Sapir production and is directed by Helen Mack. Tom Conway is soon to be seen in Warner Brothers' production of Gold Diggers in Las Vegas. All you Saint fans will be glad to know that the Saint comic books are on sale at all newsstands. Your announcer is Don Stanley. It's the Silver Jubilee on NBC. Beginning next Sunday, July 1st, The Saint moves to a new time on most NBC stations. Yes, beginning next Sunday, you'll hear The Saint 30 minutes earlier at 4 o'clock Eastern Time. Next Sunday at this hour, a new show joins your NBC lineup of top mystery programs. Martin Kane, Private Eye, starring Lloyd Nolan. And here he is, one of Hollywood's finest actors, Lloyd Nolan. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen... Here is your invitation to join me as Martin Kane, Private Eye. My new role on this station beginning Sunday, July 1st. Hear Lloyd Nolan as Martin Kane, Private Eye at this same time beginning next Sunday. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Ladies and gentlemen, we take you now behind the scenes of a police headquarters in a great American city, where under the cold, glaring lights will pass before us the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. We take you now to the lineup. <laughs> Lieutenant Guthrie, so soon? Yeah, we think so. And we'll be sure when you identify him. Oh. Uh, sit here, Mr. Weber. Thank you. I, I have never been at anything like this before. Never. Uh, uh, what will I have to do? What, what am I supposed to... Uh, will I have to face him? It'll all be explained to you in just a moment, Mr. Weber. The lineup's a new experience for most people, well, and it I'm... It certainly is for me. I, I'm assaulted and robbed and threatened with murder. And May I have your very attention, next please? morning, you found it. Oh, you people out beginning. there on the other uh, side of the wire in the audience room, may I have man? your attention? That's Sergeant Graham. He's in charge of the Thank lineup. Thank you. My name is Graham, Sergeant Matt Graham. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. <coughs> I will call off a number, their name and charge. If you have any questions or identifications, please remember the number assigned to the prisoner, as I call his name. At the end of each line, when I ask for questions or identifications, call out the number. If you are sure or not too sure of the suspect, have him held. The officers who took your name will assist you. They're seated among you. Please be prompt with your questions or identification. He, he makes me nervous, Lieutenant. I may not When the prisoners leave here, they are sent to the Mr. bathroom and dressed back right. into their jail clothes. It makes it quite difficult to bring them back after they leave here. 
The questions I ask these suspects are merely to get a natural tone of voice, so do not pay too much attention to their answers, as they often lie. Bring on the line. All right, boys, all right, this way. You're the first boy. Huh? Yes, you. Don't stop. Keep moving. Walk to the end of the stage and take your place. The rest follow. Now turn and face front. Hands to your sides. Look straight ahead. You and the boy on the end, no whispering. Keep your faces front. The people out there are here to look at you. Number one, Ralph May, assault. Where do you live, Ralph? With him. The guy down the line there, Milburn. Where do you live, Ralph? The flop house on Main. Milburn and me, we got beds there. When'd you come to town, Ralph? Two weeks ago. Three, I don't remember. Milburn will, though. Why did you come here? We was looking for work. What kind of work? Picking fruit, mending <laughs> fence or something to keep us outside. The arresting officer found a weapon on you, Ralph. What was it? Well, that's no weapon. That's just a bailing hook for my last job. Number two, Stan Fremont robbery. Where are you from, Stan? From here. Where do you live? In a house with my wife with a kid. You've been arrested before? No. Where'd you get the gun the officer found on you? I borrowed it from a friend. Number three, Jeff Carper, grand theft. Where did the arresting officer pick you up, Jeff? I don't know. You don't know because you're a stranger here? I'm no stranger. Ain't we been meeting here regular for the past six years, Sergeant? I don't know because I was drunk. He found a gun on you, a police 45. Did he? Well, just a minute. Where'd you get the gun, Jeff? Who knows? I was drunk. Maybe it was a gift from Admira. The car you stole, where'd you dump it? I stole a car? Number four, Milburn Scott, assault. Where are you from, Milburn? Lots of places. I mean originally where are you from? Kansas, Topeka, Kansas. Been arrested before, Milburn? Yes, sir. Where? Lots of places. Who was arrested with you last night? The guy down the line there, Ralph. Are there any questions or identifications uh, from the audience? Number three, that's the one. You sure, Mr. Weber? Yes, I'm sure. I'm real sure. Any questions or identifications now? from you people out uh, there? Sergeant Graham. Yes, Lieutenant. Number three, hold for interrogation. Back again, Carper. You were sitting in that chair last week, too, weren't you? Uh, the week before. Don't get too eager, Lieutenant. Carper... You know what this folder is I've got in my hand? Sure, you wave it at me every time. The record of me versus police. The record of you versus the police. May 1937, conviction of petty theft, one year. January 1939, conviction of robbery, three years. August 1943, suspicion of assault. No conviction, Lieutenant. September 1943, suspicion oh, of... Oh, now, Lieutenant, that's one I don't like to hear about. Embarrassing. A man your agent ought to be. What was I yanked out of the lineup for this time? Grand theft. Intent to do great bodily harm. Mr. Weber said murder. Now, wait a minute. Maybe we can throw in a kidnapping charge, too. Wait a minute. Oh, you're kidding, Lieutenant. Between 10 and 12 last night, it's charged you did all that. How much does those charges add up to? I mean, the total. With your record, you could get 20 years easy. 20 years, huh? Hey, what about slugging a guy and taking $4 from his wallet? What are you talking about? Jack Rowland. Roughing up and stealing. Between 10 and 12 last night, that's what I was doing. Only one customer only made $4. You said in the lineup you were drunk last night. That was to protect myself. You're trying to tell me you committed a robbery last night between 10 and 12, was that it? Yeah. I remember the time was 10.45 because I confessed I heist the guy's watch, too. Dollar watch, I give it back. What guy? Put down on the record I'm cooperating this time. When I emptied the Fink's wallet, I saw the name Lionel Austin. Lives someplace in Club Radmer. You check, huh? Well, we will. Matt? Yeah? Matt, get in here. Yeah? Yeah, what is it, Ben? Man named Austin, Lionel Austin. He, he lives... lives in Clover Avenue. Yeah, on Clover Avenue. Find him. I want to talk to him. Yeah, find him. Lieutenant wants to talk to him. This Austin can get me off for only two years. <laughs> Oh, Ben. Hi, Matt. We got Austin? Well, almost. Yeah, that's novel. How almost? He'll be home at 4 o'clock. We can talk to him then. All right. Oh, wait a minute, Ben. Wait a minute. Huh? A 201 just came in. Homicide. Where? Paradise Motel. You know, the one on top of Lookout Point. You gonna take it? Uh-huh. We'll both take it. Uh, hi, Doc. Uh, hi. 
Well, you got here fast, Dr. Lin. Why shouldn't I? I win my cigars that way. From you, from... <laughs> I even beat the camera boys this time. <laughs> I make several cigars. You've examined the body? Uh, stabbed in the throat. Good, clean job. Mm-hmm. When? Oh, a long time ago. Mm-hmm. Long time. How long ago, Doc? 14, 16 hours ago. Maybe between 10 and 12 last night. Mm-hmm. That would place it between 10 and 12 last night. Now, who was he? I don't know. But that's his wife standing over there looking out the window with uh-huh. her back to us. I asked her. She told me she was his wife. Kind of pretty, isn't she? Mm-hmm. Pretty. Uh, Mrs. Uh, please, we want... Oh. We're detectives. This is Sergeant Matt Greb. I'm Ben Guthrie. Try not to be frightened now. Oh, I'm not frightened. I, I was just looking at the lake, the view, and he touched my shoulder so... Easy like it. It startled me. The man lying on the bed. He was my uh... husband, Charles Jordan. I'm Letty Jordan. I I met Charles when he was driving through my hometown. That was eight years ago. I was Letty Arnold then. I worked in a drive in. Uh, Mrs. Jordan, tell us how this happened. I don't know. You weren't here? No, I'd been away. I went home for a couple of days to Sedalia to see my sister, my old girlfriend. When did you get back here, Mrs. Jordan? This morning? Last night? It was only just a little while ago. I'm the one who found him like that. I'm the one who called you, policeman. Well, uh, tell us how you found him, Mrs. Jordan. Well, I, I got off the bus from Sedalia this morning and walked up the road to this cabin. There was a please do not disturb sign on the door. I thought Charles was asleep. He liked to sleep late. So I, I just tiptoed in. In a little while, I, I knew he wasn't asleep. I, I was looking out the window like this. And, oh. And what is it, Mrs. Jordan? Uh, oh, nothing. I just recognized my friend in that car. My friend, Mr. Weber. Weber? Oh, that's Robert Weber. Oh, you know Mr. Weber? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Matt, uh, will you talk to Mrs. Jordan? I uh, just remembered something. Yeah, sure, Ben, sure. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Weber. Yeah? Uh, oh, it's Lieutenant Guthrie. I didn't know you lived here, Mr. Weber. The, the Paradise Motel? Oh, I've lived here for a good long while. The view, the lake, it's very pleasant here. Oh, do you mind holding these packages for me, Lieutenant? I'll get the key to my cabin. Oh, sure. Thank you. There we go. Here, I'll take them now. <laughs> it's a typical bachelor's place, Lieutenant. I'm afraid I haven't got much to offer you, but there ought to be a jigger of bourbon. No, thanks, it? Mr. Weber. Not now. You, uh, live here alone, you say? Oh, yes, yes. Hmm. That makeup kit. What? On the radio there, the makeup kit. It's a woman's. And the initials are L.J. Who's L.J., Mr. Weber? Uh, 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 I won't lie. If it's important for you to know, you'd find out anyway. Look how fast you found it. L.J. stands for Letty Jordan. How long have you known Mrs. Jordan? Letty? Oh, about six months, ever since she came here to Paradise Motel. Mm-hmm. You made friends with her and her husband? Well, with Letty, I hardly noticed the husband. You, you know how it is. Living in paradise alone, you notice a girl like Letty. You try to make friends right off. What time were you held up last night, Mr. Weber? What? Well, I told you, sometime between 10 and 12. Why? Why do you say between 10 and 12? Couldn't you be more specific? Uh, no, no, I couldn't. I, I left here around 10. The radio said it was 10. I went for a drive. And then that man I identified waved a gun at me and stole my things, my watch and everything, my car. I had to walk back, and it was 1 in the morning then, so it, it had to be between 10 and 12 sometime. Between 10 and 12, eh, Mr. Weber? Yes, that's what I said, between 10... Why do you keep asking me that? Who's the criminal? I'm the A one... A man who... who was murdered last night, Mr. Weber. Mrs. Jordan's husband, Charles. Last night. Between 10 and 12, the coroner says. Letty's husband? While I was being robbed, huh? He was killed then, huh, Lieutenant? 
Then for Letty and me... Don't move away from paradise, Mr. Weber. I want to keep in touch with you. Come in, Matt. Come in. Sit down. You know what I think? I know, I know. What I've been thinking, too. Only let's not jump at things, Matt. You figure Robert Weber's the murderer, don't you? Uh Uh-huh, sure. Maybe. Look, Ben. Robert Weber drives his car out of town, abandons it. Reports to the police that between 10 and 12 last night, he was forced to drive his car out of town at the point of a gun. Had to hitchhike back. Mm, go on. Then, then he comes to the lineup. Waits until a suspect with a known criminal record is questioned. Picks Carper, a suspect who can't account for his movements last night. So, Mr. Weber points a finger at Carper and says, Him, that's the man. Mm, the tricky. Yeah, yeah, tricky. Also, the way it happened. I told you, let's not jump at it. Okay, okay, no jumping, no jumping. But admit it, Ben, it makes sense. Mr. Weber. Especially Mr. Weber. The way he made certain time was established. How many times did he mention the hours between 10 and 12? Oh, lots of times. And his motive, the old line, the classic. He's in love with another man's wife. Well, motive's there, all right. Well, start from there, Ben, with the motive. Man wants other man's wife. Kills man. Now, get an alibi. Weber does. Says he's being kidnapped, robbed, threatened at the time of the murder. Even tells us who does it. Jack Carper. Oh, brother. (laughs) Well, let's not worry about it, Matt. We can prove it. Let's do it, huh? Well, we've got to wait an hour for Mr. Lionel Austin to get home. Yeah. Yeah, if Austin confirms he was rolled by Carper at 10.30 last night, we've got a murderer. Name Robert Weber. (laughs) Imagine the guy picking out a man in the lineup for an alibi, (laughs) saying he was being worked over by Carper at the time of the murder. Weber's a killer. A clever, clever killer. Well, now, take it easy, man. We'll find out in an hour. Yes? I'm Ben Guthrie. I called Oh, about... you're the man from the police. Well, please come in. I'm Mrs. Austin. I talked with you on the phone. I'm Lionel's mother. Won't you sit down? Thank you. Now, uh, what is it you want to see Lionel about? Is he home, Mrs. Austin? Well, I'm his mother. Lionel would tell me anyhow. Well, is he home? Yes, he is. Lionel! Well, I still don't... Uh, Lionel! Yes. Yes, what is it, Mother? Uh, this is Mr. Guthrie, Lionel. My son. Oh, Lionel. Oh. Hello, Mr. Guthrie. Yeah, Mr. Guthrie's from the police. Uh, but I didn't do anything, Mother. Well, of course you didn't, son. Uh, Mr. Guthrie, uh, what is it you want with Lionel? Where were you last night, Lionel? Between 10 and 12. Oh, I don't see uh, what... Lionel. At the movies, where I told Mother I was going? Of course. I saw Louisa. Ruth Hussey was in it. I like her. Yeah, such a sweet, sweet girl. I saw it twice. Were you Jack Rowe last night, Lionel? Was he what? Mr. Guthrie. That means thrown into an alley and robbed, Mother. Well, Lionel, how would you know such a thing? Oh, they're crime magazines, Mrs. Austin. Right, Lionel? That's right. Lionel, it depends upon what you tell me. The police are pretty sure they have a murderer. They can be positive depending on what you tell me. Were you Jack Roll last night? Were you? Me? Of course not. Of course I wasn't. Well, of course he wasn't, Mr. Guthrie. A former president once said that the armed services offer every qualified young man a chance to perfect himself for the service of his country in some military capacity. The members of the armed forces can be proud that they are serving their country while performing their assigned military duties. As U.S. citizens in uniform, our military personnel have definite responsibilities 
to their God, to their country, and to themselves. I wouldn't. Ah, but you'll find that it's worth it. Just for the view of the sunset alone. We're at 300 feet above the lake here, Lieutenant. However, tell me again where you were between 10 and 12 last night. Uh, perhaps you'd better meet my friend. Mr. Duff, this is Lieutenant Guthrie, the one I've been telling you about. Hello, Lieutenant. Uh, Mr. Duff. However, I think you'd rather talk to me alone. I don't think he will, Lieutenant. No? No. He'll talk to you only with me here. He's paying me for that. I'm his lawyer. Oh. You are wise, Mr. Weber. You will need a lawyer. But not for what you think, Lieutenant. For something else. Exactly, for something else. To protect him from you, Lieutenant. Oh? Exactly. It seems you are a great nuisance to my client. Unnecessarily. You have disturbed my client's peace of mind. Unnecessarily. You have made my client mentally ill with your allegations, your threats. Unnecessarily. My client has had to consult a physician because you have too eagerly assumed that my client is, uh... What, Lieutenant? A murderer. Ah, you admit it. You're prepared to arrest him for that charge? To suffer the consequences of a false arrest? <laughs> goodbye, Lieutenant. Uh, say goodbye to the Lieutenant, Mr. Webber. Don't bother. Maybe Lady Jordan will talk to me without a lawyer, Webber. Maybe, Lieutenant. But you won't find her here. Not at the Paradise Motel. Not anymore. Where? Is it all right to tell him, Mr. Duff? Mm. Uh, try the Plaza Apartments, Lieutenant, on West Gladstone. Ah. ah, this view, this breathtaking view. It's so peaceful. No, Mr. Duff? Yes. Oh, please come in, Mr. Guthrie. Thank you. Mr. Weber told me where to find you. I wasn't trying to run away. You could have gotten the information from the motel office. I left a forwarding address. You don't have to talk to me like... I wasn't making a point of it, Mrs. Jordan. I just wanted you to know how I found you. I moved here because... Maybe you could have lived in that motel after murder's been done there. Not me, not after what I... I realize that. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to upset you. Stay in that motel... You couldn't have grieved too much, Mrs. Jordan. I didn't say anything about grieving, did I? A dead man's been in a bed ahead of me. I'm a woman. I... I know. Squeamish. Now let's talk about the same thing. Let's talk about Robert Weber. I don't have to. How does it feel to be the reason why a man has killed another man? How would I know? You'd know. Weber killed your husband on account of you, Mrs. Jordan. Robert thinks I'm attractive, if that's what you want to know. I didn't ask you that. Well, what's wrong if he thinks I'm attractive? Just because I'm married? No. No, then what? How did you feel about Weber? Just because I'm married, does that mean I can't feel some way about somebody? That doesn't mean I did something about it. I saw your makeup get in his cabin at the motel. So? When did you leave it there? When I got off the bus from Sedaria, I stopped in his cabin for a drink. What's wrong with that? Before you said hello to your husband? My husband didn't drink. I needed a drink. You and Weber are in love with one another, Mrs. Jordan. Weber told me that. He said you'd marry now that your he husband... He said that? Robert said that? I'm holding you for complicity of murder, Mrs. Jordan. You're crazy. You both plotted to kill your husband. No! You really did go to Sedalia, Mrs. Jordan. I checked that, but you went after you plotted to kill your husband. No! There have been cases of death verdicts for complicity, Mrs. Jordan. He said we should get my husband out of the way, but he was kidding. Weber killed him, didn't he? 
didn't he? Well, I didn't plot anything with him, Mr. Guthrie. Please, you've been walking up and down and round and round like an animal for a half an hour now. You don't say a word. It makes me nervous. I'm your friend, Ben. It makes me nervous the way you do that. I'm your friend, Ben. Please. Weber killed Charles Jordan, didn't he, Matt? Uh-huh. You know he killed him. Well, don't tear my head off. I said, uh-huh. Weber's girl, Letty, confessed he planned to kill her husband. Uh-huh. So he murdered her husband so he could have Letty to himself. Uh-huh. We could pick him up, charge him, try and execute him because he's a murderer. We could do that, but we can't. He's got an airtight alibi. Because he wasn't at the scene of the crime. He was being held up at the edge of the town. How do you kill a man when you're not there to kill him? How do you get... You know... You know, if I were you, Ben, I'd bring that carper in here again. Talk to him. Make, make him... Lieutenant Guthrie, an officer's here with carper who requested... Huh? Tell him to send carper in, alone. Now, look, fellas, I confess that I cooperated. and I like you guys very much. You've become very dear to me. But why do you break up my canasta? I already won 12 addresses from my cell intimate. Carper, that man you said you held up. I know. He said I got more often than four bucks. Why do kidnappers always say they got more feathers than they got? He said more than that. He said you didn't jack roll him. Nothing happened to him but a movie. Why the dirty low down conniver crook? What does he mean I didn't rob him? Let him face me face to face and I'll make him confess to it that he. Oh, how evil can they get? Where was it you jack rolled him, Carper? Where? <laughs> Where else for a chicken like that? Baker Street, where the lights are few and dim and like wet lipstick. Yeah. That's what I figured. Let's call on a boy and his mother, Matt. I don't understand, Mr. Guthrie. No, I don't understand it at all. Why, you should come around here at nearly ten o'clock at night. All you want to do is persecute my son. The lieutenant asked you a question, Mrs. Austin. Where is Lionel? He's upstairs with his ship models. Well, please call him. I will not. He needs his relaxation before he retires. Ben. Yeah, Matt. Go get him. Don't you dare. Don't you dare. What is it, Mother? What's wrong? Lionel! You uh, better come down, Lionel. It's the police. You don't have to talk to him, Lionel. Mother, don't get upset. I'll talk to these men. Why didn't you report to the police that you were robbed last night? I wasn't robbed. I told you that earlier in the day. I know you did, Lionel. But we think you're lying. My son never told a lie in his life. Not in front of me, anyway. Lionel, the man who robbed you, he was heavy set, wasn't he? Rough features, poorly dressed. I don't know what you men are trying to do. Mother, Are I... you afraid to tell the truth in front of your mother? If he was robbed, why shouldn't he have told the truth? He certainly would have told me about it. Wouldn't you, son? Of course. Lionel, why don't we go someplace? You, Sergeant Greb, and myself, and we can talk this thing out. Well, my son has no secret from me. All right. Tell us what your son was doing down on Baker Street last night. Well, he went to the movies. The theater's not on Baker Street. He went to the movies, all right. He said he saw the picture twice. But you didn't, did you, Lionel? You saw the picture once. It got out at 10 o'clock. That left you two hours to roam around Baker Street. Lionel, what is this Baker Street? What's there? Mother, I... Mother, mother... Don't stammer. Answer me. Go ahead, answer me. Burlesque houses. Bars. A man doesn't have to know a girl to talk to her on Baker Street. Does he, Lionel? Were you there, Lionel? On this Baker Street. Were you there? Answer me. Answer me. No, no, no. Answer me. Answer me. Answer me. 
Mrs. Austin. It's all right, all right, sir. Mother, listen to me. What the man is saying is true. I was on Baker Street last night. I did meet a girl, and we had some drinks, and after that I was robbed. And I'll tell you something else, Mother. Last week I was there, too. I met another girl there. Let's go, man. That'll make you suffer, won't it, Mother? <laughs> now you've really got something to suffer about, haven't you, Mother? <laughs> Too bad. Paradise Motel? Sure. That's where the murderer is, isn't it? And take it easy, man. Let's enjoy the view. Produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin and stars William Johnstone as Lieutenant Ben Guthrie and Wally Mayer as Sergeant Matt Grebb. Music was composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were Irene Ted, Alvina Temple, William Conrad, Leo Cleary, Jack Edwards, Lou Merrill, and Stanley Farrar. to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. And now, The Man in Black takes from his files another case history of an attempt to commit the perfect crime. Good evening. This is The Man in Black. A year ago tonight, an innocent man was murdered in a small New England village. He was murdered by Clyde Ross. Listen to what happened in Clyde's own world before he was executed. As I walked across the village square toward the church, I knew I was going to murder old man Hanson, the good sexton, the church bell ringer. Oh, it was going to be so simple and easy. A couple of things left to do first, and that was all. One was to see Father Vincent and tell him how worried I was about Hanson that he was too old to be climbing the tower to ring the bell, that he'd slip someday and have a bad fall down the stairs, that he might even fall out of the belfry. <laughs> I knew how Father Vincent would react, and he did, just as I expected. I even remember how he said it. Why, we cannot retire the old man as sexton, my son. Why, next to you, this is his whole life. And I remember how I told him that, sure, he was so right, but that I loved Hanson like a father and worried about him. Well, I left it at that and went to walk the old sexton home. I lived with him, you see, but he wasn't my father. Oh, no, he was just an old goof whose wife had died five years ago, and he'd taken me in off the streets. Frankly, I hated the sight of him. But the old man was loaded. He'd saved all kinds of money and no one to leave it to. So I buttered him up for a year or so and got it all fixed legally. 
I inherit his money when the old man croaked. Yeah, I was going to fix that, too. All I needed was a good simple plan and a witness to say I was somewhere else when it happened. All was easy. First, old Hanson was going to fall out of the church belfry and kill himself. He was going to fall out. Yeah, because I was going to push him. Second, Henry Freckleton was going to be the witness to say I was somewhere else. Henry has a hamburger stand at the edge of town, and for months in advance, at the same time, every Thursday evening, I'd drive past Henry's and honk and wave at him. He knew I was on my way to Bedford. That's a town about ten miles away to see a movie. So every Thursday, Henry'd wave me out of town, and a couple hours later, he'd wave me back. So it was established where I went every Thursday night. Clever? <laughs> but one night, the big night, I didn't go to Bedford. I drove past Henry's, all right, but then I circled back on a little wagon road that led to the woods right behind the church. I hid my car there, and in a few minutes, I was silently climbing the narrow steps to the belfry. Old Hanson just begun to pull the bell when he saw me, and he smiled at me. I smiled back happily. Waited till he pulled the bell for the last time, and then I jumped him quick and pushed him over. Just a little push. He fell without a cry. And it seemed right somehow that he landed in the cemetery at the side of the church. Afterwards, I never heard it so quiet. All the way back through the woods to the car, it was as quiet as death. And then I was right on time for Henry's wave when I drove back into town. I knew then the circle was complete. The crime was perfect. Clyde Ross finished his story and said no more. The end is well known. Two short days later, Clyde was arrested for the murder of the old Saxton. Where had he made his mistake? By telling Father Vincent of his concern for the Saxton's safety. Because he'd been so convincing, the good father took the problem to the Saxton himself. And old Hanson, touched by Clyde's obvious love for him, devised a signal to assure Father Vincent that all was well. He simply rang the church bell four extra times to signify that he was not in danger, that Clyde was there. The Man in Black has brought you from his files another case history of an attempt to commit the perfect crime. This is the CBS Radio Network. And now, the man in black takes from his files another case history of an attempt to commit the perfect crime. As he walked across the village square toward the church, Clyde Ross knew he was going to kill old man Hanson, the good sexton, the church bell ringer. Oh, it was going to be so simple and easy, he thought. There were only a couple of things left to do. The first was to see Father Vincent, to tell him how worried he was about old man Hanson, to tell him that Hanson was too old to be climbing the tower to ring the bell, that he'd slip some day and have a bad fall down the stairs, that he might even fall out of the belfry. Clyde knew how Father Vincent would react to this, and sure enough he did. We cannot retire the old man is sexton, my son, where next to you this is his whole life. Clyde knew that would be the answer and told Father Vincent that he was right. And he carefully added that he loved the old sexton like a father. Although, in fact, of course, Clyde hated him. And Hanson was not his father, but just a lonely old man whose wife had died five years ago and who had given Clyde a home. Long since, however, Clyde had discovered that old Hanson had saved his money for years and now had an impressive sum to will to someone. Without much difficulty, Clyde wormed his way into the old man's heart, and now it was all legally arranged that he was going to inherit the money when old Hanson died. But Clyde was impatient, and one day he decided upon a faster way to get the money. All he needed was a good, simple plan, and a witness to say that he was somewhere else when the old man died. He found both easily. First, he decided that old Hanson would fall out of the church belfry and kill himself. And then to prove that he could not possibly have been present, 
Clyde settled upon Henry Freckleton as his witness, that he was elsewhere when it happened. Henry had a hamburger stand at the edge of town, and for months in advance at the same time every Thursday night, Clyde would drive past Henry's and honk and wave at him. He let Henry know that he, he went every Thursday to Bedford about ten miles away to a movie. And on Clyde's return, Henry would wave him back into town. And so it was established where he went each Thursday. But one night, the big night, Clyde didn't go to Bedford. He drove past Henry's all right. But then he circled back on a little wagon road that led to the woods right behind the church. He hid his car there, and a few minutes later he was silently climbing the narrow steps to the belfry. Old Hanson had just begun to pull the bell when he saw Clyde, and he smiled at him. Clyde smiled back and waited until the sexton had pulled the bell for the last time. Then Clyde picked him up gently and threw him over. The old man fell without a cry, landed in the cemetery at the side of the church, and died instantly. Nobody had heard or seen the accident. Clyde took one brief look below and then hurried back through the woods to his car. Shortly afterwards, Henry Freckleton waved him back into town. The circle was complete. The crime was perfect. And yet... Two days later, Clyde was arrested for murder. Where had he made his mistake? By telling Father Vincent of his concern for the sexton's safety. Because he'd been so convincing, the good father took the problem to the sexton himself. And old Hanson, touched by Clyde's obvious love for him, devised a signal to assure Father Vincent that all was well. He simply rang the church bell four extra times to signify that he was not in danger, that Clyde was there. The Man in Black has brought you from his files another case history of an attempt to commit the perfect crime. This is the CBS Radio Network. Within the next few minutes, a major crime will be committed somewhere in the United States. Before this program is off the air, a criminal will have struck and vanished, having accomplished a perfect crime. But is it? From his files, The Man in Black brings you another story of a crime that was almost perfect, of a criminal who made only one mistake. Good evening. This is the man in black. A year ago tonight, an innocent man was murdered in a small New England village. He was murdered by Clyde Ross. Listen to what happened in Clyde's own words as he told it to me, just before he was executed. I was going to murder a man, and the whole idea of it felt good. Right then, as I walked across the village square toward the church, I knew I was going to murder him. It was going to be so easy, simple and easy. A couple of little things left to do, and that was all. Then the church bell started ringing. I looked up at the steeple. Even at night, you could see the belfry clear enough. I could even see the bell banging first one way, then the other. The only thing I couldn't see was him, Edgar Branson. He was the sexton. Big deal. <laughs> dig a few graves, keep the old church cemetery looking homey, and ring the bell. That was old man Branson. That was his whole life. That was the guy I was going to kill. Not tonight. Later. A week or so, maybe. I went inside the church through the vestibule, down the long, dark hall that led to Father Vincent's quarters. When Father Vincent answered my knock, I looked worried. That was part of my plan. Right away, he wanted to know what was wrong. So I told him, I was worried about old Branson. He was too old to be climbing the tower, that maybe he'd slip someday and have a bad fall down the stairs, that he might even fall out of the belfry. <laughs> oh, I played it big, like a son being worried about his father. And Father Vincent went right along with it, as I knew he would. <laughs> 
I remember just how he said it. We cannot retire old Edgar as sexton, my son. Next to you, this is his whole life. To take it from him now, to say to him his usefulness is gone, would be a grievous wrong, my son. Perhaps a fatal wrong. Yeah, sure. Sure, I told Father Vincent. Sure, he was so right. Boy, both of us were pretty choked up by the time I left. I walked old man Bronson home. You see, I live with him. Why not? I wasn't blessed with a family. Besides, old man Bronson was loaded. Saved all kinds of money and no one to leave it to. His wife had died five years ago. After a year or so of me buttering the old boy up, it was all fixed legally. I'd inherit the whole load when the sexton croaked. Well, let me tell you, I earned it. Brother, how I earned it. Playing nursemaid to an old goof you can't stand the sight of. All the time, acting like he's doing you a big favor, taking you off the streets. You think that's easy? And what's worse, I'd given him something to live for. Everyone said so. Something to live for. Great. And all I ever wanted was to give him something to die for. Old goof. Well, once I knew I was going to kill him, the pressure was off. All I needed was a good plan. A simple one, you know. And a Class A bona fide witness that said I was somewhere else when it happened. A simple plan. Old Branson was going to fall out of the church belfry. He was going to fall out. Yeah. Because <laughs> I was going to push him. You see, I started the pattern a few months ahead of time. Every Thursday night, I'd drive to Bedford, about ten miles away, to go to a movie. Got so I was driving past Henry Freckleton's hamburger stand at the edge of town at the same time every Thursday night. Henry'd wave me out of town, and a couple of hours later, I'd honk, and he'd wave me back into town. Henry, Father Vincent, and old man Branson, they all knew where I went every Thursday night. Except that once or twice, I didn't go to Bedford at all. Oh, I drove past Henry's all right few miles out on the Bedford Road. Then I'd circle back on a dinky little wagon road that led to the woods behind the church. I found out I could hide my car there and enter the church belfry unnoticed. After a while, it would be simple to complete the circle and pass Henry's again as I came back into town. Yeah, and it worked, too, like a charm. Not a hitch anywhere. Henry waves me out of town on schedule. I didn't even pass a car on the old wagon road, and the woods were as quiet as a tomb when I went through them. I was silently climbing the narrow, twisting steps to the belfry, and old Branson had just begun to pull the bell when he saw me, and he smiled at me like I was his son. I smiled back. When he pulled the bell for the last time, I moved on him quick and threw him over the side. He fell to his death without a word. It seemed right somehow that he pitched right into the cemetery at the side of the church. Afterwards, I never heard it so quiet. All the way back through the woods to the car, it was as quiet as death. And I was right on time for Henry's wave when I drove back into town, too. I knew then the circle was complete. The crime was perfect. <laughs> Clyde Ross finished his story and said no more. The end is well known. Two short days later, Clyde was arrested for the murder of the old sexton. Where had he made his mistake? What thin web of circumstance became the cord about his neck? As in the case of most perfect crimes, Clyde turned out to be his own hangman. If he had not told Father Vincent of his concern for the sexton's safety, he might well have lived to inherit the old man's wealth. But because he told his story so convincingly, the good father took the problem to the sexton himself. And old Brandon, touched by Clyde's obvious love for him, devised a signal to assure Father Vincent that all was well. He rang the church bell four extra times to signify that he was not in danger, that Clyde was there. The Man in Black has brought you from his files another case history of a criminal who attempted to commit the perfect crime. 
This is the CBS Radio Network. Within the next few minutes, a major crime will be committed somewhere in the United States. Before this program is off the air, a criminal will have struck and vanished, having accomplished a perfect crime. But is it? From his files, The Man in Black brings you another story of a crime that was almost perfect, of a criminal who made only one mistake. And now, The Man in Black. The young man's footsteps echoed hollowly across the cobblestones of the deserted village square. His pace was regular, brisk, until he reached the steps of the church, and there he paused. And for a long moment, the half-light of a nearby street lamp caught the sensitive features of his young face as he narrowed his eyes and peered intently up toward the bell tower. Slowly then, the church bell began to peal, and the young man smiled. He could see the bell, but nothing else. Apparently satisfied, he hurried up the church steps, in through the vestibule and back to Father Vincent's quarters. Somewhere along the way, the smile left his face and was replaced by an expression of grave concern. It was this expression that greeted Father Vincent as he admitted the young man to his rooms. Clyde, my son, what is wrong? You're troubled. Are you ill? Clyde managed a weak smile. I'm not ill, Father. Troubled, yes. His eyes indicated the bell tower. It's... it's he, old Branson, who troubles me. Father Vincent evidenced concern. The sexton? But why, Clyde? Why, Branson and I had a long talk this evening. His health is good, exceptionally good. And his faith, his spirits are in excellent order. And here the priest smiled. Thanks to you, my son, you bring him such happiness. There was protest in Clyde's reply. Please, father, listen to me. He'll be down soon. I I have to meet him to walk him home. There's not much time to talk. Now, perhaps I'm wrong, but I worry about him climbing to the tower. When I don't worry about him, I fear that he may fall from the tower itself and... His health is good, yes, but he's an old man, Father. His step's not as sure as it was. I... You understand. I... I felt I had to tell you. A great warmth and admiration reflected in Father Vincent's eyes. You would have him retire as sexton of our church, son? Why, next to you, this is his whole life. It gave him a usefulness his nature demanded when he felt there was nothing else to live for. Why, to take it away from him now, to say to him his usefulness is gone, would do a grievous wrong, Clyde. Perhaps, perhaps a fatal wrong. Later that night, long after old Branson was asleep, Clyde smiled to himself in the darkness of his own room. Father Vincent had reacted just as Clyde knew he would. To relieve Branson of his duties as sexton might indeed prove fatal. Father Vincent and Clyde both realized that. What the good priest did not realize was that keeping the self-same job would also prove fatal for old Branson. The sexton would fall from the bell tower to his death, and Clyde, Clyde would be miles from the scene of the accident at the time. Or so it would appear. Clyde let a week pass, then two, and finally he settled on the night itself. He planned it, just as carefully planned every step of his way into the old sexton's heart. Five years before, Branson's wife and only son had died tragically in an accident, and Clyde had appeared, out of orphan poverty to take their place, and with very good reason. Old Branson was a man of means in the village. It was widely known now that when the old man died, it was Clyde who would inherit his wealth. But five years was a long time and Clyde waited impatiently for the old man to die. Finally convinced that it was he and the job as sexton that actually kept Bronson alive, Clyde settled on a course of murder. In recent months, he had formed the habit of visiting a neighboring community on a certain night each week. On his way out of town, he would wave at Henry at the hamburger stand. Later, as he returned, he would wave at Henry again. Henry would make a fine witness when the time came. Further, Clyde had... Clyde had a carefully contrived short... 
cut. He could drive past Henry if... Oh, nuts. Can you take that? Can we take it over again? Just pick it up. Uh, go back uh, about a sentence behind it, Paul. Can you cut it out? Later, as he returned, he would wave at Henry again. Henry would make a fine witness when the time came. Further, Clyde had carefully contrived a shortcut. He could drive past Henry a few miles, circle bath. I... Can we cut it and go again? Oh, this is murder. Go back and pick it up at the same place again, Paul. Later, as he returned, he would wave at Henry again. Henry would make a fine witness when the time came. Further, Clyde had carefully contrived a shortcut. He could drive past Henry a few miles, circle back on a less traveled path, seclude his car in the woods behind the church. It was always possible to enter the bell tower unnoticed, and Clyde had proved to himself that no one was visible to the street from the tower. Once he had pushed old Branson from the tower, it would become a simple matter to complete his circle tour and again pass Henry as he entered the village. The night was at hand. With apparent ease, Clyde repeated his well-rehearsed plan. Henry was at his post to wave a greeting. No one else traveled the back road that night, and all was serene as Clyde made his way through the woods, then silently up the narrow, twisting steps to the bell tower. Old Branson had just begun to pull the bell when he saw Clyde, and smiled, for Clyde was like his son. Clyde smiled, too. And when the old sexton pulled the bell for the last time, Clyde moved quite quickly and surely, the old man fell to certain deaths without a word. Fittingly enough, he fell noiselessly into the cemetery to the side of the church. Clyde took one brief look below and then made his way as silently as the old man had fallen, back through the woods to his car. Half an hour later, he was entering the village again. Sure enough, Henry looked up from his duties to wave again at Clyde. The circle was complete. The crime was perfect. And yet... Two short days later, Clyde Ross was arrested for the murder of the old sexton. Where had he made his mistake? What thin web of circumstance became the cord about his neck? As in the case of most perfect crimes, Clyde turned out to be his own hangman. If he had not told Father Vincent of his concern for the sexton's safety, he might well have lived to inherit the old man's wealth. But because he told his story so convincingly... The good father took the problem to the sexton himself. And old Branson, touched by Clyde's obvious love for him, devised a signal for va Father Vincent to assure him that all was well. He rang the church bell four extra times to signify that he was not in danger, that Clyde was there. The Man in Black has brought you from his files another case history of a criminal who attempted to commit the perfect crime. This is the CBS Radio Network. Pray to tell you today, this one's about a murder in which the victim trapped the killer. Do you want to hear it? <laughs> Starring Paul Fries as your teller of tales. Another story from The Black Book. Yes. From the world's most fabulous collection of strange and unusual stories, The Black Book, I've selected a story by Dorothy Horton. She calls it My Favorite Corpse. <laughs> Artie Paul said goodnight to Lil. Then he walked across town to his hotel. Lil's kiss was still heavy against his lips. Artie smiled as he remembered the pleasures of the evening. Now for tonight, it was ended. But there'd be more evenings like this, many more. At the hotel, he bought a pack of cigarettes, said goodnight to the desk clerk, and went up to his room. He let himself in, flicked on the lights, then placed a telephone call to Long Island. While he waited, he whistled softly through his teeth. 
there was just one obstacle in the way of complete happiness for Artie. Just one. A voice answered on the other end of the line. Hello? Jenny, this is Artie. I just finished that work for the office. Oh, that's nice, dear. I didn't realize how late it was until just now. I've decided not to drive home so late at night. I'll uh, stay at the Tarleton. Well, whatever you think, dear. If it doesn't seem wise to come home, then you'd better stay in town. I think it's best, Jenny. I'm pretty tired. Call you in the morning from the office, okay? All right, dear. Good night. And Arthur? Yes? Pleasant dreams, darling. Good night, Jenny. Arthur put up the receiver on the hook and sat staring out of the hotel window. Somewhere out there beyond the lighted city was his wife, Jenny. His devoted, faithful, understanding wife. Whom he was going to kill. Artie wasn't sure just when he first planned to kill his wife. But it was shortly after he met Lil Nelson. It had been one of those electric things... Artie and Lil had met a few times for cocktails after he left the office in the evening before going home. At first, it had been merely an exciting flirtation, but quickly, frighteningly, it had grown to be much more. Now he saw Lil every day. He knew he was in love with her. Then finally, one evening, he told Jenny about it. But, Arthur, you're 15 years older than this girl. Jenny, look, we've been all over this. Arthur, it simply wouldn't work. Right now, she seems to mean a great deal to you. But it's just a crush. A passing fascination. Jenny, I'm sorry. I love Lil. I want a divorce. You're acting like a schoolboy, Arthur. Uh... I don't think we should talk about it anymore. Jenny, can't you understand what I'm saying? I'm going to leave you. Now, Arthur. We've been through this before. I won't let you make a fool of yourself over that blonde. Jenny, you're making a mistake. Arthur, you need me. This girl wouldn't be good for you. You don't really love her. It's just animal attraction. It'll pass. In a little while, we can look back on this and laugh. I'm right. You wait and see. Arthur, are you listening? I won't let you have a divorce, Arthur. That's final. I know what's best for both of us. Arthur, are you listening to me? Artie was listening. Listening to all the things he knew Jenny would say. All the platitudes, the truisms, the trite sayings that Jenny understood so well. Oh, Jenny loved him all right. But with a cloying, maternal love... Nothing like the consuming, flaming desire that was Lil's. If there was any particular moment that Jenny sealed her fate, it was then. Half an hour after she went to bed, Artie left his house and drove back toward the city. And Lil. You're really going to do it, Artie? Yes, I've got it all planned. There won't be any mistakes. Pour me another drink, baby. Sure. Huh. Funny, she never calls me baby. Always Arthur, like I was a little boy. You're not a little boy to me. <sighs> not at all. Will it be dangerous? No. When, baby? It'll take time. Two, maybe three months. But I've got it planned. Then... You won't be stuck in this second-floor walk-up. You'll live where you want. Near you is good enough for me. We'll travel, have fun. Florida, Bermuda. You and me, Lil. Soon? Soon. Three days after he made his decision, Artie bought a small thirty-two caliber gun. Then he began his period of stage setting. Lil was never mentioned in his home again. She stopped coming by the office to see him. There were no more cocktail rendezvous in the dark bar. And as time passed, people at the office forgot about her. The kidding died away. At bridge parties, his friends remarked on how nice it was to see a couple so much in love as Jenny and Arthur. They were getting along wonderfully. 
In the months that followed, Artie sat through countless dull plays and movies holding Jenny's hand. And all the while, he ached to be with Lil. Artie wasn't certain that Jenny was fooled by all this sudden affection, but he knew their friends were. And then, after what seemed eternity, the night came. And Artie was glad. It was to be a Wednesday night, the night that Jenny went to a reading club. She'd be home around 10 o'clock. Artie went to work setting up his alibi. He phoned Jenny, then let it be known around the office he'd have to work late, might even stay in town. He ate dinner, then with his briefcase under his arm, sat down in the lobby of the Tarleton, in full sight of the night clerk. It was 8.15. Artie acted his part to perfection. By 8.30, he was nodding. At five minutes of nine, he raised his head blinked and looked around. Getting up, he walked to the night clerk. Oh, well, that's one for the books. Fell asleep right there in the lobby. Look, I'm uh, going up to my room. Nothing short of an atom bomb could get me out of bed tonight. <laughs> and the night clerk laughed with him. Artie went up to his room, Waited 15 minutes, turned out the lights, and quietly, carefully climbed out the window onto the fire escape. Three minutes later, he was in his car. Forty minutes later, he was climbing in the library window of his own home. He looked at his watch. Ten o'clock. That was good. Jenny'd be home any minute. He moved quickly to the hallway by the front door and slid into the hall closet, pressing himself back into the darkness. Jenny was such a creature of habit, he knew exactly what she'd do. After she came in, she'd lock the front door, put the key on the hall table, take off her coat, and hang it in the closet. Artie stood in the darkness, his hand wet around the butt of the gun he held. The complete lack of any sound was terrifying. But any minute now, it would... The door. She was home. His ears strained, listening. The stale air of the closet made him dizzy. Then a sound he hadn't expected. <laughs> what was the fool crying about? Now she was walking, just walking back and forth, and crying, crying softly to herself. Then the crying stopped. She was right outside the closet now. He pressed farther back. Now the door was opening and a knife blade of light sliced into the closet. The coat slithered off a hanger onto the floor. Jenny bent down to pick it up. And her eyes found his shoes, his legs, traveled up to his face. And a rasping cry, <laughs> her eyes wide. Artie lunged! Uh, I've, I've, I've got to tell you something. I've got to... Artie dragged her into the smothering closeness of the hanging coats and pulled the trigger. <laughs> As he drove back into the city, Artie knew he'd been very clever. It would look like suicide. He'd pressed Jenny's lifeless fingers around the butt of the gun. It was lying on the floor now, close to her body. It was all so simple. After he parked the car, Artie started for the hotel. But as he walked, a sudden desire made him hesitate. If only he could see Lil for a second, she'd want to know... A few minutes later, he was climbing the back stairs to Lil's apartment. He found the door unlocked and opened it. Lil? Lil, it's Artie. Where are you, honey? There was no answer. He stepped into the living room and suddenly something burst inside his head. Lil. Lil was lying on the floor, doll-like, grotesque. The blue robe he'd given her was stained with blood. A gun lay beside her. Artie? Lil, Lil baby. Oh, it hurts, Artie. Make it stop hurting. Lil, Lil, what happened? She shot me. She? Who? She, she came in and said she wanted to talk, but she shot me. Lil, she Lil, I'll call said, a doctor. Said she knew. For months she knew about me. Baby, baby, when please she, don't try to talk. When she shot me, your wife 
laughed. Artie. Oh, Artie. Lil. Artie got to his feet. Lil was dead. He picked up the gun. It was his gun. His gun. The one he'd always had around the house. The one he had registered in his name. Now too late, he remembered he hadn't seen it for several days. Of course, Jenny had taken it when she planned a murder of her own. Jenny had fooled both of them. And Artie stood there for a moment, looking down at Lil. Tears filled his eyes and spilled over. After a moment, he walked to the phone and slowly picked up the receiver. I want the police. Please, this is Arthur Powell. I want to report two murders. One at my home on Long Island. And the other here at... The Black Book stars Paul Frees as your teller of tales, assisted today by the noted Hollywood actress Virginia Gregg. Dorothy Horton's suspense magazine story, My Favorite Corpse, was adapted and directed by Norman MacDonald. The special music is composed and conducted by Leith Stevens. Next week, I'll have another story for you from The Black Book. It's most unusual, and it's called The Vagabond Murder. Oysters are in season every month that has an R in it. And Jack Benny's gang are in season whenever Sunday night rolls around. Listen in whenever you are in the mood for fun. Clarence Cassell speaking. Remember, the comedy treat that can't be beat is Jack Benny time, Sunday nights on the CBS Radio Network. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall waiting to explore with you what is often puzzling and always slightly beyond rational understanding. This story is real, and what happened goes back almost a hundred years when Joseph Conrad recorded it. Then, even more so than now, the word Congo had acquired sobering connotation, sobering indeed as a commercial trader was to discover. Chaos. Chaos. Wake up. Wake up, man. What is it? Listen. What do the drums mean? How should I know? Go back to bed, Carl. I can't. I can't sleep. I'll ask my coat. You stay inside the house. That's an order, Carl. I don't want to lose you. mystery story, The Warriors from Luanda, is adapted from a story by Joseph Conrad and was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Roy Windsor. It stars Bob Dryden and William Griffiths. It is sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule, and x I'll be back shortly with Act One. Man 
is gregarious. He likes the company of others. When men are deprived of human companionship, they undergo subtle changes. They hold conversations only with themselves. Solitary confinement is brutal punishment. It requires strong nerves to endure it. Mental change causes physical change, and a man released from isolation looks different and sounds different. Keep that in mind as we meet the director of the Dutch Great Trading Company. He is saying goodbye to Kaertz and Carlier aboard his steamer. Have you any questions, Kaertz? No, Herr Director. You are in charge? Carlier takes his orders from you. Is that understood, Carlier? Yes, Herr Director. This uh, is not Amsterdam. It is the Congo. The jungle is dangerous and enveloping. I have left you with ten men, all employed by the company, but responsible to you. They will keep the trading post clear. Mikola and his wife have survived here for years. He keeps the storehouse with its cloth and trinkets for barter. I will rely on him. The responsibility of the post is yours. We expect you to collect ivory. The company is generous with rewards for agents who are industrious. I am proceeding upriver. I will not return for six months. By then, Herr Director, I will have filled the storehouse with tusks. Good. You have ample food, and if you treat Kabila's tribe with decency and consideration, his hunters will bring you game and produce. Is there anything more? No, Herr Director, we understand perfectly. Then I will say goodbye. We will step ashore. Goodbye, Herr Director. Well, God, oh, he's wonderful. <laughs> I feel like an overlord. A raised house with a veranda that overlooks the Congo. Ten men to do the work. Nicole and his wife to manage the storehouse. What more could we walk? And the ivory tusks everywhere in exchange for a piece of cloth or a trinket. Six months, Kalia. Six months and we will be rich. You'll be rich. Your turn will come. And after you've made your fortune... I will meet your boat in Amsterdam and we'll celebrate our wonderful adventure in Africa. Look. Look how the sun casts a bar of gold across the river. <laughs> Surface doesn't seem to move. I haven't seen Makora since... Oh, ah, he's coming down to us. Well, Makola, we have been admiring the view. You must be careful, Tuan. It is a dangerous river. Ah? Uh -huh. The crocodile is very swift. You see there? It looks like a branch. It does not move downstream. Crocodile, you turn your back and he is upon you. That is why our house is on stilts. We fear the crocodile more than any other animals in the jungle. Uh, Just how do we go about the bartering, Makola? I don't speak the native language. I suppose I could manage the sign language. I, I speak the tongues. The natives come with tusks. I speak with them. You make the decision, Tuan. The director says that Skibola... Is that right, Skibola? Yes, he is chief of a local tribe. Very friendly. Does he supply tusks? No, no, Tuan. His people hunt only for food and have a village. They do not wander through the jungle. It is the wandering tribes who hunt for ivory, and they bring the tusks to our trading post. And they uh, exchange ivory for cloth and trinkets? Mm. Knives, bells, beads. We have many things. That's extraordinary. The director speaks to me about the ten men, Tuan. Oh, he did? And what did the director have to say? Tuan, it is very hot here. Men must be made to work. If they plant seeds, you will have plenty of produce. Over there was a clearing for growing vegetable. There? Mm. Good heavens, it's a thicket. Do you say there was a garden there? Hmm. Agent before you had men clear the land. He also had the house built, didn't he? Yes, Tuan. He was an uh, artist. He spent many hours 
painting on canvas. Kurtz, look up there on the hill behind our house, close to that huge Spanian tree. Ah, uh, a cross, uh, a tilted cross. Is that where the first agent was buried, Macola? Yes, one. Chewed up by a crocodile, Macola? No. No, Tuan. Of fever. Well? Mm. They are no better than first agents I have to bury in ground. Oh, do you like these men? They seem nice men. You should be the agent. Perhaps. Perhaps one day. But the director pays me well. We will see. The Congo is not good for these men who come from where it is cold and where heavy fog creeps over the shore and the land has no sun. This is our land. And the land is their enemy. Glass the sunset. Day after day after day after day. Like a cauldron of red hot metal pouring over the black jungle. And that silent, deadly river. <laughs> Sometimes I think I shall go mad, Gaius. Only a month now, Galia. The steamer will be along in a month. Uh, if it weren't for my daughter, Melly. You wouldn't catch me here. Uh, and if it hadn't been for that brother-in-law of mine, I, I, maybe I'd still be in the army. Or any place but here. He got me this appointment knowing I'd be miserable in the heart of this blasted continent. Did your brother-in-law persuade you that you'd make your fortune as a trader? Did he urge you to leave the army? No? That's neither here nor there. I see. What do you see? Were you discharged from the administration of telegraphs? Is that why you're here? No. I left to earn a dowry for my daughter. She's 17. She's all I have. Merely lives with my sister. My wife is dead. When I have saved enough for her dowry... Ah, she'll never have it. You were supposed to collect ivory. Supplies, pitiful. The trading station looks abandoned and the men do nothing. That will do. Shall I remind you, Kalia, that I am the agent and that you are my assistant? Oh, yes, sir. What will you tell the director when he asks to see the ivory? Oh. And asks about the garden and the fencing and the new landing stage that the men wouldn't work. Hold your tongue, Carl. If you weren't in charge. Yeah, but I am, and don't you forget it. I'll get down to Macola's hut and tell him to come here to the house. Well, look. Look down there, Kaird. Huh? I've never seen them before. In front of the storehouse with Macaulay and his wife. Fierce-looking devils, aren't they? Uh, I wonder where the tribe comes from. I'd better go down. No, no, wait, wait, wait. Macaulay's wife is coming up here. Macaulay seems to be quarreling with her leader, pacing back and forth and gesturing. They don't appear to be friendly. Macaulay sends me to Ann. Oh, well, speak up, woman. What is it? Macola says you are not to leave house. They are dangerous men, Tuan. Get your revolver, Kalia. No, Tuan. They also have guns. I will not have Macola threatened. He will barter with them. Do not go down there. They have brought tusks. Well? Oh, they are fierce men, Tuan. Well, who are they? Where do they come from? From the coast, from Luanda. They are warriors. Makola will talk with them, but you stay here. The natives from Luanda are dangerous. I won't be intimidated by ignorance. I think you will be, Kurtz. I will. Against ten men armed with spears and guns? They'd leave us dead. Our director wouldn't like that, would he? Shut up. 
Now, when Mako has gotten rid of them, tell him to come up here. He will come up here, Tuan. I, uh, I should thank you, Kaetz. Not that I would have obeyed you. When I give an order... But you didn't. Because you're afraid to go down there. <laughs> so am I. But I admit it. Ah, uh, the men are leaving. Mm. And McCall has uh, gone into his heart. Huh. Look, there's his wife coming up from the shore. She circled the clearing. <laughs> She's afraid, too. We should always carry our revolvers with us. I intend to. You cannot, Makola. The director will be angry. He will never know. I cannot stand up to the men from Luanda. They threaten all of us. They have guns. But the traitor and the assistant... There will be no trouble. Oh, they will know. That may be. I am loyal to Great Trading Company, but also to you, to the children. The warriors threaten to kill us. Oh, is it to be done? I have arranged it in my head. It is better you do not know. Better for them, too. A hundred years ago, the jungles of Africa were impenetrable. It truly was the dark continent. Two men are isolated there. What happens to them will unfold when I return shortly with Act Two. From the beginning of recorded time, man has been driven to explore and to plunder for survival. From England, Belgium, the Netherlands, explorers lay claim to the riches in undeveloped regions. And they were followed by traders, such as Kaerts and Collier, who manned outposts on jungle rivers to barter for ivory. Two isolated men who await Makola and his explanation about those unfamiliar warriors from Luanda. Takes his own good time, doesn't he? The sun's gone down. That's a blessing. It's positively balmy. Can't be more than 95 degrees. Perhaps we should go for a swim. You're a fool. Congo gives me the shivers. For heaven's sake. Huh? What is it? Isn't that smoke? Huh? See there, off the right. Isn't that smoke rising above the trees? Yes, it is. Three columns of it. Macola? Yes? Yes, one cares. Yes? What's that over there? Smoke? Yeah, I can see that. Fire. Villages burn. Shouldn't we take our men and try to help? No. It is too late. Is that Gibola's village? I do not know. It is close by. And you don't care? Gibola's our friend. Let's call out the men, Kayats. Ring the gong. No, no, Herr Kayats. When villages are burned, natives have been driven out. No one will be there. Who drove them out? Could be the Luanda. The blighters who were here late this afternoon? Uh, they are bad men. Did they threaten you, Makola? We argue about tusks. Oh. They have ivory? Very much. Do you like get more ivory? Yes, certainly. We haven't collected very much in the past five months. Of course I want ivory as much as they have. Then I arrange for it. The director will be pleased. Yeah, I should hope so. The director also asked about fencing and new landing stage. The men he left with me simply won't work. Well, maybe, maybe, Tuan, if you show them good time, tomorrow they will work. Give them party tonight. Ah, <laughs> what a wonderful idea. You have to give them a party for doing nothing. Isn't that novel? <laughs> <laughs> Palm wine has gone sour. I give it to them, and they enjoy themselves tomorrow. 
They will work. Well, go ahead. Why not? Uh, you, you stay in house, yes. It is dangerous. You stay with me, Carl. One of them might go off his head. That's an order. Oh, you and your orders. Ridiculous. You have fever, Tuan. You stay quiet. Fever will burn away. I will take palm wine to men. You do not leave house, Tuan. Why should we have anything to fear from our own men? Let me point out something I have said before. I am the agent in charge here. And you are my assistant. <laughs> the person in charge is Macola, and don't try to deny it. You will not call me ridiculous in front of a servant. I won't stand for that kind of insubordination. If it happens once more... Yes, what will you do? I'll discharge you. You mean throw me out of our castle on stills? This vermin-infested hutch of a platform? You're welcome to the whole place. I'll head downstream to the coast. Well, you may do what you please, but you won't survive a day in the jungle. I've warned you, Kalia. Now go to bed. Take your quinine and go to bed. You may go to hell. It couldn't be worse than this. Wake up. Huh? There's trouble in the camp. You, who, who, what is it? Well, we'll go back to bed. Oh. That's a yell for help. Go down there. Take your revolver. Ah, it's just one of the men drunk on the palm wine. Oh, do you hear that? Go down there, Chaos. That's one of our men. Macola. You're in charge here. That's what you tell me all the time. What kind of man are you? Intelligent enough not to risk my life for a uh, dead native. And I'm... I, I, oh, I'm dizzy. Ah, fever. Forget what you heard and go back to sleep. We will find out in the morning. Oh, I, I have to go to the, to the camp. Oh, do what you please, but remember the cross on the hill. He died of fever. That's right. Do you prefer a bullet? Ah, you're up, Kalia. You look better. Where? Where are the men? Well, they will straggle down shortly. I'll call again. Oh, there's Macola. Come up here on the veranda, Macola. He doesn't appear to be excited. Maybe he didn't hear the gunshot. When did you wake me up? It was almost three o'clock. Yes, one cares. Where are the men? The, uh, they went last night with the coast people... The Rwanda. What? They deserted? They, uh, they go away, Tuan. But they can't. They're company men, employed by great trading companies. They were no good. The director will be furious. He will like the ivory. Ivory? Uh, down there, Kayats. In front of the storehouse. Uh, good Lord. I never saw such a collection. The Rwanda returned and... You say barter with them, and they have many tusks. Uh, you wish to see it, one? Uh, good work, Makola. I will certainly mention this to the director. Wonderful. Are you coming, Carl? Oh, yes, yes, I'm all right. You should stay in bed here, Tuan Carl. You have fever. The sun is hot. Oh, first, first, I must see the ivory. That's, that's why we came to this desolate place. <laughs> ah, beautiful. I never saw such tasks, Makola. I, I will weigh and store for the director. What did you have to give for it, Makola? Hmm. No regular trade. They bring ivory. I tell them to take what they want. The Luanda need carriers very badly. Our men were no good here, Tuan. No trade, no entry in books. All correct. You gave them our, our men? You exchanged the company men for these, these tusks? 
You sold them into slavery? The men were no good to us. Oh, you scoundrel. What a vile thing to do, sell our men for ivory. The director will hear about this, I swear it. I've never heard of a more despicable act. You have no more duties here, Mikola. You and your family are to leave at once. You are very red, Herr Kertz. If you are so irritable in the sun, you will get fever and die like our first chief. We will return to the coast, to my people, Makola. No. You heard Herr Kea. He spoke out of anger. It was wrong to sell the men. No. The chief of the Luanda would accept nothing else. If I do not agree, he and his men kill us, take everything. We have the ivory and we are alive. Do not worry about Herr Kaetz. He will not drive us away. Oh, what will the two men do now for food? They have rice, things in tins. The steamer will be here soon. Oh, let us travel with the director down to the coast, Makola. I no longer feel safe on this outpost. Where have you been? I went up to the camp. You're mad. Have you no sense? You're fever. You're weak. Do you want to die? I, I found one of Gabola's men lying dead in front of one of the workmen's huts. What? The way I see it. Makola carried the palm wine up to the workmen. They got drunk and fell asleep. That's when that tribe from Loanda pounced upon them and carried them off. One of the men from Gabola's village was there and stayed sober. He protested. I was shot and killed. Ah, uh, what will you do now? We can't touch the ivory, of course. What a frightful thing to have done. Made slaves in exchange for animal tusks. It's very wrong, Chaos. They were walking down from the house, Makola. Of course. Now you will see. Kalia found one of Gibola's men lying dead in front of a workman's hut. You tell Gibola to have him removed. Yes, Tuan. What do you intend to do with these tusks? The sun is very strong here for tusks. I must weigh them, place them in storehouse. They are very heavy. Oh, that really is a splendid collection. The Lawanda are great hunters, Tuan. Yeah, and marauders. No, when I have stored them... I will go to Gibola as you have ordered. I will help you, Makola. Uh, oh, one uh, man could not carry so big a dust. I, I can't see a woman doing that work, Kurt. All right, if I give them a hand. We'll do as you please. You are not uh, well to uncall you. Oh, the fever will break. I can't leave this. Beautiful pieces of ivory in the sun. You, you will kill yourself. Ah, no matter. I've given up. I don't expect to leave this place alive. Six months. Uh, remember when we first put ashore? Yeah. Uh, well, perhaps tomorrow the steamer will come. Oh, that's a great store of ivory cats. It's a shame we should get credit for it. I have been giving that a good deal of thought. You need some credit. The clearing is over one with rank grass, the, the fences... That are... will do, Six Dahlia. months and you haven't accomplished a thing. The station's a disgrace. 
No Avery. You've lost the company of workmen. You've discharged McCullough, but he's still here. I'm sick and tired of listening to you talk about position. Why don't you face it, Kayetz? We're like two blind men in a dark room. But I intend to emerge from that dark room. Yeah. With credit, you will be dead. Credit? Yeah. Credit for the ivory. Oh, you said you wouldn't touch it. I've changed my mind. Selling the workmen into slavery was despicable. Uh. Macola did that. I'm still horrified by it. But the men he sold to the Luanda were company men. Whoa. They worked for the company. They were paid for their work. So the ivory is company ivory. I see. And Macola and his wife? He too is a company man. If ten workmen choose to desert... Preferring to become carriers for the Lawanda? <laughs> As I begin to see... Well, you're not an absolute fool after all, Kayats. As compensation, the Lawanda brought us a fortune in ivory. The men were worthless to us and to themselves. Yeah, we've done them a favor, and the Lawanda have rewarded us. <laughs> the logic is peculiar. Well, who will know the truth? The director has seen worse things done on the quiet, believe me. I do, and I'm relieved. Earlier, I mentioned the effect that solitary confinement can have on a man. We will soon discover the fate of Kaerts and Collier when I return with Act Three. unfolding a story written by Joseph Conrad, who in the year 1890 commanded a small Belgian Congo steamboat. He contracted fever, dysentery, and in his words, everything became repellent to him, men and things, but especially men. From that experience, he wrote this story about the disintegration of a trader and his assistant. Three more weeks have passed, and Macola's wife is concerned. The two men quarrel and break things, Makola. I have heard them. Stay away from their house. They have revolvers. They are no longer responsible for what they do. Oh, they are starving. They have rice. But nothing else. Gabola's people do not bring game or fruit. They are weak and they are starving. I do not care. I have no respect for them. They do not belong here. Have pity on them. No. Leave them alone. Time will tell against them. The steamer is late. The director is busy with other stations. I do not know when he will arrive. Mm, the men will be dead. Then Gibola's wish will be granted. We need food. We'll rot a fever and starvation. You sit there. You're in charge of this pest hole. Do something, Kayetz. The steamer oh, will... Oh, all you know the steamer's passed us by. We have to do something. I have ivory for the director. Ivory. Blast the ivory. And the jungle. Burn it down. Exterminate the natives. Set fire to the whole continent. Oh, you are crazy. You sit there mourning over that picture of your men. I warn you, Kaya. <laughs> Free me from this place. Free me. I'm so sick. Uh, the solitude. It is absolute. Everything has gone out of me. Images of home. Gone. Those I loved recede into the distance. Become become indistinct. The great silence of the wilderness, its hopelessness, 
envelops me. I've lost the will to resist. Death stalks us, and I have no will to resist. No will. Kalia? Ah. Ah, you are alive. Get away from me. You slept all day. Good. Get up now. Don't lie there and rot. I fix supper. I can't choke down any more rice. There's coffee. Then bring out the sugar. What are you holding it for? There are only a few lumps left. Well, bring it out. It's for when we are sick. Sick? I'm sick to death. Bring out the sugar or I'll strangle you to death. I forbid you to speak to me that way. You what? I'm your chief. Chief? Who's chief? There's no chief here. There's nothing here but you and me. Fetch the sugar, you blundering idiot. Shut up, Kalia. I dismiss you. You miserable scoundrel. Why, you flabby, good-for-nothing civilian. Put down that stool. Make me. Stop it. Come back here. Open that door. Open it, you coward. He's mad. Revolver. Where is my revolver? Well, ah. I have to control my nerves. If you don't bring out that sugar, I'll break the door down. I'll show you who's master. I have to get out of here. The window dropped to the ground and run for the river. Past Macaulay's hut and the storehouse. Run. My legs. This morning I couldn't walk a yard without groaning. Run. Run for my life. He's mad. I'm waiting for you, kids. You can't escape. Better jump in the river. You come near the house, I'll kill you. Come on now. You're out there someplace and I'm waiting for you. What is this all about? This madness. What did we quarrel about? Sugar. A lump of sugar. How preposterous. Ah. I will remain hidden behind the house. Where are your pairs? I'm coming for you. I hear him. Which way do I run? To the left or to the right? Yes, you are. I'm hit. My shoulder. He'll fire again. I don't hear him. Kalia! Makola! Makola! Yes, Tuan, yes. Help! Help! I, c I can hardly walk. Help me to the front of the house. Yes, Please, yes, yeah. Tuan, here, hold my arm. He, he tried to kill me. He, get me back to the porch. A lump of sugar. Civilized men quarreling and killing over a lump of sugar. Ah, oh, thank you, Makula. Yeah. What was that? It's Herr Kalia. He's been shot and killed. But my shoulder. The gunshot. Let me. Hey. He is dead, Makola. Yes, Tuan. I don't understand. He came round, threatening to kill me. We collided in the dark, and there was a shot. And my shoulder... You are not shot, Tuan. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? I will see to Herr Collier, Tuan. <laughs> that miserable brute, that bombus, lazy, insolent misfit, he, he's dead. <laughs> I'm well rid of him. Threatening me. He didn't learn very much in the army about obedience. There was mutiny. 
the director will understand. Twan, Twan, is, is this your revolver? Uh, yes. Yes, that is mine. There is only one revolver, Twan. Where is his? I don't know. He came after me to shoot me. I, I will look. Now what will I do? Bury him, I suppose. Order Macola to build a cross. Place him next to the first agent. I killed him. Killed in self-defense. Tuan, I did not find a revolver near Herr Collier. It was in his room. This is his revolver. I... I shot an unarmed man. Herr Collier died of fever, Tuan. Yes, I... I think he died of fever. Bury him tomorrow. For tonight we leave him on the porch. I am dreaming. Kalia is dead. What difference does that make? Thousands die every day. I'm at peace with myself. What if I and not Kalia was dead? But I'm not. I must wake up. The mist is all around me. Penetrating. Silent. White. Deadly. Carrying my guilt through the jungle. Calling me to justice. Calling me. Help! 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 He's gone mad. He runs wildly to the shore. The steamer. Catch! Catch! He's gone. He runs into the jungle. Oh, how do we explain what happened to Herr Kertz? He went mad from fever, ran into the forest. Both men are gone. That is all the director will need to know. And we go downriver to the coast with the director? Yes. The company sends stupid men to the station. I want no more of them. They offend the natives. We do not collect them of ivory. You have a great store of ivory, Makola. Thanks to the Luanda. And to the workmen who are now their slaves. Cola. Tie your canoe to the ladder. Well, I'm pleased to see you. I am honored, Herr Director. Uh, may I ask where Kayotz is and that uh, assistant whose name I've forgotten? A collier. Ah, oh, yes, of course. Well? They are dead, Herr Director. Ah. The usual, Macola? Uh, fever. Uh. Herr Collier died of fever. He is buried. And the agent? Herr Kaertz became wild in the head and ran into the jungle. Madness. He cannot survive. And this station, has the work been done? No, Sir Director. I fear it as much. Imbeciles. The company men did not work. Last full moon, they leave station. They join Luandas. This unlucky station to one. Well, there's nothing wrong with the station. It's the fools the company sends me to man them. Any ivory? You come ashore to see. Nicola, that's a marvelous collection. Heaven's name, how did you collect such superb tusks? I barter for it, sir. Yes, well, you bartered well. I see you still have half the supplies I left with you. What tribe brought you this wonderful collection? Luanda. Ah. Oh. I understand. And it was with the Luandas that the workmen went? Yes, sir. Amusing. <laughs> we uh, think alike, Macola. Yes, sir. Both of us have a shrewd understanding of real values. I think that you could become an outstanding agent for a great trading company. 
I'll have my men load the ivory aboard. Uh, then you and I will talk further? Yes, sir. Strangers in a foreign land, isolated and destitute. Kayerts and Collier gave up respectable positions to become ivory traders in the middle of equatorial Africa. Unqualified, they degenerated so swiftly that in six months they died, both violently. Greed drove great trading company and greed drove the two men. Only a heartless man such as a director or a shrewd man like Makola can survive the challenges of exploitation. I shall be back shortly. Conrad wrote this tragic story in 1895. The days of colonial exploitation have ended. Those who hunt and sell ivory are no longer cheated with gifts of cheap cloths glittering beads and trinkets. Now they get value for what they sell. This is advancement of a sort. And the dignity we formerly accorded only to each other is now, we hope, accorded to all mankind. Our cast included Robert Dryden, William Griffiths, Joe Silver, and Joan Arliss. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Ladies and gentlemen, this is San Francisco Final. This is the story of a newspaper. This is the story of the daily record of a city, of people and events, and a search for truth. From the pages of the San Francisco Chronicle, a true story reported by Mike Rivera. It has a latitude and a longitude, but the names can tell you better. The Gulf of the Farallons washes against it westerly, and north there's a Golden Gate. East, too, there's ocean water, called a bay now, so that San Francisco itself is the tip of a peninsula. And there's a part of it that centers on Grant Avenue and houses the largest Chinese community outside of China. City within a city. Not very many months ago, a story started here. A story that exploded all over the world. The fog tumbles over Twin Peaks from the ocean before it rolls up Mission Street. When it touches fifth, any chronicle reporter working cityside can look out of the window and see the edge of town turn gray. The way it did early Wednesday afternoon when I was working rewrite. I had on the headphones and was taking notes. Hank Peters on the chronicle police beat was calling from the press room at the Hall of Justice. They brought in this fellow, this Chinese fellow, ten minutes ago. He beat up on his own brother. Hurt bad? He's in emergency hospital right now, unconscious. Doc Bauer says he's in pretty bad shape. Possible skull fracture. Mm. Definite concussion. What were they fighting about? I don't know. All I checked out so far is they got in a fight in the corner of Waverly and Washington. The boy knocked his brother down. The brother cracked his head against a fire hydrant. Okay, wait, wait a minute. Yeah, I got it. How about some names? Uh, boy in jail is Johnny Shen. 
That's S H E N. Mm -hmm. 23 years old. Brother's name is Lee. Doc says maybe a year or two younger. That's about it. Chinese fighting in public. Never knew that to happen before. Me neither, Mike, in 20 years. They always keep their trouble to themselves. Yeah. You got an address? Yeah, both boys live at 6012 Clay. 6012. Thanks, Hank. Right. Thelma, give me the clips on a John Shen or Lee. Just a minute. What'd you want, Mike? Clips on John Shen or Lee Shen. S H E N, if you have any. You're out. John Shen? And Lee. Mm-hmm. Well, I got one for both brothers. Same, same story, Mike. One clip for each. Well, let's take a look. Sign me off of these, will you? Yeah, sure. Landfield top of the Abe. I might want to go for five takes on it. What do you think? Yeah, sure. It'll go a column on. Yeah, anyway, I'll see how it goes. Hi, Mike. Hi. You got a minute, Abe? Yeah, sure. What Hank just gave me. Maybe I better read you something first. Okay. Dated March 3, 1953. The head reads, Brother saves brother in Chinatown fire. Early this morning, John Shen saved his brother from suffocation when a two-alarm fire raged in a tenement at 6012 Clay Street. Shen, age 22. City desk, Melancott. Run it down for me, Charlie. Sausalito? Okay. Benet, 430 for the first. Johnny Shen, age 22. Shen braved the smoke to enter the back room of the third floor and carried his brother Lee to safety. Lee, two years younger than his brother, had been overcome by the smoke, but was recovering at Chinese hospital. The cause of the fire was undetermined. Saved his brother's life, Abe. Well? A little while ago, he almost killed him in a fist fight in a sidewalk down in Chinatown. What'd they fight about? Hank said he didn't know. You know, when I covered stories in Chinatown, I never knew him to bring trouble out where people could watch. Yeah, that's the point I want to make. It's a good point. I'll go talk to Johnny. All right. Can Art handle those two stories I have hanging Lee right? Yeah. You say Johnny almost killed his brother? That's right. When you write it, try a new approach on it. It's been covered before. What do you mean? Genesis, chapter 4, verse 8. Cain and Abel. I took the elevator down to the street floor, stopped at the cigarette stand in the lobby, then walked out into the fog. I grabbed a cab and took the ten-minute ride up Stockton Street to Washington and down to Kearney to the Hall of Justice. At the end of the second floor corridor is a room marked Chinatown detail. I went in. Sergeant Lou Morrissey was at his desk. I told him I wanted to talk to the Shen boy. McKelvey will bring him right down. Thanks. You hear anything more on his brother? Doc says critical. Why'd they fight? Who knows? You talk to him? I brought him in. He hasn't done anything but sneer since I picked him up. Has he got any record? Mm Mm-mm. No, he's got a job. His boss says he's a fine boy. Show you something, though. Here's the sheet on him. Look, right here. $2,000? Mm-hmm. Two $1,000 bills. I didn't find them when I shook them down. They were taped to his body when they took him to the shower room. Where'd he get all that money? Bank of America in Chinatown. Did he tell you he did? After a while, yeah. After we told him we'd throw a robbery charge at him on top of everything else. He said Bank of America and which branch? It checked out. John and Lee Shen, joint account. Up to last Monday, $2,016.23. Now, $16.23. Ask him about it and you get a stare. This is... Oh, thanks, McKelvey. Sit down, Johnny, over there. Mr. Rivera here is a reporter from the Chronicle. Oh, Johnny, how, how do you feel? Look, downstairs I told him that... Look, I've got nothing to say to you. Don't have to tell you a thing. That's right. So tell us, Sergeant, we're all finished. Or just one thing. I read something about you before I came up here. What? About the fire, how you saved your brother's life. It's a brave thing to do. You think so? No, on account of you, he might die. You're in a lot of trouble, Johnny. Go write about it. All right, what do you want me to say? What are you talking about? Well, there are two ways I can write it. I can say you're a thief, you were taking off with your brother's money. What other way would you write about it? I could start from the beginning. Like what? Your story and your brother's. You, you live on Clay Street, don't you? Yeah. How long have you lived there? As long as we've lived in San Francisco. How long is that? 
22 years. I was born in Beiping, China. I came here when I was a year old. And your brother was born in this country? Uh-huh. Just a wild guess, Johnny. This fight, this hassle you had with Lee. Anything political about it? Political? Yeah, you know, red China, nationalist No. China. Where'd you go to school? Chinatown. Nam Q school? Lee did, not me. Just plain public school. Tell me about the two $1,000 bills. I drew them out of the bank. Why $1,000 bills? Easy to carry, not bulky. Look. Yeah? Get me out of here. I want to go back to my cell. Okay, Johnny, let's go. Why all of a sudden, Johnny? We're getting along fine. Get me out of here, Sergeant. Well, wait a minute. Maybe I can help. Maybe... Johnny, if your brother dies, you might be charged with murder. I want to go back to my cell. Mike, now you just want me to write it any way I want to. Is that right, Johnny? Any way you want to. Kelly. Take him upstairs. Well, not much of a story, huh, Mike? Grief's always a story. Thanks a lot, Lou. This is Mike. Give me the city desk, will you? Aid Mike on that Chinese story. Johnny Shen had two $1,000 bills taped to his body. No, that's right. When they stripped him for a shower. No, no, Johnny drew it out of a joint bank account they had. I don't know, maybe... Well, hold on a minute, will you? Yellow. Yeah, Lucky you didn't call from outside or I'd have missed you. Well, what's up? Just had a call from emergency hospital. Lee Shen's dead. Now it's murder, huh? Mm-mm. Now it's suicide. He told me Lee Shen had leaped from his hospital room window and killed himself. I gave it to Art Hoppy on rewrite. I told him I was going to check out the boy's family. It was a short walk from the Hall of Justice to the tenement at 6012 Clay Street. The Shen apartment was on the third floor, second door of a corridor where last year's fire had been charred into its walls and still showed. Yes? I'm Mike Rivera from the Chronicle. Yes? This is where Johnny and Lee Shen... Yes. I'd like to talk with you about them. Come in, please. This is my mother, Mr. Rivera. Good evening. Ah, uh, what's in tongue? My mother speaks only Chinese. I see. Uh, Miss Shen, I... Lai, Kui bingo. One mat here. San man fang si, um zi one mat. Ah, mungkoi, mungkoi, eh? My mother wants to know what you want. Your being here disturbs her. Earlier there were police. I want to talk to you about your brothers. I'd like to know what... She wants to know about the $2,000. If you have it, she wants you to give it to us. I told you as a newspaper man, the police have... Muama, John King, police. So like, koi lafan, bingo day. What's the trouble? Nothing. But you... I said nothing. Well, your mother's upset about the money and... Well? I don't know exactly. I'm thinking out loud. If she knows about the money, she knows Johnny drew it out of the bank and... And that now the police have it. We're not wealthy. My mother's concerned about $2,000, that's all. At a time like this? What do you mean? Your brother... They won't do anything to Johnny. It was an accident. I'm talking about Lee. Oh, he'll be all right. Don't you know? We were at the hospital about an hour ago. We looked in his ward and saw him. The doctor said he'd be all right. What was that about? Between my mother and me, Mr. Rivera, it doesn't concern you. Listen, Lee is dead. What? Just a half hour ago, Miss Jenny jumped out of the window. Ah, uh, Mama. Yeah. Ali. See a law. See man. See a law. Miss Shen, tell me something. What? 
Why did he kill himself? Yeah. Out of shame? No, I don't understand. Is that what you do, explore the people's shame? All right, yes, it is. So like the phone can go. I'm a mom, more young, more young. What did she say? Listen to her. Does it need a translation? We were talking about... No more. I think you'd better go, Mr. River. Mother! Mother, what are you doing? I'm a mama, moa, moa. Take it. Take the letter, Mr. Rivera. Perhaps my mother is right. I don't know. Take it. It's written in Chinese. How am I supposed to... The letter came ten days ago from China. It says my grandmother is sick. She might die unless we send $2,000. She needs medicine and surgeons. Please, get out. Go, please. Please, please. She went to her mother, took her hand. They turned their backs on me and moved to a place where a candle burned against carved brass. I was an intruder. I left. I walked down the hill onto Grant Street. Fog was gone now, and the Chinatown neon lighted up the tourists and the brocade and the carved ivory. I thought about Mrs. Shen. The word she'd used was shame to explain why a son of hers had taken his own life. And then about the letter from China, then the two $1,000 bills, and Johnny Shen's defiance. But mostly the letter from China. I felt I hadn't got a story at all, but only incidents, and the story was still going on even while I was thinking about it. Next morning, I checked with Abe Melenkoff. Now, on the Shen story we had this morning, we need a good, strong follow. It's not cleaned up by any means. What have you got? Here. I've been waiting for you to come in to show it to you. Financial gave it to me a little while ago. Chinatown Bank reports minor run. A period of 60 days, over $2 million. Withdrawals from 500 to two, 3000 What do you think? I'd say Johnny Shen had company. If you take pencil and paper, you can figure he had practically all of Chinatown for company. How come all those people need all that money all at once? That's a good question. I got another one. Why? wonder if it's happening in other Chinatowns. I'll call down to L.A., talk to Cassell, ask him. I'll have it put on the Times wire, find out what's going on in New York. West Falls in Baltimore, he can check out Chinatown there. I'll get a reading on Chicago and Boston and Philly. Starts with a street corner fight, and we call all over the country. If this keeps rolling, it can be quite a thing. Already is. Her mother's been told her son's dead. day that happens sometimes in San Francisco. Sunlit city and strands of cloud. November winds and freighters from the tropics tied up at the Embarcadero. Ten o'clock of a November day and pick up the home edition of the Chronicle. Crease it lengthwise and consider headline first as concerns a Senate investigating committee. And then the current communique about the current war. And spliced between the two of them, the death of Lee Shen continued on page six. Now more legwork to be done. On Stockton Street in Chinatown, number 5143, House of the Chinese Community Service Union. Overlords of local Chinese affairs. All powerful, all discreet, all knowing. Tin Young saw me come into the office, looked at me for a minute, then beckoned me over. I'm fairly busy, Mike. You come at not a very good time. I want to talk to you, Mr. Young. Not that I mind, for surely you must have a reason. I have, Lee Shen. That's not a reason. The way he died and why he died. You already know that. We wrote what his sister told me. Lee killed himself out of shame. We wrote it, but didn't understand it. And for that, you have come to the Chinese Service Union? Because you don't understand the word shame? Because the Chinese Service Union runs Chinatown and its people and everything in it. If you want to know anything, that's where you go. I'll state it for you, Mike, gladly. Lee Shen jumped out of a window because Johnny Shen wouldn't give him grandmother money. It's a type of culture. Then you know about the letter the Shen family got from China. Mike, Mike. And the run your people made on the bank here in Chinatown. You know about that, too. Why? Why are they doing it? Mike. Why, are there other letters from China saying somebody's grandmother is sick and please send a couple of thousand dollars to make her well? Is that what's happening? Listen to or me. Or maybe if I put it this way, blackmail. Blackmail I'm on a scale that... I'm trying to tell you something. Well, go ahead. Give me the official statement of the Chinese service union. I'll listen, I'll write it. And... This you will not write. What you're saying I'm is... I'm saying this is our statement. 
It concerns no one. Except the people in this community, except the boy except who... Except the boy who was dead because of the letter. Official statement as to you. What I've been trying to say to you. Don't make more people die. <laughs> I left. Follow up now. I walked down to Grand Avenue to the 900 block. The Chinatown branch of the Bank of America said they'd cooperate and furnish me with a list of the people who'd made sizable withdrawals during the bank run. I started to check it out. Alka Chuen, 412 Jason Street. And be told that Mr. Chuen was away on a business trip, couldn't be reached. Then two doors down, Tom Shu, too busy to talk to anyone now. Next, around the corner to see Yu Ching, 108 Spofford Street, and a child on the sidewalk said no one was at home. And it went like that. It was mid-afternoon when I walked into Sam Shank's curio shop. I can help you, mister. I'm looking for Sam Shank. I am Sam Shank. You're looking for some nice china bells? No, thanks. I just want to talk to you, Mr. Shang. I'm from the Chronicle. Oh, you want good Chinatown story? You will mention the shop of Sam Shang? Sure, sure I will. Thank you. Many stories of Chinatown. Many, many. Did you know Lee Shen? Johnny Shen? Mr. Shang, something else I want to ask you. It's personal. Maybe I have no right. I cannot know until you ask. A couple of weeks ago, you withdrew $1,200 from the bank. A lot of other people took their savings out, too. My paper wants to know why. You have talked with these other people? I've tried. So far, I haven't been able to... And you ask this personal question of Sam Shank? Mm-hmm. But only because something's happening here that we don't understand. Why a boy killed himself after his brother beat him up. Why so many of also, you... Also, you have talked with the Chinese Service Union? Yes, I have. And they told you... What did they tell you? I could tell you they said for you to talk to me. But you will tell me what they truly said. That it was none of my concern? That Li Shen was dead because of a letter from China? That others might die? Including you? I got that impression. If it is the wisdom of the Chinese service you... Yeah, yeah wisdom. And your people being bled of every dime, of every dignity, they... Thanks, Mr. Shang. Wait... I had such a letter two weeks ago. Such a letter as was received by Mrs. Shen, the mother of Lee. Go on. It was from my sister, from Canton. My sister said she was very sick of a disease of the eyes, that she needed what monies I... I sent her $1,200. Well, have you... Three days ago, I have received another letter from Canton. It wrote of something I did not know. What? My sister has been dead for a year. It was late afternoon when the story began to shape itself. Just about the time the first edition was being trucked down the peninsula, there was a phone call from Cassell in Los Angeles. Maybe it's nothing at all, Mike. What have you got? Just yesterday, a suicide. A Chinese named Ho Liang swallowed poison and died quietly in a restroom at Union Station. Why'd he do it? Guess as good as mine, but this is the first suicide down here in Chinatown in 23 years. Well, anything on why he killed himself? No suicide, not if that's what you mean. Mm-hmm. But there was a letter on him. From China? That's right, from Swat Tao, asking for $500. Who would die unless the money was sent? His uncle from cancer, the letter said. How'd you know about We it? get mail here, too. Thanks a lot. Hey. Yeah? What's it all about? I don't know yet. No, I'm not writing for the papers anymore, Mike. What's it all about? It's about blackmail. Blackmail all the way from China? Not China, red China. The next day was Wednesday, and the third item on the New York Times teletype told of a small run on the Mott Street Bank, the one most patronized by Chinatown. And later, a similar item from Chicago. Nothing from Boston, but in the afternoon there was a phone call from Baltimore. A man named John Tu Kuo had robbed a supermarket of over $500, the first Chinese involved in a felony in Baltimore for over five years. Tu Kuo gave himself up three hours later, but refused to say what he had done with the money. The pattern was clear. I went back to Mr. Young of the Chinese Service Union. Tea? No, thanks. 
You won't mind if I do. Mm. Mr. Young. The tea isn't very good. Listen, Mike. No, I... you listen, Mike. I enjoy making comments, so indulge me. The tea isn't very good. I'm sorry. That's better. The pleasantries have been taken care of. Now you can talk to me. These last two days... He's been knocking on doors and asking questions and getting no answers. Not quite. Getting answers. Some. Not very good, you understand, but not bad. I can remember... You want to hear some of the answers? You're being rude again. Oh, let's get off it now, Mr. Young. I'll stop bowing my head and you stop being so colorful. It is time for that, isn't it? I would say so. Tell me what you know. There was a run on the Chinatown Bank here in San Francisco. There was one in New York and Chicago. In Boston, too. We got no word from there. It probably wasn't noticed. It's not a very big colony. In Baltimore, a man named Tu Kuo committed grand theft. He sent the money to China and ended his life by going to jail. True. I've heard. Down the street, Sam Shang got an anguished letter two weeks ago, supposedly from his sister in China, except she's been dead for over a year. Also true. And where it all started, as far as I'm concerned, the Shen family... Lee killed himself because his brother wouldn't let him send money to China. He died because he believed he was forsaking his grandmother. What do you want from us? All over every Chinatown in the country, people are getting letters from China. I asked you, what do you want from us? Tell me I'm not just guessing. About what? Your people are being blackmailed by Red China, is that it? Communist China, Soviet China, the money you send gives the enemy comfort. You're an American, Mr. Young. As much as you. Then... An American as much as you. Believe it and try to understand what I'm going to tell you. We Americans here have ties to an old country, ties of blood and tradition. Because America is what it is, the end of a search, it has roots all over the world. The roots of us here are in China. Yes. How does a man forsake his own? How does a man forsake his sister, his grandmother, his father? How do you turn your back on your own blood's anguish? Listen, there's a proverb. Fire burns worse when it burns your own flesh. I... Listen to me. They have come to us with this burden. What shall we do, they ask. We must send the money, they say, or this one will die or that one. What shall we do, they ask. Give us time, we say to them, and we will think of something. But we must send money, they say, or they will be dying. So we tell them to send the money. And when will it end? Now. These papers contain names and addresses. Families here in Chinatown who have gotten letters and who have paid ransom. The blackmail is more than $2 million, Mike. It's... This list and any help we can give you, ask it of us. Thanks. Now permit me a question. What will happen now? The story will be printed, it'll be read, and the world will know about it. How the communists hold their people hostage and demand ransom from America. That's the story. But now it'll be in the papers and out in the open. That's right. And the ransom will stop. Take it out of darkness, and evil dies. You just coined a proverb. <laughs> This has been a true story from the pages of the San Francisco Chronicle. In a moment, the stories follow up. The story was headlined Red China Ransom and run on the front page. The wires picked it up and printed it all over the world. The government invoked the law that made it a crime to send money to communist China under the Trading with the Enemy Act. Before it was over, more than $5 million had been extorted. But the story broke it. San Francisco Final stars Jeff Chandler as Mike Rivera. It is written and directed by David Friedkin and Morton Fine and produced by Michael Meshikoff. Music is composed and conducted by Walter Schumann and arranged by Nathan Scott. Heard in the cast were Harry Bartell, Jerry Hausner, Olin Soule, Lillian Bioff, Virginia Gregg, Herb Butterfield, Vic Perrin, Barney Phillips, and Tony Barrett. The engineer was Raoul Murphy, with sound by Bud Tollefson and Wayne Kendall. Tired 
tired of the everyday routine? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you... Escape! Escape! Designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Tonight, we escape to the island of Pelota in the South Seas and an exciting tale of the strangest bargain ever made as we bring you Letter from Jason, adapted from George F. Wirth's famous story, Sunk. <laughs> No, John. My mind's made up, but all your eloquence won't change it. You'll understand why when you hear this letter I got today. A letter from Jason. Yes, at last. Listen to this, John. Dearest Ellen, he writes, after the terrible things I did and said to you that last night, there seemed to me to be only one way out. I had failed you as a husband... I had failed the baby as a father. There wasn't anything I hadn't failed at, excepting booze. I was a great success in a saloon. But this is no news to you. You might, however, be interested in what happened after I walked out on you that night. Well, actually, I don't remember much of the night. But the next morning, when I woke up in a rooming house south of the slot, I remembered enough. I knew I couldn't go back and I didn't see any point of going on. But I even failed as a suicide. Somebody smelled gas and called the police. When I came to in the receiving hospital, Uncle Jeffrey was there. Well, Jason, you sunk pretty low. Oh, go away and leave me alone. You must have been drunk to find the courage to try suicide. I don't ever really get drunk anymore. I just drink. That's scarcely news. What about your wife and child? You're suddenly very solicitous. No, I never approved of your marriage, but you're still my brother's son. Why did you try to do this? Money. A couple of other things, but money principally. Your father left you plenty of money, too much for your own good. Now it's gone. Of course it's gone. I'm over my years in debt. How much do you owe? More than I could pay back in a year, and some of them won't wait. There's a bookie in Sacramento Street. How much? More than $3,000. Why didn't you come to me for it? Would you have given it to me? You know I wouldn't. Why, you, you're getting a big kick out of this, aren't you, Uncle? Get out. Get out. Jason, you misunderstand me. I didn't come here for fun. I came on business. Fun? Yes, I came to offer you a job. <laughs> oh, that's funny. That's a great big laugh. No, no, I'm serious. On the way over here, I did a lot of thinking. Since you're ready to die anyway, perhaps I can arrange it in a way to provide for your wife and child. Yes, and pay your debts. Oh. You know where I spent my youth? Yes. Poaching pearls in the South Seas with my father. Really, Jason? That's an ungrateful conclusion and unkind to the memory of your father. We were traitors, honest traitors. But there were others not so honest. There were killers down there in those days... There's one in particular who crossed me several times and is still alive. His name is Jake Finch. What the devil are you talking about? A business deal, Jason. I want Jake Finch killed. Since your life doesn't mean anything to you, you might as well take the job. Me? Kill a man? That's right. This morning, you tried to kill yourself for nothing. I'm offering you a chance to kill and be paid for it. How much? Your debt. And $25,000 to your wife after Finch is dead. It's a lot of money. It's worth it to me to see Finch dead. Well? And after I've killed him, what then? Helen is provided for. And me? Well, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Where is this man? He lives on the island of Pelota, three weeks sail from Tahiti. <laughs> How romantic. Not at all. He's a dangerous, treacherous killer. You're going to have to meet him face to face. He's lived too long to be caught off guard. What makes you think I'll have the guts to kill him? I'll be along to see that you do. 
What? Yes, and to see that my name is not connected with the matter. If you kill him, it will be in self-defense. So I've sunk pretty low, have I, uncle? What about you? That's neither here nor there. Do you want the job? No. But I'll take it for Ellen's sake. Yes, John, I know it sounds incredible, but don't be so hasty in your judgment. The letter from Jason goes on. I suppose if I hadn't been foggy with booze and gas fumes, I would never have accepted such a dreadful proposition, even though it meant security for you. But once I agreed, Uncle Jeffrey wasted no time. He paid my debt and sent you that thousand-dollar check as an advance on my murder fee. And in less than 24 hours, we were slipping through the Golden Gate bound for Tahiti. It wasn't any different aboard ship. They have bars, too, and wonderful brandy, French cognac. I was really enjoying life, a cruise to the South Seas, all expenses paid. And then, the fourth day out, Uncle Jeffrey came into my cabin as I was breakfasting on a brandy milk. Good morning, Uncle. Everything ship-shaped topside? Jason, it's time we got down to business. Oh, sure, sure. Anything you say. Do you understand what I'm saying? Sure, sure. Go ahead, Uncle. Mm-hmm. Here. You better get used to the feel of this. A gun? Is it, uh... Is it, uh, loaded? Naturally. Pick it up. It's heavy. Yes, it's a forty-five. Tear a hole in a man the size of a silver dollar. Never held a gun in my hand before. Aim it. There, at your reflection in the mirror. What's the matter, Jason? Your hand's shaking. You're perspiring. I can't. I, I, I can't. You must. Remember, if you want your wife to get that money, you'll have to kill Jake Finch, not just try to kill him. I, uh... I need a drink. I, I need a drink bad. Poor mixed up Jason. That was his solution for every problem, his answer to every challenge. I need a drink. He goes on to say, We arrived in Papieti, in Tahiti, on a Wednesday afternoon, but Uncle Jeffrey was in a hurry. He had chartered an island schooner, the Lorelei. And she was to sail at dawn the next morning for Palota and Jake Finch. But at least I would have one evening ashore, and I intended to have it alone. Well, uh, see you later, Uncle Jeffrey. Where are you going? Sightseeing, one enchanted evening, that sort of thing. Now you wait till I get this luggage transferred to the schooner, and I'll go with you. What's the matter? You afraid I'm going to get drunk? I know you are. That's where you're wrong. Got to stop sometime. I made up my mind I quit and we got to Tahiti, so I've quit. I don't believe you. You're drunk right now. That's what you think. I'm not drunk, Uncle Jeffrey. I'm sick. I'm sick of the sight of you. We still have a long way to go together. I know. Let's understand each other right now. I hate your guts. It's perfectly clear that you hate mine. Uh, I made a bargain with you. I'll go through with it, for Ellen's sake. Weren't for her, I'd use that gun on you instead of Jake Finch. Good. I'm glad that we understand each other so clearly. I'll see you later. Be aboard the Lorelei at midnight. Don't worry, I'll be there. I'm sure you will, Jason. Poppy 80, the letter goes on, is not the South Sea paradise we dream of back home. Unpaved streets, miserable natives, provincial French colonists, but plenty of bars. I avoided them. I headed for the big hotel and a table on the terrace. Take away the palm trees and the French accent, and it was about as exotic as the commercial house in Sioux City. Monsieur désire quelque chose à boire? Oh, what did you say? Oh, je m'excuse. Would monsieur like something to drink? An aperitif, perhaps? Cézano? Du bonnet? Oh, no, 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 thank you. Just, uh, just tea. Garçon. Uh, oui, monsieur. My check, please. Tout de suite, monsieur. 
You know, that tea, that, that's pretty vile stuff. Was there something wrong, monsieur? It is the very best, long. Oh, no, no, I, I guess it was all right for uh, tea. Uh, oui, monsieur. <laughs> voilà, monsieur. Here you are. I keep the change. Oh, merci beaucoup. Oh, say, tell me. What's a good place for dinner? Oh, you see, monsieur, the hotel has the best cuisine in Papillete. But it's a, it's a little quiet, don't you think? <laughs> Peut-être. Then I should commend monsieur to chez Tante Marguerite, or the Southern Cross. At the Southern Cross, there are the girls. Oh. Well, then I'll go to Marguerite's. With the dinner, Monsieur desires to drink water. Water? Yeah, just just water. That is Monsieur will permit. We have a proverb in my native Normandy: un repas sans vin est comme un jour sans soleil. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sorry, I, I don't understand French that well. A meal without wine is like a day without sun. Oh. oh and surely with the cuisine of Tante Marguerite, one must not drink just water. Besides, the water in Papillette is not safe. I myself have lived here more than 20 years, and never have I tasted the papillete water. Oh, no, no, no. I would recommend wine, monsieur. I urge it. With the langouste, a dry sauterne, monsieur. Oh, well. Well, very well. A, a small bottle, then. Monsieur has eaten well? Oh, yes, thank you. And now, perhaps, uh, liquor? No, no, I, I really oh, don't... Oh, permit me to offer it, monsieur. As you say, on the house. <laughs> well, no, that isn't Point the... Uh... chartreuse, cognac. Uh, cognac. Ah, oh, it's an excellent dinner, madame. An excellent liqueur, and the world begins to look all right again. Of course it does, monsieur. Of course it does. Uh, oh, and now, madame, tell me. Uh, you know of a place here in Papier they called uh, uh, the uh, Southern Cross? <laughs> and who does not, monsieur? <laughs> tell me how to get there, will you? You like maybe something, huh? Oh, yeah, another cognac. Oh, yes, sir. You like cognac, maybe, so uh, help yourself. Oh, sure, I like it. That's the best thing the French do, make cognac. Oh, look out. You're spilling it. I'm trying not to. Can't you see? I'm trying to hold it steady. Uh, oh, you're not so steady yourself. <laughs> Why can't I hold it steady? You know, it's like the gun. I can't hold the gun steady either. How can I shoot straight if I don't hold it steady? Uh, all the same. Whiskey, gun. You can't go steady with both. You go steady with me. Hmm? Oh. <laughs> well, hello, baby. You are alone? Yeah, I'm alone. It is not good to be alone too much. No, I don't mind. You like me to keep you company? I don't mind. You have cigarettes for me? <laughs> yeah, hey, sure, mate, what's me. the big idea of annoying this lady? I know it. What do you mean? This little. Watch your language. Now, look, here, I'm sitting here minding my own business. Well, now you're minding mine, now, Scram. Well, I got as much right Are you as... looking for trouble? Well, no. But it seems to me you are. Hey, you little... <laughs> okay, boys, carry him out. Nice work, sister. Here's your hundred francs. Thank you, Captain Steve. You want me to make change? Uh, not now. Some other time. I got work to do now. I know, John. It's the same old pattern. How well I know it. The promises and the failures. Anything could start him slipping. A glass of wine. The brandy sauce on the mince pie. Yes, or the sniff of the cork, if you like. But listen to Jason's letter. He goes on. The next thing I knew, I was in a narrow bed in a creaking, rocking room, and I didn't feel well, darling, not well at all. I had the world's worst hangover. Oh. Oh. Good morning, Jason. Oh, oh Uncle Jeffrey. 
Where am I? Board the Lorelei. Five hours out of Pepe E.T. Oh. Bad night? Mm, yeah, I guess so. Looks like you were in a fight. I was. I don't remember anything after it. How'd I get on board? You were delivered at my instruction. What do you mean? My captain brought you aboard. I want you to meet him. Captain? Yes, Mr. Sheldon? Come in. I want you to meet my nephew, Jason Torrance. How do you do, sir? Why, you... We've already met, Uncle. It's the man who knocked me out. I know, according to my instructions. That'll be all, Captain. Yes, sir. Well, you're a... Save your breath, that Jason. That dirtiest... Your head will only ache more if you get excited. I'm not trying to hide anything from you. Captain Steve is a tough guy, but not nearly as tough. Not half as quick or strong or hard to kill as Jake Finch. And he tells me you never even hit back. Object lesson, huh? That's right. You've already cost me a lot of money, and I want my money's worth. You're no good to me, drunk. Or to yourself. Or to your wife and child. Suppose you'd have gotten in a real brawl in that saloon last night. Well, you could have been killed. And where would your wife and kid be? <laughs> but believe me, I won't pay off until you kill Jake Finch. I do believe you. I believe you'd let Ellen and the kids starve before you'd help them. I would, Jason. You can be sure of that. Unless you kill Jake Finch. All right, Uncle. I'm on the wagon from now on. Oh, it's easy to say. <laughs> When you're still going on last night's booze. I mean it. I've taken my last drink. I wonder, Jason. I wonder. After he had left the cabin with that sneer on his face, Jason writes, I lay there hopeless and nearly helpless. For I knew now if I was to be helped at all, I would have to help myself. So I pulled my aching frame out of the bunk and head throbbing and tongue thick. I climbed up onto the deck and faced the captain. Well, Mr. Torrance, you had a nice long nap, huh? Yeah, thanks to you. You uh, got any work for me? Work? Yeah. You know, something something to do. I, I want to get busy. Well, now, there's always work aboard a sailing vessel. Know how to holy stone a deck? <laughs> Does it take a college degree? <laughs> no. But you'll need something else. Muscles and guts. Who said it gets easier day by day? Jason writes. It didn't for me. I was stiff and sore from using muscles that had never been used before. And the only thing I wanted was a drink. Just one drink to ease the pain. But I knew I'd never stop with one It got tighter and tighter inside me, and there had to be a breaking point. And then on the tenth day out, the captain sent me up to secure a block on the mainmast. The sea was kicking up a little, and when I was 15 feet above the deck, the schooner lurched suddenly. I lost my grip and fell. I grabbed at the shroud, and it bit into the skin of my palms, and I hit the deck and lay there for a moment, shaking with fear, knowing that this was the end of my fight. And I got to my feet, ran down to the galley, and opened the cabinet where I knew the captain kept his brandy. Ah, having a little nip, Jason? Yes! I'm through. You rotten bargain, you Jake Finch and you're... Through with Ellen and the baby. Through with keeping your word, back where you started from, a gas-filled room, trying to commit suicide. Well, go ahead. What are you waiting for? You've got the bottle in your hand. Go ahead. Take your drink. Shut up. What are you waiting for, Jason? Shut up, shut up! Just remember, Jason, one drink will finish you. Jake Finch will kill you and Ellen won't get the money. I'm a businessman, Jason. I made a bargain. Don't think I'm going to renege. I didn't want you to marry Ellen in the first place, remember? She won't get a penny from me when you die. Remember that. (laughs) Be careful, Jason. You're trembling so, you might drop the bottle. (laughs) Maybe you do need a drink, Jason. Think it over. It's an easy way out. And I won't embarrass you by staying and watching. Murderer! You dirty murderer! I won't touch it, Rick! I won't touch it! I'll show you! I'll show you! And then suddenly it grew a little easier. Not taking that drink was the turning point, I guess. The crying out inside, the need for liquor, grew slowly quieter. 
My muscles began to toughen. My whole body began to feel better, more alive. And the first time in years, I enjoyed eating. And I was learning to be a pretty good sailor. I began to get a kick out of the neat way the schooner handled, the clean feeling of the sea air, the wonder of just feeling good. And with this change, I slowly began to realize what kind of a bargain I had made. I didn't want to kill anyone. No, not for any reason. Not now, when I felt sure I could start my life over again. You've made a bargain, and you'll stick to it. I'm not the same now. I'm in good health. I'm strong. I can get a job and really take care of Ellen and the baby. You should have thought of that before. Well, I'm thinking about it now. I can't just deliberately go out and kill a man. I'm not, I'm not going to go through with it. All right, we anchor at Polota tomorrow. If you refuse to carry out your end of our bargain, I'll put you off the schooner and leave you there. You won't see a ship for more than six months. And when it does come, you'll have sunk lower than you've ever been. You won't have passage money back to San Francisco. You'll die in Polota. And Ellen won't see a penny of that $25,000. You'd do that in a second. But I'll pay you back the money you lent me. I'm not interested in that. I want Finch killed. Believe me, he has it coming to him. I don't care what he's done to you. I'm not going to go through with it. Not only what he's done to me, Jason. I didn't want to tell you before. I never told you how your father died. No, you never did. Jake Finch killed him, Jason. Jake Finch killed your father. Jason's letter continues. So you see, Ellen, what a diabolically clever scoundrel Uncle Jeffrey is. The last straw was that stuff about my father. I don't know whether he's lying or not, but it just might be true. And so this man who is playing God with my life has added the final motive for murder... Vengeance. We're approaching the island of Polota now, Ellen, and I have no other course but to find Jake Finch and kill him, or be killed by him. What a crying shame that I couldn't have found myself before this, for I know now what a wonderful life we might have had together. I hope you will find it with someone else, for you deserve better than I ever gave you. We're dropping anchor now, and I must go. Well, there she is, Jason. Polota, one of the loveliest islands in the Pacific. A perfect setting for a murder. Yes, isn't it? Feel up to it? Don't worry about me. Where do I find Finch? Everybody on the island knows him. Anyone can tell you where to find him. Try the traders or the bar. Good luck. Aren't you coming? Oh, no. (laughs) Remember... (laughs) I don't want to be connected with Jake Finch's death in any way. It's your affair now, not mine. Yellow all the way through, aren't you, Uncle? Yellow and rich enough to hire thugs and murderers to do your dirty work. I ought to kill you instead of Finch. I'm coming, Captain. Kill Finch first, Jason. Then you have my permission to kill me. Good day, dear sir. Good day. Put in for supplies, have you? No, no. Well, we've got everything a trim little schooner like yours would be needing. Now, look, can you uh, tell me where I can find Jake Finch? Jake Finch? What do you want with him? That's my business. Where is he? I couldn't say exactly. He might be down on the beach this time of day. Thank you. Our friend... Yeah, you. Uh, well, I wasn't sure. Ain't been called friend in 20 years. What can I do for you, stranger? I'm looking for Jake Finch. Well, don't look at me. I ain't him. Where can I find him? Look here, mister. If this is your idea of a joke, it ain't funny to me. I- I'm sorry. I'm simply looking for Jake Finch. Well, look somewhere else. Look for him in a bar. That's the likeliest place to find Jake Finch. Sir, what'll it be? I got the finest brandy on the island. Four years old, it is. No, thank you. I'm looking for someone, but the place seems to be empty. Oh, who are you looking for? Jake Finch. Jake Finch? What do you want with him? I've got business with him. Yeah? What kind of business? 
He inherited a million dollars or something? No. But I want to settle a debt with him. Okay, mister. He's in the back room. This way. There he is. That old bum? Yeah. Sleeping it off. Been there since I closed up last night. Jake Finch? This can't be Jake Finch. Yes, yeah, one of them. There's more down on the beach, kicking around town. What are you talking about? Well, there's at least a dozen Jake Finches here on Pelota. A dozen? Hey, look, somebody's been kidding you, mister. Don't you know? Jake Finch is the name we give any rum bum here on Pelota. They spend their last penny here in the bar and sleep it off on the beach. Drink, mister. All the Jake Finches drink themselves to death. Jake Finch. Me. All along, the Jake Finch he wanted to kill was in me. Hey, where are you going? I, uh... I've got an apology to make. You look like you need a drink. How about one for the road, huh? No, thanks. I, uh... I don't drink. There it is, John. That's my letter from Jason. You understand now, don't you, why I'm asking you as my attorney to stop my divorce action immediately. I cabled Jason this morning that I'm waiting for him to come home. Escape is produced and directed by William N. Robeson. Tonight we have presented Letter from Jason, adapted by Celie Glester, Mervyn Gerard, and Mr. Robeson, from Sunk by George F. Wartz. Featured in the cast were Frank Lovejoy as Jason, Will Gear as Jeff, and Kay Brinker as Ellen. Special music was arranged and conducted by Del Castillo. Next week... You are lying on a small knoll in the prairie west of the Platte River. In a few moments, dawn will herald the attack of the encircling Apaches. An attack of such fury that for you there can be no escape. Next week, we escape with an exciting tale of the Old West as James Warner Bella tells it in his thrilling story, Command. Uh me, Mr. Lamond. I'd like some information. Why, it's Gracie Allen. Oh, can you tell me who that young man was with the wonderful deep voice? Well, yes, that's uh, Paul Freeze. Well, I'd love to meet him. That'll be easy. Paul, this is Gracie Allen. Gracie, this is Paul Freeze. Hello, Gracie. Or should I call you Mrs. George Burns? Well, uh, yes, you should. You see, I've been Mrs. Burns ever since that day when a certain tall, handsome man came along. And pronounce George and me man and wife. I see. But it's George I've come to talk to you about. You have such a beautiful voice yourself, so I thought if you let him, let him sing on this program, our sponsor will hear him and realize how great he is. Then he'll let him sing on our program Wednesday night. Well, Gracie, this is not a musical program. This is escape. Well, George can make your program more popular. When he sings, everybody will be looking for escape. I'm sorry, Gracie. I'll have to turn you down. Oh? Well, goodbye, Mr. Freeze. You are a cold man. Goodbye, Gracie. Be sure to listen next week, same time, when once again we offer you... Escape. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Father Brown. And here he is, Father Brown, 
the best loved detective of them all. Humanity produces optimists only because it has never produced a really happy man. From the masterful and exciting pages of G.K. Chesterton comes that fascinating human being, Father Brown, played by Carl Swenson. Underneath the modest exterior of Father Brown is the rich character of a generous, deeply human man with a sensitive and quick-witted mind. In addition to being a man of God, he is a man of the world, a man of science, and a brilliant amateur detective. And now, the three tools of death. Facing the afterglow of a beautiful summer sunset, Father Brown sits alone in the study of his modest parish house. He's half dozing when Nora, his housekeeper, enters. Father Brown. Hmm. Father Brown. No. <clears throat> yes, Nora. <clears throat> what, what time is it? Time for your tea. Here it is, nice and hot. Ah, thank you. you just set it there, please. Were you asleep? Oh, I was in between, Nora, just in between. A beautiful state of being, I assure you. Half out of this world and half in. It's a good thing young Father Peter took over your duties for a day. I told him... Oh. There's somebody at the door. Don't worry, I'll take care of that. No. Oh, good evening, Nora. Is Father Brown in? I'm sorry, Flambeau, but he's rested. No, no, Nora, you, you know Flambeau's always welcome. Tell him to come in. Oh, all right. Come in, come in, Flambeau. Have a cup of tea. Uh, no, thanks, Father. I'm all upset. A friend of mine is in trouble. Oh. Will you come with me to Oakville? My car's outside. Here, here. No, not so fast. Get your breath. Sit down. <sighs> Father, hmm. you've heard of Aaron Armstrong, the philanthropist and lecturer? Yeah. Oh, Armstrong. The author of those bestsellers on how to be happy, etc. Had that such a tremendous following? Uh, yes, Father. That's the one. Oh, yes. Uh, I, I've read his books. And I attended one of his lectures once in which he offered his followers an easy road to happiness. Or heaven, as he called it. That's the guy, Father. Yes. As I remember, he um, apparently based his teachings on one of the Proverbs of Solomon. A merry heart doeth good like medicine, but a broken spirit dryeth the bone. Uh-huh. Yes. He believed in giving up all the physical appetites, smoking, overeating, and drinking. <laughs> yes, and above all, he believed in being cheerful. He, he dealt with a drink problem with an enormous gaiety. Well, he's dead. It, what? His body was discovered early this morning. Well, you don't say. Where? Right near his house, in a ditch on the parkway. What happened? Nobody knows. But according to the police, it looks like murder. Uh, did you say his, clo uh, his house is close to the parkway? Yes, on an embankment, just above it. Well, what makes the police think it wasn't an accident, Flambeau? Well, he was wearing only his dressing gown. And another strange thing, Father. A small piece of rope was tied around one of his ankles. Was any weapon found? No, but it was apparent he'd been struck on the head by a huge instrument of some sort. Cuts and bruises on his body showed signs of a struggle. Well, who put you on the case? Oh, no one. The dead man's secretary, Robert Royce, uh -huh. is an old friend of mine. I called him as soon as I heard the news and offered him my services as private investigator. But he, he refused to see me. Well, that's strange. No, yet, yet, no. Not so strange if he were implicated. Who else is there beside Royce in the household? Just Armstrong's daughter. A very attractive girl, I hear, but completely dominated by her father's cheerfulness. Uh -huh. And there's also a gardener, I believe. And uh, your friend Royce, uh, well, what sort of man is he? Oh, he's a huge, genial sort of fellow. A Scotsman. Did he and Armstrong get along well together? Well, Royce was devoted to him. Ah, uh, yes. Armstrong had many devoted followers. You know, he's always interested me, Flambeau. He did puzzled me, in fact. Puzzled you? Yes. When, when first I heard him lecture, I, I remember thinking that he had a troublesome road ahead. I believe that somewhere in his life, you'll find the secret of his death. But, Father, according to the papers, he lived as he preached. Oh, yes, I know, I know, Flambeau. The old fellow's optimism was phenomenal. But somehow I don't believe he found that easy road to heaven, as he called it. No? No. Neither have I. There is no shortcut to heaven, my friend. But who would want to kill such a man? Well, if, if ever I murdered somebody, I dare say it might well be an optimist of the proportions of old Armstrong. 
His optimism was so out of proportion. I've heard cheerfulness referred to as a virtue. Yeah, well, people like frequent laughter, but a permanent smile, Flambeau. Well, now that that's something else again. As Shakespeare says, the devil hath power to assume a pleasing shape. Oh, Father, it's six o'clock. We're just in time for the news. Let's turn on the radio. Yeah, that's a good idea. Perhaps there's something further on the case. Listen. Clear tonight and tomorrow somewhat cooler. Now we bring you a special bulletin just handed me on the Armstrong. Yeah, turn it up, Flambeau. John Magnus, the gardener, the millionaire philanthropist, has been reported missing. Oh. Also, negotiable bonds, the dead man, valued at $100,000. The police received this report only a short while ago and are now conducting a statewide search for the gardener. It is believed... Well, that seems to be the first real clue. Do you mind if I use the phone, Father? Uh, I'd like yeah. to uh, talk to Royce again. Yeah. The call uh, will cost you a nickel. Tax, two cents. That's seven cents. It, it just drop a dime in the poor box on your way out. All right, Father. Hello, Royce. This is Flambeau. Now, wait a minute. We just heard the news about the gardener's disappearance. Oh, hold on, hold on. You remember the friend I was telling you about? Yes, Father Brown. Well, we'd like to come up. What's that? Oh, I don't get it. Royce. Royce. My father, he's hung up. What did he say? He said if we valued our lives, we wouldn't go near that house. Ah, interesting. Well, 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 Flambeau, that's what I call a real invitation. Come on, my friend, let's go. I'm sure there's someone here, Father. Hmm. Ring again, Flambeau. Ah, here's someone now. Yes? What do you want? Oh, good evening, Royce. So it's you, Flambeau. I thought I warned you plain enough over the phone. You did. But look here, Royce. I don't understand... It was plain English I spoke. I know, but you sounded like you were in trouble. Well, I'm not. Oh, come, man. Don't act as though we weren't friends. Oh, this is Father Brown. Uh, I gathered as much. Um, Mr. Royce, I, I, I'm afraid I'm to blame for this visit. Well, it was good to be here to come, Father, but I wish you'd both heeded my warning. Man, what kind of a friend would I have been if I had? I tell you, the police have already investigated. I know, I know. I've talked with them. Uh, perhaps we can help you, Mr. Royce. Help? In what way? Well, uh, maybe we could tell better if you'd ask us in. Very well. You may come in. But you should have let sleeping dogs lie, Flambeau. <laughs> I must confess I can't find anything here in Armstrong's room that tells us very much. And just what did you expect to find? Mr. Rice. Yes? Uh, What do you make of the gardener's disappearance? Magnus is a fool, maybe a thief, but he never killed Mr. Armstrong. I'm sure it was the deed of a madman. Uh, I see. My, my, my. Well, I would never have expected those to be there. Father, what are you looking at? That pair of socks over there thrown under the bureau. Oh, they should be in the bureau drawer. Here, I'll put them away. Uh, wait, uh, may I have a look at those bureau drawers, Mr. Rice? What for? Well, I'd just like to look. What are you searching for? Well, I'll take a peep at that closet, too, if you don't mind. Well, now that's funny. What, Father? Everything looked so neat when we came in. Mr. Armstrong was always very particular. Everything is in order on the surface. But underneath, underneath... Things look different. What things? Well, in the closet, his socks are stuffed in the hangers with the suits. And in the bureau drawers, under those beautifully laid-out shirts... Yes? A whole lot of ginger spilled from a box. Why do you have to go on with this? The police went over the room very thoroughly. The room, perhaps. But they seem to have missed this piece of rope. Look here. I found it caught in the vine just below the ledge of the window. Well, it couldn't have been there this morning or the police would have found it. Well, I just saw the wind blow an end of it out from under the vine. Royce, maybe you can tell me how this piece of rope got there. What has that got to do with the case? You know perfectly well a piece of rope was tied around the leg of the dead man. That rope in your hand was left from fixing the windows. Well, now, I'm just wondering. Wondering, wondering what, Father? Well, let me take a look out of that window. Why? For a very good reason. The police haven't yet established why the dead man was found on the parkway. 
No. No, that isn't it. The window isn't high enough for the from the ground for him to have fallen. Or been pushed or to have jumped. Right. And not high enough for his body to have rolled down the embankment to the parkway. Mr. Rice, isn't there another floor to this house? Eh, uh, there's only an attic. Mm. Robert? Robert? That's Miss Armstrong. She's been much upset since her father's death. Oh, yes, yes, of course. You'll have to excuse me for a moment. Certainly. Father, hmm. I don't like the look of things. This rope I found in the vine was cut with a sharp instrument. The rope found on Armstrong's ankle was also cut with a sharp instrument. Hmm. And did you notice the cut on Royce's knuckle? Yes, yes, I did, Flambeau. But, uh, you know, I haven't noticed any geniality. He's hardly the person you described to me. Yes, I know, Father. Didn't like him. Nevertheless, it seems to fit his unshaven appearance. It's the first time I've ever seen him that way, either. You're worried about your friend's innocence, aren't you? Oh, I know how the mind of a thief works, Father. I was once a thief myself. But murder... Do you think he's capable of murder? Well, the answer to that one is more up your alley, Father. Well, in any event, he's hiding something. But I think there is a secret in this house more important than his. And I'm very anxious to find out what it is. Now, first, look at the stains on the wall. And, and you felt the dust on the banisters as we came up. Well? Well, but the, 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 the question fairly screams at us, Flambeau. What question? Why are there no servants in this house? Yeah. Well, Armstrong certainly had plenty of money. He could afford them. Mm -hmm. There could only be one reason. If the old man himself had something to hide. Father, you mean you think Armstrong... Well, I... Miss Armstrong's in the drawing room downstairs. She'd like to talk to you, Father Brown. If you will please follow me. <laughs> Well, I, I hesitate to continue, Miss Armstrong. I, I know how badly you feel. Please go on, Father Brown. I'm quite all right. But that bruise on your forehead, Miss Armstrong. Oh, that's nothing. It doesn't bother me. I bumped it. Your father had a great many followers, didn't he? Oh, yes, he helped so many people. Do you know why your father decided to give up all his servants? Well, great men like my father had their peculiarities. Their ideas are often different from other people's. Yes, very true, Mr. Royce, very true. I was only wondering... Wait. This... What? This... Someone's unlocking the front door. Who could it be? No one has a key besides us. Who's that? Me, Magnus. Magnus? Yes, Miss Armstrong. Magnus. And here is Inspector Vincent. Well, how are you, Inspector? Fine, Father Brown, fine. Uh, hello, Flambeau. I might have known you two would be here. Well, I see you got your man, Inspector. Is this the gardener who walked out of here with $100,000 worth of bonds? Walked out of here and right into my office to place them in my charge. Hello, Royce. Uh, are you feeling better, Miss Armstrong? Yes, thank you, Inspector. Now, Magnus, perhaps you'd care to tell Miss Armstrong why you took those bonds without consulting her. No one in this household is to be trusted. Not even Miss Armstrong. Now, see here, Magnus. Just a minute, Royce. What I want to know... Why did you wait so long before reporting this gardener's absence? We didn't think much of it, Inspector, until I noticed the bonds were gone, too. I was waiting for you to report it. Magnus has been telling me some very interesting things. A new angle on the case, Inspector? Well, it closes the case if Magnus is telling the truth. Inspector, what this man says is not to be taken seriously. He's not been himself. What makes you say that? Magnus used to be my father's personal valet, Inspector. But he was taken off that and put to work in the garden. He's been very upset. He thought it was quite a come down. Hmm. Upset, am I? Well, I like that. I wasn't going to tell the inspector about you two being in love. But now Be I... Be careful what you say, Magnus. You weren't so careful what you said when I heard you two talking in the garden the other night. Magnus. I've stood enough of this. Take it easy, Royce. Inspector, may I make a suggestion? Uh, just I... a minute, Father Brown. Magnus, what are you getting at? About four nights ago it was. I heard them in the garden. He was begging her to marry him. They didn't know I was close by. No. No, Robert, we mustn't. But, Alice, you have no life of your own. Let's face your father now. Let's tell him how much we love each other. Oh, but, Robert, we must wait. We really ought to. I know how important you are to his work, but 
What about us? Our life. We can't go on waiting forever. Oh, but, Robert, it won't be forever. Oh, darling, you know I love you. You must be sure of that. I am sure, my dearest. Oh, if only I could get my hands on some money. What do you mean, Robert? I'd make you marry me then, Alice. Oh, Robert. I feel guilty even thinking of it. We mustn't, my darling. Not now. So long as he's alive. I'll find some way out of this. Shh. I thought I heard someone. We better not talk here. Come. Yes. Come, my dear. Well, that's all I could hear. But I suspected them what they were up to, and now I know. Then you know what? That they would be off with the money. Mr. Armstrong's money. The money he had wanted to be used for his work. Inspector, this talk is ridiculous. You don't Mr. think... Mr. Royce, do you use an old-fashioned razor? I? You didn't use it today. Why? Why, I... I mislaid it. When? I don't know. Since, since I last shaved, I guess. That was yesterday. You can tell by his beard. Magnus brought your razor into the precinct with him with the bonds. I'm holding it as evidence. Why? Because it had a smear of blood on it. Oh, well, I must have cut myself shaving and forgot to wipe it. Oh, Inspector, is this all the evidence you have of Royce's guilt? Who said anything about Royce's guilt? Now, Magnus, tell them what you told me just now in the office. I was sleeping in my room over the garage, and about four this morning I heard shots. Followed by loud outcries, which seemed to come from the attic. An instant later, I, I saw Mr. Armstrong's body pitch from the window and roll down the embankment. When I made sure he was dead, I rushed up to the attic and found his daughter unconscious on the floor with a razor in her hand. You mean Miss Armstrong killed her father? It's a lie! Surely, Father Brown, you for one will take Miss Armstrong's word against this gardener's? But is Miss Armstrong's word against him? So far, she has said nothing. Miss Armstrong... Can't you speak? Magnus told the truth. There, you see? I'll get you for this. I'll get you. Here now. You'll not say things like that. I will, and I do. Let go. Let go. None of that, Royce. Or I'll arrest you for assault. No. You'll arrest me for murder. Robert. But, man, you've been Armstrong's best friend. What possessed you? I was drunk. Sure. Didn't I find those empty bottles hidden in the garden? Piling up week after week. Sure. I knew what was going on here. Now, now, Magnus, you've told your story. Let Royce tell his. Maybe he was too drunk to remember. Miss Armstrong did not pick up the razor to attack, but to defend her father from me. In the scuffle, she hit her head against the eaves of the attic. I hurried down to get something to revive her, and it must have been then that Magnus came in and found her. Oh, Robert. Robert. All right, Royce. Come along. Uh, wait, Inspector, before you arrest Royce. What is it now, Father Brown? Well, so far we've had opinions and confessions. But we haven't had facts, and we need facts. And where do you think we'll find them? In the attic. In the attic? Uh, yes, Inspector. Perhaps by climbing a few steps nearer heaven, we can come closer to this evil. <laughs> Father, I can't figure out what you expect to find in this attic. Hey, you, you sleep here, don't you, Mr. Royce? Aye. And Mr. Armstrong slept in the room immediately below this. Aye, but why all these questions? Well, now, in the first place, Mr. Royce, uh, why did you bring your victim up here at the crack of dawn in order to kill him? Why didn't you go to his room? Well? I confessed. Isn't that enough? Well, confession is good for the soil, that's granted, but, uh, Inspector... You, you remember Magnus telling us he was awakened by shots? Yes. What about those shots, Inspector? Were any bullets found in Armstrong's body? Well, we investigated and didn't find a one. Wait, wait. Here is my pistol. I fired those shots. You can see the holes in the carpet. Well, why should anybody fire at the carpet? A drunken man will let fly at anything. Uh, he doesn't pick a quarrel with his feet. And there's the rope. It was from my window here that Armstrong was thrown. And the piece of rope I found fell to the vines below. What about the blow on the head? According to our report, he was struck by a massive weapon. A massive weapon indeed, Inspector. Sure, the good green earth was the weapon. Okay, so the good green earth was the weapon. But look, this room was the beginning of the murder. Even I can see from the disorder. Come on, Royce. Let's go. But the disorder here is all on the surface. The very opposite of Armstrong's room. No, no, it doesn't fit. Too many inconsistencies. Father Brown, 
Royce has given himself up. No, 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 no. Really, this won't do at all. What won't do? Well, first the police said no weapon was found at all. Now we're finding too many. Too many? Now, there's the razor to cut a person, the rope to strangle, the pistol to shoot, and after all this, Armstrong broke his skull falling out of a window. No, 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 no. It won't do. It's not economical. Alice, they won't believe me. You tell them. Inspector. Yes, young lady. May I speak to Father Brown alone for a moment? If you must, but be quick. We can't wait around here all night. And now what is it, my child? What is it that you wish to say? You're trying to save Robert, but it's no use. I should have realized before this his case is hopeless. Before he came to us, he was a prisoner of war. He had some shocking experiences. Well, you think that was the reason for his drinking? Yes, he wasn't himself at times. Yes. We thought he was getting over it, but... Father, I saw Robert commit the crime myself. Mm. I heard the shot. I ran up just in time to see him leap at my father. Where was your father standing? He was clinging to the windowsill in terror. But uh, the rope... Robert tried to strangle him with it. Father fought back and the rope slipped from his shoulders to his feet, tightening around the leg. Robert was like a maniac. I snatched the razor from the floor and managed to cut the rope before he pushed me against uh, the eaves. Miss ease. Armstrong, what we see with our eyes is sometimes farthest from the truth. Now, you thought that you saw a man about to commit murder. What you actually saw was two men struggling, and then you lost consciousness. But, Father Brown... I want you to go downstairs, my dear. I don't understand. Go on now, please. Do as I say. Very well. Thank you, my dear. Well, Father Brown, I've seen and heard enough to convince me. Unless you know something pretty startling, I'm taking Royce down and booking him. If you don't mind, Inspector, I'd like to talk to Royce a bit before you do. What about, Father? Oh, where's Alice? She's out of earshot, Mr. Royce. So why don't you tell us about it now? Tell you about what? I see. Well, then I'll tell you, Inspector... Those three tools of death were not used to kill Armstrong, but to save him. Save him? Father, I don't get this. Save him from what? From himself. At the time old Armstrong died, he was a suicidal maniac. No, Royce, you weren't drinking. No? No, and you were the only one who knew what lurked behind old Armstrong's laughter. No, no. Yes, you knew what, uh, that behind that merry mask was the mind of an atheist. No. A man who knew nothing of God. He didn't realize until it was too late that human beings need something to worship greater than themselves. I warn Flambeau not to bring you here, Father. I was afraid it might come to this. Well, man, what harm is there in the truth now? Alice must never know. Why? Why shouldn't she be told that you weren't the enemy her father feared? Shall I name the enemy, Royce? All right, Father Brown. You win. This morning... Armstrong was determined to do away with himself. He knew I kept my service pistol in my dresser. And when he heard me go down to the kitchen early at dawn, he left his room and came up here. And you came in and accidentally surprised him. I, I got the pistol out of his hand, but in the struggle I had no time to unload, so I fired at the carpet. Then he found my razor and tried to slash himself. Mm. I snatched it from him and flung it to the floor. I ran after him with a rope to tie him up. And it was then that the unlucky girl ran in and misunderstanding the struggle. She tried to cut her father free with a razor. She cut the rope, slashing my knuckle just as I pushed her, and he went crashing into eternity out of that window. But, Father Brown, you spoke of an, of an enemy old man Armstrong feared. I did, yes. You mean the enemy was in this room with him at the same time as Royce? Yes. What? The sin... The very thing Armstrong was so vehement against. You mean alcohol? It was his worst enemy. The moment I saw the ginger in one of the bureau drawers downstairs, I suspected it was the futile effort of a man who was trying to give up drinking. Isn't that right, Rice? Yes, Father Brown. Armstrong was living a lie, and it preyed on his mind. And he feared his public might find him out. Aye. The more despondent he got, the darker visions he had of failing his followers. The people who looked to him for guidance... So fearful was he of anyone praying into his secret that he hid from his friends and got rid of all his servants. And you were the only one he could confide in. Aye. He didn't understand your loyalty, did he? No, but it was for her sake, you see. 
And so you kept the knowledge of his spells to yourself, letting his daughter believe it was you, the result of the war. Aye. Well, Royce, I can't imagine why you didn't speak up before. Don't you see? It was because she must never know. Never know what? Why, that she killed her own father. I see. By trying to free him. My son, I think she should know. After all, it was only an accident. And accidents, no matter how tragic, do not poison life like sins. I think you should both be happier now. Surely, two private lives are worth more than the public reputation of Aaron Armstrong. Well, Father, at last you're back. Yes, we were worried. Uh, hello, Nora. Hello, Peter. Have you had dinner? I, uh... No, no, I don't think I have. Oh, that's a shame. I'd better go fix you something right away. Ah, oh, my... It's nice to sit down again. Oh, Peter, you missed your story tonight. I'm sorry. Father, I heard tonight's story. Many versions of it. You did? How? From the news commentators over the radio. Oh. They've been reading bulletins on it every half hour or so. I see. Tell me, Father, what made you suspect Royce wasn't guilty? Well, looking into the hidden places of his attic room convinced me of Royce's innate neatness, Peter. I don't quite see. Well, I, I knew that no one as orderly as Royce could commit such a murder. The whole thing was too sloppy. I mean, the three tools of death. But how did you discover that Armstrong was a suicide? Well, the same method, but in reverse. I'm afraid my methods are not orthodox, Peter. I'm no real detective. To, to me, a man's inner nature must be revealed first. Armstrong's habits revealed his nature, just as Royce's did. They justified certain suspicions I had when Flambeau told me of his death. What do you mean? Well, Armstrong's erratic character was uh, clear to me when I looked into his bureau drawers. See, there, there I saw the compartments of his mind. The neatness mixed with the disorder which his friend Royce had tried to cover up. The litter reflecting the mind of the depressed. Surely you had something more than that to prove he was a suicide? Well, uh, yes, Peter, I had myself. Yourself? Yes. I dare say that... I would feel as Armstrong did if I had ever preached an easy road to happiness and then had slipped into a ditch by the side of the road. Yes, Father, I see. Yes. Well, now, uh, good night, Father Peter. Good night, Father Brown. <laughs> been listening to the adventures of father brown with carl swenson as father brown father brown's adventure tonight was called the three tools of death the character of father brown was created by gk chesterton in the detective novels called the adventures of father brown this is the armed forces radio service
Tonight, we again present the famous Mr. Chameleon of Central Police Headquarters in his famous cases of crime and murder. Brought to you by the makers of genuine Bayer Aspirin. Mr. Chameleon, as you know, is the famous and dreaded detective who frequently uses a disguise to track down a killer. A disguise which at all times is recognized by the audience. Tonight we give you Mr. Chameleon in The Perfect Maid Murder Case. The scene opens in one of New York's most fabulous mansions, the home of Raymond Colby. And we see a young woman about to leave. Her hand is on the knob of the front door when she is interrupted by a maid whom we hear saying the words that lead to a gruesome, fantastic murder. Excuse me, Miss Laura. Can I see you a moment before you go? I haven't any time now, Fanny. But this is important, Miss Laura. Terrible important. Well, what is it then? I want to give my notice, Mum. Your notice? You mean you're leaving? Why, I thought you were a fixture in this house, Fanny. But that's just it, Mum. I am a fixture here. Then what's this talk about giving notice? What's wrong? If it's more wages... Oh, it's not that, Mum. It's, uh, it's that... Uh, yes? It's that I'm going to marry your father. Your what? Going to marry your father, that's what. Oh, well, it don't seem to set very well with you, but... Are you completely and utterly mad? This is the most outrageous thing I've ever heard in my life. Oh, it is, is it? Well, let me tell you, I'm as good as you are. Pack up your things and get out of this house as fast as you can. I'm not packing and I'm not leaving. I'm marrying into this house. Huh, just put that in your pipe and smoke it. Get out instantly, I say. I'm not going any further than me own room. You'll find me there if you want to be coming up later and telling me you're sorry. Ta-ta, dearie. John! John, come here! John! Don't shout, Lola. I heard it all. Great heavens, what a mess. We can't let Father do this. He's gone mad. Oh, that cheap, terrible creature. I tell you, Laura, hysterics won't help. Besides, we don't want to wake the old man up and get him on our necks. We've got to think fast. But what are we going to do? What can we do? Oh, this is too dreadful. Listen, Laura, listen. Yes? You stay right here, Laura, and watch every door. <laughs> Be as loud as you can if anybody comes. You mean father or that horrible fat? Anybody. I've got the combination to father's safe. His safe? What are you going to do, John? I know he keeps his will there. That's the first thing to do. He may have changed it in Fanny's favor. If he did, I'll burn it up. And some time later, we hear the Commissioner of Police assigning another famous murder case to the astute and feared Mr. Chameleon, the man of many faces and disguises. Oh, here you are, Chameleon. A murder in Park Avenue. Oh, top draw case, eh, Commissioner? Well, that's for you to decide, old man. The murder occurred in the Raymond Colby house. You mean the mysteriously rich Raymond Colby's been killed? No, not Colby himself, Chameleon. A maid in his house. A girl named Fanny Bilkins. Throat slashed open. Better get out there. Right, oh, Commissioner. I'll take Detective Dave Arnold with me. Yep. Oh, here you are, Dave. Yes, sir. You come with me, please. Bye, Commissioner. I suppose the case we're on is that parlor maid murder at Raymond Colby's house. Yes, that's it, Dave. Well, I guess it'll be one of those jobs where the chauffeur killed some poor girl because he was in love with her and caught the butler getting away with her. I have no idea, Dave. Let's uh, get the car and buzz out there. Oh, personally, I'd be more interested if old Colby himself was the victim. I hear he's a queer character, the absent-minded professor type. He invented something somewhere that made him fabulously rich. Here's the house, Mr. Chameleon. Yes, with a very pretty girl already holding the door open. Come ahead. Oh, I'm so glad you came. You are from the police, aren't you? Yes, my name is Chameleon. This is Detective Arnold. And you are... Um... I'm Laura Colby. Come in, Mr. Chameleon. Thank you. I'm rather surprised to see you here. Surprised, Miss Laura? Why? We didn't expect to see such a famous detective as you on an unimportant case like this. Murder is always important. <laughs> Judy O'Grady or the judge's lady, I see. I understand the girl who was murdered was a housemaid in your father's house, Miss Laura. Uh, do you know anything about her? Practically nothing, Mr. Chameleon, except that she was a perfect maid. Really marvelous. And that she had perfectly wonderful references when she came. Uh, when was that? 
Oh, I don't really remember. A couple of years ago. You know how those things are. Uh, who found her body? One of the other help in the house, I suppose. No. As a matter of fact, my father did. He and my brother John, that is. Yes? Well, what actually happened was that one of the other servants, our cook, became annoyed when Fanny didn't turn up to serve breakfast this morning. She mm -hmm. thought she'd overslept. But when she knocked on Fanny's door and she didn't answer, she became alarmed and called my father. So he and your brother went up there? And when they opened the door, they found her dead. Father was very much upset, and so was my brother. Odd that the cook didn't open the door herself when she got no answer to her knock. Why, I hadn't thought of that. Oh, but I'm sure the cook wouldn't have killed her just because Fanny overslept. Oh, scarcely, Miss Laura. Dave. Yes, Mr. Chameleon? Uh, you go to the kitchen and talk to that cook. Find out what you can. I'm sure a cook can't tell you any more than I have, Mr. Chameleon. Uh, one never knows, Miss Laura. She may be concealing something from you. I'll talk to the cook now, Mr. Chameleon. I don't. In the meanwhile, Miss Laura, perhaps your father or your brother will take me up to see the murdered girl's body. John's in the drawing room, Mr. Chameleon. This door here. Oh. Oh, John, this is Mr. Chameleon, the famous detective. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Chameleon? Horrible thing, isn't it? But one never knows what will happen with servants these days, does one? What uh, happened here, however, is a bit out of the usual run. Uh, your sister says that you lead me to the murder room. Well, of course, Mr. Chameleon. I don't like the job, but just follow me. Thank you. Here are the servants' stairs. Uh, by the way, John, uh, do you know anything about the murdered girl? I mean, um, do you ever notice anything strange about her? Signs of being afraid of something, upset, anything like that? It's a funny thing, Mr. Comedian. I never notice any servant particularly. To me, they're just faceless people. All I know is that my sister always said Fanny was the perfect maid. <laughs> Laura's all in a dinner. Says she'll never find another one like her. Oh, but here's her room. Hmm. Just about the size of a cell. What? Nothing. Poor girl. A horrible sight. Her head is almost severed. If... If you're finished with me, Mr. Chameleon, I'd like to get out of here. Hmm? Oh, yes, I understand, John. I'm sorry. I forgot that we policemen are more accustomed to sights like this than people like you. Uh, yes, you go back to the drawing room. I'll see you there presently. Thank you, Mr. Chameleon. Poor Fanny. Poor child. But if the dead can hear, you'll hear me promising to bring your murderer to the execution chamber. Mr. Chameleon? Hmm? Nothing from the cook except what Laura Colby already told us. But get this. Yes, Dave? Just as I was talking to, to the cook, the girl's father came in. The murdered girl's father, Dave? Uh-huh. A man named Ed Bilkins. He started accusing everybody of murder. He's pretty wild. I told him to stay put, but you'd talk to him. Oh, poor devil. What till you get a load of him, Mr. Chameleon? Hmm? He looks like a bad customer to me. Not so sorry as he acts. But that don't mean I think he killed the girl. Uh, Dave, you call the morgue and have this body picked up. And uh, here is the knife that slashed her throat. You send it in for prints. Okay, Mr. Chameleon. And then hold the murdered girl's father down below. I want to talk to John Colby and his father first. Well, John, feeling a bit more steady now? Forgive me for bringing you back to the murder room. It's all right, Mr. Chameleon. I took a drink and feel better. Well, this is my father, Raymond Colby. Father, this is Mr. Chameleon. Ah? Mr. Mr. what? Didn't catch the name. Chameleon of Central Police Headquarters, Mr. Colby. Police headquarters, you say? John, what's, what, what's a police officer doing here? Investigating the murder of your maid, Fanny Bilkins, Mr. Colby. Oh, to be sure. You know, things slip my memory, sir. And you say your name is... Um... Chameleon, Mr. Colby. Chameleon. Unfortunate thing here, Mr. Canston. Chameleon. Oh, yes. Yeah, no, chameleon. Last thing I ever expected in my house, murder. Just one of the servants. They probably got herself into trouble. Queer lot, servants. Queer lot. Never know about them. But still human, Mr. Colby. They sing and sigh, laugh and weep, feel happiness and sorrow just like you and me. Only probably suffer more. Mm, quite right, quite right. You real, I didn't think policemen thought that way, though. Well, what can I do for you? Tell me any little thing that you might know about the girl who was so inconsiderate as to be murdered in your quiet home. Why do you think, for instance, that she was killed? 
I've no idea, no idea. Never paid any attention to her, no attention to her. My daughter Laura runs the house. You better ask her. I did, and she told me just as little as you and your son John have, Mr. Colby, but I'll... Mr. Chameleon. Yes, Dave? You'd better come downstairs and talk to the man I told you was here. He's got something for you, something plenty hot. What, uh, what man, Mr. Chameleon? After I see him, I'll tell you, John. He's going to tear this case wide open, John. Wide open. Te tear it open, Detective Arnold? That's ridiculous. Never mind, never mind, son. I fancy it's someone of Fanny's own class, and that it'll all turn out that a grocer's clerk or delivery boy killed Fanny. Perhaps, Mr. Colby. I'll see you later, Mr. Colby. John. Get Laura in here right away. What for, Father? If you don't manage to hold yourself in, you and Laura will find yourselves up on a murder charge. Our Mr. Chameleon's one of the most penetrating men I've ever met. Up to the time you revealed excitement, our story was going down perfectly. Now be careful, my boy. I beg of you. I don't want to see my children convicted of murder. What did the murdered girl's father tell you, Dave, to make you think he'd break this case wide open? Uh, you better hear it from his own lips, Mr. Chameleon. Uh -huh. He's here in the butler's pantry. Oh, all right, Dave. Mr. Bilkins, here's Mr. Chameleon. Now tell him what you told me. It, it's fair terrible I ever brought my innocent daughter to this country, Mr. Chameleon. That's how she was done in. What do you mean, Mr. Bilkins, brought her to this country? Uh, didn't this here busy tell you, Mr. Comedian? Detective Arnold wanted me to hear the story direct from you, Bilkins. Now, let's have it, please. Uh, Fanny and me come from Australia, where we should have stayed. And then she'd never have gone into service in this old duffer's house. Well, I still don't know what you mean, Bilkins. Uh, what I'm trying to drive home, sir, is that Fanny wouldn't have got herself engaged to marry the old man. Do you mean to say that your daughter, Fanny, was going to marry Raymond Colby? I'm not lying when I say it, Mr. Comedian. I, I warned her prop about marrying out of her class. But Fanny had got American ideas into her head quick. Wouldn't listen to her father. And it, it all wound up in her being killed. Butchered like an animal. Are you certain that your daughter was going to marry this fabulously rich man? Uh, look here. Here's a wedding license, Mr. Comedian. Uh -huh. She gave it to me, saying Mr. Colby didn't want it round the house. Fed his son or daughter might find it. But they, they must have caught on some other way, sir. And that's why they, they killed her. Dave, this is astounding. This license is genuine. Fanny Bilkins, age 24, Raymond Colby, 56. It's on the up all right, Mr. Comedian. I had it checked myself. I'm mm. taking the blame for Fanny's murder on myself, Mr. Comedian. I'm her father. I should have given her a good thump and I made her leave this house. The likes of her thinking of Mary and the likes of him. I always say that everyone stay in his own class. Mr. Bilkins, come with me. Who, who, where to, sir? Upstairs to the drawing room, where I think we'll find Mr. Colby and his son, John. Uh, uh, don't make me face him now, Mr. Comedian. Mm. I, I, I can't face my daughter's dirty murderers. I, I, I can't do it, sir. I can't. I understand, Bilkins. You wait here, then. Detective Arnold and I will go up alone. Uh, you, you're a real gentleman, sir. Thank you. I'll never forget your kindness, sir. Dave, come along. If ever I saw one for the book, Mr. Chameleon, this is it. If it's true, Dave, if it's true. What? Well, don't you believe it? You saw the marriage license, didn't you? Yes, indeed, Dave. And I also saw the shifty look in the bereaved Mr. Bilkin's eyes. If I were looking for a babysitter, I'd, uh, and it wouldn't be Bilkin's. Now, oh, here's the drawing room now. I expected to find your father and brother here. Uh, they're in father's study, Mr. Chameleon. I've just talked to your murdered maid's father. So they have fathers, too. Just as you and I, Laura. But uh, tell me. Yes. When was your father, Raymond Colby, going to marry Fanny Bilkins? <laughs> oh, I didn't realize detectives on duty kidded people, Mr. Chameleon. Then you didn't know? Know what? You know what. Answer the question. If you expect me to answer a ridiculous question like that, Mr. Chameleon... Are you serious? Imagine father marrying a housemaid. It's too, too silly. That the door to the study, Laura? Well, yes. I'll tell father you want to see him. Don't trouble, thank you. I'll go in alone. And you stay here. I hope I'm not interrupting, Mr. Colby. Oh. I see you have your safe open. Something lost? Uh, father has an idea he misplaced his will, Mr. Comedian. I'm on the forgetful side, Mr. Comedian. I'll find it later. Uh, why not look in the fireplace, Mr. Colby? 
Wait a second. In, in the fireplace, Mr. Chameleon? Yes, John. Yes, here is what is left of your father's will. All but the top and away, though. Uh, do you mind telling me why you tried to destroy it, John? My son didn't, Mr. Chameleon. Probably did it myself. I, I do such utterly stupid things without thinking. Like arranging to marry your housemaid, Mr. Colby? What is this, Mr. Chameleon? Father planning to marry that... That, that murdered girl, John. Murdered. Oh, Mr. Chameleon, what in heaven's name gives you the idea Father was going to marry her? Uh, this uh, marriage license, John. A ma a marriage license? John, I told you before that Mr. Chameleon was a very penetrating man. Trying to deceive him would be unfair to him and us. Then you were going to marry her, Mr. Colbin. Oh, no, no. Not at all, Mr. Chameleon. I simply, I, uh... Well, I really don't know why I took out that marriage license. Well, I'm sure it wasn't done simply to keep a perfect maid. Come, Mr. Colby, don't you think it's time to stop trying to protect your children? Why should he try to protect Laura and me, Mr. Chameleon? We didn't kill that girl. In my entire experience, I've never met with a clearer motive for murder. Never. Dave. Right here, Mr. Chameleon. Oh. What do we do, arrest John and Laura? Uh, no, not now, Dave. Bring the murdered girl's father in here immediately, and then we'll... Well, that's what I came up here to tell you, Mr. Chameleon. Bilkins slipped out of the house while I went into the kitchen to get a drink of water. What? I sent out a general alarm for him. Have this house guarded, Dave. And get this straight, Mr. Colby. If either your son or daughter attempts to leave here, they'll be taken in on suspicion of willful murder. Mr. Chameleon and the Perfect Maid murder case continues in just a moment. And now back to Mr. Chameleon and the Perfect Maid murder case. Fanny Bilkins has been viciously murdered in the home of wealthy Raymond Colby, where she worked as a housemaid. Mr. Chameleon has discovered that Colby had planned to marry Fanny in spite of the bitter protests of his son John and his daughter Laura. During the investigation, the murdered girl's father, Edward Bilkins, has disappeared from the Colby home. But an hour later, when Mr. Chameleon impatiently paces his office at headquarters, he suddenly finds that no general alarm was required to bring in Bilkins. For a strange surprise awaits him, as Detective Dave Arnold rushes into his office saying, Mr. Chameleon, hmm? I just brought in Fanny Bilkins' father in an ambulance. In an ambulance, Dave? He's got a knife cut straight down his left cheek. Hmm. Didn't miss his throat by half an inch. But the ambulance doc patched him up on the way in, and now he's squawking loud to see you. He says... Get him in here, Dave. Come in, Bilkins. Bilkins, what happened? Who tried to get you? Now get down to the point without wasting words. Uh, very good, sir. But it was a near one. Not satisfied with cruelly murdering my daughter Fanny. Who? Raymond Colby. But I, I, I mean his, his son, John. But it, the, the fact is, I, I don't know for where sure. Where did the attack take place, Bilkins? In, in the old Duffer's study, that's where. What were you doing there? Uh, nothing, sir, nothing. Just uh, nosing around. It won't do Bilkins out with it. Mr. Chameleon, here's a bag the boys took off Bilkins on the way in. Uh, yeah. Give it to me, Mr. Copper. I, I, I never seen it before. It, uh, it, uh, Fanny gave it to me. Looks like about a half million in jewels, Bilkins. And they look familiar. Very familiar. But I, I don't know anything about them. Dave, I... put Bilkins on detention. I got the answer to this case. Now look here, Chameleon. I got rights. Those jewels were planted on Come me. Come along, Bilkins. I... Chose your own daughter, did you? I'll be right back, Mr. Chameleon. Right on. Hello? Mr. Chameleon, this is John Colby. Yes? Most of my dead mother's jewelry has been stolen. Who discovered the loss, John? Our butler did. Caught the robber in the act, but he got away. Can you come out here right away? Uh, not just now, John. You said only part of your mother's jewelry was stolen? The butler came in the room just in time to save the rest. Um, I have got the stolen jewels, John. And the robber, too. You've got the jewels and the robber both? I'm pretty positive I have, John. But um, I want to make sure before I definitely charge the man that we're holding. Well, what do you mean, Mr. Chameleon? Instead of coming myself, John, I'm going to send one of our expert jewel men out there. And he'll bring the jewels I have here out, too, for identification. I wish you'd come yourself, Mr. Chameleon, instead of... What, what's that, Father? All right, I'll ask Mr. Chameleon. Sorry, Mr. Chameleon, but Father suggests... Yes? Father's worried about anybody coming but you, Mr. Chameleon. And so is my sister, Laura. Can't you come yourself? 
I'm sorry, I'm not a jewel expert. I'm sending our head man, Pierre Antoine, out right away. And then I'll follow later. Goodbye, John. What's all that about, Mr. Chameleon? Are you going out to Colby's in disguise? Right you are, Dave. Disguised as Pierre Antoine, the police department's chief man on jewels. Now you will come with me. And the instant we get there and you introduce me, arrest John and Laura Colby on my orders. Well, orders are orders, but I don't get you, Mr. Chameleon. Why not pinch them and be done with it? Because I need the evidence. I think their father, Raymond Colby, will give me, Dave. And so, a little later, we find Detective Arnold with Mr. Chameleon in his disguise as Pierre Antoine at the murder house, as Dave Arnold says. Evening, everybody. This gentleman is the police department's jewel expert. Mr. Chameleon sent him out. Pierre Antoine at your service. Uh, you, uh, Mr. Raymond Colby, monsieur? Yes, yes, Mr. Uh, Antoine. This is my daughter, Laura. Mademoiselle. How do you do? And uh, my son, John. Monsieur Jean. Uh, may we all sit down? Or uh, perhaps you, Mademoiselle Laura, will be so kind as to bring the remaining jewels from the uh, robbery for me to see. Sorry, Monsieur Antoine, but Mr. Chameleon ordered me to arrest this lady and her brother and bring them back to headquarters. Uh, that is absurd, Detective Arnold. Surely Mr. Uh, Chameleon is making a mistake. Mr. Chameleon is a fool. We won't go, Laura. Detective Arnold can't arrest us without a warrant. Here's the warrant, John. Better come quietly. Uh, John, John, you, you can only cause yourself and Laura trouble by not going with Detective Arnold. But, Father... You've got the right idea, Mr. Colby. Now, oh, come on, John and Laura. No point getting tough about it. Uh, my compliment to uh, Mr. Chameleon, uh, Detective Arnold. And uh, be good enough to express my opinion that he is making a most stupid blunder. You're arresting two such charming young people. Stupid or not, I'm taking them, Monsieur Antoine. Good night. Good night. Oh, a dreadful contretemps, Monsieur Colby. I thought better of that uh, chameleon. But there is your police mind. Uh, Mr. Antoine, did you bring the jewels recovered from the man who robbed my safe? In this very bag, Monsieur Colby, the uh, robber was the father of the housemaid murdered here today. Your uh, fiancé, I am told. Hand over those jewels, chameleon. What? Shut up, chameleon. I'm doing the talking now. Give me that bag, quick. They're the only evidence you've got that I killed that infernal housemaid, Fanny Bilkins. Now let's have them. When I take you in, Raymond Colby, it'll be for two murders. But, um, anyway, here are the jewels. You're not taking me in. No? By the time they find your body, chameleon, I'll be out of the country. Got any last wishes, cop? Mm Mm-hmm. I'd like to tell you how I caught up with you, Raymond Colby. I'm interested, but hold your gab to three minutes. Through a careful study of police records extending from New York to Sydney, Australia. You murdered the woman who owned those jewels, Lady Ashton Burl, in Australia five years ago. That's past history, Chameleon, but suppose I did. The one living man who knew you did was your murdered housemaid's father, a petty criminal named Ed Bilkins. And he followed you here forced you to hire his daughter Fanny as a maid in your house and then blackmailed you into a promise to marry her with your mysteriously and criminally acquired wealth. Anything else, Chameleon? You've got 30 seconds left. Only this, Raymond. (coughs) Don't move, Colby. You hear me, Colby? I said don't move. That's odd. He doesn't answer. Colby? What? Hmm. Oh, why did I have to become a policeman? Police headquarters? This is Chameleon. Connect me with Detective Arnold, please. Dave? Listen, Dave. Send the dead wagon out, please. Yes, the dead wagon. Well, I'm afraid I killed a man. Yes, the murder of Fanny Bilkins. I hit a fatal spot by mistake. I know, Dave, it's all in the line of duty, but still... And with these words, Mr. Chameleon concludes tonight's murder case.
Listen next Wednesday night at the same time for Mr. Chameleon, the man of many faces. The part of Mr. Chameleon is played by Carl Swenson with dialogue by Frank Hummert from the original story by Frank and Ann Hummert. Music directed by Victor Arden. The members of our cast join with our sponsors in wishing all their listeners a Merry Christmas. Your announcer is Howard Claney. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. find this a strange place, don't you? And you're wondering about a lot of things. Who I am, why I brought you here, and what's going to happen to you. Who I am and why you are here are not important, but, uh, <laughs> yes, I'll be glad to tell you what's going to happen to you. You're going to die, both of you. <laughs> Midnight, the witching hour when the night is darkest, our fears the strongest, and our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight, when the graves gape open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a moment in The Dark Chamber. <laughs> Midnight, Tales of Mystery and Terror by Radio's Masters of the Macabre. Our story by Robert Newman is The Dark Chamber. Police headquarters, Ryan speaking. Hello, police. Listen, you've got to help me. You've got to. I don't know how you can... Hold on there. What's your name? My name's Watson, Joe Watson. I'm a driver for the Ajax Sanitary Hand Laundry, and I... Address? Where I am, you mean? I, I don't know. That's part of the trouble I... Oh, now, look, buddy. Now, wait, listen. I know it sounds crazy, but it's true. Check the laundry. Check the veterans. I'm an ex-GI. They'll tell you I'm straight. It's... Well, I'm in a room someplace. I, I don't know where it is or how I got here or what I'm here for. I don't even know how long I've been here. It's, it's a big room, but funny. No doors, no windows that I can see. Just a couple of chairs and a table with this phone on it. Walls are gray, rough, like soundproofing, and... I'm scared. Well, what do you expect us to do? Find me. Find out what this is all about and get me out of here. Well, I don't know. How... Listen, this isn't a gag, can't you tell? You don't know what it's like just sitting here waiting, not knowing where or why or what's going to happen. Can't you trace this call or something? Well, okay. Hang on. Thank the Lord. I was afraid that... Listen, I hear something. Someone's coming. I better hang up. I'll call you back later if I can. How do you do? Who are you? My name's Helmut. Dr. John Helmut. And your name? I don't have to tell you anything. That's very true. Though I didn't think you were aware of it. I think I already know everything about you that I'm interested in knowing. Like what? Name? Joseph Watson. Age? 26. Occupation? Employee of the Ajax Laundry. Honorably discharged from the army six months ago with a bronze star and purple heart. What... So you went through my pockets, huh? Well, if you know that much, you know I haven't got any dough. Money? I'm not interested in money. Well, what do you want, then? Where is this place? The last thing I remember is making a delivery on Spruce Street. Noticing that the lights were out in the hall and hearing a noise behind me. You or somebody slugged me. <laughs> That's right. Well, will you stop grinning like that and tell me what this is all about? Of course. I brought you here because I need your help in an experiment. An experiment whose details I've already worked out with mice, rats, Cats and other animals. What? What kind of an experiment? An experiment in fear. Fear? Yes. You fought in the war and you were wounded. 
That means you've probably known fear. And still you won the bronze star. That means you overcame it. The question is, can you overcome your present fears? What are you talking about? Do you think I have to take your blood pressure, calculate your skin tension and adrenal discharge to tell that you're afraid? Nothing has happened to you yet. Absolutely nothing. And yet you are afraid, aren't you? You're afraid because you're face to face with the unknown. Because you don't know what I want, what I'm planning to do. That is as it should be. And that is the way we will leave it for the moment. Hey, wait a minute. Come back here. Come back. You can't. Hello, operator. Get me to the police. Hello, police. This is Joe Watson again. Listen, I got a little more dope. I don't know if it'll help, but there was a guy in here just now. Said his name was he Helmy. John Helmy. That's probably a phony. He's about 50, tall, over six foot, white hair and gray eyes. No, I still don't know what it's all about. Have you been able to trace this number yet? How long will it take? Okay, I'll hang on, but... The lights just went out. The room's pitch dark and someone's coming in again. I better stop. But please, hurry. Who's that? Who just came in? Who, who are you? A girl. Keep away from me. Keep away, do you hear? Keep away? What's the angle now? Angle? Why did you bring me here? Wait a minute. You mean he put the snatch on you, too? When I was on my way home. Chloroform or something. And the next thing I knew... But why are you pretending? You're in on it, too. You must be. It's a trap. It's a trap, all right. But I'm not in on it. I'm in it, along with you. My name's Watson, Joe Watson. I'm... Betty Grant. You, you swear? I swear. What would I lie about it for? I don't know. I don't know anything, but... No, I... I don't think you're lying. Two of us now. I wonder why he put you in here, put us together. Who is he? What's he going to do? I don't know. He said something about an experiment, a, an experiment in fear, but... Listen, we got to get out of here. Somehow, some way. Shh. He may be listening. <laughs> Very astute, my dear. Of course I'm listening. But where are you? Right here. I've been here all the time. Who are you? No, Joe, don't. He must want you to go for him. He's probably got a gun. Right again, my dear. Not that I'll need it. This is stage two of the experiment. A new stimulus to action has been introduced. Man against the unknown has become man and woman against the unknown. Look, let's get down to brass tacks. Be sensible about this. Certainly, Joe. That's why I won't need my gun. This new stimulus has been negated by an increased sense of responsibility. Responsibility towards the girl, and therefore by increased fear. Why, you. Gun or no gun, if I can get my hands on you. Where are you? Where are you? Outside now, so you can relax. That was the final stimulus in this stage. Injured pride. The discovery that I could read your inmost thoughts, knew exactly what you were going to do. But you mustn't let that bother you. I already know everything you're going to do. From now on, till the end. Listen, you. Help me. Help me! It's gone. Joe. I know. Hold on, baby. Don't let her get you. Must be a way, some way. Do you suppose he's still listening? Hard to say. But I'm going to take a chance. There's one thing he didn't figure on. The telephone. Here? Yeah. If I can find it again in the dark. It was... Oh, here. Here it is. I put through two calls already to the police. Told them what was happening and asked them to get me out of here. I had to hang on both times before they could trace the call to get this number. This time I'm going to... Hello, hello. What? Operator. No, this isn't the operator. You're on a busy wire. It doesn't matter. Thank heavens I got somebody. I've been trying for about ten minutes now. Look, get off the line, will you? I've got to get through to the police. It's terribly important. But you've got to help me. You've got to. My name is Ben Missouri, and I'm a prisoner someplace. I don't know where. Oh, what? It's true. A strange house somewhere. A doctor who says his name is Helmy. <laughs> what are you laughing at? What is it, Joe? What is it? I haven't got any clues. Hello, hello. I've got a guy named... I'm sorry, Ben. It's no use. What do you mean? We're in the same boat you are. A girl named Betty Grant and myself. Helmy's got us locked up, too. Yeah. Said he knew everything we were thinking, everything we were going to do. I did get through to the police before, but I guess he caught wise. 
We're talking to each other over an inside line. Yeah, we're through. Don't say that, Joe. Don't even think it. Look, ask him exactly where he is. Just where are you, Ben? Do you know? Hard to say. I was out cold when he brought me here. It's a kind of a hall or passageway. Cement floor, ceiling, stone walls. It doesn't seem to be any door or open or anything like that. That's what I thought here, too, but there must be one. Well, how would he have gotten you in there? Listen, start looking. See if you can find it. Then if the three of us can get together, we ought to be able to figure something out. Hold on. I'll start pounding on the walls. You see if you hear anything. Go ahead. What's he doing? I'm going to knock on the walls to see if he's anywhere near us. If he is, if he can find a door and we can get together. You hear anything? I'm not sure. Maybe. I'm not sure either. It sounds awful far away as if... There, listen. That wall right there. Hello. Hello, Ben. Yes. We heard you. You're right next to us. Now you listen and Betty will knock back. Go ahead, Betty. That way you'll be able to tell just which wall it is. Okay. All right. I hear it. I know where it is. Now to find a door. There is one. Hold on. He's got it. He's going to see if there's a door. There must be one. There must be. Ben. Ben. Hello. What is it, Joe? I don't know. I thought I heard something. A, a yell and then... Joe, look. There is a door there. It's opening and... <gasps> you. Dr. Helm. Why, yes. Were you expecting someone else? An experiment in fear. Yes, I think someone else was expected. And still is. But not for a little while yet. Not until the clock strikes 12 for... Murder! At midnight! <laughs> And now, back to Murder at Midnight and The Dark Chamber. It's just a moment later now. Standing in the darkness of the strange room, two frightened young people stare at the tall figure of the doctor, silhouetted against the dim light from outside. They catch a fleeting glimpse of a long corridor and of something lying on the floor. Then Helming steps into the room, shutting the door behind him. I asked whether you were expecting someone else. Then, then it was just a trick. It was you on the phone all the time. No. Don't you think I'd know his voice? Where is he? Our friend, Mr. Lazari. Right outside. What'd you do to him, Anthony? What'd you do to him? Don't you know? Sure I know. You killed him. You... Did you kill him? Quite a state you've gotten yourself into. Why? Is it because you finally tried to do something about your predicament and failed? Because getting together with Lazari would have been a kind of victory, indicating there was a chance of escaping? Or is it because you weren't sure whether I would kill or not? And because you still don't know? You're mad. Really mad. I wasn't sure before, but I am now. You're just not normal. Really? And just what does being normal mean? Doesn't it depend on geography, other factors? In Nazi Germany under Hitler, wasn't it the norm to hate, despise democracy, believe in violence, lies, and murder? It sure was. But this isn't Germany. True. And also true that by American standards, you are normal and I am not. And it's because you are normal, with normal reactions and inhibitions, that I brought you here for study. But you will be interested to know... You have not done, nor will do, one thing that I did not foresee. Every move you made, every emotion you felt, was charted, outlined, and... What's that? That, I think, is probably the police. Police? Yes. I know that you're very anxious to talk to them, and, well, I'll see that you get a chance to soon. <laughs> Good evening, officer. I'm looking for a guy named Helming. Dr. Helming. Oh, I'm Dr. Helming. Uh, come in, won't you? Okay, thanks. This is, well, a kind of a funny business. It's about a phone call we got a while ago. Finally traced here. From a guy who said he was a prisoner or something. And uh, that, that must have been Watson. Well, yeah, that was his name, Joe Watson. You know him? Of course. I can't tell you how sorry I am. It, 
It was really very careless of me, and I'll see that it doesn't happen again. What do you mean? Well, if you did any investigating, which I'm sure you did, then you know that I, well, I don't run a sanitarium exactly, but I do take a few patients, uh, mental cases, uh, for treatment. Oh, so that's it. A nut, huh? Oh, I, I wish you wouldn't say that. The war years have been a great strain on all of us. And there were those who just couldn't take it. Watson, for instance, and my other patient, uh, Betty Grant. Two of them, huh? What's their trouble? Well, Watson's case is particularly interesting. A 4F who wasn't able to enlist. He developed a sense of guilt which became too much for him, turned into a persecution mania. Thinks that everyone is down on him, huh? Well, not everyone exactly. His present fantasy is that he's an ex-GI and that I'm keeping him prisoner. You see, since he wasn't able to fight in the war... He's cast me in the role of the enemy, and he's fighting against me. Any hope for him? Definitely. Miss Grant's problems, however, are more complex. But the interesting thing is that when she's with him, she takes over his delusion and shares it with him. Sure sounds plenty tough. Well, I guess I'll run along. I'm sorry I bothered you. Well, don't you want to see them, First Officer, and talk to them? Oh, there's no need of that, Doctor. We get calls from cranks every day. We always investigate, of course. But, but... I insist... After all, you, you only have uh, my word for it. However, there's... Uh, well, there is just one thing I'd like to caution you about. I, I know. You want me to play along w with them. Right. Oh, don't worry. I'll humor them. Oh, splendid. Uh, right in here. Oh, quite a room. Uh, air conditioned. Uh, much better than having windows with bars on them. Joe, look. It, it is a cop. And that means that... And you did get my message. Sure, Joe. Took a little time to trace the call, but uh, everything is okay now. Oh, thank heaven. Such a screwy story. I was afraid that... Wait a minute. Why is he standing there like that? Why haven't you got the bracelets on him? Dr. Helming? Oh, no need for any rough stuff. He said he'd come along quietly. What? But you... You're lying. I don't know why, but there's something wrong here. You think we made the whole thing up that we're crazy. Oh, now, now, now. It's true. He told you we were and you believed him. Good Lord, haven't you got eyes in your head? Would two of us be crazy in just the same way? Well, of course not, and I'm telling stop you... Stop it, will you? Stop talking like that. If I could only prove it to you somehow, I'll show you. I know. Lazari. Joe. Murder. That'll open your eyes. Somewhere in that wall there, a door. Make it. Make him open it. Show you what's behind it. I think maybe I'd better be going, Doc. But there is a door, officer. Uh, just a second and I'll open it for you. Here we are. Joe, the body, it, it's gone. <laughs> These doctors, they're always hiding the bodies. If it turns up again later, give us another ring. <laughs> uh, uh, can I go out this way, Doc? Uh, down to the end of the corridor, then uh, to your right. I'm sorry I gave you all this trouble. Well, perfectly all right, and, and thank you for being so understanding. Goodbye. So long. Well, children? Don't look that way, Joe. Don't. I know what you're thinking, and it's not true. We're not crazy. There was a body there. Of course. You hid it when you went out to let the cop in. And the telephone, you left that there purposely. You wanted me to use it to get the police here. Obviously. I told you that this was to be an experiment in fear. What I didn't tell you was that, in a sense, I was one of the subjects, too. It was important for me to learn how I would function under pressure. And speaking objectively, I think I'd... Did rather well, don't you? But why? Why are you doing all this? What are you after? Well, there's no reason why I shouldn't tell you. If anyone truly understands the nature of fear, is able accurately to forecast the actions and reactions of an individual, then he can use fear as a weapon. For society will react as the individual reacts. You see, society doesn't want to believe that anything can menace it. Doesn't want to take action to protect itself. Any more than the individual had does. This was something that Hitler and Mussolini understood intuitively. I understand it scientifically. They failed, but I shall succeed. You... You mean that you... I'm afraid that's all I have time for. As far as you two are concerned, the experiment is finished. Completely finished. I have a few arrangements to take care of, and then... Well, make the most of these last few minutes... Well, they will be your last. Joe. Joe, do you hear anything? Is he coming back? Not 
yet. He, he's going to kill us, isn't he? Just the way he killed Lazari. He's going to try to. Why are you sitting there like that, looking at me? Hmm? I guess because it's the first chance I've had to look at you. How do you mean? Well, when he first put you in here, it was all dark. And so many things happened after that. It's funny. What is? The things that you can tell about a person even in the dark. I kind of thought you were little. I knew you were awful nice and had a lot of nerve, but I didn't think you'd be so pretty. I'm not so pretty, Joe. And I'm not very brave either. I'm, I'm scared. I'm awful scared. I don't want to die. Don't worry about it, baby. Don't think about it. But just sitting here like this, waiting. And there's nothing we can do. Every time we did try to do something, it was something he knew about, was expecting us to do it. Please, baby. Joe, something's happened to you. You were scared before, too. But now... This... Well, this is going to sound kind of funny, especially now, but... Well, do you have anyone special? Uh, a fella, I mean, that... that... Why, why, no, Joe. At least, not exactly. Well, that's swell. I, I mean, well, gee, it's a shame we never met before. If we had, we wouldn't be here now. I mean, well, we probably would have been out together someplace and... Say, what time do you get through work usually? About six. The store closes at 5.30, but... Me too. I could have picked you up about six and Joe, then... Joe, you still haven't told me what you're going to do. What's the difference? Just as long as somebody does something. But... Joe, I hear something. He's coming. Yeah, okay, get up. Open that corner of the room so we see you, see you as soon as he opens the door. But, but what about you? What... I'll be waiting over here, behind the door. But Joe... I know I haven't got much of a chance, but... Wish me luck. Joe, no, please, you. All right, my young friends. Time. All my arrangements have been completed, and. Where's Watson? Right here. What are you doing? What? Joe, look Give where he's that. <laughs> oh. It's okay, baby. He didn't get me. I had the barrel of the gun, and. Good Lord, it got him in the chest. But you couldn't have done that. You couldn't have. Outside, Betty. See if you can find another phone. All right. Call the police again. And this time, tell them to bring an ambulance. All right. But you, you couldn't have done it, I tell you. It was all plotted, craft, worked out in detail. I knew just what you were going to do, how you would react. By this time, you ought to be in a state of complete frustration, resigned, ready to die. Why did you do it? Why? I don't know. Now, now just take it easy, and then... Yeah, I've got to know. You've got to tell me. Was it because of the girl? Out of desperation? Because you knew you were to die anyway? I tell you, I don't know. I just know that, well, uh, a guy will take just so much pushing around. Lying there, Dr. Helming stares uncomprehendingly at the young man who bends over him. Then suddenly, a look of fear comes over his face. And even as he tries to draw away, his eyes glaze. And he, too, passes into a dark chamber, a haunted room which has no exit as the clock strikes 12 for murder at midnight. Remember to be with us again when a door that is no door opens and the clock Strike 12 for... Murder! At midnight! Joe Watson was played by Bill Quinn. Dr. Helming was Harold Young. With music by Charles Paul, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leader. This program is copyrighted material of RadioVault.com. All rights reserved.
Material of RadioVault.com. All rights reserved. Material of RadioVault.com. All rights reserved. Material of RadioVault. Murder by experts. Mutual Broadcasting System presents Murder by Experts with your host and narrator, Mr. John Dixon Carr, world-famous mystery novelist whose books have been translated into 17 languages and have sold over 10 million copies and author of the recently published detective novel, Below Suspicion. Good evening. This is John Dixon Carr. Each week at this time, Murder by Experts brings you a story of crime and mystery which has been chosen for your approval by one of the world's leading detective writers. Tonight, our guest expert is the noted mystery writer, Miss Helen Riley. From her vast knowledge of the field of mystery, Miss Riley has selected a fast-moving, taut drama by Maurice Zim. And now we present William Zuckert in Return Trip. Our scene, a small, plainly furnished hospital room, late at night. The patient, a man in his late thirties, is flat on his back, staring up with pain-filled eyes at the ceiling. He raises his head slowly as the door to his room is opened. Nurse? Yes, there's someone to see you. Yeah? This is Superintendent Andrews of the State Institution. Oh, what have, what have you got there? I've uh, set up a recording machine out in the hall. Careful of the wire, nurse, when you close the door. The doctor said not to keep him. Yes, I'll make it as brief as possible. You may go now, nurse. Very well. Do you uh, mind if I hook this microphone at the head of the bed? Suit yourself, fella. Well, it was a choice between a recording machine and a stenographer, and I figured that in your condition... I... Well, who said I was beefing? Go on, ask. Ask your questions. I have only one question. What happened? You mean I... I can tell this in my own way? (laughs) It's great. Had an uncle once, you know, that was a writer. He wouldn't have gone near this kind of a story, though, with a ten-foot pen. No, he went in for happy endings. Uncle Mort wouldn't either even have liked the beginning of this story. It was kind of dreary-like up there at the asylum that afternoon. There'd been quite a snowfall the week before, and as far as the eye could see, everything was a dirty gray, like a, like a corpse that's been waiting too long for the undertaker. Well, around four o'clock, it got so dark, the lights had to be turned on in the institution. Then the wind started moaning like a lonely banshee. Fine day for a murder, as the fellow said. Well, there were three passengers sitting in the bus when I went outside for the return trip. Two men and a woman. Maybe I ought to call her a girl, because she wasn't much more than that. Anyway, these three passengers all had return tickets, and I went down the aisle collecting. Driver, how soon do we start? Right away, miss. We're two minutes late already. These little jerkwater bus lines never keep you their schedules. Now I'll never get out of these mountains before that blizzard lets loose. Can I have your ticket, please, mister? You really think there'll be a storm? Can't fail. Lady, when they have snow up in these godforsaken mountains. Now, this morning on the bus coming up... A man was telling me about the time... The windbag was sitting right across the aisle from the girls, second row from the front. Halfway back in the bus sat the third passenger, all huddled up in his overcoat. He didn't open his trap. 
Well, that was the picture as we swung out onto the highway for the return trip. And this guy in back of me seemed to be itchy to start a conversation with somebody as soon as we got rolling. Might as well get acquainted, miss. Fifty miles before we get to civilization. John Willard's the name. I said... Oh, I beg your pardon. Were you speaking to me? Oh, yes. I'm afraid I was thinking of... Oh, sure. Sure, these visits to the institution, always depressing, aren't they? This is my first time. Oh, some friend? My... my husband. Oh, that's too bad. I, uh, I hope... What's that? Some kind of siren. Yeah, that's the, uh, asylum alarm, all right. Well, that means he... One of the inmates must be playing hide-and-seek with the keepers. That happens every once in a while. Gosh, what if it's my brother? Oh, is he the busting-out kind? Oh, it sort of upsets him to see one of the family, but then we don't come to see him, and it sips him even more. I see what you mean. Do they always catch them? Well, they tell me the place has never lost a customer yet. A moment ago, I was praying that it wasn't Jim. But now I... I don't know, even if they had to. Well, it, it would be better than seeing him as he was today. Anything would would be better than Listen. seeing him. Hey, that's a police siren. Sounds like they're almost on top of us. Yeah, there they are. Look out, they're going to pass us. Pass nothing, they're flagging me down. All right, now just keep your seats, everybody. Guards. With rifles. We're looking for somebody. Uh, yeah, we heard the asylum alarm and... Seen have... anyone along the road? No, not even a jackrabbit. Officer, who is it you... Greg, Steve Greg. Oh. That's a relief. Holly, take yourself a walk down the aisle. Keep your rifle ready when you look behind those back seats. Are you kidding? Hey, uh, when was this coming out party? I don't know. Maybe as much as a couple of hours ago. Oh. Does this Greg have a gun? I can't guarantee he hasn't. But it was a file that sprung him. A tiny steel file. Must have been working away at the bar since the day he was committed. A month ago. His stay was short. Nobody back here. Now check the gents for identification. I know how it is, driver. Can't take chances. Well, of course not. Uh, here's mine. Okay. I didn't really mean that. Your name, well, Frank Keniston? You can read, can't you? Friendly cuss, ain't you? You know, that's the first peep that passenger has let out. I was beginning to think he was a deaf mute. Yeah. Well, here, driver, you can have the stuff back. Oh, thanks. What about you, mister? It's okay, Holly. His name's John Willard. I checked his identification. Okay, Doc. Come on, then. Let's cram. We gotta find Greg before he finds anybody. Yeah. Driver, you can turn around and go back. Go back? Go back why? Look, this Greg is a killer. A ruthless, senseless killer. What I mean is, when the mood strikes him, he strikes. Oh, What's that got to do with us turning back? Didn't I tell you this guy kills even without reason? Now he's got plenty of reason. He's got to get out of these mountains, but quick. If he's down the road, there are a lot of ways he could stop a bus. I say turn back. But that blizzard's liable to break any minute. We could be snowbound up here for days. If I had to spend even one night in that institution, so help me, they'd have to keep me there. Listen, driver. Now, just a second, Mr. Willard. You're just one passenger. There are three. What about you, miss? Well... Whatever you say. Uh, Mr. Uh, Keniston? I say keep going. That settles it. Hurry up, Dan. No, wait. Uh, uh, what does this killer Greg look like? Mm, height about 5 feet 10. Weight about 165. Dark hair, brown eyes, 37 years old. Denton, get the lead out of your britches. But I still think they we ought to... We warned them, didn't we? Now, if they meet up with them, it's their funeral. Yeah, well, we can take care of ourselves, fellas. Well, after the guards left, I really set that bus to rolling. Out of the mirror up above the driver's seat, I could see that the girl was plenty scared, but she had nerve, I'll say that for her. Willard, the windbag across the aisle from her, gave up trying to draw her into a conversation. And as for the third passenger, Keniston, sitting halfway toward the back, he kept acting like a clam afraid of losing its oyster. Might as well have had lockjaw, if you get what I mean. 
Well, we hadn't gone more than another mile or two before the wind started to rise. Kept it up until you'd have thought all the devils in hell were trying to break loose. Got black as the inside of a tomb until the snow started to fall. But with that wind whipping it around, it didn't exactly fall. It was a real howling blizzard. This is getting on my nerves. What have we got here anyway? A collection of zombies? Somebody say something. I was uh, just going to say... You were going to say the weather is rotten. Yeah, and she can say that again. No, that isn't what I was going to say. No? Hurrah. That'll give us two topics of conversation. We'll save the weather for later. Well, go ahead, lady. I can't think of a better antidote for the screaming Mimi's right now than your voice. Uh, it occurred to me why the guards asked for identification. Yeah? The description of Killer Greg. Five foot ten, 165 pounds. Dark hair, brown eyes, 37 years old. So what? It's a remarkable thing. That description would fit you, Mr. Willard. Oh? And Mr. Keniston. What's that? Me? And, for, for that matter, the driver. Say, now look. We... Hey, come to think of it, all three of us could fit that description. So could a million other men. Forget it. Forget it. Keniston, what's eating you anyway? First you sit back there like a mummy, then when you finally do one... I don't happen to feel like talking. Yeah? Well, personally, the more I think of what she said, the more remarkable it becomes. Yeah. She's got something there. Only remarkable isn't the word. Mr. Willard, what are you thinking? This man, Greg, may be insane, but he's not dumb. Oh, no. Put yourself in his place. He knows he hasn't got a ghost of a chance making his getaway in that hospital clothing, see? So he borrows the wardrobe and identification of some stranger. You follow me? We're way ahead of you, Willard. It wouldn't be difficult for a killer. Say not. But that still isn't the end of his problem, see? He's fighting against time. He's got to get out of these godforsaken mountains down to civilization before they can throw a noose around the whole area. And he knows that if he's brought back alive, he'll be wearing a straitjacket until he's as old as Methuselah. Well, you've got quite an imagination, Willard. Thanks. Now, the odds that Greg will be able to get himself transportation are mighty slim, except for this bus line. So let's suppose... Yeah, you got a great imagination, all right. You got it all figured out. It's a bit too pad, if you ask me. Remember, please, you're the one who was so dead set against turning back. Really, Keniston? Well, I'll leave it to the lady here and the driver. Do I look insane? Well? Search me. There were times, long periods of time, when Jim didn't either. My husband, I mean. That was the terrible part of it. He he would be just like the old days, and we'd be so happy together, and then all of a sudden, without warning, he would... It's Keniston has been acting crazy, not me. I'll bet it wouldn't take a half a dozen psychiatrists to prove that he... Hey, an avalanche! It's coming down on us! Hold on! After the avalanche struck, I... I sat there, gripping the steering wheel, sort of... sort of stunned. And there wasn't a sound except for the wind... And it was muffled by the snow barrier that packed us in. Even on the far side, the bus was buried up to the middle of the windows. Well, all this was only a matter of seconds, I suppose. And then suddenly the quiet was broken by the most gosh-awful racket. It was as if somebody had up and given the signal for my passengers to go completely crazy. Get me out of here. Now, take it easy, will Get you? Get me out of here. Look out, Will. It's got an axe. The axe. Go of it, will it? Let go of that axe. Well, that did it. He's the one. He's the one. Lucky I saw him grab the fire axe from up on the rack. It's what the district attorney likes to call a, a lethal weapon. And then some. 
Step back. He's coming too. Yeah, tie him up. Yeah, you'll find a rope in the dashboard compartment. Get it for me, huh? Uh, driver, I'll report you for this. You will, huh? I was going to smash a window so we could get out of here. Oh, yeah? Sure. What'd you think? Oh, so that's it. Here's a rope, driver. Thanks. Please, you can't do that. You can't tie me up, you fools. I'm not Killer Greg. Maybe. Maybe, maybe he isn't. Maybe. But like the guard says, we can't take chances. Now, if you're innocent, mister, you can prove it to the authorities. If we ever live that long. Have you forgotten that we're trapped here by an avalanche and a blizzard that could go on and on and on? Just the same. Hey, stop, could... stop. This is ridiculous. What do you mean, miss? Well, it's just that there's no proof that Killer Greg is on this bus. Well, if you, if you put it that way, I... It's all I... my fault, and I, I'm very sorry. My only excuse is that I was so upset by seeing Jim, my husband. I still say that... No, Colin... no. We've got to start acting like rational human beings. You let poor Mr. Willard up from that floor. Thanks, lady. All right. But I'm warning you, Willard, no funny stuff. Oh, snap out of a driver. We've got to get out of this mess. Hand me that axe. Do I look that dumb? All right, then use it yourself. Smash a window so we can crawl out. Willard, what makes you think the windows won't open? Huh? Then open one. What for? To let in the blizzard? But we've got to get out of here. Not me. Take a bear to make even a city block in that blizzard. But we can't stay here. Why not? We're not freezing yet. Driver's right. Our best chance is to sit pat until the storm lets up. But what if it doesn't? If and when the weather clears, we can send out a party for help, huh? Yeah, or maybe a road clearing crew will come to our rescue. Yes. I, I suppose that's the same thing to do. Wait here. Well, how about you, Willard? You also decided to do the same thing? I don't like that crack, Keniston. One more like now it. Now, look, we're not starting that again. That's going to be a long night. We might just as well make ourselves comfortable and try to get some sleep. Sleep? Cut it out. Miss, you, uh, you take the back seat. That's the only one that runs the full width of the bus. You can use your lap robe for a quilt, huh? All right, driver. I, uh, want to apologize again to everyone for the way I behaved. Casting suspicion. Forget it, forget it. Need any help? No, no, thanks. I don't know what came over me starting that idiotic talk. Please, bel- What? What's the matter? Why are you staring at the floor? Well, say something. Look. Look! A file. A tiny steel file. On the t- After the avalanche hit, there was a mad scramble. One of you lost it then. One of you is Greg. Killer Greg. Let me out of there! Let me out of there! Well, we just let her wear herself out, kicking and banging on the door. Nobody said a word. Willard and Keniston just stared at me and at each other. By and by, the girls stopped her fussing to stand and stare at the three of us in rotation. But it made your flesh crawl. And outside, the blizzard was getting worse, if possible. Finally, I reached into the watch pocket of my pants and brought out the old timepiece. What? What time is it? Uh, broke the crystal, uh... Still says a quarter to four. It's 5.30. It's only an hour and a half since we started out. Only an hour and a half. 5.30 in the afternoon. And at the very best, we're stuck until morning. 14, 16 hours. Might as well be forever. Now, look, miss, we just got to make the best of it. I still think you ought to go back to the rear seat. And sleep? If you can, yeah. Willard, uh, the driver, and myself will be keeping a rather uh, close eye on each other in the light of recent developments. You'll be all right, especially if you take that axe away from the driver. Huh? Let her have it for her protection. Sure. Let her have it. Yes. You give it to me. Okay. You, uh, holding on to the file, too? Of course she is. 
The file could also be a lethal weapon. Well, she took the axe and the file back to the rear seat with her, and we all sat down to wait. Have you ever fought against sleep? With the cold numbing you and the wind lulling you? <laughs> you know, sometimes even the fear of sudden death can't win against those odds. Time and time again, the girl's eyes would close just for a second. And then they stayed closed longer, and her head nodded and her body slumped over against the corner of the seat. I got up and started down the aisle. Where you going? Shh, Keniston, can't you see she's asleep? Where are you going? Her lap robe slipped to the floor. I was going to pick it up and cover her so she wouldn't freeze. Any objections? I'll do it. Oh, no, you won't, Keniston. Go ahead, driver. Now, you see, Keniston, Willard thinks I should do it. It makes it two to one. like a devil on a pinwheel. I was lucky to tear loose before she did any more than nick me about the face. Afterwards, when Willard told her what I was up to, she apologized, but I didn't go near her again all the rest of that night. Well, about five o'clock, the blizzard stopped, and at seven, the sun managed to break through. We held a council of war. We can't send out for help. Why not? Don't you see, Mr. Willard? If we split up the men, whichever of you is Greg, would have too good an opportunity. Whether he goes or stays. Well, you could go alone. I'd never make it. We could all go together. How about that, driver? Well, I'd, I'd rather stick with the bus, Keniston. But before we decide anything, let's get out and look around. We got a window open on the far side of the bus and crawled through. The girl first. She was still clutching the axe and the file. Come here and look. Another few yards and we'd have escaped the avalanche entirely. We can shovel our way out. I'm sure we can. Well, there were two shovels in the tool compartment at the tail guard of the bus. That only let two men shovel at a time with the third man getting a breather meanwhile. And it took a lot of shoveling. What's the matter, driver? Did you hurt your hand? Nothing much. Feels good just to take off these stiff leather gloves. Looks to me like uh, you've got some blisters on that right hand. Thumb and first two fingers. Say, Keniston, are you shoveling or talking? We'll never get out of here at this rate. Well, it's your turn anyway. I'm tired. Not as tired as Willard looks. I'll relieve him. No, no, no. That's all right. I, I can keep going yet for a while. Okay, then, Keniston. Here. Let me take a turn. I know I won't be much help, but I, I can at least try. No, you're a mounting guard. I'm sure you could do as well as Kenneth. Where is Keniston? Why? Oh! Keniston was making a mad dash through the snow. Willard dropped his shovel and tore after him. I yelled for Willard to let him go, but I don't think he even heard me. For a while, it looked like Keniston was going to make it, but then he floundered and fell in the snowdrift. And before he could get underway again, Willard nailed him. <laughs> You'll stay put for a while. What did you do? Knock him out? What else was there to do? Is he? Oh. I knew all the time it was Keniston. You think his running away proves it? It's the same as if he'd confessed. He knew it was his last and only chance. Well, what are we going to do with him now? Tie him up. And we're getting him and the bus out of here. Say, I wonder if there's a reward. In no time at all, we had the bus clear and headed for civilization. Those snow-covered mountain roads weren't exactly my idea of a speedway, but I gave the motor the gun. Willard and the girl didn't take their eyes off Keniston. I kept watching him, too, out of the mirror over the driver's seat. Uh, he looks like he's coming, too. Don't worry, driver. Those knots I made in the rope won't give. Besides, I'm keeping the axe handy just in case. 
He's opening his sure. eyes. Watch him now. Watch him. Yeah. Yeah, watch me. And listen to me, too. Shut up, Tennyson, or I'll stop this bus and put you out for good. Not before I've had my say. Willard, you too, lady. Why do you think I tried to make a break for it? That's easy. You're killer, Greg. You fools. You blind, stupid fools. Was it my watch that had its crystal smashed at a quarter of four yesterday afternoon? So it was mine. So what? At a quarter of four yesterday afternoon, Killer Greg waylaid the real driver of this bus and took his place. What? Oh, no. That's how the crystal came to be broken. Shut up, Kenniston. You can't talk your way out of this. It, it could be a coincidence. Sure. Yeah, that's what I thought, too. A coincidence. Until I noticed the blisters on the thumb and first two fingers of the right hand. A file would make blisters like that. A file held in the right hand of Killer Greg. Look at him. It's true. Greg. Greg. Don't come a step closer, any of you. You make the slightest move, I'll crash the whole lot of us. Don't do it, Greg. Stop the bus. We won't do anything. It was a perfect plan. It had to work. Oh, if only that avalanche hadn't come along. Well, I'll still make it. I'll still make it, even if I have to kill us. That turn! Look out for that train! <laughs> You got all I said on your on your recording machine, huh, Super? You got you, you got it all, huh? Yeah, I'm, I'm right back where I started from. The asylum. <laughs> anyway, I I outlived those three. <laughs> I outlived those three, didn't I, Super? <laughs> Killer Greg, that's me. <laughs> Killer Greg. <laughs> And so the curtain falls on Return Trip, which was chosen by guest expert Helen Riley, whose latest thriller is Staircase 4. Next week at this time, Murder by Experts brings you a story of a woman who awakened from a nightmare to find reality even more frightening, as selected for your approval by one of America's leading detective writers. Until then... This is your host, John Dixon Carr, hoping you'll be with us next week at this time. Return Trip was written by Maurice Zinn. In our cast were William Zuckert, Anne Shepard, Roger DeCoven, Frank Behrens, and Alan Manson. Music in our program is under the direction of Emerson Buckley, composed by Richard DuPage. Murder by Experts is produced and directed by Robert A. Arthur and David Cogan. characters in this week's story were fictitious. Any resemblance to the names of actual persons living or dead was purely coincidental. This is Phil Tonkin speaking. This is the world's largest network serving more than 500 stations, the Mutual Broadcasting System.
mysterious traveler. This is the mysterious traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves, and be comfortable, if you can. Where are we going? Why, we're going to visit a man who could change the soul of a human being from one body into another. In a story I call... They who sleep. My story begins late one foggy night in a dingy little room in the slum section of a great city. The occupant of the room, a small man, white-haired, his cheeks hollow from hunger, has just admitted a visitor whom he does not know and whom he is trying to send away. An expensively dressed young woman with a heavy veil hiding her face. But, my child, it cannot be me to whom you wish to speak. You have made some mistake. I haven't made any mistake. I've been hunting for you for days. I spent a good deal of money tracing you here. But I do not understand. Why should you wish to find me, Alexander Thomas, a penniless old man You did not always use the name Alexander Thomas. Once you called yourself Chadwin the Great, hypnotist beyond compare. Chadwin the Great? Yes, I, I once used that name. But Chadwin the Great no longer exists. I am only Alexander Thomas now. Listen to me, Chadwin. We've met before. Ten years ago, you gave a performance at the Bijou Theater. Oh, there are so many Bijou Theaters. You asked for volunteers to be hypnotized. I came up on the stage. I and my sister Rose. You hypnotized her easily. But you could not hypnotize me. Oh, there were so many. I cannot remember. No, but you can remember this newspaper clipping. <laughs> old story from the newspapers. Where did you get it? It says that you, Chadwin the Great, once performed the experiment of exchanging two men's souls. By the use of secret drugs and your great powers of hypnotism, you transferred one man's soul into another man's body. You cannot believe all the newspapers say. But you did this before witnesses. And one of the two men died. You went to prison for five years for manslaughter. Why do you come here to remind an old man of his tragedies? Go, please, leave me alone. No, Chadwin. For years I've kept this clipping, for years. Never knowing what impulse made me tear it out and save it. Until last week I found it again. And then I knew. You speak not like a woman, but like a soul possessed by devils. Perhaps I am. So you can transfer souls from one body to another? No, no, I cannot. How much would you charge to do it again? Do not ask that of me. I am old. I have been in prison. How much, Chadwin? Could you put my soul into another's body for $10,000? $10,000? Yes. Then you could live like a man again, not like a starving animal in this hovel. Once before I tampered with the eternal laws, I paid the penalty. And so did one of those I experimented upon. But which one, Chadwin? The which weaker one? one? He died. The other, the strong soul in its new body, lived. Ah, then I am ready. When can you do it? Tomorrow night? But my child, why should you risk your life for that which cannot be, which was not meant to be? Look, Chadwin. I shall raise my veil. Would you call me beautiful? Even pretty? No. I'm ugly. You are not ugly. Your face is strong. But if it were not twisted by bitterness... Enough of talking. How can you know what it means to a woman to be ugly? To lose the man you love to a woman you hate? Because you are plain. And she is so beautiful. Chadwin, will you do as I ask? To help you change with one who is beautiful. To help you to be loved for just a little. My child... Perhaps it is not such a great wickedness to do that. And you'll do it? But it is only for a little while. You must understand that. For ten days, no more. Then the laws which cannot be violated with impunity require that your soul must return to your body. It's enough. It's all I want, Chadwin. Very well. 
I have here a small bottle. Here. Take it. Guard it carefully. When the moment comes, she, the other, must drink it in water. Yes. It will be easy. She will drift off to sleep. Then you, you must come to me. But not here. It would not be safe. Never mind. I know the place. The safest in the world. Very well. The exchange will be made, and I will see that she, in your body, slumbers dreamlessly. After ten days, she will wake and be herself again, with no memory whatever of what has happened. And uh, now, Miss... Vaughn. Helen Vaughn. Now, Miss Vaughn, who is this beautiful one with whom you would change places? The girl who just married the man I love. My sister, Rose Vaughn. Good morning, Bessie. Good morning, Miss Helen. Where's Miss Rose? She's gone downstairs yet? Mrs. Tabor, you must learn to say now, Miss Helen. Mrs. Tabor, then? Uh, she's in her room, Miss Helen. Is uh, Mr. Tabor with her? Yes, he is. All right, Bessie, thank you. Helen, is that you? We thought we heard your voice. Come on in. Leonard's just leaving for the office. Good morning, Helen. How's the best sister-in-law I ever had? Hello, Rose. Leonard? Darling, what's the matter? Ah, I know. Did you hear what time this young lady got in last night? It must have been quite a party. Oh, Leonard, I hope you aren't keeping tabs on Helen. No, but I did hear the clock strike three just as her door closed. Oh. <laughs> well, me for the office. First, a goodbye kiss. Oh, gosh. I sure picked myself a beautiful wife. Oh, run along, you silly. <laughs> Bye, Helen. Got a sisterly kiss for me? Leonard... Don't put your arms around me, please. Well, there's sisterly affection for you. You'd think she hated me. Oh, run along, Leonard. They probably need you downtown to polish off a big deal. Yeah, they probably do it that. Okay, I'm on the way. Bye, you two. Bye, darling. Well, Helen, you are in a mood this morning. I just think you two carry this lovey-dovey business to a ridiculous extreme. Helen, it's as if... Well, as if you... It's like seeing Leonard kiss me. You don't have to be constantly kissing him in front of... of other people, do you? Helen. Oh, my dear, I didn't realize. Didn't realize what? Didn't realize that... Oh, Helen, darling, believe me. Someday the man will come along who will mean just as much to you as... as Leonard does to me. You'll find him. I'll help you find him. Listen, I'll give some parties and invite a lot of new... Stop Rose. Let go of me. Don't go gushing over me, you idiot. Helen, how can you be so cruel? Oh, stop sniveling like that. I'm sorry, Helen, but you're always so sharp when anybody tries to be nice to you. And you, you're always so nice to everybody, so soft, so sweet. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Rose. I always forget how the least quarrel upsets you. Well, here... Drink this, Rose. There's a sedative in it. Something quite harmless. It'll soothe your nerves. Oh, all right. Oh, oh nasty stuff. Now lie down in your bed. That's it. Just a few moments now, and you'll be drifting off to slumberland, my beautiful sister. Oh, it is quick, isn't it? I feel drowsy already. You do? Huh. And you must give in to the feeling, you hear? Don't fight it. It feels so queer. It's as though I were on a boat. A little boat. Rose? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, Helen, I hear you. Seems such a long ways away. Such a long way. Rose, you're to come to me when I call you. Do you hear? Yeah. You're to sleep for a while. Then when I call, no matter where yeah. I am, 
You're to come to me. Yes, I'll come to you. I'll... She's asleep. Jadwin's drug is working. The rain! Come. Well, let it rain. Yes, let the skies open and drench the earth. Let the rain fall like a curtain. Like a cloak to hide the rebirth of Helen Vaughn. Leaving her sister Rose in a slumber so deep, it was almost death-like. Helen Vaughn hurried to her room. There she wrote a note addressed to Rose and Leonard, explaining that she had decided suddenly to go off by herself on a trip to Mexico, and that they would probably not hear from her for some time. Then she put on her hat and coat and slipped out. All day she waited in a hotel. Then when night came, she picked up Chad with the grave in a rented car and drove him through the storm into a spot well outside the city, where she turned into an ancient cemetery. There she brought the car to a stop before a low building of white marble over which ivy and moss had grown for many years. With a heavy key, she opened the massive padlock and they entered, shutting the door behind them. The air in this old mausoleum is dank odor of a charnel house. But where else could the living lie asleep, peaceful and undisturbed, as safely as here among the sleeping dead? No, I will not go through with it. You this. already have your money. You can knock back out now. Then in heaven's name, let us be finished quickly. Quickly, yes. The storm should hide the car from the cemetery guards. But we must take no chances. Now, here's a flashlight I brought. I'll turn it on. Look there, Chadwin. At the tiers of compartments this tiny stone building holds. Each compartment with its iron door. Each holding within it a coffin. In which lies the dust of a vault. I see them, yes. Twelve of them. This one, here on the bottom, is empty. Meant someday to hold the body of Helen Vaughan. Tonight it shall receive her. No, no, this is madness. I'll open it. There. See that narrow, dark compartment? So small, so quiet, so restful, so safe from disturbance. In it for the next ten days shall rest my body. Holding the soul of my sister Rose. No, no, there must be some other way. None that is safe. While my body sleeps and I am absent from it, it must be where no one can find it. And here, no one ever will. I do not like it. Hold the light. I'll slide into it. It's quite roomy enough. The stone is chilly, but what matters that to one who is asleep? Go in. Rose one, hear me. Enter the body that awaits you here. Enter quickly and wait. Leonard paced the floor, waiting for some change in the condition of his wife Rose, who all day had been in a strange stupor from which nothing could arouse her. Say, doesn't she look better? Yes, I I think she does. Um, um, She's waking up. Rose, Rose, darling, don't be frightened. Uh, uh, My Leonard. Yes, of course it's me. Who did you think it was going to be? I don't know. I was startled. I guess 
I guess I must have been dreaming. Rose, Rose, what's happened to you? Why, your voice sounds just like Helen's. Really, Leonard? That's odd. Perhaps I'm catching a cold. No, no. Now you you sound like yourself again. But for a moment, I'd, I'd have sworn it was Helen speaking. Oh, I guess I've been so worried, I'm, I'm just imagining things. Oh, Leonard, hold you close. Close, darling, close. Always, Rose. Always. Always. Yes, always. She'll never have you back. Never. What What are you saying, Rose? I was just thinking of how much I love you. So much that I'll never let anything take you away from me. Never. <laughs> days that followed, Leonard found his beautiful wife, Rose, so strangely changed. You, you've been different somehow these last ten days. In fact, ever since Helen went away so unexpectedly. Have I, Leonard? How? Well, you've been gayer, more headstrong, too. It's almost as if you'd acquired a whole new character. Well, perhaps I have. And how do you like this new wife of yours? Well, I do, and I... Don't. Oh, please, I I don't mean it. It's just that, well, I was so in love with the old Rose, it's a little hard to get used to the new. And all these bills that you're running up, why, that's not like the Rose you used to be. Oh, Leonard, I do hope you're not too mad at me because... Well, what is it this time? Another fur coat? <laughs> Worse than that. We're going to give a party. Another? Why, there's three in ten days. Rose, I forbid it. You can't, Leonard, because I've invited everybody already. Rose, it's so unlike you. You used... Why, you act more like Helen than like yourself these days. Never mind, darling. You'll get used to the change in me. In time. Ignoring her husband's displeasure, Rose, or should I say, Helen, went ahead with her plans for a party that night. And when early in the evening, a small gray-haired man presented himself at the door and asked for her, he sent word by Bessie that she would not see him. I'm sorry, Mr. Chadwin. Uh, Mrs. Tabor says she cannot see you. Um, she says she does not know anyone named Chadwin. But she does. Ten days ago I was here. I gave you an envelope for her. It had a key in it. Oh, surely you remember? Yes, but just the same, she says she doesn't know you. Now, please go, or I'll have to call an officer. Did you tell her what I said? This was the tenth day? Yes, and she said she had no idea what you were talking about. All right, I'm going. I must do what I can by myself. <laughs> the gay party went on. Miles away in the old cemetery, Chadwin the Great worked frantically with a hammer and chisel to force the padlock on the door of the mausoleum in which, unknown to the world, a sleeping girl lay hidden. Look! Got to get it open! Won't let me into a house! Don't even talk to me! Won't let me warn her! She won't... What is that? Dog's coming this way. There he is. Somebody trying to break into the barn mausoleum. The dog. I must run for it. Look out! He's getting away. Hey, you brave runner! Here comes somebody. They missed me. I've got to get back to town. I must warn her. She's got to know. Miss Vaughan. Thank heaven this time you heeded my message. I won't have you coming around to my house this way, do you hear? You must never come here again. But you do not understand. The ten days is up tonight. Now, your time is over. Are you trying to scare me, Chadwin? To get more money from me? Money? No. I am just trying to tell you. It was understood ten days only. More is not allowed. You fool! Do you think I ever intended to give up Rose's body once I had it? In that narrow crypt in the tightly locked mausoleum... My body has long since died from lack of air. That rose has died with it. But I remain alive. So, that is what you planned. I should have guessed. But it is not so. 
Your body is not dead. It is in a sleep so deep that it scarcely breathes. Needs no food, no water. But sometime tonight the dog will wear off and your sister Rose will claim her body again while you, you, Helen Vaughn, will wake to find yourself locked within a burial crypt. No. No, it's not true. It is true. And you will not be asleep. You will be awake, needing air. And there will be no air. You're just trying to frighten me. And tonight I tried to open the tomb to save you. I was driven away by guards with dogs. But what can I do? Only if we can reach the tomb in time to open it, can you be saved? And we must go now. I'll get the key. And we must hurry. Hurry! <laughs> There's the most lame, Miss Vaughan. Pray heaven the guards are not waiting. They won't be. We fooled them by leaving the car outside and walking up this back path. Now hurry, Chip. What is it, Miss Vaughan? I, I don't know. For a moment, I, I felt so dizzy. So weak. It's Rose trying to return to her body. We cannot waste an instant. Hold me up. Something is pulling at me, tugging at me. Darling, where are you? She's speaking through her own lips. No. No, not yet. Go back, you hear me, Rose? Go back. Here's the mausoleum. The key. Give me the key. Here it is. Quickly. She's pushing at me so hard. No. Oh, Darling, help me. Everything is so dark. Where are you? Go back. Go back, I tell you. Chedwin, have you got the lock on again? It won't unlock. It must. They put a new padlock on. Oh, dear heavens, they've changed the lock. No. No. It's getting dark. Dark. It's hopeless. We cannot enter. Darling, where are you? No. We can't both be in the same body. Go back. Darling, I'm frightened. Don't force me out. Help me. Go back where you were. Help me. Wait, Rose, wait. Help me. Helen. Helen. No. No, don't. Rose, you mustn't. You mustn't. The guards, they're coming back. Where am I? What happened to me? Sleep, child. Sleep a little longer and wake without memory. Sleep. Yes. Sleep. For her, I can do nothing now. And the guards, they must not catch me. They must not. There he is. We got him this time. Holy catch. It's a girl. It's Mrs. Taylor. Asleep on the steps of her own family mausoleum. Say, we got to get her out of here. Help me lift her out. Yeah. Hey, wait. Did you hear something then? Like somebody calling a long ways off? Listen. Help me. I can't breathe. Help me. I'm not dead. Did you hear anything? Nah, I can't hear anything, just the wind. Come on, we got to phone Miss Tabor's husband. She may be sick. Come on now, no time to lose. Help me. Help me. About a man named Chadwin? Chadwin? No, I don't, Leonard. Well, Bessie says he called several times last week to see you. The last time was the night of the party. You're sure you don't remember him? Uh, no, Leonard. I, I'm sorry, oh, but... it's all right, darling. I just thought maybe you might have begun to remember some of the things that, that happened during those ten days when you, well, weren't yourself. It's so strange. As if my mind had been asleep the whole time. Is there something about Chadwin in the paper? He committed suicide last night. Oh. His body was found near the old family mausoleum. He left a mysterious note saying he was paying for some transgression. How strange. I wondered if he could have given us any clue as to... as to how you came to leave the party so suddenly that night and drive to the cemetery. Oh, but... It's all over now and not worth worrying about. I'd remember if I could, but when I try, I, I become suddenly frightened and, and feel as if I were locked in in some dark, tiny space where I can't breathe. All right now, darling, all right. Let's forget the whole thing. Now, let's see what came in the morning mail. 
Maybe there's a letter from Helen. You know, it's high time we were hearing from her. She's really not acting much like a sister being lost for long without even finding a letter to know where she is. This is the mysterious traveler again. I'm afraid Leonard and Rose are going to have to wait a long time for a letter from Helen. In fact, I'll be very much surprised if they ever get one. I suppose it'll never occur to them to look in the old mausoleum. In fact, uh, since they both feel a distinct aversion to going near it, it may never be opened again. But I don't suppose that'll make much difference to Helen. <laughs> uh, now... Now, if you were wishing uh, you could step into somebody else's shoes, maybe what happened to Helen will make you change your mind. You know, I knew a man once who... He, he stole somebody else's body, only to discover when it was too late that he... Oh, you're getting off here? Well, perhaps we'll meet again soon. I take this same train every week at this same time. You have just heard Chapter 55 of The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying. In tonight's story, They Who Sleep, Philip Clark played Chadwin, Gertrude Warner played Helen, and Helen Clare played Rose. The Mysterious Traveler is written by Bob Arthur and David Cogan. Original music is played by Henry Silverne, and the entire production is under the direction of Jock McGregor. Listen next week to a tale titled Escape Through Time. Another tale of the mysterious traveler. The mysterious traveler is presented by WOR Mutual from the WOR Studios in New York. This is Mutual. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell means mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. You want Mr. Wolf to what? Mr. Wolf will do nothing of the sort, Archie. Mr. Wolf is thirsty. Hold on for a moment. Uh, the bottle opener is in the left-hand drawer of your desk. Thank you, Archie. Mr. Wolf, I've got a man named Denby on the phone. He wants you to umpire a card game. The man is insane. He's offering a fee. The answer is no. I know nothing of card games, nor do I wish to learn. Okay. Well, the answer's no, Mr. Denby. Sure, I'll ask him again. After he finishes the beer he's working on. Goodbye. People appall me. The fantasies they indulge in. Bah, what on earth made that maniac think I might consent to preside at a card game? Well, seems he expects one of the players to be deaf. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's the bulkiest, balkiest, smartest, and most unpredictable detective in the world. That chair-born genius, Nero Wolfe. Created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> Wolf would not attend, but the card game went on anyway. 
at the home of a Mr. Stephen Denby. Well, Jean? Yes? The Costa? Mr. Piper? Ruth? I think we're ready to begin, eh? I'm ready. Yes, Jean, you always are. How I like that remark, I'll have to decide later on. Yeah, please do. Augusto? It's all right with me. And Mr. Piper? I, uh, I brought a deck. No, as host, I shall supply the cards. Uh, before we play, I examine them, yes? Of course. Here you are. Chuck? Yeah, Mr. Denby? You will remain outside the door until call. No one is to enter this room under any circumstances. Got it. Augusto? The cards look all right. Thank you. Now then, shall we make things absolutely clear? You mean, should you make a speech? I don't mind. But uh, make it short, huh? I shall. The four of us seated at this table are joint owners of the Candy Club, a rather successful institution devoted to the sale of food, liquor, entertainment... And the gambling. And games of chance. For some time now, we have all resented sharing the profits... Some of us have attempted to buy out the others. Uh, Denby, you needn't babble on. No one wants to sell. We know that. True, true, Mr. Piper. Which is the reason for this little game of cards? One hand shall be dealt to each of us. A hand at poker. Whoever wins gets the club. The others retire as gracefully as they can. Agreed? That's why we... Agreed. Very well. The cards are shuffled. I'll place them in the center of the table. Bacasto, would you like to... I cut. Good. If nobody minds, I'll cut them too. After Mr. Bacasto. Nobody minds. Happy now, Mr. Piper? Let's get going, huh? Very well. Unless Jean would care to... Oh, <laughs> We're all crooks here, which sort of cancels out any funny business with the card. Very well. We shall all draw a card in turn until five cards are drawn by each player. Shall we start, Jean? Sure. Lucasto? Okay. Mr. Piper? Yes, of course. And myself. We just keep going in rotation. This is fun. Fun? No, no. There's too much money which rides on these cards. That's what makes it fun. Uh, Would you mind keeping quiet? I'm nervous. We all are, one way or another. I think we all have our five cards now. We all got them. Very well, then. In the same order that the cards were dealt. Jean? A pair of threes. Lucasto? Nothing. Mr. Piper? Kings. Two. Two. Piper. No, what? Da, 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 da. Da, da, da. Hey. Hey. Hey, I don't like the same stuffy, Mr. Boo. Will you take your elbow out of my back? I'd be delighted to, Mr. Goodwin. But it's not my elbow. I don't care if it's your tibia maximus. Just take it away. Chuck wouldn't like that. Well, we have company. Mind if I look around? Keep uh, right on walking, pal. Well, that would be Chuck behind me, huh? And you are... My name is Denby. You may remember it. Oh, yeah, yeah. You phoned a couple of hours ago about, about a card game. Now, look, just what is your boy poking in my back? I think it's a 38. You're not sure? It might be a 45. Chuck, is it loaded? Make a funny move, pal, and you'll find out the hard way. Yo, wait a minute. It's just a passing curiosity. Uh, where are we going? My car... Get in. If you insist, I guess you do. Okay. I'll drive, Chuck. The car bulletproof? No, that's hardly necessary. Chuck shoots first. Well, it's a saving, I guess. The only thing is, I, uh, I hadn't figured on taking a ride. I told Mr. Wolf I was going for a walk. He disapproved, You're but... going for a ride. Isn't that a little corny? Now, there's a minor difference. Usually the uh, guest, shall we say, is killed at the conclusion of the ride. In this Let's case... Let's not make the difference too minor. Huh? You will survive the ride. It's what comes afterwards that might kill you.
You see, Mr. Goodwin, my friends and I have a little mystery to solve. You want me to solve it? No. We want Mr. Wolf to solve it. In order to do so, he must leave his house and come to mine. He has to in order to find the solution quickly. Why? Neither my friends nor myself have any desire to improve our acquaintance with the police. Therefore, we want the mystery solved before the police are even called in. Hence our need for Mr. Wolf. Hence our detaining you. Detaining is a pretty word in the circumstances. Now, this is my home, Mr. Goodwin. Oh, well, I don't like the architecture. I think I'll stay out. Get going, pal. On second thought... Mr. Denby, what makes you think Mr. Wolf is going to leave his house and come here? You. Unless he does so, he will lose you. Forever. The door, Chuck. Okay. Mr. Goodwin, may I introduce you to my associates in business and in poker? To your right, Mr. Lacasto, a charming but impulsive fellow. Hello. He's only the stooge. Where's the fat fellow? In time, Lacasto. The lovely lady whose back is to you is Jean. Jean something or other. She's always changing her name. Hello. Hello. And the gentleman facing you is Mr. Piper. How do you do? Uh, is he exclusive or just... Hey, he's wearing his red carnation a little low, isn't he? Over his heart. Except that's no carnation. That, Mr. Goodwin, is blood. Life blood. Harjay. Oh, bah, he's always taking walks. Come in, the door is unlocked. Are you? Yeah, you're Wolf. Having made a magnificent discovery, suppose you remove your hat? No, come on. I beg your pardon? Mr. Denby wants to see you. Mr. Danby can see me here. Here ain't where he wants to see you. Here, at the risk of minor monotony, is where he'll have to see me. Don't you want your boy Goodwin to keep on living? No one has ever been able to discourage him. Mr. Denby will. Ah, Archie's in custody? No, in Mr. Denby's house under a gun. I don't have to believe that. Take a look at this. Hmm, a wallet. Archie's wallet. I should have come in here. And permit me to warn you that if Mr. Goodwin has been harmed, nothing short of murder will satisfy me. It's getting late. Wolf isn't here yet. Maybe he doesn't worry about you, Goodwin. Well, he could have been delayed. Maybe an orchid needed a pollen transfusion or something. <laughs> Besides, only the good die young. Then you must be very, very good, Archie. That remark I didn't care for. We sit here and wait for the fat one, but in the meanwhile, the police... The police will come when we notify them. But they will not like the delay we make to notify them. I say we waste time. I say the fat one will not risk coming. You say entirely too much. Is that so? Maybe I kill you myself. Picasso, put that gun away. Yes, darling Archie should have a chance to live. Not long if Wolf doesn't come. Stop looking so pleased. Are you afraid to die, Archie? Yeah, well, I'm not looking forward to it. It's so final. <laughs> Besides, I didn't eat a hearty dinner. And it... Oh, the Marines have landed. Who is it? Chuck, with Nero Wolf. Let him in. Shut the door, Chuck. Stay outside. Archie? Hello, Mr. Wolf. Oh, am I glad to see you. I regret I cannot say the same thing. Blast you, why couldn't you stay at home instead of taking those confounded walks? I warned you it'd be dangerous. Yeah, but Mr. Wolf, it wasn't the fresh air that got me. It was Denby. Mr. Wolf, I knew you wouldn't come here without some sort of pressure. I thought the method I used would be most effective. Would you really have killed Archie if I hadn't come? I would have had no choice. I would have been stuck with a witness to an unsolved murder. Suppose I cannot solve it. I should be forced to apply the same logic to two witnesses. Mm-hmm. Mr. Wolf, you really came here to save my life, huh? Nonsense. I came here for a fee, Mr. Denby. I have a check for $1,000 already made out. Clear it up. You forget. I left my home. I traveled unprotected through the streets of this city, exposed to motor accidents, to fresh air, too. You offer me $1,000. Will $2,500 do? Barely. Archie, will you take the check? Now... 
I presume you want me to find who killed the gentleman at the table, the one facing me, huh? His name is Mr. Piper. The name is no importance. Will you all sit at the table in the same position you were at the time of the shooting? Of course. Jean? Picasso? Good. Now for a look at the wound. Hmm. The lights, I should imagine, went out for a while when the shooting occurred. They went out. Yes. Of the three of you at the table, which one had the best motive for the murder? We all have the same motive. The club. Helpful. There was no one else in the room at the time? No one. The door? Locked. With Chuck on guard outside of it. So much for that. The windows, I notice, are closed. They were closed when the murder took place? They were closed. The window panes are all unbroken, which eliminates the possibility of the shot being fired from outside of them. Unless one of them was raised and lowered. That wouldn't have been possible. The windows are secured by catches. Archie, will you check that? Okay, Mr. Wolf. I shall for the moment assume that the windows are neither lying nor untrustworthy. Does anyone remember anything unusual occurring at the time of the shooting? Well, someone whispered Piper just before the shot. Indeed. You all heard that whisper? We heard it. Man's voice or woman? Well, I... I can't say, uh... Whisper doesn't reveal much of anything. The windows weren't open, Mr. Wolf. Which leads to... The uh, fact that it had to be one of us in this room. But which one, Mr. Wolf? The murder weapon. Ah, yes. Yes, yes. Has it been moved? Nobody touched it. It's laying on the floor where it was dropped. Interesting. If you look closely, you would observe two oil spots staining the rug between the revolver and the lady's chair, indicating... Uh, who sat at the right of Mr. Piper? I did. Why? Mr. Danby. Yes? If I were you, I would turn Mr. Lacaster over to the police. You are a liar. I, I warned you about that gun, Lacaster. <laughs> was it necessary to shoot Mr. Lacaster? In the arm, yes. He was reaching for a gun. He'll live, however, till the police take him away. What do I tell them? You could point out the angle of the wound. As you notice, Mr. Denby, the bullet entered Mr. Piper's heart from the right. Yes, so it did. Therefore, whoever sat to his right, well, that was Locasto. Archie, you have a check? I have it. We may as well leave. Uh, Mr. Wolf, you're sure Locasto shot Piper? I have indicated the evidence. The rest will be up to the jury. Come, Archie. Uh-huh. Uh, Jean. Yes, Archie. Now that my life expectancy has increased, what are you doing tomorrow night? Archie? I got a scram. Lancaster 7583. I'll be ringing your bell. Oh, Mr. Denby, you better do something about Lucasto's arm or he won't live to be executed. You see, the executioner likes them warm before he chills them. Homestead looks very nice, Mr. Wolf. Yes, Archie. You should stay in it more often. <clears throat> yeah, but you never get to meet babes like Jean that way. You never get kidnapped either. Nor would I have had to leave my home in order to rescue you. Yeah, well, you earned a nice fee, fast. Indeed? Mm-hmm. You seem doubtful about it. Positive, Archie. I know. I have not as yet earned my fee. Huh? You mean Denby might not turn Lucasto over to the cops? Of course he will. The trouble is, you see, Lacasto did not murder Piper. No? <laughs> he just thought a bullet in the heart might be good for Piper's rheumatism, huh? As it happens, Piper suffered from asthma. <laughs> That's beside the point. Fine. Mr. Wolf, I'm going to take it for granted that you know who did kill Piper. I'm also going to take it for granted that you won't tell me until you're ready. But why turn Lucasto over to the police? Two reasons, Archie. First, I had no proof against the real killer. Secondly... We had to supply a scapegoat in order to be permitted to leave the Danby home. You were unarmed, helpless. Go ahead, rub it in. Nonsense. It was an interesting problem. I enjoyed it. It was, huh? Well, to me, it's still in the present tenses. Which reminds me, as old Dr. Tidmouse said, there's always a future tense. And in that future tense, Jean. No, Archie. Oh, Mr. Wolf, stop. That girl's got a love for blood that appeals to the ghoul in me. Besides, did you notice what she does to her dress? Archie, I was merely about to say that I have no objections to your dallying with the girl. 
Oh, I don't believe it. My ears need overhauling. I objected only to the future tense. Why not call her now? Yeah, well, I won't pretend I understand this sudden enthusiasm on your part about my love life. Probably there's some foul scheming motive at the bottom of it. But who am I to look a gift horse in the mouth? Now, let's see. Her number was, uh... Lancaster, 7583, of course. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> the most beautiful bar and grill I've ever seen, Archie. Drank, you mean? What? Uh, never mind, never mind. Oh, all right. Archie, did anybody tell you you were beautiful, too? Well, a girl here and there has mentioned it. Oh, were they liars? Now, uh, tell me, Jean, how did you ever get into the gambling den racket? Because I'm a crook. Well, I suspected that, but... Uh, I want another drink. You've had enough. I want another drink, and when Jean wants another drink, no gentleman who is a gentleman... Jean, get down. Oh, let me go. I don't want to climb under the table. Don't stay under here until the barrage stops. Ah. I guess the war's over. All right, Jean, get up. No, now I'm here. I like it. I'm going to stay here for months. And Monday. Jean, do you realize that somebody just tried to kill you? And I thought you had such a nice, honest face. No, 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 not me. Somebody out in the street. I don't know why, but Mr. Wolf will. Come on, pour yourself together and let's go see him. The nice fat man? All right, I like him. You do? Why? Because he'd make such a big corpse. <laughs> Plus Jean. What made you think I wanted her here? Well, she's one of your fans. <laughs> she thinks you'd make a lovely corpse. What was the reason for bringing her here? She was shot at. Did you expect her to be? I expected her to be killed. That's why I sent you to her. It didn't occur to you I might be killed too? It did. I was willing to take the chance. You were willing? <laughs> oh, Mr. Wolf, Jean's a little under the weather. Splendid. In vino veritas. Watch your language. I mean, the people in their cups often tell the truth, a proverb of some antiquity. Who shot at you tonight, Jean? Well, I don't know. I, I didn't see. Has it occurred to you that you might just as easily have murdered Piper as not? But Lucasto killed Piper. You said so yourself. I lied. Furthermore, why the attack on you if Lucasto was the murderer? Well, I... I don't know. Did you also not know that Lucasto escaped from jail earlier this evening? You're making that up. Why should I? Mr. Denby turned him over to the police, but Lacoste managed to get away before being jailed. That's not cricket. Incidentally, Mr. Denby will be joining us at any moment. I expected you to bring Jean Archie. Therefore, with the exception of Mr. Piper, who is resting in the morgue, and Mr. Lacoste, who is at large, we shall have all the participants in the card game. With them, perhaps, we can deal a new hand, hmm? Archie? Okay. Maybe it's the morgue to tell us Piper escaped. Oh, wrong again. Come in, Mr. Denby. Mr. Wolf, I'm upset. I heard over the radio about Lucasto's escape. He'll try to kill us all. Why? Well, because we can testify that he murdered Piper. Fooey. I beg your pardon? Lucasto did not kill Piper. What, you said that he did. The only evidence against Lucasto was the angle of the entrance of the bullet that lodged in his heart. May I remind you of the whisper you all heard in the darkness preceding Piper's death? The whisper that said Piper? Precisely. We must assume, then, that Piper turned his body in the direction of the whisper. Therefore, the angle of the wound would be wrong for Lacasto, but the correct one for... Whoever sat opposite Piper. I sat opposite him, but that doesn't mean I killed him. Wait, you must have. Once he turned, the bullet must have come from opposite him. Only possible way. That means you, Jean. No. No, it's a frame. May I interrupt for a moment? Mr. Denby, if our present analysis is correct, it must have been you who whispered to Piper. Did you? I... I hadn't thought about it before, but... I... Denby, you're lying. No, he's not lying. Continue, Mr. Denby. Well, when the lights went out, I wanted to tell Piper something. He, he turned to me, and that's when he was shot. Archie, you've taken all this down. In my prettiest shorthand, Mr. Wolf. Good. I... 
I don't know why you're doing this, Denby. Maybe you think if I take the rap, you'll get the club. But remember, Lacasto's still free. He's gunning for all of us. But it'll be you. Especially you he'll want. Maybe you can talk a jury into sending me up for something I didn't do, but you won't live to gloat about oh, it. Oh, shut up, Jean. You killed Piper and... Who, who's that? This is, of course, the murderer of Mr. Piper. No comments? Archie, the door, if you please. But you said I was the one who... What kind of idiocy is this? Archie, I said the door. Okay, but shall I ask him in or sock him? You will act as the situation demands. Yes, sir. But for once, I'd like to know what the situation is. Raise him, Goodwin, and keep him that way. Now back up into the living room. I don't back up, Good. My gears... You want it here? Uh, never mind, I'll strip a gear. Archie, what are you doing? Just what the situation demands, backing up. In case your knowledge of armaments has failed you, our little friend Chuck here is pointing a thirty-eight revolver at me. Won't save him from the chair. Maybe not, but it could give me quite a pain in the stomach. Chuck, what do you think you're doing? You double-crossing louse. Gentlemen, if you So please. you thought you'd run to the fat dick and pin it all on me, huh, Denby? You don't know what you're talking about. We haven't even mentioned you. You sure of that, huh? Then why did Wolf phone me and tell me you were about to sing? Wolf phoned you? Yeah. Said you were getting ready to feed me to the electrician up the river. Oh, he was making a stab in the dark, Chuck. Trying to start something. That's so, Wolf. Archie, will you read Chuck your notes about Mr. Denby's statement regarding the whisper? Well, that doesn't mean... It, it could be Mr. Shut up, Stewart. Read me the notes, Goodwin. Here it is, I quote. When the lights went out, I wanted to tell Piper something. He turned to That's me and... That's all I need to hear. Chuck, you were selling me out after hiring me to knock off Piper. You dumb gunman. Now you've given Wolf what he wants, a confession. I was trying to pin it on Gene. That's what you say now. It's kind of late, though. Too late for no, you. No, no, oh, oh. Goodbye, Mr. Denby. Nice shooting, Chuck. Stay put, Goodwin. The rest of you, I'm leaving. The police wouldn't approve. But let me have your gun. Right? Wise guy. You know something? I've been thinking. Can you think? If I was to knock off you and Goodwin, me and Gene could split the club between us, and nobody'd ever know who killed Piper. Very whimsical, Chuck, but if you don't mind... Archie, don't be an idiot. Well, if I have to get shot, I prefer it to happen when I'm moving forward. Archie. Okay, come and get it, Goodwin. March right up nice and easy and take it. I'm coming. <laughs> Would somebody mind telling me why I don't fall down? Ooh. I've been shot. Well, that's not the way to talk to a man who's just been... Hey, Chuck is lying down. He... Is he dead? Well, there's been a mistake. I didn't shoot him. He shot me. Archie, stop blabbering. Neither of you shot the other. As a matter of fact... I shot the Chuck. Lucasto. Lucasto, Archie? Well, I thought he escaped. No, I'm not crazy. I do not escape. The fat one, he phones the police to tell them how I'm innocent. Yes, I had the police announce the escape, however, for reasons of, uh, shall I say, strategy? <laughs> Well, on account of there are no bullet holes in me, you can say whatever you like, Mr. Wolf. Thank you, Archie. That announcement helped heighten the tension our murderers were under. And then they explode. The fat one, he says to me, Locasto, wait in the next room. Watch careful. Maybe there's trouble. I watch. And now? <laughs> now there's no more trouble. <laughs> Well, the place looks a lot tidier now with all those bodies removed, huh? Indeed. Okay, I'll get I... you the bottle of beer. But first, make with an explanation. The case was crystal clear, Archie. Maybe, but I'm no crystal gazer. Sure, I know. Denby had things arranged in advance with Chuck in case anybody held a better hand than his own. Piper did. So Denby whispered to Piper after kicking the light switch and set him up for a shot by Chuck from the doorway. The angle would provide evidence against Lucasto. True. However, we had only Denby's word for it and Chuck's that the door was locked. All right. We know, but you knew before Denby and Chuck blew up, huh? The oil spots on the rug, Archie? Well, they only showed the gun had bounced when the murderer threw it away. Spattered oil, very well-kept gun. They showed more than that. Where were those spots in relation to the gun? Think back, Archie. Spots in relation... Oh, sure, they were between the gun and the door. Therefore, the gun must have been thrown from the door. Bounced twice, staining the rug before reaching its final destination. Ah, oh, I get it now. 
That told you who'd fired the gun. But there wasn't proof enough, so you set up a nice atmosphere of suspicion and had the boys give each other away. <laughs> All right, Mr. Wolf, you're a genius, and uh, you may have your beer. Thank you, Archie. As for me, I'm not a genius, but I remember a phone number. <laughs> so if you'll excuse me, Mr. Wolf. You're excused, Archie. Thanks. But before you call that number, may I remind you that Jean is a girl of macabre tastes who appeals to the goo in you. <laughs> sure you may, but why bother? In order to be able to warn you that uh, <laughs> a ghoul and his money are soon parted. <laughs> Good night, Archie. Ah. have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program. In the cast were Gerald Moore as Archie Goodwin, and Betty Lou Gerson, Jay Novello, Howard McNear, Barney Phillips, and Bill Johnstone. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolf and Archie will bring you The Case of the Calculated Risk. Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. The non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil, again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Sam Spade, Detective Agency. Me, sweetheart. Sam, how did it go? It was the end, Effie, but the end. Oh, Sam, not another one of those society things. Depends on what you mean by society. Well, you know, Sam, cafe society. Cocktails for two, hands across the table, naked and other old-fashioned flurry. Let's not lose our head, Effie. Uh, nothing but double martinis, very dry, with two olives, sweetheart. Two olives? Mm-hmm. Oh, Sam, isn't that overdoing it? It was all overdone, sweetheart. That's what cracked it. Now, stay right where you are. I'll be right down to mix up my report on the dry martini caper. Get it? Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the Hair. August is always a great vacation month. And for those of you planning to take your vacation soon, let me suggest that when you're packing, be sure you include a bottle and a handy tube of Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. For no matter where you go, you can always depend on Wild Root Cream Oil to groom your hair neatly and naturally, relieve dryness, and remove loose dandruff. Yes, you can take it with you on your vacation, and you should. Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again... The choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in The Adventures of Sam Spade. Wise as an owl, sober as a judge, F. Oh. Well, the way you talked on the phone, I thought you drowned the shamrock, kissed mm-hmm. the black betty, spliced the main brace, decorated the mahogany, made a Dutch bargain, or, in a word, gone to give a Chinaman a music lesson. Effie, I wish you'd spend more time with Harper's Bazaar while I'm gone, and less with the thesaurus of slang. Ah. Uh, Didn't know I could say that. Are you sober? Well, I've been riding the choo-choo and drinking Adam's ale. And if you don't believe it, just ask me to walk the chalk. Okay, heelsy toesy, arms akimbo, eyes glazed. Yes, sir. Now then, uh, tip of the forefinger to the tip of the nose. Oh, oh, Sam, 
Sam, it makes me dizzy. Dizzy Gillespie? Dizzy go. Oh, Sam. Exactly. And uh, you are not sewn up, shagged, shellacked, shickered, stuccoed, tap shackled, stiffo, or real crazy. Well, you know best, Sam. Good. Now try this one. Yes, Fred. Uh, sitting posture, limbs cruciform. What? Cheesecake style. Oh, Sam. That's it. Now place the notebook. Uh uh-uh, just a little higher. Good. Yeah. Now uh, apply the tip of the pencil to the top of the fool's cap and proceed viz. Viz. Date. August 1st, 1948. To Mrs. Netta Martini, 1000 Marina Boulevard, San Francisco. From Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, Dear Netta. The first I knew of the caper was the day before yesterday morning when I saw your husband's picture in the paper. It was one of those lovingly retouched executive-type photographs of a man in his late 40s or early 50s, graying at the temples and wearing an embalmed man of distinction look. The story was headlined, Corporation Head Waylaid by Mysterious Assailant. Chauffeur foils would-be kidnappers at offices of Martini Trading Company. The item under it wasn't as thrilling as the headline. It sounded as if he'd been knocked down for his wallet and the attempted kidnapping had been dreamed up by a bored city news reporter. I tossed it into the wastebasket along with my morning mail and went back to the police gazette. On page three, the phone rang. You need garage, Harry speaking. Mr. Spade. One moment, who's calling? Gordon Martini. Not uh, Gordon Martini, the corporation head, waylaid by mysterious assailant. Chairman of the board, and there's nothing mysterious about it. Then what are you doing on this phone? I can't talk on the phone. Where are you? In a hospital? I left that pest house this morning. I'm at my residence, 1000 Marina Boulevard. Mm -hmm. It will take you exactly 20 minutes by cab. You will meet me in front of the building, and we'll have our conference in my car en route to the office. Where's your office? Downtown Post Street. Oh, why don't I meet you there? I'm a busy man. I have a full calendar. I'm already late due to all that hospital red tape. But I can fit you into my schedule if you'll hurry. Now, look alive, man. Well, it's a little early in the morning, but I'm trying hard. Good. What will you want for a retainer? I'll let you know if I decide to take the job. Fair enough. 20 minutes. I'll expect you. I uh, should have looked more alive. It took me two minutes to get onto the street, one minute to flag down a cab, and 18 minutes to reach your address, Netta. A total of 21 minutes. As my taxi drew up to the curb in front of the canopied entrance to the corner apartment house at 1000 Marina... I saw your husband pacing indignantly up and down in front of the entrance, pausing only to glare at the outsized chronometer on his left wrist. His gray Hamburg was perched atop an outsized turban of gauze bandage that decorated his head. Ah, now you're spade. You're exactly one minute and uh, 22 seconds late. Hours are made of minutes, minutes are made of seconds. In killing this seemingly negligible interval of time, you have wounded an hour. Oh, I have. Well, I'm sorry. The uh, traffic's pretty heavy out here this hour of the morning, you know. And you should have started a minute and 22 seconds earlier. I'm sorry there was a bore on the telephone kept talking about how valuable his time was. Yeah, well, don't apologize. Only waste more time. Now, here's your check. hundred dollars. My car's just around the corner. I paid that chauffeur a large salary. We mustn't keep him waiting. In the meantime, you may as well start earning your fee. I've been earning it for the past uh, 22 minutes and 22 seconds. Wait. Uh-huh. I suspected as much. Do you drive a car? Yeah, you mean uh, one man drives all that? Uh, I see him, that rascally chauffeur of mine. Sleep in the back seat. All right, come out of there, you. Hey, hey, watch! I was behind him and a little to the right. The shock of the rapid-fire 30-caliber slugs lifted him off his feet and knocked him against me. I went down under his 300 pounds of dead weight. By the time I rolled him off of me and got up, the gunman had jumped out of the limousine and into a gray sedan that was double parked alongside. In the welter of traffic on the boulevard, I didn't dare risk throwing a shot after him, but I did get the first three numbers of the license plate before it buried itself in the heavy stream of AM commuters. That's when the air changed from exhaust fumes to something out of a Persian garden. I turned and looked for the first time into your Nile green eyes, Netta and saw you twisting a handkerchief in your pale hands I might have loved beside the Shalimar, but on Marina Boulevard, they looked like hysterics dead ahead. Who, who did it? You saw him. Don't lie to me. Why don't they come with hey, the ambulance? Why are all those people standing around there staring at me? Make them go Calm away. Down. Make them go away. Take I can't any... stand no, Stop it, will you? That's better. Now, come on over here. Who are you, his wife? Yes, and it was all my fault. This is the end. I called Ernie out the window and asked him to come upstairs. I, I wanted him to return some lingerie. They sent the wrong color, Pete. Yeah, yeah. Who's Ernie? He's our chauffeur. I was looking for the exchange slip when we heard the shots. Is he dead this time? Yeah. Don't go to pieces. Poor Gordon. He had so many enemies. He didn't drink well, you know. People dropped us like flies. Well, they certainly dropped your husband. Are you a policeman? No, but I'll do until the real thing comes along. 
which is right now. If I were you, lady, I'd uh, go back upstairs and relax. They'll get to you soon enough. Yes, I suppose you're right. Poor Gordon, he looks so natural stretched out on the pavement. Yeah. I-, I keep thinking he'll get up and stagger on into the elevator. He didn't drink at all well. Go on, will you? All right, I'm going. Oh, Ernie, where did you go? Down to the garage. I, I heard a car drive in. Poor Mr. Martini, it, it's all my fault. Oh, no, Ernie, it's mine if I only hadn't mislaid that exchange slip. What? You know, when I called you out the window to come and get that package. Oh, oh, that. What do we got here? Who's the witness? Me. Oh, Spade. Lost another client, huh? Not quite. I hadn't cashed the check yet. Well, they got him anyway. All right, clear a space in there. Let him through with that stretcher. All right. All right. Step over here out of the crowd, Sam. I want to get this statement. Hey. Yeah. Okay, Gary, take it down. Got a pencil? Yeah, and I want it back. Let's have it. This guy is Gordon Martini. Mm-hmm. He headed up a local firm, the Martini Trading Company. Yeah. Last night he was working late at his office. Got boinged. All right. Phoned me this morning. Didn't know why. Thought maybe he wanted a bodyguard. Anyway, he needed one. Mm-hmm. Gunman was uh, crouched in the back seat of the limousine, shoved the carbine out when Martini opened the door. Carbine, huh? Didn't get a good look at him. You can see why, the way it's closed in. No side windows. Mm. Foreign car, isn't it? Stop drooling. You can't afford one. You getting all this? What about the getaway? Martini fell on top of me. I saw the getaway car on the back of his head. Yeah. The car was a gray sedan. The mm. back of his head was a standard make, too. Only got the first three digits of license plate. Uh, 5D9. 5D9. Anything else? Yeah, give me back my pencil. The homicide boys want some help. They know my fee. Mr. Spade. This is Martini. Why aren't you and Ernie upstairs getting your alibis shaped up? Oh, please, I, I can't face the questions just yet. Would it be legal if I just avoided them till I can collect myself? I don't know about legal, but it might be smart. Where can we talk? What do you suggest? Well, there's a little cocktail lounge up on Lombard where Ernie and I all... Uh, I mean, well, it's, it's just around the corner. Very handy. Let's go. <laughs> Against my mother's advice, I should have listened. But, well, that's why I married Mr. Martini. Well, uh, that brings us up to 1943, and it's only uh, quarter of 12. You're just like him, always holding a stopwatch over my head. Always? Well, he drank, you know. You told me that. But it's much more important than you think. He often fell down and bumped his head. You mean that mysterious assailant that waylaid him last night in his office was a double martini? Two pitchers full before dinner. Two? Ernie had to carry him up to his office. Well, what did he go up there for? Oh, he had an appointment with the vice president of the firm, Mr. Nesbitt. Something had come up, and he wanted Gordon to sign some papers. I don't know what. It wasn't the first time. I waited outside in the car. After Ernie had taken him upstairs, he came back to the car, and we talked. Mm Uh-huh. Ernie has alibis upstairs, downstairs, and all around the house. Well, then when the others came out and Gordon didn't, Ernie went upstairs to see why. Others? Mr. Nesbitt and who else? Mary Callahan. Secretary? No, she's an attorney. And if you think everything was legal between those two, well... <laughs> but after all, who am I to call the kettle black? Now, what are you trying to tell me? That she got him drunk so they could make him sign some papers? That he got himself drunk so he couldn't write his name? Or that he just got drunk and fell down? Between you and me, I think she pushed him down a flight of stairs. In his condition, he'd never remember. Why are you putting the finger on the Callahan dame? Well, what would you think? She was the last one out of the building. Why didn't you want to tell all this to the police? Well, I didn't want to talk about his drinking. Things were bad enough already. That would have been the end. Well, that's as good an answer as any. What do you want me to do for you? Prove that she did it and Ernie didn't. I'll let you take care of Ernie. Oh, no. I don't want to alibi him unless I have to. He might get the wrong idea. You mean I've got the wrong idea? He might think it meant I still care for him, and I don't. I can't stand him anymore. The way he chews those toothpicks. (coughs) And besides, if his alibi is too good, I might have trouble about that carbine in the backseat of my car. Pardon me, it sounded as if you said you might have trouble about a car being in the back seat of your car. That's what I said. Where is your car? In the garage. But somebody had it out this morning. They, they scraped the fender coming back in and they ran in the wall. They must have been in an awful hurry. Tell me, this car of yours, it wouldn't be uh, a gray sedan? Yes. License number? Oh, wait a minute. It's on my key ring. Uh, here, 5D90. That's enough. Why didn't you tell me this before? Well, I, I couldn't get up the nerve. After I heard you tell that policeman the gun that killed Gordon was a carbine and the gray sedan and all that, well, it's the end. I hoped you were right, but I didn't think so. When I went to look at the gray sedan in your garage, I knew you were wrong, dead wrong. It was the getaway car, all right, and the carbine, as you know, was proven later to be the one that killed your husband. 
But Ernie had turned into a very poor suspect indeed. He was hugging the carpet between the front and rear seats, and when I nudged him, he didn't move. He'd been shot at closer range than Gordon Martini, and the killer had used only one slug. It was planted in the base of his brain, which made him not only a very poor suspect, but a very dead one. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. And no wonder. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms the hair neatly and naturally, relieves annoying dryness, and removes loose dandruff. What's more, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil is the only leading hair tonic that contains soothing lanolin. So ask for Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too. And mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. <laughs> Now, back to the dry martini caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. Martini Trading Company, good afternoon. I'm sorry, Mr. Nesbitt is in conference. I'll see that he gets your message. Well, what can I do for you? I, uh, would like to see Miss Callahan. Miss Callahan is in conference with Mr. Nesbitt. Good. I would like to see them both. But I have orders not to disturb them. You do not have to. I will. Just a minute. You can't go breaking in like that. Yes, and I'll tell you something else. He won't ever get away with it. Why, everyone in this town knows about your underworld connection. Why, you doddering old fool, when I get through with you, if you don't go to the gas chamber for Gordon Martini's murder, you wish you Chow. had. If I go to the gas chamber, it'll be for killing you, not Gordon. Oh, you said it. Oh, why didn't I have witnesses here? <clears throat> Miss Callahan? Oh. Did you hear that? Uh, you weren't talking loud enough. I didn't hear a thing. Well, come on in here and I'll tell you a thing or two. Uh, close that door. Now, sit down. Thanks. I listen better on my feet. Oh, so you're the detective Netta Martini employed, eh? Uh, what's she paying you? That'll depend on how much I have to do for it. Well, I'll tell you how much you'll have to do for it. You'll have to make a case against me, and that's not going to be easy. Uh, why do you think she's out to get you? Why, indeed. <laughs> For years, this moth-eaten mouthpiece, this parboiled Porsche, you... has been victimizing poor Gordon, <laughs> taking advantage of his weakness for drink. Oh, you... Now that she's liquidated him, she appears with 55% of the common stock. <laughs> Motive enough, eh? Why, well, uh... you fraudulent old fool! I simply bought up his debts and threw an attachment on those stocks. Unethical, but perfectly legal. Uh, look, Well, uh... you're not even a proper thief. You're nothing but a bumbling old embezzler. Now, listen You had here. to tell because he was going to call in the auditors to look over those books of yours. The dean of double entry, Mr. Spade. Look, look, will you say this for the courtroom? I'm saying. Now, you've convinced me. You're both crooked. I'll see that you both go up for something. That's a promise. Oh, Mr. Spade, I gave you credit for better sense. Do you know that this Medusa of the magistrate's court, this harpy of the Hall of Justice, what? tricked him into changing the beneficiary of his insurance the very night she pushed him down the stairs? And you were all in favor of it when you thought you held the controlling interest in the company. Answer that. You uh, see, Mr. Spade, he can't answer that. Oh. Good, good. I'm glad one of you is temporarily lost for words. Now, I only want to know one thing, and I want a straight answer, and if either one of you starts off on another speech, I'm going to push you into the nearest cloakroom and lock you in together. Why, you wouldn't dare. Try me, sweetheart. <laughs> well, uh, what do you want to know about this Amazon ambulance chaser, this trilby of the traffic court? Uh, 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 uh. Watch it. Well, what do you want to know? About Martini's insurance policy. Now, you say he changed the beneficiary. Please answer in ten words or less. Who was the beneficiary, and who is the beneficiary now? I'll have to answer that question in two parts. The beneficiary was his wife. He changed it to the Martini Trading Company, a corporation of the state of California. Thank you, and goodbye, Mary Callahan. And that netter took the heat off of you for the time being, which made things tough for me. Because Callahan and Nesbitt were so horrible, I never wanted to see them again, even to testify against them in court. 
I was sure of one thing. None of you had pulled the trigger of that carbine. There'd been a hired killer behind it, and the way he operated, taking crazy chances in broad daylight on a crowded street, told me an important thing about him. That night, I made the rounds of the joints. At a plant called the Bing Room, I found a bouncer who'd tossed out a customer that'd run up a bill and tried to pay it with a $1,000 check. He sent me to the Atlas Hotel. The Atlas Hotel is off of 3rd Street, down near the railroad yards. Not even a flea bag. The fleas sickened and died a long time ago. They couldn't take it. And from the look of the guests sprawled out in the mission furniture of the lobby, they wouldn't be able to much longer. A half-dead room clerk came back to the land of the living long enough to mutter a room number and wave me feebly toward a flight of crummy stairs. Yeah, what do you want? You, uh, Hack Hartman? Hey, you got anything for me, huh? Yeah, I got news for you. Get back in the room. I'll tell you all about it. <laughs> yeah, well, come on in. Drop the shiv. Yeah, I'll drop it. I'll fix you. I'll cut you good. I'll cut you. I'll cut you. <laughs> I'm glad you did that. You make it easy for me. Now get over there. Uh, uh, leave me alone. Leave me alone, huh? I'm not feeling so good. You can feel a lot worse. Who hired you to put the burn on Martini? Uh, you don't get nothing out of me. Who gave you that check? Oh, leave me alone. I got all night, Hack, and I feel better than you do. Now, what did you do with that check? I'll shake it if your teeth come out with it. Come on. All right, all right. Stop it, stop it. I don't feel so good. Okay. Where? pocket. My shirt. Don't reach. I'll get it. Right. It was a company check, which is what I'd expected. It was for a thousand dollars drawn on the Golden Gate Trust and Loan. But I wasn't expecting to find the signature on the bottom line. It was signed in a bold, firm hand, Gordon Martini. Who was the penman on this? He wrote it himself, right in front of me. What was it supposed to be for? Uh, he, he wanted I should knock off his brother. You get mixed up? Well, he's dead, ain't he? That's what I mean. Gordon Martini's dead. Ah, the papers got it wrong. That was his brother, his twin brother. And that other guy, that chauffeur, kept hanging around the garage so I couldn't get out. I had to, I had to burn him, too. You know what I, you're saying? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm making sense. Now get out of here. I, I'm, I'm getting steamed. Don't let it worry. I got a nice, cool place all picked out for you. After I turned Hack over to the cops, I did what checking I could on my own at that time of night. As nearly as I could learn, Gordon Martini could never have had a brother, twin or otherwise. He was a first child, his mother died in childbirth, and his father died one month later. So I went back to the offices of the Martini Trading Company, glass-keyed my way in, and made a quick frisk of it. There I learned that the signature on the check was indeed Gordon's, but that he had closed out his account at that bank the day he wrote it. I thought about that on the way out to your apartment. Sam, I've been calling and calling, trying to reach you. I've been so worried. It's the end. This time you might be right. Fix me a drink. Well, there's nothing in the house but those prepared martinis Gordon used to drink. Is that all right? No, but fix me one anyway. Never mind the ice. It's not morning yet, but I hate myself already. Why don't you just relax and let me get it for you? I'll relax. You get the martinis. What happened? What'd you think of Mary Callahan? Isn't she the end? <laughs> She's cute. You're all cute. All of me? How nice. I put ice in anyway. It's nasty without. It's nasty anyway. <laughs> I hope it doesn't make you fall down the way it did poor Gordon. Thanks. <coughs> what? Well, what's the matter? Too dry? You open this bottle fresh? Why, yes. What's the matter? Where are they? The rest of the bottles. Oh, yeah. More of the same. Is this all your husband ever drank? Yes, gallons of it. It's a special brand. He even took it with him to bars and people's houses. He'd sit and drink them right out of the bottle like a little child. Then he'd be falling down drunk, of course. And that's how we lost so many friends. They dropped us like, like... Like flies. Yeah, it was the end. Who are you phoning? City morgue. Uh, Maxie, Sam Spade. Sammy, what can I do on you? On, uh, Martini, Maxie. Uh, they got around to the autopsy yet? Yeah, they rushed him through. Got the report handy? Right in front of me. Funny thing, Sam. The doc said they should have saved themselves the trouble. He'd have been dead in a week or two without no help. What from? Brain tumor. Malignant, it says here. Any alcohol in him? None from drinking, Sammy. 
Uh, what about the head wounds? Accidental fall due to periodic fainting spell. Part of his condition. Thanks, Maxie. Well, what is it, Sam? Were the martinis poisoned? No, sweetheart. The martinis were colored water. Why, they couldn't. Well, what made him get so drunk? He didn't. He was sick. But, Sam, who killed him? He killed himself. But he couldn't have. He hired a gunman to do it. He planned his own murder. But that... Why... Well, well why didn't he leave a note or something? He could have ruined us all. Come here, sweetheart. Put your little hat on Uncle Sam's shoulder. Why, Sam... That's, uh, uh, just what he wanted you to do. He wanted to ruin you. He let Mary Callahan place him out of his interest in the company. He let Nesbitt juggle the books. He let you go your way with Ernie. He let all three of you fix yourselves up with as nice a set of motives for murder as a jury could ask oh, for. Oh, he couldn't have... The real joker was the check he used to pay off the man he hired to kill him. It bounced. It also proved he'd planned his own murder. But he still has his revenge. Because the insurance that would have kept the corporation from going broke won't be paid off on account of a self-liquidating cause. Oh, Sam, darling, what's going to become of us all? Well, uh, Callahan and Nesbitt will probably sue each other to death. You might have to go to work and earn a living. Well, I have $500. I might invest it in something. You already have. Here's my bill. But, Sam, you didn't help me. What? This is the end. No, it isn't, sweetheart. This is the beginning. Come here. <laughs> Period, uh, end of the end. Well, if you ask me, you helped it. Now, F. Well, that just goes to show you. Show what, F? Man's ingratitude to man. Hmm? But what did Mr. Martini have against you? Why, uh, nothing, sweetheart. He, uh, just needed a smart operator like, uh, well, no, Johnny Madero was on vacation. Sam. Hmm? Have you cashed that check Mr. Martini gave you? Well, uh... Not yet, oh, I, uh... Sam, any bartender would know better than to take a check from a man who... who drinks that much? F, you haven't been paying attention. He didn't drink. He didn't. I was able to establish that later on. Well, you haven't been listening. Well, at the time, Sam, for all anybody knew, he was a hopeless drunk. He was, Sam. Oh, you're so wonderful and trusting. But I do wish that you'd understand this. He was a hopeless drunk. For the last time, Effie, he didn't really drink. I'll just type this up, Sam, while you call the bank. I'll do that. A final reminder, friends. Whether you're going on a long vacation trip or just a weekend to the beach, be sure you've got a bottle and tube of Wild Root Cream Oil tucked away in your suitcase. Do this, and you'll find it's easy and quick to spruce up again after stepping out of the water or off the tennis court. For no matter where or when you use it, Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, removes loose dandruff. So at home and away from home, help yourself to handsome hair with Wild Root Cream Oil. And next time you have a chance, ask your barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic. Again and again... The choice of men who put good grooming first. Well, here it is, Sam. I hope it was worth the price of the paper and carbon. You made carbon copies of that? An unimportant report like that? Oh, it bounced? Well, the estate isn't settled yet. Is... Oh, Sam, you're so wonderful and trusting. Effie, I am not wonderful and trusting. I am a hard-boiled private eye. I know. Just a pity there's no money in it. And I'm also two-fisted. Sam. Hmm? Have you ever thought of ceramics? Of what? Ceramics. It takes virtually no capital. All you need is a small furnace and some clay. And if you don't have any talent, you can you can just make ashtrays. Thanks. I already have one. Oh, flower pots are fun. You can pot them on a wheel. And you can pot your hat on and wheel on out of here and also take your furnace and clay. <laughs> Oh, I love you when you're so gay and carefree. I am not gay and carefree. I you am a... You are a hard-boiled private eye. <laughs> Good night, Sam. Good night, and sue me for your back salvy sweetheart. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. Lorene Tuttle is Effie.
The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tallman and Gil Dowd, with musical direction by Lud Gluskin. Gil Dowd directed tonight's broadcast in William Spears' absence. Join us again next Sunday for another adventure with Sam Spade, brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. This is Dick Joy reminding you to... Get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's non-alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with soothing lanolin. You better get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. Start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie. Keeping all the gals away. Hiya, Baldy. Get Wild Root right away. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Adventures of The Saint, starring Tom Conway. The Saint, based on characters created by Leslie Charteris and known to millions from books, magazines, and motion pictures. The Robin Hood of modern crime now comes transcribed to radio, starring Hollywood's brilliant and talented actor Tom Conway as... The Saint. Coming. Oh. Yes? Uh, ain't you going to ask me in, partner? Look, cowboy, if you've lost your horse, well, I... Let me in. I gotta talk to you. I gotta. All right. To come in, partner. What can I do for you? You Templar, the man they call the saint? That's what's engraved on my halo. Well, uh, I'm McGowan. They call me Tex. Well, um, it fits. Born and raised in Texas and aiming to die there. Uh, Somebody's stopping you? Somebody don't care where it happens, just so long as it's now. Here, look at this hat. Hmm. A funny place for air holes. Not so funny when they're bullet holes, though. Run out of rustlers to shoot at? I was bushwhacked, partner. I was stepping out of a taxi and some sidewinding bushwhacking pool cat took a shot at me. Well, we'll head him off at Eagle Pass. Go on. Well, I came to New York to have fun, not to be killed. Well, that's logical. You reckon you can ride shotgun on me? You've got me confused with the police department. I understand they have a special bureau that does nothing but protect visiting cowboys. I don't want the police department. I'll pay. Uh, 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 uh. I'm not in business. Uh, Look, money's money and you're human. Oh, so you've noticed that, have you? And I ain't exactly a poor man. Raising beef's a big money business these days. Yes, so is buying it. Uh, What do you fellas fatten those cows on that makes a steak so expensive? Broccoli? (laughs) Hey, you don't want my money? Oh, it's only money. Uh, how about a cow? Oh, that's an interesting thought. Uh, but the management of this apartment house is so stuffy. The only livestock permitted is dogs and cats. Oh, I don't mean a cow on the hoof, one for the broiler. Uh, uh, I beg your pardon? When I get home, I'll personally airmail you once a week the best darn steak this side of Fort Worth. Oh, you interest me. Well? I'm bought. Go ahead and brand me. Uh, good. Uh, You made me feel better. You made me feel hungry. Just see that I don't get killed, partner. That's all you're supposed to do. I um, always like to do a little more than I'm supposed to. I'll see that neither of us gets killed. Now, what's all the shooting for? In a couple of days, I'm going to Chicago to have a talk with a fella. The fella knows I'm coming, and he ain't hankering none to see me. Oh, so he sends someone to head you off with a gun. Hmm? Him? Why? It's just a little business matter. You see, he... Oh, but come on, partner. Tell you all about it somewhere else. This is New York City. Let's go live it up some. And we can talk during it. What have you got in mind? Heard about a saloon where a dozen pretty gals come out and dance the (laughs) can-can. I'm fixing to cut one up from the herd. (laughs) Yahoo! Yahoo! Tex, 
Hey, Jax. What's the matter, partner? All out of bubble water? No, but that little talk we're going to Waiter, have... Waiter, I... where's that other case of champagne I ordered? You haven't told me what he did. Well, who's that, Simon? The fellow in Chicago. Oh, him. The varmint's only been short waiting me on my beef, that's all. Know what I mean? Yes, my butcher invented it. A thousand head of... That's it, boys. Fill up them glasses. We're gonna live her up tonight. <laughs> Where are we now, Mr. Templer? Greenwich Village? 52nd Street. Now, about Chicago. Say, you know, uh, I got a sudden hankering to see that old horse of mine. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, please, Tex, don't cry. Now, when you get to Chicago... He's just an old cow pony, but I wouldn't swap him for all the horses in Kentucky. Yes, I felt that way about a girl once. Now, about the man in Chicago. Oh, that crimson fool cat. Oh, so you do remember him. He underweighed a thousand head of my steers on a rigged-up scale. Cost me 20, maybe 30 pounds a head. Oh, that's a lot of T-bones. Who is this fellow? Oh, he's... Uh, I just now decided something. What? Next time I come to New York City, I'm bringing that old horse with me. Got a feeling he'd kind of like all this. Where are we now, partner? 52nd Street. No, Greenwich Village. Who'd you say the man in Chicago was? The critter who's been shoving all my cattle out of the Chicago market the last ten years or so. Yahoo! Uh, Frozen. No telling how many pounds of beef he bamboozled me out of in all that time. So you're going to blow the whistle on him, huh? Huh? Meaning what? Tell the police. Nope. I ain't even telling you, partner. I want this critter all to myself, Texas style. Yahoo! That Yankee music is wonderful. Warms a waddy's blood. Where do we go from here? Home. <laughs> Buddy, Hotel Wentworth. Just wait here a moment, driver. That's a new twist. You always take a little walk before you pay off the cab driver. Only when I'm playing bodyguard. How much? One forty, it says. Who are you looking for? Brownies. Help me haul my cowboy friend inside, will you? I don't think I'll be able to wake him. <laughs> Not wake him? He left. What? There's a saloon across the street, buddy. He's making a beeline for it. Oh, for the love of... Now, wait a minute. A buck forty. Here. Keep the change. Yeah, thanks. Tex. Tex. Wait a minute, you darn fool. I... Tex. <laughs> Tex. Stand back, bud. Do you want it to? You murderous rat, you dirty... So you do want it, okay? Now that's a gun jam. Now it's going to be jammed down your throat, killer. I'm going to... Oh. Nice work, Stan. Come on, Nick. Let's get out of here. Mr. Templer. Hello, nurse. And how are we today? You're fine. How am I? I'll let you know just as soon as I've checked your pulse. What are you doing for dinner tonight? Oh, I have a date. Mm, too bad. Besides, you're not leaving the hospital until tomorrow. How can you ask me out? Oh, it's uh, just a form of exercising. You're very beautiful. Mr. Templer, if you keep me talking, how can I check your pulse? Why bother to see if it's normal, of course. Well, if my pulse is normal when you check it, then uh, I'm not. Oh, you and your jokes. Oh, I, I forgot. You have another visitor. Oh, blonde or brunette? Redhead. Oh, cute? I think so. Mm, but you wouldn't. No? 
It's that nice young lieutenant from the Homicide Bureau. Oh, again. I, uh, I suppose it would be pointless to tell him I'm out. Can I come in, Zeppler? Obviously. Come in, Lieutenant Varden. I was just going. Thank you, Molly. You're welcome, Lieutenant. You, uh, you don't have to ask, Lieutenant Varden. The answer is no. Thanks. Now what's the question? Have I remembered anything I forgot to mention about Tex McGowan's killer? Isn't it? No. This time I'm here with an invitation. Oh, a party. The morgue. And, oh, the, the doctor told me I was past the critical stage. The picture morgue down at headquarters. More romantically known as Rogue's Gallery. Oh, you want me to look at faces? Yeah, as soon as you're strong enough. Might just be that the guy who dumped McGowan left his face with us one time or another. Well, it'll be a nice change in the routine. Uh, what will? Uh, getting out of here. Hand me my clothes, Lieutenant. Now, wait a minute. You're not due to blow this joint till tomorrow. Lieutenant Varden, are you a public servant? Well, I'm a cop, so I'm a public servant. Hand me my clothes. You sure? Positive. Besides, there's very little point in a patient staying in the hospital when he's making so little progress. Clearing up a concussion in three days' time isn't progress? Uh, I mean with that nurse. I'm not getting anywhere. Yeah, I know. You know? Uh-huh. Because I am. Oh, <laughs> Now, don't look at me like that, Saint. We public servants got to live, too, you know. Mm. Well, come on. We'll go look at pictures. Well? No. This one? No. Now, take a look through these. No. Oh. I'll take this one. Huh? Oh, for... Th how did a pinup girl's picture get in here? I don't know, but it certainly breaks the monotony. This one? No. This? No. How about... No. One of these? Well, well. The guy who killed Tex McGowan? No, my old geometry teacher. <laughs> No. Here? Oh. Uh, pardon me. No. Him? Mm -mm. Hey. Yeah, I know. The boy most likely to succeed in your graduating class. The boy most likely to get the electric chair for shooting down Tex McGowan. At last. You sure? Like Stanley finding Livingston. Let's see. Nick Nemoshenko, check Chicago police files. It's practically done. Thanks, Tupper. Thanks, refused. I've got a slight interest in this trigger man myself, you know. If you don't believe me, ask my head. Uh, I see what you mean. Will you stay until I check on Nemoshenko? I'll stay. Well? I got Nemoshenko. Where? Chicago. Cops out there grabbed him when he came off a plane. Good. You going? Uh-huh. You want it? Delighted. Nice of you to ask. You can clinch the identification for us. When are we leaving? Well, there's a train at midnight. Enough time for you? I'll go home and pack a bag. Suppose I pick you up at your apartment in about half hour? I'll be ready. Thanks again for the invitation, Varden. And, uh, Lieutenant, mm? I uh, think I'll forgive you. Forgive me? For stealing my nurse while I was unconscious. <laughs> time you got home, Saint. Uh, what? You know what I am? Uh, animal, vegetable, or mineral? I'm the fella that watched you come out of the little building at police headquarters where they keep the pictures. Well, it's an interesting hobby, I admit, but... I uh... slugged you once, Saint, when my cousin's gun jammed up the other night. I guess now I gotta make it more permanent. Uh, don't bother on my account. It's on my cousin's account. You're the only fella can send him to the hot seat. You're the only eyewitness he killed that cowboy. Uh, you'll, uh... Excuse me while I get on with my packing, won't you? I... Where you're going, Saint, you ain't gonna need to pack nothing for. No? You think you're going to Chicago, but you ain't, Saint. Well, must you be poetic at a time like this? You ain't gonna go to Chicago and put no finger on Nick. Oh, now, wait a minute. I, I... Are you gonna go to Chicago when I'm gonna beat you to death right here in New York? Well, it answer me. Oh. You call that an answer? Who's that? Detective Lieutenant Varden. Would you like to meet him? 
We'll see you again soon. Come in, Varden. Kepler? What are you sitting on the floor for? I've been entertaining. You know, company. Yeah? What happened to him? Oh, well, no use going after them. Out the service door. Tranquilly flew. Shy? Only of policemen. So he belted you, huh? They caught me with my vitality down. Remember, I was a hospital case only the day before yesterday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You need protecting. Come on, let's catch that train. You can tell me the whole sad story on the way to the station. Good thing this train had a second coat of paint. Because that's what we caught it by. Uh, here. This is our uh, drawing room D. Excuse me. Could one of you gentlemen tell me where to find drawing room C? Yeah. Is there one right now? Uh, you'd better let me handle it, Varden. You policemen are so dropped. Uh, drawing room C? Huh? Uh-huh. I'm so helpless on trains. Oh, that's a pity. I'm always lost. Uh, I'm always finding things. Are you? I... Oh, there's drawing room C right next to yours. We're neighbors. Well, sometimes that's uh, a very interesting relationship. If you should ever want to borrow anything, neighbor, I... Oh, I've got everything. Yes, you have. But if you should need something, well, after all, what are neighbors for? I never was really sure until now. Well, goodbye, neighbor. You know, Lieutenant, these trains are getting better equipment all the time. You, Deal Varden. Lieutenant. Hmm? Oh, what's my deal? Get her off your mind. She'll be there when you get back. Although they are rather prone to elope with interns. Templar, what are you talking about? My nurse, or uh, should I say our nurse. Get her off your mind and start concentrating on who hired Nick Nikoshenko to smoke down Tex McGowan. Hey, hey, where are you going? Uh, you don't have to be a detective to guess that. Oh, yeah. uh, uh-huh. I'm um, tired of cards. I'm, I'm going to be neighborly for a while. <laughs> See, I uh, knew it would come to this. I'd like to borrow something. What have you got in mind? Oh, anything. What have you got? Maybe we'd better talk it over. My name's Linda Jarvis. Simon Templer. Oh, that sounds very distinguished. Won't you come in? All my life I've been easily persuaded. Now, I want you to tell me all about yourself. You going to Chicago for business? pleasure? Well, uh, it started out to be business. And your friend, when I first met you in the corridor before, didn't didn't I hear you say he was a, a policeman? Oh, did you? I was simply fascinated by crime and policemen, and I bet you're going to Chicago to arrest somebody. Oh, you must tell me about it, please. It, it, it's so fascinating. Only in the comic books. The man you're going to arrest, what did he do? Is he a bank robber, a murderer? Please tell me everything. I'm all ears. You are? Well, fancy that. Oh, Simon. So enjoyed the trip, but you didn't tell me half of what I expected to hear about crime and criminals. Well, and... there were many more important things to talk about. Uh, do you happen to have a phone number handy? Only my own. But I don't think I'm going to give it to you. Now, is that being neighborly? Why, we were... Uh Uh-oh. Hmm? Lieutenant Varden. On his way to fetch me, there's an impatient look on his face. Look, Linda, when can I see you again? I I don't mean to break up what appears to be a beautiful friendship, but we're expected at Chicago Police Headquarters today. In other words, right about... (laughs) 
No! Pardon! Get me in the arm. No, only in the arm. Linda! She blew right after the shot. Look, I'll be all right. You go after her. All right, pardon. Excuse me, please. Let me through, please. Please, let me through. Come on. Buddy. A girl, tall, brunette. You see her? In that cab. The one turning out up there. You follow her. Hurry. Hey, mister. Her cab's stopping. So I see Pull up to the curb, right here. She's getting out. Going in that apartment house. Okay. This is the end of the line. Wait for me. It ain't gonna be long, is it? My shift ends in a half an hour. I've been pushing this hack all night. I'll be back in a few minutes. Don't worry about it. Flowers for Miss Jervis. Flowers for... <gasps> All right. So I'm not a rose. No. no, you can't come in. Sure I can, see? I'm in. How dare you? This is outrageous. Not nearly as outrageous as putting a finger on a fellow so that a rifleman knows who to shoot down. I haven't the slightest idea what you're talking about. Oh, sure you have, baby. Sure you have. That bullet was for me, wasn't it? Lieutenant Barden just happened to stroll into it. Simon, darling, why shouldn't... Why should I want to have you killed? I don't know you that well. But you know me well enough to know that I'm the only eyewitness to a murder. And that I should be eliminated, don't you? But I... What reason would I have to... If I should fail to identify a certain Nick Nimoshenko as the gunman who shot down Tex McCann, then the possibility of Mr. Nimoshenko's telling who hired him to do the job is very slight. I still have no idea what you're talking about. Then suppose we go down to police headquarters and I'll tell you all about it. Well, it's about time. How long was I supposed to keep him talking before you were ready to swing that club? Oh, I thought I'd let him feel he was living for a while. You know, Linda, I told this sucker he hadn't ought to come to Chicago. Oh, I told him. Oh. George! Beginning to wake up, is he? Uh huh. Oh, splendid. There's some questions I must ask him. He's beginning to flutter his eyes, boss. What? Oh, yes. Uh, what are you three staring at? Have, haven't you ever seen a man with two heads before? Feeling better, Mr. Templer? Not as good as when I was unconscious. It can be a rain, sucker. Making you unconscious is how I earn my pay. Uh, you had a better future when you were swinging through the trees. Huh? At least you were your, your own boss. That mean you're calling me an ape? Well, if the fur fits, wear it. All right, wise guy. Now Never I'll... Never mind, Stanley. Uh... Stanley. Throw him a banana. Why? Oh, Stanley! All right, I'll... Better not irritate him, Simon, darling. He's hot-headed. And soon he'll be sitting in a chair that's going to make him hot all over. And so will you, Linda. Oh, and last night on the train, you said such sweet things to me. Remember? I remember. Next time I go anywhere, I'll ride a freight. You meet a better class of tramps. Georgie's grouchy. Aren't you, Simon, darling? Stop pestering him, Linda. Let's get on with this. Yes, let's. Uh, Tex McGowan was a talkative man, was he not? You tell me. It's hardly likely that you'd agree to interest yourself in this affair without knowing all the facts. Uh, facts uh, concerning me. Uh, who are you? Uh, what do you do besides uh, train apes? George Haggerty, I'm a cattle broker. Oh. I'll bet you haven't been called Honest Weight Haggerty much lately. Ah, so he did tell you. Uh, what you do to a scale could uh, outmode reducing diets. What else did McGowan tell you? Uh, you've had it, no springs. Stanley. Okay, boss. The pleasure is mine. <laughs> all right, all right, Stanley. Let's keep him conscious for a while, shall we? Uh, you needn't bother. 
Uh, Mr. Temple, I trust you don't think all this is just idle curiosity on my part. Oh, don't apologize. I want to know how much McGowan told you so that I'll know how much you might have told the police. Thanks for the blueprint. What I mean is, if certain facts are known to the police, then it might be... uh, Well, it's quite possible, that is, that they'll be able to... Stop stabbing yourself. You want to know if the police have anything that establishes you as Nimoshenko's sponsor. Well, uh, have they? Next time you see your barber, get the top of your head shaved. The ones up at Sing Sing are so messy. You're lying. They don't know. Okay, I'm lying. Sweat it out, killer. Sweat it out. You mean beat it out, don't you? Stanley. How much? Went over lightly again? Not too lightly. But don't kill him until later. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> Well, Templin, going to talk to me now? What's the use, George? You'll never tell the truth. I know. I had a date with him. You're boasting. This is just a waste of time. Let Stanley get it over with. Yeah, that's what I say, boss. If the cops knew anything about us, they'd have been here a long time ago. Yes, I suppose you're right. All right, Stanley. How do you want it done? Oh, anyway, I don't care. Well, I do. That's what attracted me to you from the start, Linda. You looked like a neat housekeeper. Shut up. All right, take him out of here and throw him into Lake Michigan. Uh, uh, but uh, I didn't bring my bathing suit. Who? I have the least idea. Shall I answer it? You have to. The doorman knows you're in. Very well. Whoever it is, get rid of him and fast. Yes, what? Let me in. I'm yes, looking what? for a guy and I'm going to pin his ears back. That's what I'm going to do. But I... Look here, you can't burst into here like oh, that. Oh, I can't. What? You'd be surprised at what I can do when I'm sore and believe me, I'm... Oh, so there you are. Hello, Captain Carson. Don't go giving me no lip, brother. I told you I was off duty in a half an hour, and you said that you... Hey, how'd you get your face all banged up? Oh, it's all in the day's work. What's going on here? You've got your men stationed at all possible exits, Captain? Well, I... Haven't you, Captain? Well, sure. Oh, yeah, yeah, they're they're surrounding the whole building. Fine, Captain. And here are your three murderers, just as I promised. Now we'll Wait see. a minute. This doesn't look like any cop I've ever seen. Nor I. Don't let him reach for that gun. Oh, no, you don't. Let me go. Give Take me that gun. Thank you. Stanley, Stanley, hit him, hit him. Not me. I ain't going to hit no you... cop. Spoken like a gentleman of the old school. Not when they got all the exits covered, especially. I'm giving up. That's using your head, Stanley. Stanley, he isn't a... Here you are, Captain. Here's my gun. I'm ready to compare. I don't want your gun. I just want Take my... it, you fool. Take it. Okay, I'll cut it. Now do I get my fare? Yes, you get your fare, my friend. And you know what I'm going to give you for a tip? What's that? A new cab. But first, get on the phone and tell the police to come over, will you? Tell them there are some people here I'd like them to meet. You have been listening to another transcribed adventure of The Saint, the Robin Hood of modern crime. And now, here is our star, Tom Conway. Ladies and gentlemen, in our cast, you heard Joyce McCluskey as Linda and Sandra Gould as the nurse. Brooke Temple played Tex. Ted DeCorsi as George. Lamont Johnson was the lieutenant. Ed Max Stanley and Howard McNear, the cab driver. And this is Tom Conway inviting you to join us again next week at the same time for another exciting adventure of The Saint. Good night. Tonight's script of The Saint was written by Michael Cramoy. The Saint, based on characters created by Leslie Charteris, is a James L. Safier production and is directed by Helen Mack. Tom Conway is soon to be seen in the Warner Brothers production, Painting the Clouds with Sunshine. And all you Saint fans will be glad to know that the Saint comic books are on sale at all newsstands. Your announcer, Hal Gibney. It's the Silver Jubilee on NBC. Now stay tuned for more great mystery entertainment as Lloyd Nolan stars in Martin Kane, Private Eye, 
Yes, now hear Martin Kane, Private Eye, on this same NBC station. He's the daring private investigator who's become a popular hero throughout the nation. Now you'll hear Lloyd Nolan as Martin Kane every Sunday immediately following The Saint. Listen first for The Saint, and then stay tuned for Martin Kane, Private Eye, starring Lloyd Nolan. Hear him next on NBC, the national broadcasting company. Ladies and gentlemen, by transcription, we take you now behind the scenes of a police headquarters in a great American city, where under the cold, glaring lights will pass before us the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. This is The Lineup. Just take any one of the seats. You know, right, right here is fine. Hi, Ben. Oh, hello, Coin. How many you got? Six. All of the robberies? Yeah. I don't think we'll get much, though. I'm pretty sure the boys we want don't have a package. May I have your attention, please? You people hey, out I, there uh, on the other side of the wire in the someday. audience room, oh, okay, may I have sure. Your I'll see you in the office later. Huh? Right. Thank you. My name is Greb, Sergeant Matt Greb. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call off a number, their name, and charge. If you have any questions or identifications, please remember the number assigned to the prisoner as I call his name. At the end of each line, when I ask for questions or identifications, call out the number. If you're sure or not too sure of the suspect, have him held. The officers who took your name will assist you. They're seated among you. Please be prompt with your questions or identifications. When the prisoners leave here, they are sent to the bathroom and dressed back into their jail clothes. It makes it quite difficult to bring them back after they leave here. The questions I ask these suspects are merely to get a natural tone of voice. So do not pay too much attention to their answers as they often lie. Bring on the line. All right, keep it moving right over to the end of the stage. Right over here, boy. That's right. Okay, now face front, hands to your sides. Come on, you, come on, give him a little room up there. Now look, boys, this is a big room. You'll have to speak up so everybody can hear you. A lot of people out there, and they all want to hear what you got to say, so keep your voice up. Okay, number one, Joel Webster, robbery. Where do you live, Joel? 717 and a half west 108. Is that a hotel, a house, or what? Hotel. Has it got a name? Yeah. Ashton Arms. Who were you arrested with? Nobody. I was arrested alone. I wasn't with nobody. Any weapons? No. Didn't you have a knife? Yeah, but I wouldn't call it a weapon. Well, what would you call it? A knife. Just a knife. How big a knife was it? Oh, about this big, like this, when it's open. About eight inches? When it's open. It was open when you were picked up, wasn't it? Yeah, it got open. Okay, number two. Leonard Palms, robbery. All right, Leonard. Don't look at me. Look out at the people. I can't see him. What? Nothing. All right. Where do you live, Leonard? Just got to town. Okay. Where have you been staying? In your tank. I just got to town two days ago. Been here maybe an hour. I pull a job. I get picked up. I've been here for two days. That's where I've been staying. Where are you from? California, San Bernardino. You mean San Bernardino? Yes, yeah, San Bernardino. Were you arrested with anybody? Yeah, I was arrested with another guy, George Lumpkin. Right here, number seven. We're buddies. How long have you known him? Kids together. Lived in Verdu, San Bernardino, over on D Street, right behind where I used to live. Known him uh, 20 years, huh, George? Yeah, about 20. Any weapons? No, we never pulled nothing like this before. We got rolled on a train. Oh, you came in by train? Yeah, boxcar, rods. In the boxcar, a couple of guys piled on and rolled us. We needed dough, so we grabbed a purse, but we never done nothing like that before. Huh, George? See? Okay. 
Number three, Carl Young, robbery. Now, how about it? Any of these men? Where do you live, Carl? 889 South 4. Now, have him talk up, Matt, please. Right. You'll, uh, you'll have to be louder, Carl. 889 South Fuller, I live there. You always wear glasses? Yeah, I don't have to all the time, but I do. Take them off. Keep facing the front. What you gotta say, say it to the people out there, not to me. Yes, sir. You working, Carl? No, sir. Not in six or seven months. What do you do when you work? Gardener. Sometimes anything. Odd jobs and things. Any weapons? Yes, sir. A gun. What kind of a gun? 32, Smith & Wesson. Blue steel, nickel plate, or what? Nickel plated. I had it for about ten years. You own a car? No. Were you arrested with anyone? No. Where are you from, Carl? From here. I've been here all my life. I was brung up on the south side. I wish I wasn't from here. Now, how about it? Recognize any of these men? All right, number four. James Newton, robbery. Where do you live, James? 309 Greenlawn. Now, remember what I said about talking up? 309 Greenlawn. That's better. Where's that, James? South side, over near Garvey Hill. Who were you arrested with? Three fellas. They're in the other room. Guess in the next line. Who are they? A fellow named Bleeker, another guy named... Uh... Hi, Ben. Oh, you look a little tired. Yeah, a little. No identifications? Uh-uh. I didn't think they would. These boys don't have records. Well, they're sure going to have. Uh, eight robberies in a month. You know, got good descriptions. Yeah, they follow a pretty uniform M.O. Gas stations, all-night markets. Yeah. The best we can do is stake out every all-night market and try watching as many gas stations as possible. Uh, that's a big order. It sure is. Uh, you're with me tonight. Okay. We've got the west side market over on Fountain. You better go over and check out at Thompson just in case we're lucky. Lucky. Hmm. Gee, it's 2.30. Yeah. I'm sure getting tired of sitting here. 88. Ooh. If you see the humane officer... <sighs> What are you going to do tomorrow? Well, i got to go qualify if I want to keep my rating. Well, you rate expert, don't you? Yeah. Eight bucks a month. Well, it's my day off, too. I think I'll go along. Well, I'll pick you up. Okay. About ten? I'm picking Quine up, too. Yeah, he's a good shot. Darn good. i got to get up there. <laughs> my last qualification was in February. <laughs> February? Yeah. Boy, what did you start yawning for? <laughs> you know, I hate guys who pick on all night spots to stick up. We've already been here four hours. Well, one thing these guys aren't consistent about is the time they pick. Liable to be anywhere from 11 o'clock to 6 in the morning. Oh, that's well. Huh? Oh, my watch is fast. Yeah, here's All something. All units in area Q, a 211, code 4, at the Wheeler Market, 608 South Chestnut. All units in area Q, Well, this is what we've been looking for. Our boys have started Chestnut. using their guns. Ambulance is on its way. Take it away. Yeah, that's Asher. Uh, Quine's inside talking to the manager. Okay. All right. All right. Let us through, please. Let us get by, please. Come on. Come on. Who'd they haul off in the ambulance? Manager's son. Oh. Hello, Ben. All right. What happened? Uh, this is Mr. Bishop. He runs the store. This is Lieutenant Guthrie and Sergeant Greb, Mr. Bishop. I've got to get down at the hospital. That was his son in the ambulance. Yeah, Asher told me. Please, I should be with Jack. It was the four men we want, all right. They came in and held up the cash register, girl. Oh. Is that her? Yeah, the one crying. 
They asked for the money, and Mr. Bishop's son went for a gun under the counter. He wanted to protect the store. He wasn't afraid of them. Please, I've got to get down and see how he is. Asher. Yeah, Ben. See that Mr. Bishop gets down to the hospital. Get him there fast. Sure. Thank you. The car's out this way. Get a statement when he feels like it. Yeah, okay. Now let's go talk to the girl. Oh, okay. The name's Wilson. Jean Wilson. Engaged to the son. Yes, yeah. Miss Wilson? Yes. This is Lieutenant Guthrie. He'd like to talk to you. All right. Uh, Miss Wilson, uh, did you get a good look at the hold-up men? Yes. Oh, it was just terrible. I've never been in a hold-up or anything. It was, it was just awful. I wouldn't have one man shot, shot Jack. Oh, it was just terrible. You could I've identify never... the man who shot Jack, though, huh? Yes, I, I could identify him. I think I could identify all of them. All but the one who stood by the door. There were four of them? Four, yes. I, I got a good look at three of them. Two of them came right up to the cash register. The one stood right over there by the vegetable section, but I'd recognize him. Uh-huh. And the uh, the fourth, he stood by the door? Yes, right over there on, on the right side. I, I didn't see him until the two men who walked up to me took out guns and told me to give them all the money in the cash drawer. And then I noticed the one standing by the door, just sort of out of the corner of my eye. He had a gun, too. <laughs> I was scared to death, and, and Jack, hopefully he was standing in. <laughs> Jack was standing right behind her. When the holder boys showed their guns, Jack reached for her gun. His father kept under the counter. Still there. He never made it. Boy, I'm really tired. Yeah, me too. Been a long night. 4.30. I wonder how Mr. Bishop's boy is doing. We ought to hear soon. Hey, wait a minute. I got to wash up. Yeah, me too. <coughs> Matt? Huh? Want to lift home? Yeah, yeah, please. Hmm. Are you still going out to the range at 10? Yeah, I got to. I have to qualify tomorrow, or I don't qualify at all. Yeah. I sure wish we'd get these guys. Oh, we will. Might take a while, but we will. <coughs> Sooner or later, they'll make a mistake. We'll get spotted, and we'll get them. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> Well, the descriptions we've got from all the witnesses, somebody's got to spot them. Hi. Hi. Oh, hello, Asher. How's the bishop, kid? He's dead. Huh? Died ten minutes ago. I took Mr. Bishop home. He didn't feel much like making a statement. I felt like I was waving at a bus. You got a 98, Ben. Waving at a bus. That's what I felt like. <laughs> I wish I could wave like that. 97, Matt. Hey, how about Quine? We got a bet. I'm counting it up. You might as well pay up now, boy. I feel it today. <laughs> <laughs> the Annie Oakley of the 16th Precinct. <laughs> 99, Quine. What? You see? Come on, come on. Pay up. Uh, you probably made a deal with the range master. Come on, I hate Welshers. Let's have it. Okay, okay. Here's your dime. Wait a minute. You want to double it on the time fire? 20 cents? 20 cents. How are you going to eat next week? 20 cents. You want it or not? <laughs> you want in on this one, Beth? Sure. I'll get in on it. <laughs> okay. First half of rapid fire. Load and lock. Fire on third bell.
Wow. Oh, here comes Asher. Hello, Asher. Hi. Hey, you boys all look pretty mean. Second half of rapid fire, load and lock. Fire on third bell. Pretty good, Ben. Yeah, he waves, and every time he does, he shoots a 98. (laughs) They got two of the hold-up men. Oh, they did? Come on, Matt. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. You say they got the hold-up men? Two of them. Phillips had a rookie out in the car, spotted two guys in a parking lot, stealing some stuff out of the back of a car. A couple of young guys. Phillips and this rookie named uh, Crockett picked them up. That's wrong. They got two of the hold-up men. Phillips and a rookie picked them up. They didn't even figure that they might have been part of the hold-up gang. Caught them stealing something out of the car, huh? What? Well, they took them in, shook them down, but not very well. They were bringing them up the back way when one of them pulled a hideout gun. There was a fight on the steps. A rookie got both of them. One dead and the other's dying. I uh, just left Phillips' family. Well, what happened to Phillips? The one with the hideout gun killed him. Though each of us hopes the current war will not spread and the world peace will yet be achieved, the present crisis has made intensified military preparedness unavoidable. Men are being recruited for all the services. The Army, Navy, Marines, Air Force, and Coast Guard. Volunteers mean high morale and efficiency for our armed forces. Go to your nearest recruiting office to see if you are eligible to volunteer. Volunteer today and be the leader of tomorrow. Second floor, please. Yes, sir. Hello, Guthrie. How are you, Doc? Uh, Sergeant Graham. Yeah, I, I know the doc. Yeah, how are you, Sergeant? <sighs> okay. Your man's in here. Bullet severed the cervical spine. He's in bad shape. His partner's in the morgue. Jacobs? <laughs> Jacobs, he was talking ten minutes ago. Jacobs, this is Lieutenant Guthrie, Jacobs. He wants to talk to you. Jacobs, we want to know where we can find your other two partners. Where's Eddie? He's dead. You killed a policeman, Jacobs. I don't know nothing. You killed a policeman, and we know you're one of four men who've been pulling off those robberies. We got Eddie, and we got you. We want to know who the other two men are. Told Eddie we should have left those cars in one small time. The other two men, Jacobs. <laughs> no good, Eddie. Let's get out of here. One of you killed that boy in the grocery store. Now tell us who the other two men are. He doesn't know what he's saying. You won't get anything out of him now. We gotta find those other two. <laughs> Sorry, Sergeant. He's in a coma. Okay. I'll put a man on him in case he comes to and wants to talk. He'll need an oxygen tent if he's going to pull through. Well, do you think he'll make it? I doubt it. That slug went in crazy. Right in his hand, up his arm, and through his body. He must have hit his arm out straight. That's right. Pointing a gun. I'm going to see about the tent. Hello. Robbery, please. I, uh... I talked with Crockett, the rookie. He's just sick about it. Hello, Coyne. Guthrie, I want a man up here to stay with Jacobs. No, no, he's he's in a coma, but he may come around. I want a man here. Yeah. Yeah? Well, what's the address? Uh, just a minute, wait. Hey, give me that pencil, Matt, and that pen. Here. All right. All right, go ahead. 445 North Elm. Okay. His uncle, huh? Ketchel? Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, Matt and I'll take him. Yeah, bye. What's up? They got an address on Jacobs, 445 North Elm. Lives with his uncle, Mr. Ketchell. Well, things are getting hotter. 
Which way, Lieutenant? Down. Yes, sir. Mr. Ketchum? Yeah. Police. What do you want? We'd like to talk to you. Okay, come on in. The place is a mess. Excuse it. <coughs> hey, we can sit in here. It ain't so dirty in here. <coughs> How about a drink? No, thanks. You don't mind? I'm going to have one. Just grab a chair. We want to talk to you about your nephew. Yeah, I figured. Sure you won't have a short one? No, thanks. <coughs> Lousy cough. Had it for a month. No. More than a month. Had the lousy thing since December. Cheers. <coughs> Your nephew's in the hospital. He is? He was shot. He killed a policeman. <coughs> killed a cop, huh? How do you like that? Well, he ain't no nephew of mine. I'm not really his uncle. My wife's nephew. She's dead. I brought him up. He was with a friend, Eddie Klein. Yeah, just like Jake. No good. Knew Jake would get thrown into jail sooner or later. Never thought he'd kill a cop. We're looking for two more of his friends. Two more? Your nephew? He ain't no nephew. Jacobs and Klein, along with two other men, started holding up stores and gas stations a week ago. Holding up stores and gas stations? Yeah. And we want to know where we can find the other two men. And sticking up places. Kills a cop. And a young boy who worked in one of the stores. <laughs> got to get me another drink. You sure? Uh, no, thank you. Hey, never was any good. I, I brung him up. His family died when he was three, I think. Wife's sister. Come to live with us. Wife died ten years ago. Never could do anything with him. Yeah, he's been getting in trouble. Oh, those kids making all kinds of racket. I told them. Hey, cut that out. Cut it out. Little brats. Beat that dishpan all day. Look, Mr. Ketchum, can you help us on the other two men? Well, one of them would probably be Willie Harris. They run around together. Where does Willie Harris live? A rooming house over on Maple, next block. Don't know the address, but it's in the middle of the block. All right, thanks, Mr. Ketchum. Sure. Kills a cop, sticks up stores. They get much money out of these stores? Quite a bit. Never showed none of it around here. <coughs> so long. Thirteen J, a four five nine at Lincoln and Washington. Yeah, this looks like the place. Rooms. Eighty eight, code six. Oh, that's us. 88, Roger. Let's go, Matt. I'll use the phone in the rooming house. I wonder what's up. Uh, if Willie Harris lives here, I'll want to call in anyway. And if he's one of the boys that... Yes. The police. Oh, is something wrong? Does Willie Harris live here? Well, yes. Has he done something? Is he in? No, hasn't been in since yesterday. Well, I'd like to use your phone. Well, all right. Has Willie done something? You're going to arrest him? No, we're not sure. We want to talk with him. Where'd you say that phone was? Oh, right in there on the stand. Oh, thanks. Wouldn't be a bit surprised if Willie's done whatever you think he's done. I've never liked him. Has, uh, has he had any money in the last two weeks? Uh, yes, he's paid some of his back rent. I don't know where he got it. He isn't working. Hello, this is Guthrie. Uh, thanks. It's Quine, Matt. Willie Harris came into some money this week. Oh, much money? Yeah. Paid his back rent. Yes, he hasn't been. Oh, uh, hello, Quine. Yeah? Oh, yeah? Well, look, uh, we're over to Rooming House. We got a lead on a guy named Willie Harris. Might be one of them. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, we wait. Yeah, they, they might just show you. Okay. Yeah. Now, the hold up. Same M.O., only two men this time. You think Willie was one of them? Might be. If you don't mind, we're going to wait here in case he shows up. Everybody's out. 
They made a mistake around the block. I just talked to Quine. He spotted across the street in the alley. Did you find anything? Yeah. Slugs from a thirty-eight. Hmm? No gun. Say, it was a thirty-eight that killed that bishop boy. Mm-hmm. I'd like to find some of that money. Shh. Huh? Somebody came in. Yeah, it's coming up here. Get over by the door. Don't move! Hey, look out, man! I got it. Now here. Here's your 38. Uh, okay, okay, get up. Hey, what is this? Where's your partner? What do you mean? Eddie's dead. Jacobs is dying. Where's your partner? I don't know what you're talking about. Take him down, man. Hey, hey, look. Can't I, still Wait you. a minute, will you? Here, Ben. Ah, it's a nice bundle of dough. I want it. I want it. You just held up a gas my... station on Lincoln Boulevard. No, I didn't. That kid in the grocery store died. Oh, now, wait a minute. Will you wait we a minute? We got a dozen witnesses who can make an identification on you. I didn't shoot that guy in the grocery store. I didn't shoot him. Who did? Oh, Frank. Frank shot him. Frank who? Frank Woodard. You and Frank held up that gas station? Yeah. Where's Frank now? He went home. 618 North Wilton. He was tired. He was going to take a nap. <laughs> Get up. He said, get up. Hey, what, Grab what him, Matt. Grab him. Let go, will you? Let go. Yeah. Sit there to get under the pillar. And the bundle of dough. Hey, you busted. Get man. up. You're not. All right, all right. Get your pants on. All right. Who told you where I was, Willie? Yeah, Willie. Look, you can't prove Can nothing. It? Come on, let's go. What about a shirt? Leave the pajama top on. We'll give you a whole new outfit downtown. Okay, okay. Any trouble? No. You can have them, Quine. Oh, here. This is yours. What for? Sixty cents. Matt and I got 96 in that last round of rapid fire. You had a 98. Lineup, where before you pass the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. Listen again next week when we again bring you the lineup. May I have your attention, please? <laughs> you people out there on the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention, please? <laughs> Thank you. My name is Greb, Sergeant Matt Greb. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call off a number, their name and charge. <laughs> If you have any questions or identifications, please remember the number assigned to the prisoner, as I call his name. At the end of each line, when I ask for questions or identification, The Lineup, starring Bill Johnstone as Lieutenant Ben Guthrie and Wally Mayer as Sergeant Matt Greb, is written by Blake Edwards with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were High Everback, Gil Stratton, Vic Perrin, Sam Edwards, Jack Moyles, Gene Bates, Herb Butterfield, Tony Barrett, and Virginia Gregg. The lineup is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. CBS will bring you General Dwight D. Eisenhower's first report to the American people tomorrow evening. This CBS broadcast will be General Eisenhower's public review of his recent visits to the Atlantic Pact Nations, where he laid the groundwork for rearmament under his direction as Supreme Commander. Earlier tomorrow evening, Edward R. Murrow and Hear It Now will bring you a picture of Detroit, Arsenal of the Republic, as it girds for defense production. And for light entertainment, Jan Murray will be present with his songs for sale. Songs for Sale, Hear It Now, and General Eisenhower's Report will be heard tomorrow evening on most of these same CBS stations. Your favorite daydreams can come true if you save regularly with United States Savings Bonds. Use the payroll savings plan where you work or the bond-a-month plan where you bank. 
by United States Savings Bonds. Dan Coverly speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Now, Roma Wines present. Suspense. Tonight, The Lodger, and our distinguished star appearing as the storyteller and as The Lodger, Robert Montgomery. Suspense is presented for your enjoyment by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Those excellent California wines that can add so much pleasantness to the way you live. Finding ways to make living more enjoyable is an art in which Miss Elsa Maxwell is an expert. This famous hostess and authority on hospitality gives you a good thought. Entertaining friends is one of life's finest pleasures. And I suggest to you, next time you have friends in to dinner, serve them either ruby red Roma Burgundy, so tartly rich and piquant, or pale golden Roma Sautern with its delicate, delicious flavor. If you choose Burgundy, serve it cool. Or if Sauterne, serve it well chilled. Use any glasses you have and serve whichever one you like best with any food. I happen to like Burgundy with the richer meat dishes. Sauterne with fowl, fish, or the like. But you follow your own taste and you'll be perfectly correct. The main point is, serving these wonderful Roma wines is a delightful compliment to your friends and a great addition to the adjoinment of meals. Well, the only possible thought I can add is that Roma Burgundy and Sauterne, like all Roma wines, are the best that California's magnificent sun-ripened grapes can provide in fine flavor, color, and fragrance are always unvaryingly good and delicious, protected by all the ancient skill of Roma's noted wineries. Yet all this goodness is yours for only pennies a glass. Listen, more Americans enjoy Roma than any other wines. Roma, R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Yes, right now a glass full would be very pleasant as Roma Wines bring you... Suspense! This is the man in black, with a few words concerning London in the year 1888. A London terrorized by the fifth in a succession of recent murders. Murders of young, attractive women. The unknown killer at large and little else absorbed the horrified imagination of the great city. Of all those in fine quarters and all those in small, grimy houses. As, for example, Ellen Bunting. Ellen was no different from all the other middle-aged housewives dwelling in squalid Whitechapel. She knew all the known facts of the case. As that artful storyteller, Mr. Robert Montgomery, will tell you, Ellen knew it was quite proper to refer to this wielder of the knife as... The Avenger. On Thursday night, the 16th of April, 1888 it was. Ellen Bunting and Robert, her husband, sat before their fireplace reading the newspaper account of the latest murder. The Avenger had struck again. As Ellen expressed it, he might be anybody. He might be the fellow you pass on the street. The fellow standing next to you, the man you bump into, Oh, it's a terrible thought. Yes, if only the police had something to go on. But it looks like the Avengers just too quick for them. Look, uh, it says here that this girl he got last night was like all the others. Pretty, blonde, and, um, let's see, described by her friends as a very light-hearted girl. Oh, what a pity. Hmm. Did you ever stop to think who fits that to a T? In fact, fits all those girls? Why? My own daisy. Yes. Well, 
Well, maybe it's a good thing she's with her aunt instead of here. London ain't a safe place for any girl right now. Just the same. I can't help thinking how fine it'll be to have her back. Now, Bunting, you know that Daisy seems just as much my own daughter as she is yours. But I'm telling you, there's no sense even thinking about having her back right now. We just can't afford it. I know that, Ellen. Only, well, maybe we could manage it some way. And How? Uh... Haven't I scrimped myself half crazy trying to keep us going? But you don't care about that, do you? Oh, no, your daisy's more important to you than no, I am. No, 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 and, uh, Ellie. We that haven't had a lodger like for months. Nobody even comes to look at the room anymore. And, oh, oh, I'm sorry, Robbie. I didn't mean to take on so... Oh, no, Ellen, it's all right. Well, don't you go worrying another second, old girl. First thing you know, you won't be pretty no more. Why, you'll have your face all wrinkled... Now, this... see here, Bunty. Oh, come on, no. Let's oh. see a smile. <laughs> come on, come on, just one. Oh, leave me alone. <laughs> I won't have... Oh, get on with you. <laughs> now, who do you suppose that could be? Awful late for visitors. I... Bunting... Do you think it could be somebody looking for rooms? Why, it might be. You want me to go to the door? No, 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 I'll go. You just stay in here. And I'll be sure to get a good look at who it is before you let him in, dear. I'm coming. <clears throat> oh, I, I do hope that it's... Yes, sir? Is it not true that you let lodgings? Yes, sir. Uh, won't you come in, sir? Thank you. Uh, could I, uh, could I take your cape, sir? There's no need. Now, I am just looking for a quiet room. It must be quiet. Oh, we have that, sir. Above all, our house is quiet. Your bag, sir. May I take it? No. I'll hold it. If you'll be so good as to show me the room, please. Oh, yes. Uh, yes, sir. It's right up these stairs, sir. Uh, this way. Thank you. Uh, you see, sir, uh, there's just my husband and me here, and, and we're ever so quiet, and, and I'm sure you'll find this room to your liking, sir. Oh, here we are. Now, uh, I'll just uh, light the gas. There. Very good. It is pleasant, isn't it, sir? And, and there's not many rooms with such pretty pictures, are there now? We have uh, had them in the family for years, sir, and we're... Pictures interest me very little. You see, what really impresses me about the room is the very simplicity of it, the bareness. Yes, sir. It's not at all crowded, is it? It will be quite suitable, Mrs... Uh... Uh, Bunting, sir. Mrs. Bunting. You see, I do a great deal of reading in my book here, the Holy Bible. Yes, sir. Anna, please, sir, let me help you with your luggage. No. I... Don't touch it. But I, I only you wish... You only to... wish to help, of course. You must forgive me, Mrs. Bunting. It's just that I'm so very weary. Of course, sir. He bringeth them to their desired haven. Beautiful words, Mrs. Bunting. Indeed they are, sir. And now at last, I have found my haven of rest. Yes, sir. Then, uh, then you'll be taking the room? Yes. I shall pay you 30 shillings a week. This is satisfactory? 30? Uh, why, why, yes, sir. Yes, sir, that will be quite all right. Good. My name is Sleuth, Mrs. Bunting. Mr. Sleuth. S-L-E-U-T-H. Think of a hound, Mrs. Bunting, and you'll never forget my name. Twenty-three. Four. Thirty. Thirty shillings. Thank you, sir. And uh, would you be wishing anything now? A supper, tea? Nothing, thank you. Good night, sir. Good night, Mrs. Bunting. You have... Stop it! Oh! Oh, yes, sir. What did I do? That song you were humming. That music. But I... Music, Mrs. Bunting, save that expressing the majesty of God, is an accompaniment for irreverent gaiety and an instrument of sin. Yes, sir. And you... You assured me your dwelling was quiet. But it is, sir. Believe me, sir, I, I didn't mean any harm. I... Of course, of course. I'm sorry, Mrs. Bunting. I fear I spoke sharply. I don't wish you to think me rude. After all, you have been so kind, so considerate. I hope I know a gentleman when I see one. Thank you. Thank you very much. And on second thought... Perhaps a bit of bread and butter would be pleasant. Bread and butter? Uh, certainly, sir. I'll have it in an instant. Ellen! Ellen! Did he take the room? Come and 
to the kitchen where he won't hear us. He, well, he took it. He took the room. Yes, Robbie, we're all right now. Look, 30 shillings a week in advance. Oh, it's wonderful, wonderful. Ellen, do you see what this means? Yes, you can have Daisy now. Uh, here, Bunting, hand me that dish. Right. Do you know something, old girl? We're not going to worry too much about Daisy being in danger of that Avenger fellow. Whatever do you mean, Robbie? Well, she's not one for dancing, you know, or any kind of like entertainment. Mm, what's that to do with it, please? Something I read here in the paper while you was with the gentleman. They found out that every one of the Avengers' victims had just come from a dancing party or a music hall. What a peculiar chap. Now, Harry Bunting, please. Two thoughts, two thoughts only, governed Ellen's mind. The lodger's light supper and her own good fortune at having such a lodger. She started up the staircase to his room. Oh. oh. She hath cast down many wounded from her. Yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Come in, and to know the wickedness of folly. <gasps> why, why, mister... Yes, what is it? Those pictures, those pretty girls. You've turned all their faces to the wall. And that maneuver, that strange action, was the beginning of Ellen's concern. The day following, the lodger did not leave the upstairs room once, nor did he leave the next day. And the oddness of this occurred to her and the approaching arrival of Daisy, her stepdaughter, added to her concern. On the second night, her sleep was restless with vague, disturbing images. And so when she heard the first stealthy footsteps outside her bedroom, she was instantly awake. Oh! Tensely, she followed those steps down the stairs, down the hallway, she heard the front door open and then click shut. Utter stillness fell upon the house, and outside the streets were so silent she could hear distinctly the clock from a church tower a mile away toll the hour. In her troubled fancy, she pictured a long figure plodding through the deep fog, moving quietly, stealthily, searching, stalking, Finding. When, soon after, she heard the lodger return, she sought to quiet the horrible dread which had possessed her. But for Ellen, there was no more sleep, merely a tormented state of half-consciousness which suddenly dropped from her soon after dawn. Horrible murder! Horrible murder. That was the piercing scream of a newsboy far down the street. The Avengers draws during the night! Ellen Bunting heard the boy cry out the Avengers' latest stroke, made during the night. No, no. Extra special, horrible murder at King's Cross. Avenger takes six victims special. Avenger is recognized. Another lone victim of nine. Avenger strikes again. Ellen's first glimpse that morning of the gray-faced lodger brought the sleepless night's terror full to the surface. But on the next instant, she saw the pitiable, helpless weariness in his eyes. And curiously, the terror began to pass. She found that she was hoping desperately that her fears were unfounded. To lose 30 shillings a week, perhaps because of a mistake? No. She must be certain, certain, before she spoke to a soul. She knew that there was one thing she must examine, the lodger's single piece of luggage. What could it hold? Not much in the way of clothing, surely. It was too small, too narrow. It was more like a case. A case for a knife. It was almost noon before Ellen found her opportunity to search the lodger's room. Soon after, Bunting left to meet Daisy, Ellen watched the tall, thin figure in the black Inverness cape 
disappear down the street. And then she rushed upstairs and into the room. Quickly she moved to the closet. It was no different than it had always been, utterly empty. She went then to the chest of drawers against the wall. She opened the top drawer and found nothing inside but a frayed shirt, two handkerchiefs. The next drawer, underclothes, socks, the next empty. There remained then only one possible place for the small, narrow bag, the bottom drawer. And it was locked. Tugging at the drawer, she heard suddenly the opening of the front door downstairs. Oh. Panic-stricken, she rushed out of the room and down the hall to the head of the stairs. You're upstairs, Ellen. Oh, look, look, Ellen. Daisy's here. Oh, it's so good to see you. And what? Whatever's the matter? Yes, you're gone quite white. Oh, well, I, I'm all right. I, I wasn't expecting you so soon. Oh, you don't know how fine it is to be back again, Mother Ellen. Now, the country's all right in its way, but there's nothing like London now, is there? No, no, there isn't. Well, as long as that Avenger's about, I can see we're going to have to do something to keep this young lady indoors, London oh, or no London. Don't you worry. Mother Ellen will see to that. Well, Daisy, I might as well get you settled. Oh, you see, Father, what I tell you. She'll have a dust cloth in my hand before I got time to take my coat off. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Sleuth. Mrs. Bunting. I see my door is open. Uh, we, we was just leaving, sir. Does this mean that all of you have been in my room? Oh, not all, sir. What must I do? Keep it locked? Uh, but you see, sir, I I was just tidying up a bit, and, and Mr. Bunting, he, he brought his daughter up, sir. She's just arrived. Uh, this is uh, uh, Daisy, sir. Pleased to meet you, sir. Uh, uh, she's been away for quite a long while, you see, Mr. Sleuth, and that's why we're a bit excited, you might say. <laughs> yes. You must have been surprised when you came in hearing us laughing and carrying on that way. Yes. Yes, I must say I was. However, Miss Daisy, there are all types of joy, are there not? Uh, uh, y yes, I I'm sure there are. The despicable evil joy of the abandoned and the divine happiness of the blessed... A vast difference, that. You do understand me, don't you? Why, uh, yes, sir. Yes, Mr. Sleuth. I devoutly hope so, Miss Daisy. Nowadays, there are so very few young women like yourself who do. All women are placed on this earth filled with evil. They, therefore, must struggle constantly to find the paths of righteousness. Why, Mr. Sleuth, you mean a girl's not to enjoy life at all? Not to have fun? Frivolity, my child, is the devil's breeding ground. All his implements are there. Pleasure, impropriety, the temptation of music, dancing. Oh, that's crazy. Why, there's nothing I like better than an evening of dancing. You and dance? She didn't know what she was saying, Mr. Sleuth. Just a child. And, and Daisy, you know you've never been one for dancing. You, you never even learned how but to. I did learn, Mother Ellen, while I was away. And what's so wrong about it? What's the harm in just a nice dance? She lieth in wait as for a prey, and increaseth the transgressors among men. I don't know what you mean. I never heard such nonsense. You call holy scripture nonsense? So, what I prayed against is true. You are beyond salvation. That's not so. I'm a good girl, I'm, and I won't have you saying that. Daisy. Daisy, go into the front room. It's quite all right, Mrs. Bunting. I must be going upstairs anyway. I'm used to being misunderstood, you know. People never realize that my efforts are simply for the greater good of humanity. Of course, sir. And that the power on high will direct my hand toward the expulsion of all evil. Beautiful words. Beautiful words. Daisy. Daisy, listen to me. Yes? I I've got to tell you about... Uh, about... Uh, about what, Mother Ellen? Nothing. I I've got to go out for a while. I I'll be back. At that moment, Ellen had been determined to pour out her terrible suspicions. But she paused on the very brink. After all... They were still only suspicions. 
A sudden inspiration had come to her. That very day, a coroner's inquest was being held into the last Avenger murder. She would go there now, this very instant, and perhaps she would hear evidence to disprove all her fears about the lodger. She must give him this last chance. If that chance should fail, then she would tell Bunting or the police. So with the knowledge that Bunting was left in the house to look after Daisy, she boarded the underground train bound for the coroner's court. Ellen, seated at the rear of the inquest room, listened to each of the witnesses, and from one of them she found the first hope she had known for many days. This witness claimed to have seen the Avenger from her window, and the man she described in no way resembled Ellen's lodger. But in another moment, Ellen's hope was swept away. It was pointed out that the fog had been so heavy that night that the witness could not possibly have seen the murderer from her window. The next witness was a Mr. Cannot. This elderly gentleman was certain that he had not only seen but talked with the Avenger. It was in Regent's Park, he testified. Only, only a few, a few moments before the murder, Mr. Coroner, when I, when I saw him. He was quite a tall man, very gaunt-looking, and carrying a handbag. Uh, uh, a handbag, you say? Yes, a small, narrow one. Just such a bag, I might add, as might contain a knife. A knife? He had a rather an eye-hesitating voice, an educated man, I should judge, but <laughs> quite mad. What do you mean by that? Well, as he emerged from the fog, he was talking aloud to himself. And believe me, sir, he was reciting scriptures from the Bible. Scriptures from the Bible. Horrified, Ellen rose from her seat, only half hearing the confusion about her. Are you asking us to believe that? I would say, Mr. Cannot, that the man we're looking for would be, least of all, a religious man. That's where you're in error, Mr. Coroner. The religious note is the very key to the case. Very interesting. Uh, that will be all, Mr. Cannon. Uh, just a moment, sir. Don't you understand? The man you're after must be a religious maniac. That's the only explanation possible. You will please step down. The court was dismissing the very truth. Ellen knew that now. She could no longer keep silent. Her hand shot forth and she screamed. I, I want to say I... I... No... On the verge of speaking, she had fainted. And then when Ellen was revived a few minutes later, she said nothing. Her brain was in too great a turmoil, her nerves too shocked. Like one in a dream, she allowed herself to be led from the courtroom. And then she made her way toward the underground. A faint, distant rumble of thunder never even reached her consciousness. And she was barely aware of the grind of the wheels as her train pulled away from the station. Then with the force of a mighty blow, the full realization struck her. No doubt, no doubt any longer, Mr. Sleuth, her own lodger, was the murderer. He was the avenger. The Avenger, the Avenger, the Avenger. <laughs> On the street again, Ellen knew she must go at once to her neighborhood police and there pour out her terrible knowledge. But with each moving footstep, with each heavier boom of thunder from the rainstorm that was almost there, the grip of terror grew tighter and tighter about her. She moved faster faster. If only she were in time. The first light drops of rain sprinkled her brow as she came within two streets of home. Then she was one street away. Then she saw Bunting. Sharply like the thrust of a knife, the one fact pierced her mind. Daisy was now alone with the lodge. Bunting! Bunting! Why, Ellen, Ellen, what is it? Tell me, Bunting, where's Daisy? Where is she, I say? What, Daisy? Where's Daisy? Why, she's at home. Why? Listen What's to the... me. Try to understand. Sleuth is the Avenger. What? What? What are you saying? Our larger. He's the Avenger, Bunting. Daisy's in danger. Oh, Hurry. Yes, yes, Daisy. Daisy. Oh, 
wanting. <laughs> Daisy! 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 Where are you? I'll look in the kitchen, Bunting. You try the sitting room. Daisy! Daisy! Where are you, Daisy? Daisy! Daisy! Oh, yeah, yeah, let's try the bedroom. Oh, she's not there. Oh, what about the dining room? Oh, I looked. She's not there. She's not downstairs. Then there's just his room. Forget the old Jerusalem. Let my right hand forget her cunning. And now hear me, O Lord. Daisy. I have not forgotten. I am ready. The knife. He's got the knife. Ready to smite thine enemy. For man born of woman is born unto trouble. And I shall cleanse thy kingdom on earth. Yea, I shall show her thy wrath from heaven. No. Stop. Speak, o Lord. Daisy. I am ready. The power on high will direct the expulsion of evil. Yes, yes, O oh Lord, my servant parent. And now... He's dead. Daisy. Come to me, Daisy. Oh, thank heaven. Yes, thank heaven. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. And his word burned like a pillar of fire. death by act of God. Thus the final entry in Scotland Yard's record of the famous Avenger case. Yet curiously enough, there were those at the Yard who were never quite sure, never entirely convinced that Mr. Sleuth was indeed the Avenger, any more than Mrs. Bellock Lowndes, who novelized the case, was convinced. There are those who will tell you that the real Avenger a tall man clad in black, a man almost exactly like Mr. Sleuth, left England and came to America to live in a town near yours. He would be quite old now, but it may be true. Yes, perhaps, as it is written in Holy Scripture, he did fly upon the wings of the wind to walk as a stranger in many lands. Hast thou found me, O mine enemy? Beautiful words, those. Beautiful words. Don't you think? And so closes The Lodger, starring Robert Montgomery. Tonight's study in... Suspense. Suspense is produced, edited, and directed by William Spear. In everything she says about enjoying Roma wine when entertaining and with everyday meals, Miss Elsa Maxwell holds out for simplicity and common sense. I've often been a guest in great homes abroad where enjoyment of good wines is as much a part of life as eating. And I tell you, the kind of glasses in which you serve your Roma wine is completely unimportant. Just use any glasses you have. Serve whatever Roma wine you like with whatever food you prefer. That is smart, simple, and always a delight. The important thing, Miss Maxwell says, 
is to have Roma wine and enjoy it regularly. Roma wines are California's finest, always extra good, unvaryingly fine in flavor and quality, yet only pennies a glass. So don't miss this simple, easy, enjoyable addition to daily living. Remember, more Americans enjoy Roma than any other wines. Robert Montgomery appeared through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, to whose studios he has just returned, having been ordered to inactive duty after three and a half years' service with the United States Navy. He will shortly begin work on the production, They Were Expendable. Next Thursday, same time, you will hear a radio play based on the RKO picture, The Brighton Strangler, with Mr. John Loder and Miss June Dupre as your stars of Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines, R-O-M-A, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Signal gasoline. Let every traffic signal remind you, you do go farther with signal gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with signal. The Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood signal dealer bring you another curious story by The Whistler. Tonight, Death Watch. I am the Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Did you ever commit a murder? No? Then you don't know, do you, how irresistible is the urge of the murderer to return to the scene of his crime. It's a very overpowering feeling. Especially if you're not even sure that... Oh, but wait, I'm getting ahead of the story. They found Lucille Doan late at night on the floor of a not-too-lavish apartment. A neighbor noticed a light that had been burning for 24 hours, blundered in and found her. The police came very quickly. The coroner arrived shortly after. And he and Detective Rock Adrian looked over the body. Well, coroner, what do you say? Mr. Adrian, she's dead. Plenty dead. Cause of death? Do I have to tell you? You can see... I can see, but I want your official verdict for the record. Well, you can put down death from repeated blows over the head by a heavy instrument. How many is repeated blows? Mm, 20, 25 at least. How old would you say she was? I'd say around 30. Would you say she was pretty? Beautiful? She was certainly better looking than she is now. Why worry? The papers will headline her as a raving beauty. The newspapers won't hear about this case yet. Time of death? Oh, I'd say about this time last night. Well, I guess I got everything I need from you. Go ahead if you're through. I am, and glad of it. This isn't my favorite kind of case. You coming? No, 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 not just yet. And, uh, Karna. Yeah? Don't talk about this to anyone, especially reporters. Right. Say, you got any ideas on this one, Mr. Adrian? Uh, nothing much. But I don't think the murderer of Lucille Doan is sleeping peacefully tonight. Well, I don't blame him. I wouldn't either if I'd done something like that. Well, 
Yes, and how right you are. The murderer of Lucille Doan is not sleeping peacefully tonight. Is he, Oliver? No, Oliver Gorst is walking the streets, wandering aimlessly, paying little attention to traffic, thinking, thinking. <coughs> hey, hey, why don't you look where you're going? What's the idea? Oh, I, I'm sorry, I, I wasn't thinking. I, I mean, I was thinking about something else. I'm sorry. Hey, are you all right? You don't look so good. I'm all right. There's nothing the matter with me. Stop staring at me. I'm all right. Okay, brother, Okay. You better watch out where you're going. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Watch where I'm going. Watch. Where am I going? I started toward home, but I... I'm walking downtown. I... I am almost to Lucille's place. No, no, I can't do it. I, I can't go back there. Not now. But why do I keep walking in that direction? Why? Why? Yes, why, Oliver? Why this irresistible desire to go back to the scene of the crime, as they call it? it? Seems to get worse all the time, doesn't it? It's almost a quarter to twelve, just 24 hours since you killed her. Now you want to go back. But that's dangerous, you know that. The police might be there right now, gathering clues. And they'll peer through microscopes, test things, interview people, and soon they'll be combing the city for you. The murderer returns to the scene of the crime. If that's true, then why don't the police just wait there for them? Maybe they are. Maybe they're waiting there for me right now. I mean, I, I've got to be careful. I'm almost there. I, I can't go. I can't. It, it's suicide. Here's a timely little gift offer for all you Whistler fans who drive cars. You see, July 1st, that's next Sunday, is the deadline for getting the new federal use stamp on your windshield. Well, since that little stamp has to hang on through a whole year of wear and window washing, you certainly don't want to have it peel or scuff off around the edges. So Signal Oil Company has had some special transparent use stamp protectors made up. They're neat looking, they're easy to apply, and they're free. Yours for the asking at any Signal gasoline dealer. Of course, like everything in wartime, supplies are limited, and every car will be needing one. So I'd suggest that you get yours this week. Just drive into any of the friendly stations displaying Signal's yellow and black circle sign and say, I'd like one of Signal's use stamp protectors that was offered free on The Whistler. And now, back to The Whistler. Well, Oliver Gorst, you can tell yourself that it's suicide to go back to the scene of your crime. But you can't stop that irresistible desire to go anyway, can you? Your head tells you to turn around and run, but your feet take you closer and closer. You'd better be careful, Oliver. You'd better be careful. There the devil's a switch. Hey, anyone here? Hello, Inspector. They told me I'd find you here, Adrian. What's up? The idea of camping here and not letting the newspapers have the story. Not so loud, Inspector. Close the door. Yeah. I've got a hunch about this crime. I'm listening. Better be good. Where's Arnold and Henderson? Not sleeping. Sleeping? And just what do you do while they slumber? Wait. We take turns. For what? The murderer. I don't get it. Whoever killed Lucille Doan did it in a moment of blind fury and then rushed out of here thinking only of escape. Mm. Only then did he realize what he'd done. Now he's bound to have the jitters. Every time he picks up a newspaper, he expects to read about the crime. If we keep this thing still, our silence will puzzle him. We'll begin to wonder whether the police have discovered the body. He might come back for any number of reasons. But I think he'll come back lured by all the doubts and hopes and curiosity our silence can stir up in the mind of one who's come face to face with murder for the first time. Murder's very upsetting, you know. Yeah, especially for the victim. 
Well, all right, Adrian, go ahead. Some of your wacky ideas have been your most successful ones, and I'll string along, but don't take too long. Thank you, Inspector. I'll take care of the chief in the newspapers. Good night and good luck. The detective has a hunch, Oliver, and it's a pretty good one. Of course, you don't know it, but he's figured you out pretty well. Except when you committed murder, you were more surprised than upset. Yes, you couldn't believe you'd done it. You wanted to go back and convince yourself right then. But something told you not to. Instead, you ate a big supper. Murder made you terribly hungry. There was nothing like a good meal to buck a man up. Only now you wish you had gone back, don't you? Just to make sure. Maybe I... Maybe I didn't do it after all. Maybe it's something I dreamed. I've often thought of killing someone. No. Of killing her when she was causing so much trouble. That's it. I dreamed of killing her, and the dream was so vivid, I thought it actually happened. I have to go back to convince myself it isn't true. <laughs> She'll be surprised to see me so soon after our quarrel. I'll look around, and if I don't see any blood stains, I'll know it didn't happen. But why can't a man be sure about something like that? It's such an awful thing to do. Kill a human being. I couldn't have done it. I'd feel remorse. I, I'd have such a sense of guilt, I'd have to give myself up or, or drown myself. It goes to show I didn't do it. How could I have eaten that meal afterwards if I'd killed her? The food would have choked me. But I'm hungry again. I'll stop for a sandwich. That'll give me time to think. Anderson, wake up. <clears throat> what? Oh, oh, it's you. Time for your watch. Here's some coffee. More in the thermos. Oh, thanks. Look, do you really think we'll trap this guy? Brother, it seems to me I've been here a month already. I'm playing a hunch, that's all. I, I could be wrong. Well, much more of this, and we'll be chasing each other around with butcher knives for diversion. Don't worry, Anderson. The idea is not as crazy as it sounds. Okay, Mr. Adrian. Wake me if you hear the slightest sound, will you? Yeah. Good night. Good night, and pleasant dreams. Is there anything else for you, mister? Uh, what did you say? I uh, said, would you like anything else? Oh, uh, well, well, yes, I think I'll have another hamburger. Well, I'm sorry, but the chef's gone. Oh. All we have is coffee and cold sandwiches. We'll be closed in about 20 minutes. Well, I'll, I'll have a cup of coffee. Okay, draw one. I wonder if he ever killed anyone. I wish I was in his place. Nothing to worry about. Lucille deserved to die. I had to do it. It's not my fault. She fell in love with me, and I warned her not to, that I could never marry her. She understood all that. It's foolish to come all the way down here just to prove I wasn't dreaming. I'll call her up. I'll be pleasant and tell her I'm sorry about the quarrel, and... Cheer up a little. Hey, mister, don't you want the coffee? Huh? Oh, yes, uh, I'll be back. I'm just going to telephone. No. Don't touch that receiver, Henderson. Oh, it might be headquarters. No. I'm not to be called here. I've left instructions with the operator to trace any call that comes in. To try to stall anyone who calls. Let it ring. What number are you calling, please? Uh, Lincoln 57431, please. Will you please hang up and dial again? I'm returning your coin. Sorry, mister, we're closing up. There's a drugstore up the street where you can telephone. It's no use. She didn't answer. No, Oliver, she 
he didn't answer. And you know why, don't you? Really, you know why. But you don't know about Detective Rock Adrian and the operator tracing the call, do you? Hold it. Sorry, I'm closing. It's place now up around the corner. Never mind that. Did anyone telephone from here within the last five minutes? Huh? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, a man just left. Went down the subway steps over there. Okay, Henderson, bring this man with you and come on. Can you identify him? Sure I can. He just ate here. Why, what's the matter? Never mind. Come on. We'd better catch him before that train pulls out. Wait a minute. I'm afraid we're too late. Well, Oliver, you were lucky, and you don't even know it. Sitting safely in the subway train, your thoughts are far from police in your danger. They're with Lucille. Why didn't she answer? Maybe she was out with someone else. And all the time telling me I was the only one she ever loved. Couldn't live without me. If I ever left her, she'd kill herself. Well, why didn't she? That would have solved everything. Always threatening to tell my wife. Always demanding. Threatening and demanding. Demanding and threatening. Every time I saw her, there was a big row. I began to lose my control, my, my self-respect. And then... Then I knew I'd have to kill her. That's when I started having those horrible dreams. Then I... I dreamed she was a little white mouse. And asked me to give her something to eat. But I told her I hadn't anything. Then I saw my heart on a little tin plate and she began to nibble on it. The heart was pulsing and when she bit into it I screamed and grabbed the poker and began to beat her with it. Beat her and beat her long after she was dead. All out. End of the line. All out, mister. This is the end of the line. A end of the line? Where am I? 242nd Street. Can I write anymore? Sure, mister. You want to go back? We'll take you back. Yeah. I've got to go back. I forgot something back there. Yes, Oliver, you forgot something. Or did you? You can't be sure about anything anymore. The whole thing's like a dream, a nightmare. Only you can't seem to wake up. When you go home, finally, you avoid your wife. You've done it before. She doesn't bother you. At the office next day, the people wonder about you, but they only think you're not feeling well. If they only knew what's going on in your mind. And then it's night again. You're wandering the streets again. The urge to go back is there again. Ah, oh, this job ain't so bad after you get used to it, Mr. Adrian. Something ought to happen tonight. Oh, you think so? He's hovering around the edges. That call came from a phone booth only three blocks from here. We almost had him. Yeah, that was a tough break. Quiet. Someone's coming. I hear it. He's coming this way. Stand by. Be ready for trouble. What'll I do? Open the door. Fast. Put up your hands. Y yeah, yeah, sure, mister. Don't shoot. I I'm just delivering a telegram. All right. Come in. Who's the message for? Uh, Miss Lucille Doan. I'll take it. You wait. Hmm. Where'd you get this? Came through the office. Boss just handed it to me and told me to deliver it. Here's, um, here's two bucks. If anyone asked you about this telegram, telling you delivered it to Miss Doan in person, not to me, see? Yes, sir. Say, can I tell my boss what happened? Yeah. Tell him if anyone tries to put a tracer on this telegram to find out if it was delivered... He's to get in touch with police headquarters. Yes, sir, I'll tell him. Thanks for the two bucks. That's all. Well, what's up? Read this telegram. Meet me for dinner at the usual place, signed Ollie. Who the devil is Ollie? That's our man. The one who phoned. The murderer? Perhaps. Well, dining with a corpse would be a novelty. Look, if he's the one, what's the point in inviting her to dinner? Maybe it's hope. Maybe he's trying to convince himself it never happened. Maybe it's an attempt to fool the police in case he's found and questioned. 
Well, if we only knew where the usual place was, we'd drop in for dinner ourselves. This Ollie doesn't know she's dead. If he isn't our man, he'll probably try to find out why she doesn't meet him. We'll just sit tight. Oh, no, not more waiting. Well, I think I'll water the plants again. That geranium's going to blossom any week now. <laughs> Waiter. Yes, sir. Hey, what time is it? 10.15. Can I get you something? No, no, I'll wait a little longer. My companion must must have been detained. She'll be along any minute now. I'd suggest, sir, if you want steak, you better let me place your order. We have only a few left. Well, I, I don't know. She eats so little. I, I tell you what, reserve one steak. If she orders it, I'll take something else. Very well, I'll have one put aside. And uh, bring me another newspaper. Yes, sir. Why did I tell him only one steak? We both like them better than anything else. Maybe, maybe I know she won't come. Is this just a game I'm playing with myself, just pretending it never happened? But why? Why isn't there something in the papers? I've read a hundred since Monday, and all there is is war news. Nothing about... Uh, she's staying away on purpose, just to torture me. She knows how easily I become upset and worried. She's deliberately not answering my phone call and my telegram. Just like her to pull a trick like that. Like the time she faked a suicide and had me frantic for a week. Well, two can play that game. I'm not waiting any longer. Waiter. Yes, sir. I'll have the steak by myself. Medium rare. Baked potato. Green salad with French dressing. That's right, Oliver. Get angry at her. That will relieve the tension in your mind for a while. Eat a good meal. Go home. Get a good night's sleep. You'll feel better in the morning. But you don't, do you? And the next night, you're worse than ever. Take it easy, Oliver. If you can just wait a little while longer, Detective Adrian can't keep this up forever. Adrian, I can't put the chief off much longer. He's howling for an arrest. We'll get him, Inspector. He's nibbling at the bait. Yeah, but when? It's three days since the murder. That's not long. Just give me a few more days. Days? Good Lord, the chief wants to see me the first thing in the morning. And I know what he'll say. Uh, I can guess. I'll give me one more day. I'm sure something will break. Well, I'll try. I'll tell him you got a hot lead. The case will soon break. Thanks, Inspector. Oh, forget it. And let me warn you, Adrian, this is the last time I get involved with you and your hunches. This kind of detective work is too hard on the nerves. I'm a wreck. And my wife's complaining. But just think what state of mind the murderer must be in. Oh, Lord. What I wouldn't give for a night of quiet, undreaming sleep. I'm a sick man. Maybe I ought to go to the doctor. But I'm afraid. Afraid of what I might tell him. I've so many things on my conscience. There's only one person in all the universe who can help me. And that's Lucille. I can't fight anymore. I've got to go to her. Oliver, you're going to give up. You knew you'd have to sooner or later. Yes, the murderer returns to the scene of the crime, and you can't help yourself. You may be caught, but you don't care anymore. Too bad. You will be caught, of course, because Detective Rock Adrian is still there, waiting for you like a spider waiting for a fly. But he's not happy. I've got good news for you, Anderson. Well, you don't sound very happy. This will be the last watch. You sure? Positive. When's he coming? The chief's called it off. Oh. Tomorrow the papers get the story and we start a routine hunt. Ah, oh, that's too bad. I was getting used to this retired life. I wanted it to last until that geranium bloomed. Without me, it would have died. Take it home as a souvenir. A trophy of the chase. Oliver, if you could only wait until tomorrow. But you can't, can you? You're going back to Lucille right now, and nothing can stop you. It's better to be caught and hanged than to have this doubt eating into my mind. I just sit at the office, my brain vibrating with every telephone call. It can't go on. 
Tonight I'll know. And then I can get some sleep again. And right now, that's the sweetest, most desirable experience in all the world. Oh, here's that coffee shop. I, I got this far the other night. I'll stop in and then go on. And what's yours? Uh, coffee. I guess I'll have a roll, too. Uh -huh. Draw one. Hey, mister, you were in here the other night, weren't you? Oh, yes, I, I guess I was. Uh, you made a phone call, didn't you? Yeah. Yes, I remember. Well, you look like a pretty good guy. I'll give you a tip. I don't know what's up, but right after you left, the cops were here and wanted to know who called. Then they beat it right down to the subway, but your train was just pulling out. Now, as I the said... Police. Yeah, and they seemed anxious. This thought I'd tip you off. Thanks, I... I gotta get out of here. They're after me. It's true. I killed her and they're after me. I gotta get away. To Mexico, anywhere. They don't know who I am yet. I can make it. If I hurry, I can get away. Taxi! Taxi! In just a moment, the Whistler will bring you the strange ending to tonight's story. Meantime, I'd like to tell you about the happy ending that more and more drivers are finding in their quest to make ration gasoline go farther. Now, if you think I'm going to say signal go farther gasoline, well, you're right. Well, after all, friends, what could be a more logical place to look for mileage than to the gasoline that for years has been famed for mileage? You see, each oil company has its own formula for its own brand of gasoline. Well, long before the war, when economy was still the important thing, Signal Oil Company set out to produce a gasoline formula that would give more miles. Today, of course, with certain gasoline ingredients reserved for war, no gasoline can promise you all the brilliant anti-knock performance you enjoyed in pre-war Signal gasoline, and which you'll find again in even further improved Signal post-war gasoline. But here's the important point. Even today, Signal's wartime formula still puts the emphasis on mileage. That's why if you haven't tried Signal Go Farther Gasoline in your car, there never was a better reason or a better time to get acquainted with your Signal gasoline dealer. And now, back to the Whistler. Well, Oliver Goist, by a stroke of luck, you found out. At last, your mind is relieved. Or so you think. At last, you know you did kill Lucille. It wasn't a dream. No, the police are after you. But you found out in time. You can get away. As long as the police don't know who you are, you can just go home and pack your bag, buy a ticket, and go away. Nobody will ever know. And those policemen sitting back there in Lucille's apartment can wait till doomsday for you. Your move. Well, thanks. You know, I've got you licked. Sure, sure. But I like to take my time about giving up. <laughs> I'm sure glad I'm not playing you for dough. You... Hey, did you hear that? Elevator. Stop at this floor. He's coming this way. Get ready. But don't make a sound. Let it ring. I'll open it. You stand by. Oh. Oh, I thought... Come in. Well, I'm looking for a Miss Doan. This is Miss but... Doan's apartment. Well, is Miss Doan here? I'd like to speak to her privately. She's not in just now. May I ask who you are? It, it, it doesn't matter. I'll, I'll call some other time. I'm sorry, but we're interested in Miss Doan, too. I'm Detective Adrian from police headquarters. Police? Is Miss Doan involved with the police? Very much so. Well, I'm glad... It's about time the police took care of women like that. Breaking up homes, stealing my husband. I found her address in my husband's letter file. I came here to tell her that if she didn't leave him alone, I'd call in the police myself. Your name, please? I'm Mrs. Gorst. Mrs. Oliver Gorst. And I want to tell you that Your I Your should... address? 30 Weston Street. As I was saying, Oliver and I were quite happy until this woman came along. What's the matter? Here they are, Mr. Adrian. 
Hello, Inspector. This is Rock Adrian. Have Oliver Gorst, 30 Weston Street, picked up for questioning. Yeah. For the murder of Lucille Doan. Next Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program is directed by George W. Allen with tonight's story by Joseph Cochran and music by Wilbur Hatch and is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Marvin Miller speaking and suggesting that you let every traffic signal remind you that you do go farther with Signal Gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with Signal. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Mr. John Dollar? Yes? Western Union, I have a message for you from New York. Oh? Please proceed Northern Hotel, Clinton, Colorado, as soon as possible. Yeah? Building irregularities suspected affecting several insurance companies will advise, regards, signed Albert Davies, Chief Investigator, United Adjustment Bureau, New York, New York. Uh Uh-huh. Would you like that mail to you, Mr. Dollar? Uh, no, no, don't bother. Can you take an answer? Go ahead. To Albert Davies, Chief Investigator, United Adjustment Bureau. You have the address. Confirming. Exact time of arrival to follow. Sign that, Johnny Dollar. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the United Adjustment Bureau, New York City, New York. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Clinton matter. Or maybe racket is a better word. Expense account, first item, $105.63. Transportation by air, Hartford to Denver. Item two, $28.50, Denver to Grand Junction. A place busy and bustling with uranium hopefuls. Third expenditure, $100. Deposit and rental on a car, which I used to drive the 105 miles through the rugged mountains due north of Grand Junction to Clinton, Colorado a place that the rental agents had described as a sleepy little mountain town. When I got there, everybody was running in the direction of what was very shortly not going to be the new school building. Like everybody else in Clinton, Colorado, I spent the next three hours or so helping to try and get the fire under control. Then finally, I left the scene and located the Northern Hotel, where the clerk was standing by waiting for me. Mr. Dollar? Uh, yeah. Operator 18 New York City has been calling you for the last four hours. Uh, Mr. Davies, I believe. Oh, yeah. Could you put the call in for me? Certainly, I'd be glad to. I'll take it up to my room. I want to change my clothes. Certainly. Boy, take Mr. Dollar's bags up to 310. I shaved and showered, changed clothes, and unpacked. From my window, I could see the still glowing embers of the fire, red against the winter night. The school building was completely destroyed. Beyond, the snow-covered Rockies rose all about the town of Clinton, which I had yet to see. Johnny Dollar. I, uh, have your call now, Mr. Dollar. Oh, good, thanks. Johnny? Hi, Al. Say, I've been trying to get to you all day. I thought you were going to let me know the minute you got into town. Well, there was a fire here, Al. I had to pitch in and help along with everybody else. Oh, I see. Well, has Osborne contacted you yet about this case? Osborne? Who's that? Julian Osborne. Look, I talked to him in Clinton last night. He said he'd wait around the hotel until you showed up. He lives there, Johnny. He drove into Denver two days ago and told the insurance broker he thought a building that Great Eastern Fidelity covered was in real bad shape. Now, what building? Well, a new school that they just put up there, Johnny. 
Al, it was in bad shape. Worse shape now. It fell down about four hours ago. That was the fire, Al. Oh. Well, Great Eastern's in for $200,000. Look, Johnny, contact Julian Osborne and see what he has to say. Right. And call me back when you find out what's what. So long. Yes, Mr. Dollar, may I help you? Yeah. Do you have a city directory here in Clinton? We aren't that small. Here it is. Right here. Good. After all, we have 14,263 people. Okay, thanks. I know most of them, Mr. Dollar. Who do you want to get in touch with? A man named Julian Osborne. Uh, Julian Osborne? Yeah. Know him? I didn't know him, but it came over the radio a little while ago. They found his body in the fire. He burned to death. A four-block walk down the icy streets of the town took me to the sheriff's office and face-to-face with a heavy-set, owlish-looking man named Doherty. Sheriff Paul Doherty. He smiled professionally until I got around to inquiring about Julian Osborne. Oh. Well, uh, you his family? No, no. I, I made the trip here to Clinton to see him especially, though. I just heard he was killed in the fire. Yes. Yes, too bad about Mr. Osborne. I don't quite understand about it, though. He was school janitor. Oh. What, uh, what was your business with him, Mr. Dollar? Insurance investigation. Oh? Yeah, Osmond reported the possibility of something wrong with the new school. He, he did? Uh, to who? To our brokers in Denver. That's why they sent me out here. Well, <laughs> your trip was for nothing, then. Maybe. Well, you'd think if he had anything like that on his mind, he'd have come to me, wouldn't you? Yes. Did he? No. No, used to pass him on the street. Never said a word. Uh Uh-huh. Where's the body? Morgue. I, uh, I wouldn't go over there, son. I want to contact some of his family, his friends. Well, that might be hard to do. No family here, no close friends. Used to prospect for a living until he got kind of old. Then he took the job janitoring. Lived right there in the basement of the school. Eh, city will bury him. I see. How long had he worked at the school? Six months since the place was built. Mm-hmm. Who hired him? Principal, Flory Hawkins. Flory Hawkins. Where can I find her? Lives on Pearson Street. That's one block over and two blocks to your left. Number, uh, 326. 326 Pearson, huh? That's right. And son. Hmm? Bad night to go calling on her. <laughs> I'd like to see Mrs. Hawkins, please. I'm Miss Hawkins. Well, I'm an insurance investigator. My name's Johnny Dollar. Insurance? Yes. Why do you want to talk to me? Well, I'll be frank with you, Miss Hawkins. I came to Clinton to talk to Julian Osborne. Oh. You heard he died in the fire. Yes, I heard. Tragic. I'm so thankful school wasn't in session today. Uh, Come in. Thank you. I know this has been a pretty grueling day for you, for everyone in this town, Miss Hawkins, losing your school and all. I wouldn't call on you, except I feel it's important. I... Excuse me, please. Sure. Hello? Who? Yes, Sheriff. Yes, he is right now. Yes. Good night. There's just a couple of questions I'd like you to answer about Julian Osborne so I'm I can get... I'm afraid I can't help you with anything, Mr. Dollar. What? You'll have to go now. Well, look, now, wait a minute. If, if you don't eat... I don't want to be impolite, but I'm tired. Very tired. Yeah, sure. That phone call wore you out. Please. All right, all right, I'll go, Miss Hawkins. But I think you should know why I came here. I can assure you, Mr. Dollar, whatever the reason, I'm simply not interested. I was sent here because Julian Osborne advised the insurance company that he suspected certain building irregularities had gone into the new school. Miss Hawkins, did Mr. Osborne ever mention anything like this to you? No. Now, will you Do you have an idea to whom he might have confided such information here in Clinton? No. I rather think he was imagining things. You noticed nothing irregular yourself? No, of course not. Mm-hmm. 
Would that call you just had from Sheriff Doherty cause you not to notice anything? Is that all? I'm dreadfully tired. Thanks for your time. Oh, Miss Hawkins. Yes? If Sheriff Doherty calls again, tell him I'm at the Northern Hotel. Northern Hotel. Good night, Mr. Dollar. Expense account item four, ten dollars and eighty cents. One long distance call to New York. I got Al Davies out of bed and told him the fate of Julian Osmond. Davies requested me to stay on in Clinton to see the matter through. About eleven o'clock that night, I walked over to the site where the new school had once stood. A few firemen and policemen were still around, searching the ashes by the light of lanterns and spotlights. One of them told me the cause of the fire had not yet been determined. I started back to my hotel. Turning a corner by an alley, two men in dark clothes were holding a third man in a sheepskin. A fourth man was giving him the works. Hey, just a minute here. Come on, let's get out of here, boy. Yeah. Yeah, easy now, easy now. You need some help, mister. Everybody needs help. But let me tell you who I am before you help me. Maybe you won't want to. Easy, just take it easy now. I'm... David Baines. You're from out of town, aren't you? Yes. <laughs> I thought so. I architected that school that isn't anymore. Well, don't you understand, Samaritan? Don't you see? That group of citizens who were working me over just now have kids. The kids could have been in there when the fire broke out. Your reason, uh, I, I'm afraid... I'm afraid they feel I don't design especially good buildings. I took David Baines over to my hotel room, still half unconscious from the beating. I sent the bellboy out for bandages, iodine, and something to take off the chill. While I was patching him up, I was thinking how he'd stood there and taken that beating. Stood there in sight of half a dozen policemen and firemen and let them do that to him. <coughs> yeah, try a little more. Thanks. Uh, who are you? Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator. I came here about the school. I see. <laughs> you want to beat me up, too? The company you're working for will be liable. Want some more of this? Uh, what'd you say your name is? Dollar. Johnny Dollar. Mr. Dollar, I'm in a curious position. I designed the school. I planned every feature of it. But I had nothing to do with the building. You don't believe me? I wish you'd explain that. A week before they broke ground, a very important thing happened to me, Mr. Dollar. I went to Europe. I couldn't pass it up. It was a chance to study for another year under some men I'd admired all my life. <laughs> Consider it a scholarship, Mr. Baines. That's what he said. Who said? The man who paid my way to Europe. His name was Roy Vickery. So I went to Europe, and I studied. I came back, and my building was all built... Now it's burnt down. I'm a local boy who's made bad. Very bad. Who's Roy Vickery? The contractor who built it. Oh, I better talk to him. Yes, talk to him by all means. You represent a rich and powerful company, Mr. Dollar. But in Clinton, you're wasting your time. You'll learn no facts, no information, nothing helpful from anyone here. Particularly Roy Vickery. You're in a tight, hot, mean little burg, Mr. Dollar. All right, let's have it. Was that building fired on purpose? I just told you. You won't find out anything in this town. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow? Well, there's a lot of information to be had in a town that won't talk. And there are times when the silence screams all over the place. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar.
Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Deller. David Baines. Hi. How's it going this morning? I'm staying off the streets. I don't want to be beat up again. I'd advise you to do the same. I can't very well do that. The city of Clinton has filed claim for their school building. I have to make an investigation. You're booking a rough crowd, Mr. Deller. Where will you meet them all? I intend to. I admire you, but I think you're foolish. Good luck. Just a minute. What? Not only did a school building burn down yesterday, but a man died in that fire. If there was something wrong with it, I want to get to the bottom of it. I expect help from you, too. I'll stay here until I hear from you. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly... Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to United Adjustment Bureau, 418 West 61st Street, New York City. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Clinton matter. That's Clinton, Colorado. Expense account item 5, 80 cents, telegram to Dodd and Company, Denver Insurance Brokers, who would handle the policies covering the new school building in Clinton. I requested them to forward copies of the policies. Item 6, 10 cents, one copy of the Clinton Times and the full story on the fire. It was believed by Fire Chief Hanley that the fire had started because of overheated boilers in the heating system. Dollar, is it? Yeah, that's right. I'm an insurance investigator. Yep. Well, what can I do for you? Tell me about the fire yesterday. You sound like you're carrying a chip on your shoulder, Mr. Duller. We had word that building irregularities were suspected in that school, Chief. The word came from the janitor, Julian Osborne. He burned to death in that fire yesterday, and the building's gone now. You get as head up as you want to, boy. I got my own troubles. I'll tell you what we think, and you can take it, whether you like it or not. We think old Julian Osborne might have passed out, got drunk, or had a heart attack in that building... We think something like that happened, and the boilers kept right on going and built up the pressure. We think the boilers exploded, the fire started, and that was that. And why do you think the whole place went down? Because it spread so fast. Why did it spread? I didn't build the building. I just took care of the fire. You're going to have to change your attitude around here if you want anybody to cooperate with you. All right, then tell me this. Why, on a day when school wasn't in session, would those boilers be fired up at all? I don't know. Chief, last night I talked to Sheriff Doherty, trying to get information about Julian Osborne. He didn't know anything either. I also talked to Flory Hawkins, the school principal. She didn't know. Now you don't know anything. Who does? I've done my job, boy. I've determined cause. You've also given me a chance to look at you. Which was about the only reason I came here. Nah. I'll get information elsewhere, Chief. There's some people in this town who want to talk and tell me things. You and your sheriff and whoever else is involved can't keep every mouth in this town shut. And I'll tell you like I told Miss Hawkins. I'm at the Northern Hotel. In case you remember anything. I can't hear you, boy. Not one word. <laughs>
Expense account item seven, dollar eighty. Breakfast in the coffee shop of my hotel for myself and David Baines, who still looked badly battered from the beating he'd taken the night before. You're taking a chance sitting here with me. Hope you realize that. Am I? I'm public enemy number one in this town. I'm the man who built the school that didn't stay up. Look, Baines, I want you to tell me all about it. If you have any information or knowledge that would be helpful in this investigation, then you'd better give out with it right now. What specifically do you want to know? First, the town. Do you know what this place is? It's a backyard. And only the rich kids can play here. Vickery, Hanley, Doherty, those are the rich kids, Mr. Dollar. The rest of us are, well, we live across the tracks. Let's start with Vickery. He's a builder. Not only here, all over these mountains. Grand Junction, Rifle, Mesa, all over. He's got a million dollars and a million angles. He's the one who sent me to Europe to study for a year after I completed my plans for the new building. Got me out of the way. Okay. Fire Chief Hanley. A friend of Vickery's. And any friend of Vickery's is going to get rich one way or another. Sheriff Doherty. He keeps the law orderly for Vickery. Very necessary. Okay, then. The fire itself. Chief Hanley says the school boilers blew up and caused the fire. There was no reason for those boilers to be fired up. No reason. If they were fired, they were fired to blow up. They had automatic shutoff equipment. What about Julian Osborne? You say he notified the broker in Denver that something was wrong with the building, and that's how you got here. I don't know. They might have fired it for money, too. I told you I was in Europe until they constructed it. I got back in Clinton four days ago. I went over to see my building. They used my outside drawing, Dollar. Wooden beams where I indicated steel girders. Only half the plumbing and heating system, other things... Looked like they'd made it up as they went along. Did you talk to anybody about it? Oh, sure. The contractor. Vickery. Vickery. He told me to keep my mouth shut and be a good boy. You think he got you out of town during the construction so you wouldn't interfere? I think so. I'm not important, but it was the easiest way. I understand Mr. Vickery's a little unpopular today. What? A delegation went out to his house to hang him or something. Baines was partially right a delegation had gone out to see Roy Vickery in his polished pine domain at the end of town. They were still there when I drove up in my rented car. Twenty or thirty irate citizens demanding an explanation for the lost school. Ten uniformed men from Sheriff Doherty's office formed a half-moon circle in front of the main entrance, their holsters unbuckled. The sheriff himself was directing the operation. All right, just a minute there. Hello, Sheriff. Huh? Johnny Dollar, I talked to you last night. Oh, yeah. Chief Hanley called me about you. The chief called you, and last night you called Flory Hawkins. That was nice. Keep the wires burning. The chief said you came over to see him. Used abusive language. Tried to cause trouble. The chief was mistaken. I wasn't trying to cause trouble, Sheriff. There's enough of that in this town. I was just trying to find out how the fire started yesterday. The chief told you how it started. I didn't believe him. Now, what do you think of that? You better watch your step around here, Mr. Dollar. You seem to be looking for arguments all the time. Not at all, Sheriff. I'm misunderstood. We understand you all right. How's Mr. Vickery? He's all right, and he's going to stay all right. I'm sure he will. But these people don't like their school burning down. It's expensive. Also, their kids could have been in it. I want to see Mr. Vickery about that. He isn't seeing anyone, Mr. Dollar. And we aren't letting anybody in to see him. Really? Did any of you people hear that? Now, look here. Hey, listen, folks. Listen to me, will you? Look. Now, listen. I'm an insurance investigator. I'm worried about what happened to your school yesterday. Keep quiet. Hey, tell me Mr. Vickery built that school. The architect who designed it said it wasn't built to his specifications. Now, I want to go in and ask Mr. Vickery about that. The sheriff here doesn't want me to do that. I'll get you for this dollar. Wait a minute. The sheriff just said, I'll get you for this. All right, hold it. Hold it, please. Please, now listen to me. Listen. I'll put it to the sheriff again so you can all hear. Sheriff, I want to go in and see Mr. Vickery on business. Well? Go ahead. Thank you. from Sheriff Doherty, the wedge of deputies opened up long enough for me to walk through the wrought iron gate and up the steps to the Vickery Mansion. A tall man in a white jacket answered the door and ushered me into a den that was stocked with good liquor and big leather chairs. Finally, a big man in a blue suit walked in. He had lots of good teeth and there wasn't an ounce of fat on his 230 pounds. I'm Roy Vickery. 
It was quite an act with Sheriff Doherty just now. I watched you from upstairs. That's a good, safe place to watch from, Mr. Vickery. Now that you're in, what can I do for you? Tell me everything you can about that school building. Mm-hmm. Has the, uh, the city of Clinton made a claim yet? Yes, $200,000, building and contents. You got in town pretty fast. We heard there might be something wrong with that building before the fire. Apparently there was. Now, who told you a thing like that? Julian Osborne. He's dead now, you know. Oh, well, two boilers explode, and there's something wrong with the building. Is that the way you people figure? Yeah. Well, so do we, and we couldn't find anything wrong. Who's we? Officially, we're the Civic Construction Department. We just had a meeting. We, we thought we ought to. Yeah, yeah. I figure those people hanging around outside should be worrying. Well, they don't worry me, and you don't worry me. A drunken janitor goes to sleep and lets the boilers kick up, and the joint blows apart and burns down. That's what we decided in the meeting. It was a, a terrible accident. We'll have to use an old garage or something for a school, but, but then we'll get around to building another school with the insurance money we have coming. And that's that? That's that. Mr. Vickery, I'd like a copy of the specifications that went into that building. Sure, anything at all. Uh, there you are. Okay? That'll do for now. Good. Now, you can get out of my house, Dollar. You smell smoky. There were 50 pages of specifications on the building materials used in the construction of that school. They looked all right. They also looked as though they could have been forgery. Expense account item eight, six dollars, one bottle of whiskey for David Baines and myself in my hotel room. Baines went over the specifications page by page. Okay, what do you think? These are my specifications, more or less. This is what's on paper that went into the building. How about what actually went into it? Well, the little I saw, they cut corners everywhere. The outside was just a shell of this stuff. You sure? These are my notes. I can remember this much. Can you remember it in front of a notary? I want a sworn statement. I don't know. You what? Well, don't look at me that way. You can get my statement and possibly a half a dozen other statements. On paper, you'd have a case. Then what would you do? Go to the district attorney? We haven't got a district attorney. We got a county attorney who's elected for a four-year term. All right, I'll go to him. Vickery? Then I'll go to somebody else, the insurance commission. If you try to go any farther, they'll kill you, Dollar. Well, let me worry about that. Now, would you make a statement? Sorry. That'd kill me, too. And that's the way matters stood in Clinton, Colorado, 24 hours after their new school building had burned down and a man had died in the flames. Everyone seemed to know it was all wrong, but no one was willing to do anything about it. Johnny Dollar. Hello, Dollar. Roy Vickery. Well. Did you go over those specifications? Yes, I did. Very thoroughly. Well? I think they're fakes, Mr. Vickery. <laughs> I didn't ask you your opinion, Dollar. But you've got it. Well, I'm sure you're entitled to it. Uh, when, when are you leaving town? Not for a while. I was kind of hoping you'd be leaving like in about an hour. You'd make good connections then. Sorry. I haven't really gotten around as much as I want to yet. You saw me. I can tell you anything. Well, I'll get around to you again. Get out of town, Dollar. Now. Vickery, there are times when I don't hear good. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a lady who promised to love, honor, and obey a building inspector, but wound up a widow. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood, written by John Dawson. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. <laughs>
From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Florrie Hawkins, Mr. Dollar. Oh, yes. You were the principal of the school. I'd like to talk to you if I could. All right. Would you care to meet me for a cocktail? There's a place called the Trader's Inn not far out of town. I could be there in an hour. All right. Miss Hawkins. Yes, Mr. Dollar. What changed your mind about talking to me? Well, I've... I've heard how you've gone about this. I mean, you forced Sheriff Doherty to let you in to see Roy Vickery. You defied Chief Hanley, and... Well, you don't seem frightened of any of them. Also, I... I suppose I'm a little sick of everything I've seen around here. Okay. I'll see you in an hour. I'll be there. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the United Adjustment Bureau, 418 West 61st Street, New York City. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the racket in Clinton, Colorado. Expense account item nine, ten bucks, one dinner and four drinks for myself at the Trader's Inn, five miles outside of Clinton, where I waited for Flory Hawkins to appear. Sorry, I'm late. Oh, well, that's all right, Miss Hawkins. Uh, sit down, please. Would you, uh, would you like something to eat? A drink, maybe? No, thank you. I, uh, um... What's the matter? What is it? Oh, I can't help looking around. I hope no one sees us together. I mean, that would be difficult to explain. To explain to whom? Your friend, Sheriff Doherty, for one. Oh. Last night when you came to inquire about Julian Osborne... Sheriff Doherty called and told me to get rid of you and not answer any questions. Yeah, I guess that. Did he tell you what would have happened if I had stayed and you had answered some questions? No. I can imagine it would have been something that would have barred me from teaching for the rest of my life. <sighs> that sounds incredible. No, not too. I've been looking at your little town, Miss Hawkins. A school building can be made of paper, go up and smoke, a man can be killed, and none of the responsible people, the man who built the building, the fire chief, the sheriff, seem to care too much. You asked me about Julian Osborne. I knew he wrote your insurance company, or called them, and told them the school building wasn't right. He told me he was going to do it. I see. I knew it wasn't right, too. Everyone who worked in there, who worked on the building, knew it wasn't up to specifications. Then I'll contact some of those people. Well, that may be difficult. Julian Osborne spoke up, and he burned to death. Yeah, but that doesn't mean you can't speak now or any of the others. I'm willing to speak about that building now. Now I'm willing to help you. I'd, I don't know about the others. Will Mr. Baines help you? Well, he's frightened of going up against Vickery and the others. But I think I can talk him into it. That would be two of us. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Two people speaking out. And then there'd be others... Once it gets rolling, it won't stop. Unless I've missed my guess about the townspeople of Clinton. You seem to know a lot about people, Mr. Dollar. How to say what will stimulate them at the right time or make them speak out. I have to confess you did that to me. You looked hurt and bewildered last night when I insisted you leave me alone. I realize, you know, very deeply, I realize there could have been 1,400 pupils in that school when the fire broke out. I didn't sleep last night thinking of it. Yeah, I guess that was the only good feature of it. No children died. But as you say, Miss Hawkins, it could have happened the other way. Now, look, besides yourself and possibly Mr. Baines, can you think of anyone else who might be able to supply information about the construction of the school? I don't know. Let me think. Somebody who'd, who'd have evidence in hand, possibly. Wait. Yes, I can think of someone. Who? The building inspector, the one who approved the building. Oh, well, that doesn't seem likely. If he passed that building, he must have been in with them. What's his name? His name is Richard Hobb. Oh, I've known him for years. Oh, he is in with them in a way, but I know he'd get out of it if he could. He, he was a very decent man when I knew him well. 
I think he's still decent. Richard Hobb. All right, who else? Well, that's all I can think of. Well, that's a start. Well, what will you do? I'll ask you to take a plane to Denver, register at the Cosmopolitan Hotel, and wait until you hear from me. What? I'll want a statement from you before you go, but I want you to be safe. I'll get around to Hobb and Baines. All I want are sworn statements to the effect that Vickery built a bad school, that he violated insurance specifications. That'll start it rolling. Oh, when do you want the statement? Tonight, right here. All right. Let's get busy. It took an hour to get the statement. After that, I drove her to Grand Junction to catch a plane. Expense account item 10, dollar and a half, telegram, to a friend of mine in the private detective business in Denver. I asked him to meet Flory Hawkins' plane, see that she was safe and comfortable, and keep an eye on her during her stay in Denver. Then I drove back to Clinton. Item 11, 10 cents, another phone call. This one to David Baines. Yeah, Dollar? Baines, Flory Hawkins made a statement about the school building and the fire. She's tired of being scared and shoved around. Now, how about you? You want a statement from me? Yes. Comparing your specifications with what you saw that actually went into the building. Will you make it out and take it before a notary? All right. If she can, I can. Then what? Then go down to Denver and wait to hear from me. I'll make the statement, but I won't leave town. You'll help me a lot if you do. Sorry. You'll be in danger here. I feel brave. If you're going to play it so broad, I'll do it too. I took his statement directly to the post office and mailed it to myself at the Northern Hotel. Expense account item 12, 40 cents phone calls. I telephoned Sheriff Doherty, Fire Chief Hanley, and County Attorney Contractor Roy Vickery and told them that I had a sworn statement regarding building irregularities. Sheriff Doherty snorted and hung up. Chief Hanley yawned and told me not to bother him. And Roy Vickery just laughed. About 8 o'clock that night, I was at the home of Building Inspector Richard Hobb, a nice home in a nice part of town. The woman standing in the doorway was tall and blonde, holding a drink and smoking a cigarette. Yes? I'd like to see Mr. Richard Hobb. I'm Johnny Dollar. I'm Lucille Hobb. He isn't home right now. But you can come in and wait for him and talk to me. I'm not bad company. Would a drink help? Help what? Whatever's wrong with you. You look tired, Mr. Dollar. It might, but uh, I'd rather not. I just came by to talk to your husband. You said that. What do you want to talk to him about? Business. This time of night? Let's stop talking about him. What do you say? Uh, look, uh, you, uh, you probably missed your dinner tonight, and you've been getting all of your nourishment out of a bottle, so I'll come back <laughs> and you're later. you're afraid and... Dick will walk in. No, 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 I'm not afraid of that, Mrs. Hobb. He's already walked out, and you're feeling sorry for yourself. What? Well, a man, if he lives in a place, has a, an ashtray or a picture or yesterday's sports section lying around the front room. I don't see anything like that in this room. If I walked over to that closet, ten to one, I wouldn't find any of his clothes. And if I tried the drawers, I'll lay odds there wouldn't be a shirt around either. When did he leave? You're crazy. When did he leave? Yesterday. After the fire? During the fire. Where did he go? I don't know. Did he go alone? I don't know. Did Vickery tell him to get out of town? No. I'll ask that again. Did Vickery tell your husband to get out of town? I don't know. You said no the first time I asked. Vickery, a pal of your husband's? Well, they know each other, naturally. Look, Mrs. Hobb, I don't know how much you've had to drink, but if I'm reading your eyes right, you're scared. You're scared about what's happened here and what could happen here. And you know your husband's involved. Mrs. Hobb, I want your husband to help me. If he helps me, I can help this town get rid of people like Vickery and Doherty and Hanley. If you see him, if he contacts you, tell him that. Tell him I won't let anything happen to him. Tell him I have statements from two people already, and they're being protected. I'll protect your husband. You got all that? I don't know what you're talking about. Good night, Mrs. Hobb. I left her standing in the middle of the living room, drink in hand, staring vacantly at... I don't know what. Outside in the crisp mountain air, I took stock of the situation. Richard Hobb, building inspector who had passed the school building, would be the most important witness I could find to make a statement. The others, from Flory Hawkins and David Baines, would help. But Hobbs' information would be essential to an investigation. I was just clinging to my rented car when a sleek, dark limousine pulled up, and Roy Vickery leaned out the window. Come here. Why not? 
pretty cold weather to be out so late at night. Yeah, but then I've got a lot to do. Uh, you've been in to see Mr. Hobb? Yeah. How's Richard these days? I wouldn't know. I only spoke to Mrs. Hobb. I see. Lovely girl, isn't she? Well, she's a little sad right now. Her husband's missing. He left town during the fire yesterday. Do tell. Yeah, I have a feeling he might have been ordered out of town. Sooner or later, people will be asking the building inspector embarrassing questions about their school. Uh-huh. Were uh, you going to ask him some, some embarrassing questions, that is? Yeah, yeah, sure I was. I was going to ask him why he passed it. I was going to ask him how much he was paid to pass it. I was going to ask who paid him to pass it. And then I was going to ask him to make a statement. I, I figured you might have had something like that in mind, yeah. Well, it's been nice talking to you, Mr. Vickery. I hope I see you real soon, in jail. Hey, Dollar. What? I know you're trying to earn your money and you're working very hard. Hmm? But I'd stop it if I were you. I, I admire a man like you, someone who calls a, a spade a spade. Or a liar, a liar. Or a liar, a liar. But, Dollar, it, it just won't do you any good here in Clinton. You see? Tell you what. You worry about your problems and I'll worry about mine. Have it your way. Your call to New York, Mr. Dollar. Right. Go ahead, please. Hi, Johnny. Hello, Al. Hey, look, Al, it's a mess here. I've made a little headway. I mean, I'll have a couple of statements coming in, but no concrete evidence yet. Well, what do you think? The school building was a fix or something or other. Money somewhere. I haven't been able to find out. The town's sewed up tight, civically and politically. I can't expect any help from the law or the fire department here. They're in it, too. Oh, that kind of thing, huh? Afraid so. I need help. We'll be there in 24 hours. They want to play it that way? We'll play it that way. Twenty minutes after I hung up the phone and was in bed, I found out how much of a mess it really was. That's when my hotel door opened and a man lurched across the room toward me. Dollar, I, I've got to tell you, I wanted to get to you yesterday. He stood in front of me, swaying back and forth, his hands clutching the front of his coat. He fell before I could get to him. Three bullet holes formed a neat trio across where his tie pin should have been. I ran my fingers through his coat, pulled out his wallet. The license read, Richard Hobb, age 39, occupation, building inspector. Here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, the town of Clinton begins to fall apart, and it takes a lot of work to pick up the pieces. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Al Davis, Johnny. We're on our way. What? Yeah, we're in Grand Junction now. We ought to be in Clinton three hours, renting a couple of cars. I brought help. I can use it, Al. There's been a murder here. What? Last night, a building inspector named Richard Hobbs staggered into my room, tried to tell me something, but died before he could get it out. He'd been shot three times. Now, look, you be careful. Don't do anything until we get there. 
That's an order. Yes, sir. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the United Adjustment Bureau, 418 West 61st Street, New York City. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Clinton matter. Expense account item 13, 60 cents breakfast. I had it sent up to my room. Right behind the bellhop appeared the tall figure of Sheriff Doherty. How about inviting me for a cup of coffee? Sure. Sit down. Help yourself, Sheriff. Uh, thank you. You know, you're a mighty lucky man. In what way? I was almost holding you for murder, boy. That hob fella. Oh, that, yeah. You're looking into it, I suppose. Yep. Yep, we're looking into it. I hesitate to ask, but are you getting anywhere? Uh, we figure he was shot sometime last night. Found his car downstairs all smeared up. Might have driven in from someplace. Where? We don't know. Well, do you know he blew town when the school fire broke out? We talked to Mrs. Hobb. I talked to her myself. Yeah. Naturally, we want to find out everything we can about this matter. Now, Hobb came up here last night and died in this room of gunshots. Why do you suppose he came here? I never knew the man, Sheriff. I talked to someone who did know him once. She said he'd been a pretty decent man at one time. If you and Chief Hanley and Vickery didn't tell him to leave town when that fire broke out, he might have told me himself. His conscience might have hurt him about passing a building that never could have stood an inspection. Go on. He might have heard that I was in town investigating it. He might have gotten sick and tired of the cheap, rotten little schemes here in Clinton and come back to help me straighten it out. You don't think much of our town, do you? Not the way it is, Sheriff. And I don't think much of you. In that case, I'll just try to keep out of your way. Do that. You do the same, Dollar. Here. Two hours later, Al Davies and a contingent of special operatives arrived in Clinton. Toby O'Brien from Continental States Insurance. Rob Schwartz and the Minx Twins from Columbia Adjustment, giving us a friendly hand. Todd Weaver, who just finished a case with the Canadian Adjusters Limited. Lou Doniger and Thad Thomas from Chicago. A pretty imposing group of expert investigators. Well, Johnny, you look okay. Yeah, still in one piece. Hi, Thad, Lou. Fine. You want to get the door, Toby? Yeah, sure. Now, sit down there, Joe. Now, this isn't any vacation trip, boys. We're all going to have to roll up our sleeves. All right, Johnny, you want to break it down? Yeah, all right. Well, this is a big one, fellas. If you'll all sit, I'll bring you up to date. Yeah, sure. Now, sit right there, Toby. Three days ago, I came here on a tip that building irregularities were suspected in the new school building. The man who tipped the insurance company was the janitor, name of Julian Osborne. I never talked to Osborne because he died in the fire that destroyed that building. I did talk to the man who designed the building. His name is David Baines. He claims none of his specifications were followed in the construction. So that's why it caught fire and went down so fast. His statement right here. Now, I talked to the school principal, Flory Hawkins. She supports Baines' statement. I wanted most of all to get a statement from the building inspector who passed the building, Richard Hobb. Hobb was murdered last night. Ah, no wonder you need help. All right, now, the sheriff, the fire chief, and the building contractor are all in on it. And there are too many leads for one man to follow, too many people for one man to talk to. The sheriff is making an investigation of Hobb's murder, but we'd better make our own. Now, you, Toby, and you, Thad, Hobb's your job. Find out everything about him, his bank account, his friends, his troubles, everything. Especially who killed him. His widow's Lucille Hobb. I met her last night. Leave it to him to find the woman. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now. Rob? Yeah? Your man is the building contractor, Roy Vickery. He's big and tough and shrewd, and he talks softly. He owns and runs the whole show, if I'm guessing right. Now, take Toby and run Vickery down. Bank accounts, purchase orders, what kind of money he spends, and so on. Right. Jim and Al Minx? Uh, yo. All right, you two, find out everything you can about Julian Osborne, the janitor who was burned to death. I want Lou Doniger to stick close to Fire Chief Hanley. Same thing. Everything and anything you can get on him. Al, you can handle Sheriff Doherty. 
The rest of you spread out. Start talking with anybody in town who might know anything. When you find one who's sick and tired of watching their town being run by a pack of hooligans, send them up here to the room. We'll try to get statements from them making specific charges, Al. Yeah. I want to guarantee every one of them security. So take them down to Denver, give them protection until it's safe to walk the streets here. If that's necessary, I'll arrange it. It's necessary. All right, right, now report back to me any time you want. Don't push anybody around. Don't let anybody push you around. Okay, let's get to work. Eight strange men moving through Clinton, Colorado, asking questions were as conspicuous as I wanted them to be. I knew everybody in the little town would be hearing about them and watching them. And sooner or later, I hoped that would pay off. An hour went by before I got any action. Johnny Dollar. You, the fellow with the insurance company? Yeah, that's right. Who's this? Never mind. You're taking a lot of chances around here. We're going to take lots more. Do you have anything to say? Yeah. My name's Earl Kennedy. I'd like to talk to you. Name the place. You go down and stand in front of your hotel. I'll drive by and pick you up. I went down and stood in front of the Northern Hotel. Five minutes passed. Ten minutes. And then a car drove up. Two men in the front seat, three in the back. One of them leaned out. Dollar? Yeah. Come on, get in. Kennedy, construction foreman on the school. Hi. I thought you were going to be alone. Man next to you is Frank Ibsen. I'm the city editor of the Clinton Times. Those three boys in the back are Chuck Borden, Pete Geiger, and John Newton. They all worked for me on the construction. Hi. Hi. We seen the guys you brought into town. Really? Some pretty heavy boys. You know, the town's a little edgy with all that's happened. Fire, the janitor getting burned murder of Dick Hobb. None of which were caused by any of my investigators. How long are they going to be in town? As long as they have to be. We're going to get to the bottom of all this. How many did you bring in? Eight. I'll bring in 80 if I have to. Aren't you talking kind of big? This is a big job. Yeah. This far enough? Turn in here. Now what? Just want to talk to you. Well... Yeah. We're all willing to make statements, Dollar. I can charge Vickery with shortchanging the city on materials. These guys in the back seat will tell you the same thing. They came to me to ask my advice. I told them to talk to you, see what kind of man you were. I'll print anything that's the truth. Well, that'd help a lot, Mr. Ripson. The paper's at your disposal, provided it's the truth. Fair enough. All of you be willing to testify? I am. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, a couple of other things. First... About Richard Hobb. You tell him, Frank. Hobb had big ideas. and He played ball with Vickery and the rest of them. It also looks like he was murdered because he was going to try to make it right. Now, about Roy Vickery. He was born here in Clinton, brought up here. He's built about one-third of the structures in this town. Every one of them standing today. Every one except the school. Any angle on that? Your insurance. $200,000. Okay. Where can I get a copy of the actual purchase orders used in the building? From Vickery. But I don't think he'd let you have them, if he still got them. Well, he gave me specifications that look like forgeries. I want the real thing. I'll have to have the real thing. Well, let me look around. Now, when and where do we make the statements? Let's go over to my hotel room and do it right now. Better use the newspaper office. You're probably being watched by now, Mr. Dollar. Expense account item 14, $10, legal fees. Two hours later, I hired a notary to attest the sworn statements of Earl Kennedy, Frank Ibsen, Charles Borden, Peter Geiger, and John Newton. They were damaging statements that would bear considerable weight in a courtroom. But they were not enough to bring the matter before a court. Al Davies was waiting for me when I got back to my hotel room. Hi. Hi. Come here. Mm, What is it? We've got friends. Yeah. One, two, three, seven. Mm Mm-hmm. They've been gathering around the hotel now for the last hour or two. Any of the boys run into trouble yet? No, none they couldn't handle. This could be ticklish, though, Johnny. Huh? Well, if Doe's down there uh, provoked a 
An open showdown. Yeah, that might be the idea. We aren't ready for anything like that yet. We're getting there. Come in. Well, hello, Sheriff. This is Mr. Davies, our chief inspector. Davies! Are you the man who brought these troublemakers into town? I brought eight assistants with me, Sheriff. They're troublemakers. They've been going around asking questions, upsetting folks, getting in the way. I'd hate to see any of them get hurt. Like with those out there on the street? Those men out there, a group of indignant citizens who came to see me in a body and protested this investigation and the way it's being handled. They look more like hired bully boys, Sheriff. I'm asking you and Mr. Davies to withdraw these men you have working in Clinton. I'm asking you to do that by sundown. Suppose we don't, Sheriff. Then you'll take the consequences. Now, wait a minute. What? I don't want to keep you in a state of suspense, Sheriff. We're willing to take the consequences. What? If that crew out there shoot as well as they look, they're pretty rough people to go up against. Let me tell you, every man in this investigation is armed. We won't be intimidated, shoved around, or bullied by you, those bums out there, or anyone in this town. Now, you tell that to Mr. Vickery and Chief Hanley. And then you go home and stand in front of a mirror, Sheriff, and tell it to yourself. You gave us till sundown to get out. I'm giving you until sundown to resign as Sheriff. Now, if you don't do that, I'll see that you're forced out of office. Now, what do you think of that? You must feel mighty strong to talk like that. You see this, and this, 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 and this? These are all sworn statements from people in this town who aren't afraid of you and Vickery and the others. You'd be surprised how many other people around here are on the verge of making statements, on the verge of not being scared of you anymore. So where are we, Sheriff? I'm going to kill you. Now, now you aren't. Come on, get out of here. I'll kill you, Dollar. Now, here's our star to tell you about the final exciting episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, the end and the beginning of Clinton, Colorado. It all happens when the smoke clears. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Deller. Toby O'Brien, Johnny. Heard you had a run-in with Sheriff Doherty. They say you gave him a little sundown to resign his office. Yeah, I don't think he will, though. He'll have to do something close to it. I got some information on Richard Hobb, the building inspector who was murdered. Yeah? Hobb deposited $20,000 in the bank last year. What's that? Now, wait. Hobb's salary as city building inspector was $7,500 per annum. The 20000 went in in four $5,000 deposits. Holy... And now, wait, there's more. Those deposit dates coincide with OKs Hobb made on the school building. He was paid off after each inspection. Johnny, we got it on paper. We got some other things on paper, too, Toby. Hold on, keep digging.
tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. Location, Clinton, Colorado. To United Adjustment Bureau, 418 West 61st Street, New York City. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Clinton matter. Expense account item 15, $45. For photostatic copies of deposit slips in the account of Richard Hobb, building inspector, lately murdered. Furnished by one of my operatives, Toby O'Brien. Here you are. Okay. I got a feeling this whole town's coming apart at the seams, Johnny. The sheriff threatened you openly. Everybody who's anybody around here is trying to cover up the school burning down and the way it was built. I think I can hurry up the process. Uh, you be careful. These people seem to play for keeps. They've got to realize we do, too. These photostats are the first real bit of presentable evidence that the building was constructed under fraudulent circumstances. Hey, take it easy. Now, you keep the originals. Mail them out to the office. The post office is still pretty honest. Yeah. Also, let it out that we have the information wherever you go. I want them to get worried and steamed up and start acting dumber than they already have been. Okay. Might scare Doherty and Hanley a little bit. That Vickery seems like a different proposition. I don't think he scares. I drove my rented car over to the home of his grieving widow. She answered the door with tears in both eyes and bourbon over the rocks in one hand. She wore a black dress, black and satin and tight, low cut. Not exactly Emily Post for mourning. But as I say, it was black. A black lace handkerchief waved in the air. Oh, Mr. Dollar, I'm glad you came by. I'm so unhappy and lost. Yeah, I can see that. May I come in? Why not? The sheriff hasn't done anything about, about Richard's murder. I wouldn't rely too heavily on Sheriff Doherty, Mrs. Hobb. I don't think he will do anything. No? Well, don't look so surprised in your hour of bereavement, Mrs. Hobb. You know he won't do anything. I don't know anything of the kind. Why don't you sit down and let's talk? I want you to help me. Well, I'm, I'm not sure I can help you. I'm... I'm so broken up. Oh, now, if you're not careful, you might drown in those tears. What are you trying Relax, to... Mrs. Hobb. All right. So I can't really cry about Richard. I never have. But I thought it was expected of me. Some people might expect it. I don't. Now, look. This set of creaks from top to bottom. Your late husband made 7500 a year and deposited $20,000 in six months. Here. Figure. I don't know anything about his money. All I know is the bank told me he had only $300 left. What did he do with it? What do you think? He spent it on other women. Then why the tragic act? I'm not very good at it, am I? Not the best. And it's funny, Johnny, because I really mean it. Oh, I know how foolish I look in these clothes. I wanted to cry because, well, I really loved him once and he loved me, but we kicked it away because we both wanted more excitement than this town or his salary could give us. He was always out spending his money on other women, being a big shot. What about the money? He got it for falsifying the inspection papers, didn't he? Yes. Who gave it to him, Mrs. Hobb? I don't know. Probably Roy Vickery. Who do you think killed him? I don't know that either. What do you know? Johnny, he didn't leave insurance. And I have to live the best way I can. If I stay in this town, I have to keep friends. If I don't want to keep them, I have no choice but to move. And that takes money. I wonder what could possibly be going on in your mind. Your company handles insurance, doesn't it? 263 different kinds. Are you particular what kind of premiums you collect? Well, we pay off on a lot of things. Just what kind of insurance were you thinking about? $2,000 endowment. Got your pen? No, but my words go to the cashier's cage. What do you got? I'm trusting you. Richard got that $20,000 from the Clinton Gravel Company for services rendered. Know who owns the Clinton Gravel Company? Roy Vickery. That's close enough. Last night after you were here, Richard came back. I told him what you'd said to me. He said Vickery and the others were going to make a patsy out of him. So he left to see you. And got shot up. Hey, wait, wait a minute. Vickery was outside your house when I left. He might have done it himself. That's all I can tell you. Now, uh, do I get my insurance? If what you say is true, Mrs. Hobb, I'll have to check first. Well, you'll find out. 
Say, where do you come from, anyhow? Hartford, Connecticut. Connecticut. Say, I got an idea. What's the housing situation in Hartford? Rough. For you, Mrs. Harm. Very rough. I finally tore myself away from the grieving widow and headed back to the hotel. On my way down the main street of Clinton, someone with a wrinkled coat and bourbon on his breath stepped out and stopped me. David Baines, the architect. Dollar. Well, hi. Yeah, I told you I was going to stick around and do something brave. Oh? I finally got up courage enough to do something decent. Decent for me, anyway. For anybody else, it'd be too low to talk about. Well, what was it? Well, I'm not much of a lawyer, but they say there's a statute in the books that says a private citizen may commit a crime to prevent a greater crime from being committed and still go free. Is that right? I wouldn't know. Well, I committed a crime. Two crimes. Dishonor to my noble character. Disappointing the trust of a young woman. That was the first one. Then, uh, then engineering a theft. I'm a fagin. That's what I am. Under the guise of loving a young female secretary eternally, I have, well, here. The purchase orders from Roy Vickery's office. The actual purchase orders for the school. What? She stole them for me. For you. With my best regard. I looked at them. They were as advertised. Purchase orders complete down to the last ten-penny nail. Expense account item 16, 48 cents, postage. Not being a technical expert, I sent them down to Denver for perusal by the original brokers. Fourteen hours later, the verdict came back in a long telegram. The materials used in the school construction were not passable. The insurance company would never honor the claim of the city of Clinton. This text I turned over to Frank Ibsen, publisher of the Clinton Times. He promised it would be in the late afternoon edition. There were other developments. Toby O'Brien again. Yeah, Toby. We located two witnesses to the Hobbs shooting. Vickery put Hobb out of the way himself. Get their statements and get them on a train to Denver right away. Right. Then you better gather up the rest of the boys and come over here. Right. Expense account item 17, 10 cents, one newspaper. The afternoon edition of the Times, which carried a complete story of the insurance investigation up to date, naming Vickery as the perpetrator of the school fire and involving Sheriff Doherty and Chief Hanley. I phoned Frank Ibsen and explained his next edition could carry the story of Hobbs' murder by Vickery. Ibsen said he'd make up an extra for that. I'd no sooner hung up the phone than I had visitors. Want to come with us, Dollar? Not particularly. Who are you? Deputy Egan. Sheriff Doherty wants to talk to you. I've already said all I want to say to him. Get out. Guys? Oh, no. Guys, get him out of here. There was strictly no contest. I walked out of the room with a deputy on each side of me and Egan behind me. We were in front of the hotel when I saw Toby O'Brien, Al Davis, and John Newton coming toward the entrance. I kicked out at the nearest man and yelled for help. A few of the local citizens joined in the fight, and Sheriff Doherty's three deputies got the worst of it. We took them all back up to my room. Now, sit down. All right, Egan. You're, you're going to be arrested for this, Dollar. Where were you going to take me? Where? Uh, place on the edge of town. Clinton Gravel Works. Why? Doherty, Doherty said to bring you back. He, he wanted to see you. Who's there with him? I, I don't know. The Clinton Gravel Works was a large building and tall shaft set on the edge of a frozen lake. Parked near the entrance was a long black limousine, such as a well-to-do contractor might drive. A white supercharged sedan, such as a fancy western sheriff might use, and a red sedan, unmistakably belonging to the fire chief. We covered all the exits, and Toby O'Brien and I went in the front way. We were halfway up the steps when things began to happen. You all right? Yeah, come on. Well. Hello, Dollar. <laughs> all right, lie still, Vickery. I stayed still for you too long. I should have put you out of the way. The same as you put Hob out of the way. Better. Ah, <coughs> uh, this one's gone. Who is he? Fire Chief Hanley. Vickery, where's Doherty? He's out shooting his gun some more, Dollar. I hope he gets you, too. I hope. He's back stairs, Johnny. Yeah. Stay away from me, Dollar! The place is surrounded. Throw down the gun and walk out with your hands behind your head. Toby, I'll get on the front way. Get the guys to step around through the shaft. Right. You coming out? 
Doherty, you coming out? No. Doherty. You ought to go over a place good before you think you got a man trapped, Dollar. You're trapped, Sheriff. The men are waiting for you. I'm up here with you, and you're the one I want. I told you I'd kill you. I've still got my gun in my hand. Vickery had his gun, and so did Hanley. Look at them. Yeah, you did pretty well. Made it look like they shot each other. And now it's your turn, Dollar. No! Get back! Okay, Johnny? Yeah, just a nick. Hey, get a doctor, will you? Yes, sure. Well, Sheriff? Uh, I guess... (laughs) I guess I... Kind of forgot some. Yeah, what's that? The part about about the falling out among thieves, Dollar. That was Sheriff Doherty's last statement. He died on his way to the hospital. Roy Vickery recovered and was arraigned on charges of murder, conspiracy, 28 counts all told. Chief Hanley was dead. Expense account item 18, $62, board and room. Item 19, $58, miscellaneous. Item 20, $164, transportation back to Hartford. Total expense account, $2,385.03. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's exciting story. Next week... The Jolly Roger fraud matter. And, uh, yeah, that means piracy. Of a kind that would have made Captain Kidd look like a bungling amateur. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Jeanette Nolan, Lucille Meredith, Carlton Young, Herb Ellis, Jack Petruzzi, Bob Bruce, Herb Butterfield, Paul Richards, Edgar Barrier, Russell Thorson, Jack Moyles, and Frank Gerstel. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. <laughs> <laughs>